Hey, this is Andrew Brown, your cloud instructor at Exam Pro, bringing you another complete study course, and this time it's the HashiCorp Terraform Associate Certification made available to you here on FreeCodeCamp. So this course is designed to help you pass and achieve HashiCorp issued certification, and the way we're going to do that is by going through lectures, follow-alongs, cheat sheets, and even a practice exam so you can prove on your resume and LinkedIn you got that Terraform knowledge so you can go get that DevOps job or get that promotion you've been looking for. To tell you a bit about me, I'm previously the CTO of multiple ed tech companies, 15 years industry experience, five years specializing in cloud. I'm a community hero. I publish multiple free cloud courses. And if you ever want to buy me a drink, coconut water is what I drink. Uh, if you uh, I just want to take a moment here to thank viewers like you because it's you that make these free courses possible. And if you want to know how you can uh, support more free courses like this, the best way is to buy our additional study materials at exampro.co forward slash Terraform for this particular course. So this is where you'll get study notes, flashcards, quizlets, downloadable lectures, downloadable cheat sheets, practice exams, ask questions, get learning uh, support. And so if you want to access the free practice exam at Cheat Sheets, you do have to sign up, but there is no credit card required. There's no trial limit and you're not gonna get spammed, okay? If there are course updates, they are going to appear within a link within the YouTube and also on the Exam Pro platform. Uh, just make sure that you uh, have access to these corrections, additions, modifications uh, before you start this course. So you're making sure you are consuming the latest version so that you have the best chance of passing. If you want to keep up to date on uh, new courses that I'm working on, the best place is to follow me on Twitter at Andrew Brown. And I'd love to hear if you have passed your exam, what courses you'd like to see next. And there you go. So let's go jump into the course now. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are at the start of our journey asking the most important question first, which is what is the Terraform Associate? So the HashiCorp Terraform Associate is a specialty certification in Terraform, and it is an infrastructure as a code tool that is both declarative and cloud agnostic. So you might be considering getting the certification if you are seeking a DevOps engineer role, if you enjoy automating infrastructure or writing scripts, if you have knowledge uh, working with multiple cloud service providers like AWS, GCP, Azure, or you enjoy designing and iterating on end-to-end -end infrastructure life cycles. So Terraform is the third most uh, uh, cloud skill that is in demand for DevOps roles. So it goes AWS, Azure, Terraform, and Kubernetes. So Terraform is the industry standard for infrastructure as a code. I know AWS really likes uh, cloud formation, but you know when you're using more than one provider, and most companies are, they're going to be turning to Terraform. Uh, this is not a difficult exam. However, grasping Terraform requires a bit of patience since uh, it requires a bit of uh, silo uh, uh, circular learning to fully understand certain concepts. So when I say that, it's like you'll go over something, you'll kind of get it, then you'll go put it into practice and you'll come back to the original lecture content and then it will all make sense. So you just have to kind of work through it with having partial information. It's kind of like doing math back in the day for high school. So Terraform is easy to learn, but it definitely is hard to master. So uh, just because you pass this Terraform associate doesn't mean you're an expert in it, but definitely means that you're going to have the skills to meet the job requirements for junior DevOps roles or, you know, if you're upskilling, okay? So there are multiple uh, ways that we can look at this. I call it the multi-cloud roadmap because everything that HashiCorp does is all about uh, multi-cloud workloads and a prerequisite of doing this kind of stuff is actually having base knowledge in uh, different providers so if we're looking at certifications you have the google cloud engineer uh, you could have any any sort of um, aws certification could be the solutions architect could be the developer um, but generally the sysops is probably the most aligned and then you have your azure administrator or maybe your um, uh, azure uh, developer, the AZ204. And then there's also Kubernetes because Kubernetes workloads can uh, come into there. So that's the CKAD. Uh, so very common is you'll pick up one or two certs in your uh, associate tier for one of the CSPs, and then you're going to move on to your Terraform associate certification. Uh, HashiCorp, uh, while I'm making this video, does not have that many certifications beyond the associate track. As you can see, they only have a single professional up here, and it's for Vault. Would they make a Terraform professional? I don't know. Um, but you know, that'd be interesting to see if you wanted to know where to go after your associate, I would probably go uh, over to console because that is, uh, like cloud networking or uh, multi-cloud networking that is agnostic. And then maybe you might want to go over to vault. Um, if you are, uh, interested to go the vault route, 
And again, this is outside of the Terraform roadmap, but you could just take one of those associates and move to vaults and then go to the Take the Professional. If you're doing the Kubernetes uh, track, then you, you would probably want to go over to console there. But really what we're focused on here is this over here, okay? So how long does it take to pass uh, this exam? So here I have kind of a, a scale here. We're going to look at beginner and then experience. So I, I describe a beginner as someone who's never written infrastructure as a code. Uh, has not previously focused on automating infrastructure and doesn't hold an associate level certification. If this is you, you're looking at a 30 hour study time. You really should go obtain a, uh, a cloud service provider associate before you take this exam. You don't have to, uh, but it's generally recommended. For the experienced person, uh, this is someone who has written infrastructure's code. Maybe it's been cloud formation, maybe it's been ARM templates, but maybe it's just not Terraform. Uh, they are already working in a DevOps role, automating infrastructure, writing scripts, and they hold an associate level. They probably have professionals too. So they're looking at 12 hours study time, okay? So there is a, a large window of time, uh, but my recommendation is that you spread it out across 14 days, study one to two hours. Obviously, this is gonna vary based on uh, what you're doing here, uh, but that will pretty much get you there, okay? What does it take to pass the exam? Well, you're gonna to have to watch the lecture uh, materials and uh, memorize key information. You absolutely need to do hands-on labs. It's really gonna cement your knowledge here. When I made this course, I did all the lecture content first, and then when I did my follow-alongs, I just had so many misconceptions um, because the, um, the actual uh, documentation did not exactly match what was in practice. So it's very important that you do that. And I would strongly recommend some practice exams. And the great thing is I have practice exams for you on our platform. And not only that, I have a full free practice exam for, for you with 57 questions. Like that's a full set, just like the real exam. So I strongly recommend that you go redeem it. Uh, you could probably pass just with the free one, but you know, if, if you wanna help support the platform, then go pay to unlock all the rest of the study material content, okay? Um, in terms of the content outline, there is a lot of domains here. So we have understand infrastructure as a code, understand Terraform purpose, understand Terraform basics, use Terraform CLI, interact with Terraform modules, navigate the Terraform workflow, impl implement uh, and maintain Terraform state, regenerate, modify configuration, understand Terraform cloud enterprise capabilities. And the interesting thing is that they don't give a, uh, a distribution in terms of the weighting. So it's my assumption that, um, and when we look at the exam guide outline, you'll see that they'll have subdomains under each one. So I would imagine that if, you know, if there's like five questions under, or five subdomains under 1.0, then that kind of tells you the weighting for that section. Uh, but we'll talk about that when we get the exam guide because there's some interesting stuff there, okay? Where do you take the exam? Well, you can take it at an in-person test center or online from the convenience of your own home. And uh, it's only with one uh, test center, and this is with PSI. When I say test center, I mean like uh, there are a network of test centers around the world. And this is a proctored experience. So there is a supervisor who monitors students during the examination. So, uh, you know, to make sure that it's legit, okay? In terms of grading, you have to get a 70% to pass around that. Just like every other um, exam out there, it probably uses scaled scoring. So it's not always exact. If you get exactly on the dot, 70% doesn't necessarily mean you pass. So make sure you aim for 75% for your exam, okay? There are 57 questions. That affords about 17 questions that you can get wrong. There's no penalty for wrong questions. So absolutely make sure that you always take a guess. The format of the questions are multiple choice, multiple answer. And this last one's interesting, but there's fill in the blank. And this is where you type a single word answer. So they might ask you like, what is the name of the Terraform state file? And you just write in terraform.tf state. Uh, so, you know, it could be as simple as that. The duration of the exam is one hour, but that is plenty of time. You get one minute uh, per question, a little bit more than just a minute. So your exam time is 60 minutes, but your seat time is 90 minutes. Seat time is meaning that you show up uh, 30 minutes early and you make sure you're ready so you can review the instructions. Uh, if you have to work with your online proctor to make sure your workspace is secure, accept and read the NDA, uh, complete the exam, provide feedback at the end of the exam. So make sure you get pad for that time. Uh, this exam is valid for 24 months. So that means two years before uh, recertification. One little thing I want to note here is um, about Terraform version considerations. When I designed this course, it was uh, designed around the 1.0 specification of Terraform. So Terraform is always incrementing in versions. So for your studies, you may always need to look at the feature set of versions that go back three minor versions from the current stable version. So if it's 1.0, like uh, which, which the exams, at least when I sat, it wasn't even at 1.0, it was probably like 0.15 or 0.14. 
Uh, but my point is that I designed this kind of to be like a bit future proof. So it's this course is not going to go stale for uh, a couple of years. But I do want you to tell you that like, you know, if the exam is based around, let's say like the Terraform version that's out is 1.6. Uh, you know, uh, that doesn't mean like the exam is always a bit behind it. So, you know, the exam might be 1.0. And then that means that the content of the exam would cover these three things. Okay, so uh, throughout this course, I will cover older stuff, but I'll also cover newer stuff and I'll give a more emphasis on and you'll see me do that throughout the course, okay? So Terraform, Terraform certification is heavily dependent on practical knowledge. So as, as long as you take the time to apply the knowledge, uh, yeah, you'll have a good chance of passing regardless of the differences in versioning. And uh, more than half of this course is hands-on, okay? So the bulk of it is hands-on. Um, you could pass just doing lecture content. So like when I sat the exam, I had done a, a, like a, like a very simple walkthrough and then I made all my lecture content and I was able to pass no problem. Uh, but again, I have a background in DevOps and I understand how this stuff works. So it was easy for me to translate that. If you are new or you're not confident, you should really do all those practice exams. So there you go. And let's take a look at the actual exam guide, okay? <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are on the HashiCorp certification website looking at Terraform Associate. And we're going to take a look here at the exam guide because I have some commentary that I want to share with you about it. Uh, and what I found really interesting with the way they design their courses is that everything that you see pretty much shows up on the exam. So there is 57 questions of the exam, and but down below here, there's just shy of 57 uh, subdomains. And so the great thing here is that pretty much Every single question will map to one of these, and you're not going to be worried about having to figure out things outside of this pool. So that really is going to narrow what you need to study for, uh, and it creates a lot of less uh, like confusion or guesswork or overstudy. And I really appreciate that. And I did not until I actually uh, finished, like I got certified and made the lectures in the labs and my practice exams, and I realized. Wow, that makes it a lot easier from a study perspective. But when I came into this, I thought the exam was going to be something like AWS, where what they do is they have all these domains and subdomains and subtopics. And then besides that, then they also have like appendix and then the service and features list. And so basically, more than half, like half of more than half of the stuff that they say here, you might not even experience an exam. And that's really frustrating because you're really overstudying here. And I really like HashiCorp's approach here. So if you really do want to know what you need to know, just go down the list here and say, do I know what all of these things are? And if you can checkbox those off, you're very likely to pass, okay? Um, I do want to say that this is uh, dated, even like right now as we talk, because this is not based off of Terraform 1.0, this exam guide outline. And we can tell because we see Terraform taint. If you look up Terraform taint, this is a deprecated command. Um, so it has been replaced with Terraform apply uh, with the hyphen replace, but do not worry. I have taken care of all of that for you in the exam. So you do not have to worry about any kind of confusion. We are going to cover things outside of just this exam guide outline because after talking to DAs, uh, their technical writers, product marketers, I feel that there's going to be additional content coming in the update like Terraform Cloud, because I feel like that needs a lot more attention here. And so I was I was sure to pack this course with a lot of extra stuff so that the lifespan of this course is going to be a lot longer than what is being shown here, okay? So yeah, uh, hopefully that gives you kind of an idea and some confidence going into this exam. Uh, but let's jump into the real content, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and what I want to do is walk you through a few of our practice exam questions just to give you an, an idea of what it will be like on the real exam and where we might have had to make some adjustments to help your study. So what you'd have to do to access this uh, practice exam is you'd have to be uh, signed up and logged in to the Exam Pro platform, make your way over to the HashiCorp uh, Terraform course, accept the free tier or pay for full access. But once you go there, you'll scroll all the way down to the bottom and you should see three or four practice exams at the time of writing this. We're still writing the questions, so that's why they're not shown in the video here. But what I want you to do is to go to the first practice exam and notice that there are 57 questions. You get an hour uh, on, on the exam here and we have a breakdown based on domain. Now the percentage is not something that uh, Terraform or HashiCorp provides. So we just had to break it down based on the coverage of questions that we saw 
in the exam guide outline and so that should be accurate enough and that's kind of what it felt like on the exam so I don't think that's going to be a problem if we click into here we're just going to look at some of the questions and I'll talk around them so the first one here is we have how do you create a workspace and it's showing us a bunch of CLI commands and so on the exam you do need to know um, uh, you know, CLI commands and the difference of them. And the questions can be as simple as this, where you're just choosing the option. And some are uh, obvious distractors, like there is isn't, there is no one called Terraform Workspace Branch, okay? So just understand that you not just need to know the conceptual ideas behind Terraform, but also it in practice, okay? Another one here would be the Terraform registry can search based on the following search terms. We have an option to choose multiple uh, questions and so this is something that you will see on the exam where you're choosing multiples of something I didn't get a lot on my exam, but I cannot say for certain like how many questions would show up like this um, But you know, they're not really that hard to figure out. Okay, and this question is about um, a tool or sorry uh, the uh, public Terraform registry website and that is just a uh, a a public facing website, if we go to registry.terraform.io here, it's this website here. So it's not just the tooling of Terraform itself, but it's the ecosystem around it. So Terraform Cloud, the Terraform Registry, things like that. Another type of question you will see, and I think it's over here, is what they will do is they'll ask you to fill in the blank. Now we don't have that support in our platform just as of yet, but the idea is they'll say like, okay, uh, we'll ask you a question or we'll even give you, um, Maybe they'll have like underscores and they'll say, fill in this thing. And you'll literally have to type the answer in, but the answer is gonna be like a one word answer. So um, on the exam, I literally had a question which was like, where is the API stored? And it was actually terraform.tfstate, but I did not know, I could not recall the name of it, which is kind of embarrassing. But uh, you know, that is the level of fill-ins that you'll have to do. And you're very likely to see some code on the, on the, uh, the exam too. So if I just click through here really quickly, you may see a code block. Okay, and you might have to decipher it. So that's the difficulty of the exam. I would not say this is a hard exam, but you just have to understand the scope of those kind of questions and make sure that you have well-rounded study in both practical and conceptual concepts of Terraform. So hopefully that helps you out, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at what is infrastructure as code. And before we talk about that, we need to talk about the problem with manual configuration. So manually configuring your cloud infrastructure allows you to easily start using new cloud service offerings to quickly prototype architectures. However, it comes with a few downsides. So it's easy to misconfigure a service through human error. It's hard to manage the expected state of the configuration for compliance. It's hard to transfer configuration knowledge to other team members. And so this is why uh, infrastructure Infrastructure Code is going to really help us out. So um, Infrastructure as Code, commonly abbreviated to IAC, and you'll see that a lot in this course, allows you to write a configuration script to automate, creating, updating, or destroying cloud infrastructure. Notice I gave great emphasis on automate or automation because that is really key to um, Infrastructure as Code. IAC could also be thought of as a blueprint of your infrastructure. IAC allows you to easily share, version, or inventory your cloud infrastructure. And just to kind of give you a visualization, imagine you write a script and that's going to uh, provision uh, and uh, launch a bunch of cloud services that are all interconnected, okay? <laughs> All right, so we're taking a look at popular IAC tools. Um, and so of course this course is about Terraform, but by understanding um, all the options out there, we can understand why we're using Terraform. Uh, and one thing that is very important to understand is the difference between declarative and imperative IAC tools. Those are the broad categories um, that we see uh, for IAC. So let's start with declarative. So the idea here is what you see is what you get. Everything's explicit. It's more verbose, but there's zero chance of misconfiguration. And this all relies on the fact that they use a scripting language like, such as JSON, YAML, XML. In the case of Terraform, they have their own language called HCL. But the uh, way these languages are structured is that they're very verbose um, and there's not a lot of programming logic involved. Um, so for Azure, we have ARM templates and Azure Blueprints. For AWS, we have CloudFormation. For Google, we have Cloud Deployment Manager. And there, there is, of course, Terraform, which has many cloud service providers such as AWS, Azure, GCP, Kubernetes, and a lot more. But these are all in the declarative category. On the right-hand side, we have Imperative. So 
you say what you want and the rest is filled in. Everything here is implicit. Uh, it's less verbose, uh, but you could end up with misconfiguration. And when I say that, it's that like if you were to find, um, let's say a virtual machine, you might not have to provide every single uh, option that you would normally do and that it would fill in the rest. But if you weren't aware of what it was doing, that's where you could end up with misconfiguration. Uh, though I would say that imperative tools uh, generally try to always uh, uh, have their defaults as best practices. So you're not usually in a bad position, uh, but you know you might end up with something you don't expect. Uh, imperative can do more than declarative. So there's just some very hard uh, limitations with declarative languages. Uh, so there's just cases where you want to do imperative. Uh, and the idea here is imperative languages use programming language you know, like Python, Ruby, JavaScript, Golang, you know, whatever it is, uh, there's likely an SDK for it. Uh, and so it's just a lot more um, programmer friendly. A lot of developers like imperative tools. Um, so AWS has their own called Cloud Development Kit, CDK, and it technically only supports uh, AWS. And I say technically because HashiCorp has a very cool library that allows you to generate out uh, Terraform HCL files, which allows you to work with anything. But when we're just talking about CDK on its own, it's just for um, AWS. Then you have Plumi. It supports AWS Azure GCP uh, and Kubernetes. Um, so it can do a lot. So why would you choose with your team to use declarative over imperative? Well, it just really depends on your um, your team, right? So like if they're all used to, if they're all administrators and they're used to using JSON YAML and they're not good with programming languages, uh, that is one reason why you might want to use declarative over imperative. Um, the other thing is just, you know, you prefer to know exactly every single thing that was defined, right? You don't want anything uh, left up to uh, a chance. And so that is another reason why you might want to use declarative, but both are great options. It just really depends on your team's knowledge and what your goals are. Okay. So we just looked at imperative and declarative, but I just want to clarify that Terraform, even though it's a declarative language, it has imperative like features. So I've coined the phrase declarative plus. And so Terraform kind of gives you the best of both worlds. So you have declarative and imperative, and then the three types. So our YAML, JSON, XML, we have Terraform language, which actually utilizes HCL underneath. And then you have programming languages on the right-hand side, like Ruby, Python, JavaScript, uh, what have you, right? So when we're looking at YAML or JSON, these are very limited languages um, or scripting languages where uh, you know, you don't really have any kind of complex data types. You probably don't have a whole lot of uh, robust functions, but in some cases you can extend that uh, base behavior. So in the case of CloudFormation, which uses YAML or JSON files, they have a concept called macros. So you can uh, extend it a bit, but again, it's very inflexible. And so a lot of people are led to go and use CDK. So Terraform is great because it kind of has a lot of stuff you'd see in programming languages like for loops, dynamic blocks, locals. It also has complex data structures and a lot of functions around using those data structures. And so it allows you to stay in that declarative world, but having the stuff that you generally need when you're in the imperative world. When you're in the imperative side, uh, the idea is that the language is what you're utilizing. So you can do anything that the programming language allows you to do. Uh, but I just wanted to kind of show you that Terraform sits in the middle, okay? Hey, it's Angie Brown from ExamPro, and we are looking at infrastructure lifecycle. So what is infrastructure lifecycle? It's the idea of having clearly defined and distinct work phases, which are used by DevOps engineers to plan, design, build, test, deliver, maintain, and retire cloud infrastructure. When we're talking about like SDLC, so software development lifecycle, there's usually a really great visual that I can show for you. But for infrastructure lifecycle, especially cloud infrastructure lifecycle, there isn't something that is well defined which is weird by the definition, but um, I think that there's just nobody's agreed upon one yet or nobody's made the graphic yet. So I just don't have anything to show you for that, but I just want you to get familiar with the term infrastructure lifecycle because you're likely to hear it again. But one particular infrastructure lifecycle that is pretty common is ones that talk about day zero, day one, and day two. So the idea here is this is a simplified way to describe phases of infrastructure lifecycle. So when we say we are on day zero, we are planning and designing our infrastructure. On day one, we are developing and iterating it. So we might be, uh, you know, uh, 
deploying or provisioning it and actually testing it uh, in the cloud. And then day two is actually when we go live with real production users and maintain it. And the idea of mentioning day zero, one, and two is to say, well, when does IAC start? And the idea is it starts on day zero, okay? The days do not literally mean a 24 hour day. Uh, it's just a broad way of defining where in the infrastructure project we would be, okay? So after defining what infrastructure lifecycle is, what advantage or what uh, advancement are we going to have when we add IAC to our infrastructure lifecycle? Well, the first thing we're going to get is reliability. So IAC makes changes impotent, consistent, repeatable, and predictable. I'm going to give extra attention here to impotent because it is a very strange English word. But uh, no matter how many times you run your IAC, you will always end up with the same state that is expected. That is a very important concept of IAC. Uh, whereas if you use configuration management, there's no guarantee of that. That's why you'd use uh, Terraform over something like Ansible, okay? You have manageability, so enable mutation via code, revise with minimal changes, and then you have sensibility, so avoid financial and reputational losses to even loss of life when considering government and military dependencies on infrastructure. So there you go. <laughs> Okay, so idempotent is a very important concept to infrastructure as code. And so we're gonna give it a little bit more attention. I wouldn't stress out about the pronunciation. Uh, there's more than one way to pronounce it in English and I've probably even said it wrong uh, in the previous slide. So uh, just be uh, uh, forgiving on that part, okay? But the idea is that uh, let's stage a scenario between a non-idempotent example and an idempotent example. So when I deploy my IAC config file, it will provision and launch two virtual machines. That is what I'm expecting, okay? And that is what I get. But what happens when I go and I update this infrastructure as code file saying, maybe I wanna increase the size of the VMs or some of the configuration, and I deploy that again when it's non idempotent uh, What will end up happening is I will end up with two additional virtual machines with the new configuration and the old ones will be there. And so this is something you might not want because you just want to have a file that says exactly the state that you expect, okay? So when we have something that is idempotent, um, the idea is we will go and we will uh, define our two virtual machines and we will get our two virtual machines, but we go and we update that file and we deploy again. And what happens this time is it just ends up modifying the original virtual machines, or if it really can't and it has to, it might delete them and recreate them. But the idea is that we end up in a state of exactly what we want. So in the first case, we expected two, but we ended up with four. But with uh, the idempotent uh, case, we expected two and we always end up with two. So hopefully that makes that very clear, okay? <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and what I want to do here is concretely define the difference between provisioning, deployment, and orchestration. Now, in practice, sometimes these have overlapping responsibilities, so you might say provisioning when you really mean deployment or vice versa. It's not a big deal. Uh, we all get kind of mixed up about it, but I did want to just take the time to make sure that we understand what these things are supposed to mean, okay? So the first on our list here is provisioning. So to prepare a server with systems, data, and software, and then make it ready for network operation. If you're using a configuration management tool, you are most likely provisioning because that's what these tools do. So Puppet, Ansible, Chef, Bash Scripts, PowerShell, or CloudNet so you can provision a server. When you launch a cloud service and configure it, you are provisioning it, okay? Then you have deployment. So deployment is the act of delivering a version of your application to run a provision server. Deployment could be performed via AWS Code Pipeline, Harness, which is a third-party uh, deployment tool, Jenkins, GitHub Actions, Circle CI. There's a lot more other providers out there. Then you have orchestration. So orchestration is the act of coordinating multiple systems or services. Orchestration is a common term when working with microservices, containers, and Kubernetes. So uh, orchestration could be done with Kubernetes, Salt, or Fabric. So if you're working with containers, uh, generally, like you use the word orchestration, especially with Kubernetes, because you're working with thousands of uh, microservices, okay? So, you know, hopefully that helps you uh, uh, know the difference between those three. Again, it's not a big deal if you don't perfectly know them. Uh, but there you go. 
Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at configuration drift. So this is when provision infrastructure has an unexpected configuration change due to team members manually adjusting configuration options, malicious actors, so maybe they are trying to cause downtime or breach data, or side effects from APIs, SDKs, or CLIs. So you've written some code that uses a CLI in a bash script, uh, and it does something you did not expect to happen. Uh, so here, an example could be, imagine you have a server, like a database, and a junior developer turns off delete on termination for your production database. This could be a problem where, let's say there's an accidental deletion of the database. Uh, this feature would protect the database from deletion, but if it's turned off, you don't have that, right? So configuration drift going unnoticed could be a loss or breach of cloud services and residing data or result in interruption of services or unexpected downtime. So there's a lot of um, uh, downsides to uh, neglecting or not noticing configuration drift. So what can we do about this? So how to detect? So there's three things, detect, um, we can fix it and then prevent it, okay? So to detect configuration drift, if you have a compliance tool, uh, it can detect misconfiguration. So AWS Config can do that. Azure Policies can do that. GCP Security Health Analytics can do that. Some of these are constrained to uh, uh, security uh, things, not just uh, configuration in general, but there are tools there uh, for uh, all the cloud service providers. There is built-in support for drift detection for AWS CloudFormation. It's called CloudFormation uh drift detection. Uh, other providers don't necessarily have that. Um, if you're using Terraform, which is this, which is all this course is about, you have uh, the Terraform state files, which says what the state of things should be. Uh, so that's how you could detect configuration drift. Uh, how to correct configuration drift? Well, compliance tools can remediate. So again, AWS Config, you can create a custom Lambda to say, hey, when this happens, then do this. So set the configuration back into place. With Terraform, you can use the refresh and plan commands, which we'll look at in detail in this course, um, or you can manually correct it. So if the option was changed, you could do that. Not recommended to do that. Another thing would be tearing down and setting up the infrastructure again, because that would bring it back into its original state. Uh, that could be a risky thing to do, um, uh, depending on how you have things set up, or it could be, it could be fine, right? Then there's prevention. So um, this is a, a, the important thing and kind of why we're talking about configuration drift, which is all about immutable infrastructure. So always create and dis destroy, never reuse. So that might be blue-green deployment strategies. Um, servers are never modified. They are all, they are just always deployed with a new version. Uh, the way you would do that would be baking AMI images uh, or containers via AWS Image Builder or HashiCorp Packer or a build server like GCP Cloud Run or uh, code build like AWS. Um, but the idea is that you're not modifying after they're deployed, you'd have that image already ready to go. Another thing you could use is GitOps. So uh, you would version control your IAC, like within GitHub or something like that. And you would peer review every single uh, um, uh, change via a pull request to the infrastructure. So hopefully that gives you an idea of things we can uh, do to tackle configuration drift, okay? <laughs> We were just talking about immutable infrastructure, but I just want to give it a bit more attention here. So uh, the idea is um, we are going to first develop our infrastructure as a code file, Terraform, CloudFormation, what have you. And then we're going to go ahead and deploy that. So we'll end up with our own virtual machine. And then that virtual machine needs to be configured. So you need to install packages and things like that. That's where CloudInit would come into play, Ansible, Puppet, Chef, Salt, uh, whatever configuration management tool you want to use. Uh, the problem here is that uh, there's no guarantee that that configuration is going to stay in place. Uh, so that's where immutable infrastructure comes into play. So we develop our uh, infrastructure as a code file, Terraform, CloudFormation, uh, and then we're gonna go ahead and do our configuration by building a virtual machine or building a container. So we can use something like Packer. Uh, and then the idea is once we are happy with our configuration, uh, what we're going to do is bake that image and put it in an image repository. And then uh, that image is gonna be referenced when we do our deploy. And so that's gonna make sure that our infrastructure is always immutable, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at the concept or methodology of GitOps. So this is when you take infrastructure as code 
and you use a Git repository to introduce a formal process to review and accept changes to infrastructure code. And once that code is accepted, it automatically triggers a deploy and changes that infrastructure. So uh, here's my illustration through it. So the idea is you would have um, a Terraform file and you would place that in something like GitHub. You would uh, apply your commits, and when you're ready, you'd make a pull request. You would merge that pull request into the, the main branch or whichever branch is set up for production, and that could trigger something like GitHub Actions, and GitHub Actions would then uh, trigger a Terraform uh, plan and, and accept it, or maybe you have to manually intervene to say, okay, I accept these changes, uh, but then it would roll out those changes. Now, Terraform does have their own, and it's pretty darn similar, but I thought mine was a bit easier to read. But the idea is you have your Git repository, uh, you have your pull request. Uh, this is pulling from Terraform Cloud because you can uh, have files and state managed there. Uh, so that is another uh, means to do it, but th that's generally how it works, okay? <laughs> So we were just looking at immutable infrastructure, but what I want to do is just kind of cement in your head things that you should be asking yourself as a DevOps engineer so that you kind of lean towards uh, that immutable uh, kind of uh, way of thinking. And so this is mostly going to be applicable for virtual machines, but let's just ask some questions of things we should be thinking about. So what's going to happen if we deploy our virtual machine and there is a physical failure of the hardware by the provider? So this can sometimes happen on AWS where they have two status checks that have to complete before a virtual machine is ready. Sometimes they fail and so, you know, your infrastructure is not ready, it's degraded or damaged, right? Uh, then you have application failure. So you have this post uh, installation script, maybe to install your application. And uh, there's either a bug, so introduced by developer, uh, or uh, maybe there's just a dependency and it's changed. And so it's breaking your app. Uh, what happens when you need to deploy in a hurry? Um, what happens in worst case scenarios where you have accidental deletion, compromised by a malicious actor, need to change regions, maybe there's a region outage. And so uh, the thing is, is that when you look at these things, what happens when multiples of these happen at the same time? Because that's the problem where, you know, it's like, okay, I have something wrong with my application code, but I also have, uh, you know, now we also have a region down. And so you don't want to be dealing with more than one problem at the same time. And so that's where you're going to have an issue of agility in terms of deployment. Another thing that is overlooked is there's no guarantee of one-to-one -one if you are configuring your code after deployment. Uh, because if you um, were to deploy a virtual machine and it installed all the dependencies, uh, and then you to, were to deploy a virtual machine literally a minute later, one of those dependencies could have a minor revision. And so that would be deployed with that one minor revision. So they would look very similar, but they aren't one-to-one. -one. So by introducing golden images, which is an immutable infrastructure idea, you get a guarantee of one uh, one to one with your fleet. You have increased assurance of consistency, security. You, have, uh, you can speed up your deployments. The reason why you'd have an improvement of security is because at that stage, you could, um, you could perform kind of security checks and things like that there on that image uh, before you roll it out. Uh, so I don't know. Um, I would just say that I would recommend that you go with uh, the immutable infrastructure or baking your images when you can if you're using VMs, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we're going to take a look here at what is HashiCorp. So HashiCorp is who creates Terraform, and they are a company specializing in managed open source tools used to support the deployment and development of large-scale service-oriented software installations. And they have their own uh, cloud platform called the HashiCorp Cloud Platform, HCP. And it's a unified platform to access HashiCorp various products. So uh, the main thing is that it's cloud agnostic. So HashiCorp makes it really easy to build cross-cloud. Uh, and they have support for all the three main providers, so AWS, GCP, Azure. Uh, I'm sure they have more support like Kubernetes and things like that. Uh, they're highly suited for multi-cloud workloads or cross-cloud workloads. Uh, and they have a lot of products that will help you out there. So let's go through them quickly. So first we have Boundary. This is secure remote access to systems based on trusted identity. This is Console. This is a full featured service mesh for secure service segmentation across any cloud or runtime environment. You have Nomad. This is scheduling and deployment of tasks across worker nodes in a cluster. You have Packer, which is a tool for building virtual machine images uh, that will be later uh, deployed or they will place 
them in a image repository. Then you have Terraform, which is infrastructure as code software, which enables provisioning and adapting virtual infrastructure across all major providers. Then you have Terraform Cloud, and this is just a place to store and manage your IAC uh, state files and things like that with a team or just in the cloud by yourself. We have Vagrant, so building and, uh, building and maintenance of reproducible software development environments via virtualization technology. We have Vault, so secrets management, identity-based access, encrypting application data, auditing of secrets for application systems and users. And lastly, we have Waypoint, a modern workflow to build, deploy, and release across uh, multiple platforms. So there you go. <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at what is Terraform. So Terraform is an open source and cloud agnostic infrastructure as a code tool, and Terraform uses declarative configuration files. And the configuration files are written in the HashiCorp configuration language, HCL. Uh, and so that's what you can see on the right hand side. Uh, we'll generally call it the Terraform language, which we'll talk about later. Uh, but notable features of Terraform are installable modules, plan and predict changes, dependency graphing, state management, uh, and provisioning infrastructure in familiar languages. Uh, that's something you could do via AWS CDK. So I wouldn't say it's uh, um, core to Terraform, but that's what they listed on their website. So that's why I put it in there. And Terraform Registry, which has over 1,000 plus providers. Okay, so there we go. So we were just looking at Terraform, but what is Terraform Cloud? Well, it's a software as a service offering for remote state storage, version control integrations, flexible workflows, and allows you to collaborate on infrastructure changes within a single unified web portal. And this is all accessible uh, via terraform.io. And the first thing you'll have to do is create yourself an account on Terraform.io, but it's free to start with. And they actually have a very generous free tier that allows for team collaboration for the first five users of your organization. That's not part of the team's plan, that's part of the free plan. And in the majority of cases, you really should be using Terraform Cloud as your remote backend, even if you are an individual, just because you know it makes the experience so much better. The only case that you might not want to use Terraform Cloud is if you have a, a very large company that's trying to meet particular regulatory requirements. And it's not that Terraform Cloud uh, does not meet them, but sometimes there's just a long procurement process. So in the meantime, you'd have to use something like standard remote backend or Atlantis, or maybe you need to investigate Terraform Enterprise. I do want to note that uh, Terraform Cloud and Terraform Enterprise is the underlying software known as Terraform Platform. It's not something you're going to ever have direct access to, but uh, just to clarify that terminology, okay? So what I want to do is just set you up with understanding the Terraform lifecycle. This is not necessarily uh, described in the documentation anywhere, but it's something that is inherently known when you're working with Terraform. Uh, and it's definitely not uh, 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 inclusive of every single command that can be ran, but the ones that you're going to encounter most often. So at the start, you're going to be writing or updating your Terraform configuration file, okay? And from there, the first thing you'll want to do is initialize your projects and or if you need to pull the latest providers and modules, you're going to use Terraform init to do that as well. From there, you're going to use plan. So plan allows you to speculate what will change or generate a saved execution plan that you could use later on. When you run plan, validate happens automatically, but you could also run this separately and ensures types and values are valid, ensures the required attributes are present within your configuration file. From there, if everything is good, you're going to execute your uh, execution plan by running Terraform apply. Uh, you can also, from this point, use Terraform apply to destroy infrastructure. So if you have things set up, there's actually a flag for it, or you can use the alias, the Terraform destroy command. And then, you know, as you work, you're just going to keep updating your code. And that is the Terraform life cycle. So, you know, hopefully this gives you kind of a, a snapshot of what the workflow will be. Um, and I mean, we'll be covering it tons and uh, tons of times over in this course. Okay. <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at change automation. But to understand that, we need to first talk about change management. So this is a standard approach to apply change and resolving conflicts brought about by change. In the context of IAC, change management is the procedure that will be followed when resources are modified and applied via configuration scripts. So what is change automation then? It is a way of automatically creating a consistent, systematic, and predictable way 
of managing change requests via control and policies. Notice, and I should have probably emphasized this, is change requests saying, I'm going to change these resources. Terraform uses change automation in the form of execution plans and resource graphs, which we'll look at uh, detail those two things in upcoming slides, and apply review complex change sets. So a change set is a collection of commits that represents changes made to a versioning repository. And an, uh, for IAC, it uh, uses change sets so you can see what has changed by who over time. So when I say versioning repository, that doesn't necessarily mean Git. Uh, and if you're using GitOps, I suppose you could consider your change sets being committed to that. But something like CloudFormation, uh, when you uh, apply a change, you actually have to accept a change set. Uh, and so the version repository is part of AWS. And so um, you know, with Terraform, you just kind of accept it in place. It's not necessarily on your local machine. Uh, but it gets reflected in your state file, okay? So change automation allows you to know exactly what Terraform will change and in what order, avoiding many possible human errors. Uh, a change automation is essential to any IAC tool. They all have it, okay? So there we go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at execution plans. So this is a manual review of what will add, change, or destroy before you apply changes. And so let's say you type in Terraform apply, it's not just gonna go ahead and do that. It's gonna have you uh, type in yes or accept the value. But what you can do is see the resources or configuration settings that will be added, changed, or destroyed, and it will summarize them at the bottom. And then you'll have to type something like yes in order to accept the changes, okay? <laughs> Something else I want to show you is that you can actually visualize your execution plans by using the Terraform graph command and Terraform will output a graph viz file. You'll have to have graph viz installed, but graph viz is an open source tool for drawing graphs specified in the dot language scripts, having the file name uh, extension of GV. So I believe this is cross platform, it's open source. Um, but once it's installed in your machine, you can run Terraform graph and here this is Linux. So we're using a pipe to say, okay, pass it over to graph is, which is dot. And that is going to then uh, create an SVG file. You can just open that in your browser. And the idea is you're gonna get this graph, which kind of shows you the relationship of the resources uh, here. But we'll talk about the, these uh, relationships in the next slide here, which is a resource graph, okay? <laughs> Let's take a look here at the resource graph. So Terraform builds a dependency graph from the Terraform configurations and walks this graph to generate plans, refresh state, and more. When you use Terraform graph, this is a visual representation or presentation of the dependency graph. If you're wondering what a dependency graph is, in mathematics, it's a directed graph representing dependencies of several objects towards each other. So it's pretty much like nodes uh, with relationships between other nodes. Uh, so that is one that I generated out um, from Terraform. And so there's a few different types here. We have a resource node that represents a single resource. A resource meta node represents a group of resources but does not represent any action on its own. And provider configuration node, so represents the time to fully configure a provider. Uh, will you need to know this for the exam? Probably not. Do you need to know this in great detail? Probably not, because there's a lot to the resource graph. But the idea here is just kind of like Terraform saying, just so you know, we're using a graph database and graph databases are very well suited for uh, this kind of stuff. Uh, and that's why uh, Terraform is very good at um, uh, figuring out conflicts uh, and things like that, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we're taking a look at Terraform use cases. And the idea here is not necessarily because this is gonna show up in the exam, but the idea is to give you a business use case or to highlight the features as to why you'd want to be using Terraform. And the first one here is that it has exotic providers. So Terraform supports a variety of providers outside of GCP, AWS, and Azure, and sometimes is the only provider. Terraform is open source and extendable, so any API could be used to create IAC tooling of any kind of cloud platform or technology, so you can make your own provider. There's some interesting ones that they have like Heroku or even Spotify playlists. I have my own platform called Teacher Seat, and I want to have IAC um, uh, for my platform. And so this is what I'm going to be using Terraform for. Uh, for multi-tier applications, Terraform by default makes it easy to divide large and complex applications into isolate configuration script modules. You'll notice in this course that uh, it, when you have a bunch of Terraform files, they're all treated as one. Uh, so that makes it really easy to split up your, uh, your projects uh, or your, your infrastructure. So it has a complexity advantage over cloud-native IAC tools for its flexibility while retaining simplicity over imperative tools. 
Then we have disposable environments. This is not unique to Terraform. It's any kind of ISC tool, but easily stand up an environment for a software demo or a temporary developer environment. Resource schedulers. So Terraform is not just defined to infrastructure of cloud resources, but can be used to uh, uh, set dynamic schedules for Docker containers, Hadoop, Spark, and other software tools. You can provision your own scheduling grid. Uh, and the last one here is multi-cloud deployment. Terraform is cloud agnostic and allows a single configuration to be used to manage multiple writers and to even handle cross-cloud dependencies. And that is a big deal uh, and is a very unique offering to Terraform, okay? Let's take a look here at Terraform Core and Terraform Plugin. So Terraform is logically split into two main parts, Terraform Core, which uses remote procedure calls, RPC, to communicate with Terraform plugins, and Terraform plugins, so expose an implementation for a specific service or provisioner. Uh, something that's interesting to know is just Terraform Core is written in Go. Um, you know, you probably won't ever encounter it, but it's just a, a fact, okay? Uh, and so here's the graphic that Terraform uses to kind of like explain uh, Terraform Core uh, versus Terraform plugins and how they all relate. Um, and so here's the Terraform core and here are the plugins. Notice we have uh, providers here, which we'll cover provisioners. Uh, and there's just, this is the group for plugins overall. Um, but yeah, that's about it. Um, will it show up in the exam? Probably not, but it's good to understand from a top level view, the split between these two things, okay? <laughs> If you are new to Terraform, I just wanted you to be aware of an additional resource that you can use beyond this course, which is called Terraform Up and Running. So it's a, uh, a book uh, and it has a deep dive into the internal workings of Terraform. And this is really great if you want to go beyond this course, beyond certification, beyond the basics, because what it will do is teach you about testing with Terraform Cloud, uh, zero downtime deployment, common Terraform gotchas, and compositions of production grade Terraform code. There's a lot more to it. Uh, and this book in particular is written by Jim, who's the co-founder of Gruntwork. And we do have a whole section just on Gruntwork. Um, and the thing is, I just wanted you to uh, know about this resource. Uh, you definitely don't need it to pass a certification or to have um, a good understanding or working of Terraform. But you know, at some point, you, if you want more, I just wanna point you to that resource, okay? There's one other resource I want you to check out for Terraform, and this one is free and just online, and it's the Terraform Best Practices. So it's an open book, it's a Git book. Uh, so it's essentially a wiki, and it basically covers the best practices that are being used in the industry. And so this is stuff that is separate from the Terraform documentation. Uh, it's just good practices, you know, if you're going to be using Terraform professionally uh, within the industry. So I just wanted to make you aware of this resource and to go check it out, okay? Hey, it's Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and it's time to begin our follow along for Terraform. And the first thing we need to do is actually install Terraform. So what I've done, uh, and this is in the Terraform Associate uh, folder, this will all be hosted on GitHub so you can access it later. But what we're gonna have to do is make our way over to the HashiCorp Learn website to get to the tutorials Terraform install CLI because that's the first thing we're gonna need. And then once we make our way there, we are going to need to choose our installation method. So we have manual install, Homebrew uh, OS 10, uh, Chocolate on Windows or Linux. So it's just gonna vary based on your installation. I'm not gonna walk through them all, but I'm gonna definitely do the one that is for me. So I'm on Windows 10. And it's very common to use the Windows uh, uh, subsystem of Linux. And so the way I would go ahead and install this, I would open up my terminal in VS Code. And by the way, I recommend you probably follow with VS Code through all these uh, tutorials just because VS Code has a very good extension for uh, Terraform, okay? But once we are there, what we can do is make our way over here. And because Linux, uh, the Linux variant I'm using is Ubuntu, um, I can go ahead here and just go and start going through this process. So we would grab the first URL here. And again, it's gonna vary based on how you want to install. Um, so we'll go there. And I already have it installed, so I'm just installing it again. All right, after a short wait, that uh, line finished there. So we'll just proceed to the next. So we'll grab the GPG key. That's just going to verify that uh, we are grabbing from who we say we're grabbing our code from. So I'll add that takes two seconds. We'll go ahead and this will go and uh, add that repository so that we can um, install from there. I believe this takes a second just as well. 
Okay, that took a little bit more extra time there, but no big deal. Uh, and so now we are ready to actually install the CLI. So we can now do our sudo apt get install terraform. So just copy and we'll go ahead and paste that in there. After a short little wait there, uh, the installation is finished. And so what I would just suggest is type in terraform to make sure the command works. And then just type in terraform hyphen version and just see what version you are using. Uh, as of this tutorial, I'm using version 1.07. There's one other thing I want to get set up for installation here. And that's going to be going over to the extensions in VS Code and making sure that this um, extension is installed because it's going to give us um, a bunch of options here. I don't know what they all are, but uh, I definitely know that it's going to start format and do a bunch of nice things for us. Okay, so once you have those two things installed, our installation step is over. And what we can do is begin on the getting started section here. Okay. <laughs> All right, so now that we have Terraform installed, we are ready to uh, go through our first basic Terraform tutorial. And the idea is to try to touch a bit of everything going through uh, a very basic workflow. Um, and the reason I want to do this early on with you, it's not important for you to know what all these things do and remember them because we're gonna cover them multiple times throughout this course, but just to give you kind of an end-to-end -end experience so you have a point of reference because it's really hard to learn Terraform because you have to kind of go back a lot to uh, remember information, okay? So uh, we'll just start at the top here. And what I wanna do is in my getting started folder, I'm going to make a new file called main.tf. Um, the way Terraform works is you can name the files whatever you want, but generally the standard practice is to use main.tf when you just have a single file or the entry point file. But I'm pretty sure that Terraform will read anything that starts with TF and treat all the files as one single uh, file, okay? So once we have our main TF, we're going to need to add ourselves a provider. So what I'll do is make my way over to my browser here and I want to go to the Terraform registry. So just type in Terraform registry. And uh, what we'll do here is go and look at providers. And since we're gonna start with AWS, we'll click that in the top left corner, we have this use provider and we can just go ahead and grab this code, okay? And so we'll go ahead and paste that in. And uh, so now what you'll see here is we have this Terraform block. That is our Terraform settings configuration. We need to have a provider, at least a single one. And so we're using uh, AWS here. Um, notice that the source is HashiCorp AWS because this provider um, is provided by HashiCorp, not AWS themselves, but it is an official one. So it is in pretty good shape, okay? Uh, notice the version is uh, 3.580. Um, I don't know much about the versions in terms of how they matter, um, but I would just say you probably want to stay up to date to the latest, okay? Uh, so down below we have provider AWS, and this is where we're going to configure our additional options. So this is where we would do like our AWS credentials. But before we do that, let's go uh, find whatever code we need to provision ourselves a virtual machine, because that would probably be the easiest thing that we could do. So what I want you to do is go back to the Terraform registry and we'll click on the documentation because this is where we're gonna find all our information for anything we want to provision, okay? So if we want to provision EC2 instance, which is a virtual machine on AWS, we'll expand that uh, there. And I know that it's called AWS instance. So I'm just gonna scroll on down here and click on AWS instance. And right away we have ourselves a, a very easy example. Um, I'm just gonna scroll down here and just see what else we have. So this all looks okay, but you know what? I think that I'd rather go grab one from the Terraform um, tutorial here because I believe that they have a much nicer one here for AWS. So I'm just gonna scroll on down here. Yeah, this one's a lot simpler. So what we'll do, so just grab this code here and we'll make our way back. Okay, and uh, I think it's probably good to set our region. So I'm gonna do US East one, because that's where I like to deploy things. Uh, and for profile, we can set it as default. That's totally fine for now. And so notice here we have AWS instance. That's going to be the type of resource we want to provision, which is an EC2 instance. And then we're gonna name it whatever we want. App server, my server. I'm gonna name it something else here. Uh, TT micro is pretty standard. This would be the name. So I'm just say my server. Okay, and then we need to get our AMI. I'm just gonna clear that out. So that's pretty much all it takes to set up a resource for AWS, but we're gonna to have to go get the AMI instance and we're also gonna to need to go get our credentials. So let's go do that next. 
All right, so what I've done here is I've logged into my AWS account. You are going to have to create your own AWS account. And if you're looking for how to do that, just go to the readme here and just go to the AWS and just go and create an account. It doesn't take that long to do. Uh, you will need a credit card. That's just like with any cloud service provider, you have to have a credit card to activate the account. Doesn't necessarily they're, mean they're gonna charge you anything, but uh, you know there's the possibility in the future that if you do use resources, it's possible to uh, have a uh, spend, okay? So what I wanna do is make my way over to IAM. And uh, I'm gonna to go to users, oops, over here. And I have a user here, but what I'm gonna do is go ahead and delete this user, just because this is an old one for me. I'm just gonna start the process over and create a new one. And this is considered a machine user because I'm never going to use this user to log into AWS. I'm only gonna use it to generate out uh, programmatic keys. So I'm typing my name in here, Andrew Brown. Uh, and if you wanted to, you could really just type in Terraform as well. Actually, that's what I'm gonna do. And I only wanna give it pragmatic access. So I generated an access ID and secret. Um, I'm going to give it uh, admin access. So what I've done here is I've created an admin rule, but let's just make a new group. We're gonna call it Terraform. And we're gonna give it admin access. This gives you 100% access to all of AWS. Uh, if you are uncomfortable with that, you can try power user. But um, it used to be called power user anyway. If we can't find it that way, we can drop it down here and say um, AWS manage policies. And there should be, or there should be like role-based ones here. Ah, job functions, there it is. And so, uh, you know, if admin access is too much, you can do power user and that usually prevents people from creating users and groups. Uh, so that might be more uh, or, or, or uh, less of a problem, but I just want everything to work for this tutorial. So I'm gonna do what everybody does and we're gonna give admin access, okay? And so now we have that new group. Um, it says no policies are attached. I'm not sure why, maybe I forgot to attach them. So I'll just go back in here. Oh no, it's there, okay. Not sure why I didn't say it was there, but we'll go back and I'll just check box on Terraform. I guess it needed a refresh, eh? And we'll just hit next, next, create user. And so now I have an access ID in secret. So this is gonna vanish after uh, I leave this page. So I wanna leave it open. And what I'll do is go down below here. And I'm gonna open up my um, AWS credentials. So I'm not sure how to open this in uh, VS Code. So I'm just gonna type in Vi or Vim. And I'm gonna go to uh, tilde, that's your home directory, forward slash dot AWS. And this is gonna be in credentials. Okay, and so here I can add that. So we want to have a default profile. So I'll make square braces, type in default, um, and then I need to put in these keys. So I don't remember, I mean, it should be just like AWS, you know, key something, but I always forget what it is. So what we'll do is just look it up, say AWS credentials. And it should just tell us here, there they are. So this is generally what we're looking for. So I'll just copy that. And I'm going to go ahead paste that in there and I'll just clear out these keys because these are not my real keys. Uh, I also like setting the region here. So I'm just gonna set it to US East one. That is the, uh, the the default region for AWS and has the most stuff. Well, technically your default region is gonna be whatever's near you, but that's where all new services are launched. So we're not gonna run into any problems if we use US East one. Uh, and I'll go ahead and grab my key, okay. And we will go ahead and Paste that in. And I will go ahead and grab this secret. Okay, and we'll paste that in. And I'm just gonna double check if that ends actually with a tilde. I don't think it does. I think I introduced that by accident. So I'll just delete that out. And just double check because once you leave this page, you're not gonna see it again. So A K uh, I E P M. K1, that is for me. And of course, don't ever show these to anybody. Um, for me, I will I will be uh, regenerating these. So uh, by the time this is published, you won't have these and you can't compromise my sandbox account, which wouldn't be a big deal anyway. So I'm just going to go ahead and save this file um, and probably be smart to have the AWS CLI installed. So if you're wondering about that, AWS CLI, I already have it installed on this machine, but let's go take a look. Um, and see how it gets installed. Oh, this looks like something new. Developer preview, AWS shell, that looks cool. AWS CLI install, oh, it's over here. 
So download, unzip, and then run the Linux installer. So if we wanted to do it for Linux, I go in here and I would just go ahead and start grabbing this stuff. So we'll just go and curl that file. It's probably a good idea to install the, um, the CLI here. After a short wait, that finished there. So we'll go grab the next line here, which is to unzip it. All right, so after waiting a little while there, it finally unzipped. And so we can go ahead and run the last command, which is sudo uh, period AWS install. And so that shouldn't take too long. Okay, and so here it's just saying found pre-existing AWS CLI because I already have it. Please rerun install script with the update flag. So you would not have to do this, but I'm going to do this because um, you know I'm just trying to get it up to date so that I'm on the latest while doing this tutorial with you. We'll just give it a second to see if it executes there. I think we'll just wait. Okay, great, so now it is using the latest. So if I just type in AWS version, I have uh, 2.2.38. What I will also do is just go ahead and delete this uh, zip here that it placed in my directory and also this AWS directory just to make sure that it's working if, if I delete it. Just assuming that it didn't uh, install it in this directory here and it's, I mean, it does say it's in user local bin but just as a sanity check there, okay? So we'll type in version again. Okay, great. And so now what we'll do is just type in AWS uh, S3 list just to see if there's anything there. Um, so it has an issue. Let's just type in AWS, I think it's AWS credentials to uh, authenticate. Uh, I haven't done it in a while. So let's just take a look at what we can do to check that out. Because we did set up the credentials file, but sometimes, sometimes you might have to run a command here. So I'm just going to find that. Okay, I'll be back in a second. All right, so I didn't have to look far. I just went to configuring to configuration basis. It's AWS configure, not uh, credentials. Um, I'm not configuring new CLIs all the time here. So what we'll do is just type in AWS configure. And so here it has that key. I still have my uh, my IAM open here, so it's IE, so that is correct. And then that is forward slash Y H, that looks correct. Default region is US East, yes. Um, default output, you know, JSON sounds good to me. So, uh, you know, if I do, it was, S3 list, that should work. Because the signature you provided does not match. Check your signing method. So uh, just give me a second to figure that out, okay? All right, so I just tried another command that I know that should just work and it's just saying that they're not valid uh, access credentials. So if it's having problems with those, then that generally means that we need to go and fix our credentials. So maybe there's like a hidden character we pasted by accident or something. You might not be having this problem, but um, I'm just gonna go ahead and double check. So what I'll do is go back over here and I'm gonna go back to my users or I am. And we will go to users and we will go into Terraform here and we will go to our security credentials. I'm gonna delete those ones. You have to deactivate them first and then I'm gonna Delete it. And we'll create new ones. We'll give this another go. It really likes to put that tilde in there. And that uh, doesn't end with a one. So you're seeing I'm getting like weird characters as I do this, but just double check to make sure they are correct.
AK at the start, EU on the end, okay. This is default, that looks correct to me. The region looks fine to me. So we'll go ahead and quit this and we will try this again. Great, and so it works. And I do have a few uh, uh, S3 buckets there uh, prior in the sandbox here. So uh, you might not might not get anything, but as long as you're not getting the error that's saying does not match signature or validation doesn't work. So now that's all set up, uh, if we go back to main TF, that means that this here is going to use the default profile. So uh, that's gonna make it easy. So the last thing we need to do to set up this virtual machine is provided an AMI. And the reason why is that an AMI is a required field. So what I wanna do is just go back over to the documentation here. And if you scroll on down to attribute references, you can see uh, what is required. So, um, well, AMI should be required. I guess the only thing that's required is the instance type here maybe. Uh, am I in it? Yeah, I am. So, I might have went too far down here. Oh, instance type is optional. Huh. Op they're both optional. Okay, maybe it's just like one or the other. Um, but I think that if we didn't have the AMI there, we'd probably run into an issue. Um, so let's go ahead and make our way over to EC2. And we're gonna go ahead and grab ourselves that AMI ID. So we'll go and make sure we're in North Virginia, which is US East 1. We'll go ahead and launch a new instance. And I want the Amazon Linux 2. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab this X68 AMI, AMI ID. And it's really important that you watch uh, which region you're in because different regions, these IDs are gonna be different, okay? So we'll get, go ahead there and save that. And so technically we should be ready to be able to do a plan and apply to provision this. But uh, before we do that, there's a couple things that we should do, which is to try out doing format and validate, okay? Before we do format and validate, what I want to do is actually initialize this project. So go up and create yourselves a new terminal if it's uh, closed or not. So I actually have two open here, so I'll just close the other one. And I'm just gonna type in clear here. And what I want to do is type in terraform init. And before I do that, I just want to show you that right now there's only main TF in here. And so if I hit enter, uh, it's going to say terraform initialized an empty directory. Oh, you know what? I did it in the terraform associate by accident. So we're going to go into getting started here and type in clear and type in terraform init again. And so what it's going to do, it's going to pull uh, whatever providers and modules are defined. So all we have is a AWS provider. So that is what it's pulling right now. And so I'll just give that a bit of time to do that, okay? All right, so after a short little wait there, you'll notice that we have this .terraform directory and we also have this terraform lock HCL. So this is a dependency lock file. It's going to tell us uh, what version of modules or providers that we are using. Um, so because in the main TF, you know, we have 3.580, so that's going to match exactly that. But if we said something like greater than or equals to, this could be a different version, right? So whatever version is set here, it's going to make sure that it stays with that version as long as we're not changing it, okay? Um, so there's that. If we open up the .terraform file, this has information about our provider. So the provider is actually downloaded here. And this is a binary file, so there's not, there's not anything to look at when we open it up, okay? So now that a knit is done, what I want to do is go ahead and show you format and validate, okay? All right, let's take a look here at format and validate. So format is just a way of making the files uh, uh, syntax consistent. And this is going to really help you uh, reduce arguments within your team because there's only gonna be one way to write a Terraform file. And if you don't write it the, the way to the standard, format's going to correct it or complain about it, okay? So one thing we can do is change the indentation level here. Uh, and what I'll do is run in, run Terraform format. And notice that it fixed the indentation. So that's all there really is to it. It's just dealing with the uh, styling of the actual file. Um, I'm not sure if it would do anything for double lines. Let's see if that would take it out. out. I'm not sure. It doesn't. So, you know, it's pretty much just indentation and a few other things. Besides the indentation, I don't know what else it would do. Uh, then you have Terraform Validate, and this is really useful to make sure that you have uh, particular fields required. So I'm gonna go ahead and comment these out. 
I'm going to type in terraform validate. And it's going to tell me if my file is valid. And it's saying here missing required. So um, it wants an AWS instance to have a instance type or launch template, right? So remember it said it was optional, but one or the other is required. So if we add this back in, okay, and type in validate, we'll see if it works. And now it's saying if you specify an instance type, you have to also have an AMI. So we'll take that out there and type in validate. Okay. Uh, another thing I want to show you is let's imagine that we just specified an AMI that doesn't exist, something like uh, this doesn't exist. I just want to show you what validate will do and what it will not do. So we type in Terraform validate. It says it's valid because it's checking, you know, do you have the required uh, attributes and is it the right type? So this is a string, but it doesn't know the contents of that string, whether this is actually a valid one and does it match up to USC uh, one. So just consider that validate doesn't take care of everything for you. Okay. So yeah, that's all there is to format and validate. And so we'll move on to actually setting up a plan. Okay. All right, so now what I want you to do is just give yourself a lot of room in your terminal and type in Terraform plan. And what this is gonna do, it's going to generate a speculative plan of what it would deploy. And so if we just scroll to the top here, uh, what you're gonna notice here is gonna say, this is what it's going to create. So see the green plus sign? And it's saying, we're gonna create a new uh, AWS uh, instance or resource here. And this is all the configurations that we were adding to it. And down below, it's gonna say one added, zero change, uh, zero destroy. And so it's speculative in the sense that it's not generating out a, a plan. You can actually generate out the plan to be used by a uh, Terraform apply. So notice that it says hyphen out option uh, to save this plan. Um, so, you know, we don't need to generally save out our plans, um, but that is an option if we want to do that for some programmatic use. Uh, but now that plan has been uh, shown here and we're happy with it, what we can do is go ahead and type in Terraform apply. And it's going to do the exact same thing. It's going to show us a speculative plan, um, exactly the same thing. So it's running basically a Terraform plan. And then we're going to review it. And if we're happy with it, we're going to write the word yes. Okay. And so what that's going to do, it's going to go ahead and start creating uh, some, uh, some AWS infrastructure there. And in particular, it's just a single AWS instance. So if we make our way over to AWS and we go to EC2, Okay, I can just close these other tabs here. Uh, you'll notice that we have the server and it's starting to spin up. But if you're familiar with AWS, you're probably also familiar with CloudFormation. And CloudFormation is what uh, AWS uses for infrastructure as code. It's their uh, native tooling for it. And I just want to show you that there are no stacks. Like these are for um, Aurora serverless. I just couldn't delete them out. But notice that there is no underlying stack that Terraform is setting up. So Terraform is responsible for managing the state and uh, it's not using CloudFormation underneath, just so you're aware. If we make our way back here, it says that it is uh, completed provisioning, okay? And so what we'll do is make our way over here and give it a refresh. And notice that uh, even though it says that it's uh, complete, it technically isn't because the status checks aren't done. So uh, if you use CloudFormation, it would not be considered done until we had a, a status check one and two. Um, I'm sure there's some way to uh, check that with Terraform to consider it actually complete. I'm not really sure uh, at this point in time how to do that, but I'm just pointing that out, okay? So we'll just wait here for this to complete to move on to the next step, okay? All right, so after a long wait there, our two status checks are complete. So what I wanna show you is how we would go and update that infrastructure, okay? Because, uh, you know, in the course we say that um, infrastructure code is idipotent, meaning that if you define something, you know, like a resource and you run this again, it's not going to create an additional resource, it's just going to only have what you define, which is you expect there to be this single resource here. So what I'm gonna do is just change this T2 micro to a T2 nano, and then we'll go down below and type in Terraform apply. And we're just waiting for it to refresh the state. And by the way, anytime you run Terraform plan or Terraform apply, it actually runs validate every single time. So you don't have to run Terraform validate. You can just do it as part of your Terraform plan 
or if you're doing Terraform apply, you'll it'll be it'll also run there as well. Okay. So notice this time we get this little uh, tilde squiggly here, and it's showing what it's going to change. And so this is doing an update in place, or um, yeah. And so that means that yeah, update in place. And so that means that it's not going to destroy and recreate that instance. It's just going to keep it in place and modify it. So we'll go ahead and type in yes. And we'll let that perform there. And so if we just make our way back over here, uh, to show us that we have a T2 micro. And so if I refresh here, and we take a look here, it shouldn't take too long. And it is stopping the instance, okay? So, but it's not destroying it, okay? All right, so after a short little wait there, it's now a T2 Nano coming back over here. You can see that it's still uh, elapsing time. It's checking to make sure that it's possible, probably because it's in the initializing state. And uh, yeah, there we go. So now it is complete. But you know, like just because it says update in place doesn't mean that your instance or your service is not going to be interrupted. Uh, so that's another consideration uh, that update in place does not mean that there's no interruption of service. Okay. Um, yep. All right, so um, we were able to change the parameter of T2 Nano, but let's imagine that we wanted to make that a little bit more configurable so that we could provide a instance type uh, pragmatically via a variable. Uh, so that's what we'll do next. So what I want you to do is make your way back over your, to your main.tf. And what we're going to do is define ourselves a new variable. Uh, so it's like variable T2, oops, sorry, um, instance type. And just to look it up in the documentation, we'll just type in variable Terraform. I'm just trying to show you where you can find this stuff very easily. So if we scroll on down, notice here that we need to define a type. So this is just going to be a string. So we'll go ahead and grab that, okay? And we can just make that a type string. And then when we want to reference this, what we do is just type in var and then the name of the uh, variable name, which is instance type. And so instead of setting it um, you know, through here, what we can do is we can create like a tfvars files, or we can uh, provide it as a, a flag. So what I'll do first, and I'll just do a plan to just show you how we can do it a few different ways, but um, I'm gonna type in var, and I'm gonna put the name of the, inst the, the variable. So it's like instance type equals, and I think I can do double quotations here, T2 micro. And we'll see what we get as a plan here. Okay, so notice that it's using the T2 micro. I could do this at, like with a medium as well here. Okay, so that's just one way of changing it. Another thing we can do is create ourselves a terraform.tfvars files that allows us to set a bunch of variables. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. So what we'll do is just create a new file here and we'll type in terraform.tfvars and we'll say instance type equals t2 large. Again, I'm not gonna execute this. I just want to show you in the plan that's gonna show up. Okay, and see that it says a T2 large. So I'm gonna go back here and just change this to a T2, um, um, T2 micro, because that's what's on the free tier for AWS. T2 nano, even though it's smaller and more inexpensive, it's not. Uh, so if you are in the free tier, I wanna keep you in that so you save any money or have no spend. Uh, notice over here on the left-hand side that we have this TF state file. This has been uh, generated out. Notice that it's version four because every time uh, we've ran this, it, it has a new iteration, okay? Um, and this is basically defining the current state of our uh, infrastructure. So if you go through here, notice that it says type AWS instance, my server, what provider it's using, what its schema version is, the AMI here, the reference to the AMI, and all the properties. And these are all the properties we basically saw here. Uh, like if we scroll up, notice all these things here, they're pretty much all defined in here, exactly how it's going to be defined. You aren't ever supposed to uh, manually modify this file, um, but it is something visible you can look at. And when we do deploy, um, it is gonna show us the uh, a backup here. 
So if we, um, if we ever happen to lose our TF state file or we want to go, uh, uh, we can always grab that backup file OK. Um, but uh, yeah, so what I want to do here is now that I have that TF vars in place, I'm just going to go ahead and actually run apply. And actually, I'm going to run plan first, sorry. So let's see this as T2 micro. Okay, so it's T2 micro. And what we can do is just do Terraform apply. And this time I'm just gonna do hyphen auto approve. You probably rarely wanna do this, but if you just wanna skip that yes process, you're like, you know it's gonna be fine. You can use the auto approve flag to do that, okay? So here it says the T2 micro and it's just starting to modify it, okay? So uh, th now that we've done that, I guess we'll take a look at locals here, but we'll just let this finish updating and then we'll move on to that, okay? All right, so now let's take a look at local values, uh, which seems very similar, or locals, which seems very similar to variables, but it's slightly different. So what I'm gonna do, it actually it's right here in the documentation. So we'll go down to local values. And this is kind of a way to dry up your code. And so if I just go grab this block here, uh, it's different from variables because, you know, they generally are hard coded. But I can go to here and say locals. And then if I had like a generic name, I could say name. And I could just say, uh, you know, Andrew or, uh, yeah, Andrew's fine. Could just say project name. And so if I wanted to use that somewhere else, if it says my server, I could uh, use inter string interpolation. Um, I believe it's this, yep. And if we have locals, it's just gonna be local dot project underscore name. Okay, and so now if I just do a Terraform plan, Oops, I have to type it right, eh? Uh, whoops, let's do uh, Terraform validate. I think I'm using the syntax incorrectly. Local is not a valid template control keyword. Um, it should be because if we go back over here, yeah, see how it's referencing as local and that's exactly what I'm doing. It's just that I'm using interpolation and I might be using it incorrectly. So what we'll do is make our way over to uh, template strings Terraform. And if we go down here, we have interpolation. So I want the one that is for literals. Oh yeah, this is for directives. And so we want interpolation. So it's a dollar sign. Just to show you like I've done this whole course, I've passed the exam. Uh, I've used Terraform and I, I can't remember. So it's not a big deal if you have to look things up, okay? So we'll type in Terraform validate here to see if that is correct. Good, and so if we do Terraform plan. Okay, uh, now you'll see that our, our tag would change over to that. So that's basically what locals are. It's just like a way of having some um, uh, local variables that are uh, in line with your code, okay? Let's take a look at outputs. So I'm gonna go back to Terraform here and I think it's actually right here, but yeah, variables and outputs and we'll go output values. And this is just a way to get an outputted value. And this is actually a really good example where we might want the private ID or the public ID. So we'll scroll on down below here. Um, and this has its own section, so we'll paste that there. And this is private ID and that is fine, but I might wanna get something a little bit more fun. Uh, so we'll go here and just kind of see what we can get. So we saw private ID IP. Um, argument reference, right? So we have private ID, maybe we want public ID here. Public ID, IP, oops. Yeah, so let's give that a go instead. I think I'd prefer to get the public IP because this is a, is a public facing server, okay. And notice that this is not the name, right name. We're gonna to have to call this my server, right? And so outputs is gonna allow us to uh, see those values. So what we'll do, uh, I'm gonna run Terraform plan and see if there is any required change. I'm not sure if we have to deploy to get that output working. So we'll just run Terraform plan first. And notice it says changes to outputs and then it adds us as a plus. So if I was to type in Terraform um, outputs, 
there is commands for this. <laughs> I don't seem to remember off, off the top of my head, so we'll just look at it up here really quickly. Output. Uh, here it is. So, oh, it's Terraform output. Okay, sorry, it's not the plural. So we'll go here and type in Terraform output. I just wanna see if it'll actually output it without us doing it. So it says, warning, no outputs found. So what we'll have to do, so the state file either has no outputs defined or all the defined outputs are empty. Please define an output in your configuration with output uh, or run Terraform uh, refresh to become available. So we don't need to run Terraform apply, I don't think. We probably could just run Terraform refresh. So let's give that a go and see what happens. Whoops. Might be a good example of um, using Terraform refresh. Terraform refresh is a command that is going to make the state file match whatever the, the remote instance is. So we already have an instance up there. And so that's what it did. So it's probably a better example to use output. So now if we type in Terraform output, we should be able to get that value there. Only if you type it right though. Okay, so there it is. And if we really wanted to be in particular, we could say instance IP address. I really don't like the name of that. I might just change this here. So we'll just say um, public IP. Okay, I'm not sure if we can just change it on the fly there. Let's see what happens if we do that. Yeah, see it's still uh, the old one. So in that case, I'll just type in Terraform refresh and see what happens. Okay, and notice the old one is still there. So I think in that case, we'd have to do, because this doesn't exist in our output files anymore. So I think it uh, because refresh just adds, I don't think it's going to remove anything. Uh, well, actually it would, if the server was gone, it would do that. So, but anyway, if we type in Terraform outputs, we get, do we get both of them? We do. And so in that case, I think we would want to do a Terraform plan and see if there's any differences here. Yeah, notice it's gonna remove it there. And so then that's how we'd have to get rid of it. So we just say Terraform apply. And we'll just say yes. And that's our opportunity to update our tags and also get rid of this output. So you can see refresh doesn't work in all cases. Um, and so now if we type in Terraform output, Get a list there. I just want to say like public ID, just to get the exact one there. Uh, IP. <laughs> okay, cool. So that that works great. So that's outputs. So we've seen uh, providers, but let's go take a look at modules. So what I want you to do is uh, go back to the internet here, and I want to uh, go back to the Terraform registry. And in this case, I want to go grab some modules. So providers, uh, you know, providers are basically one-to-one -one mappings to the uh, underlying uh, API. So like anything in CloudFormation is pretty much mapped up here. And modules are basically, um, they're like con conveniences because they allow you to configure a, a bunch of resources using a more uh, short form DSL, okay? So like if we open up here, the VPC, this is a, a very easy way for us to define an entire VPC without having to create like each of these resources individually. So if we had to do this by hand, it'd be a lot of work. So what we'll do is go ahead and copy this. Um, and we're just going to expand this a little bit here. That's a bit hard because my font's really large, but you know, of course uh, you'd probably be using a smaller font. And so what I want you to notice is that it starts with a module block and we're providing it a source. So Terraform AWS modules VPC AWS. Uh, and that's how it knows to map over to this one over here on the Terraform registry. Uh, and this is just defining a new VPC. As long as we don't have any uh, conflicts with this block, it should deploy no problem. So I'm gonna go ahead and give that a go. So we'll just type in Terraform apply or plan. And actually, before we even do a Terraform plan or apply, notice that the module isn't installed. So this is where we'd have to type our Terraform in it. And that's gonna go ahead and grab that module. Great, and so once we have that, we can now do our Terraform plan. And we'll give it a moment here. And notice that it's gonna generate a lot of stuff out, that's fine. So we will say Terraform apply, 
And I just want to auto approve that. Save myself some trouble. That's going to go set us, us up a, um, a module. And I want to point out that actually uh, when you're writing files out here, and we're going to find this later on in the course that even uh, even when you write a single file like maintf, you are creating yourself uh, a Terraform module because everything is based off of modules. Um, so you'll see that later on in the course. But we'll just wait here until this is uh, finished here, okay? So after a short little wait there, I actually ran into an issue um, here. So I, I probably, I was a bit too, uh, too quick to just copy this over because um, it is having some issues. I think it's because our provider is in US East 1 and we're trying to specify something in US West. So that's probably our problem. So, or this is actually uh, Europe, which is no surprise because Anton who made this is actually over in Europe. So it makes sense that he might set it to that. So I'm gonna do US East uh, here, right? And so that's something that you have to understand that if you have a uh, provider, it's gonna be mapped to that one. Actually, if we wanted to keep it in uh, e, uh, EU, uh, West, this is a great opportunity to kind of show you how to make a, another provider as a reference. So I'm just gonna go here and paste this in and we'll change this to EU West. And was it one or two? It's one. And so in here, what we can do is set ourselves up an alias. Okay. And uh, we could just say like, this is called uh, U, uh, we'll just say this, this is EU or AWS to you. And I actually might not remember how to do this exactly. So I'm gonna just type in um, Terraform resource alias, because that's what this is called. It's a meta argument, Google Europe. Okay, so I just wanted to know if I had to type in Google or something like that in the front of it. So if we make our way back over here and we go back to the top here, we don't need to put the word AWS, that's just redundant. So we'll just say EU. And if we go down to our uh, VPC here and type in provider, we'll say uh, AWS EU. Okay, and so that should allow us to have both. Um, I'm not sure if we have to run Terraform init, so we'll run Terraform plan first. It might say, hey, you gotta run Terraform init maybe. Uh, an argument provider is not expected here. Let's just make our way back over here. Oh, because that's to be within the resource and I put it in the module block. So we'll just cut that out here. And it doesn't uh, doesn't have that. So actually, I, I wonder how you'd set a provider for module. Maybe you don't. I'll be back here in a second, okay? All right, so I just pulled up the documentation here and here's a module and it has this little providers block. So let's give that a go and see if that fixes our problem here. So I'll just paste this in, providers, AWS, and we'll say EU, okay, and see if that works. You know, again, it's not hard. Like if you get stuck, you can pretty much Google anything. Uh, and so that did not error out. And so if I was to do a Terraform apply, auto approve, that should work. And so I'll see you back here uh, in a bit, okay? All right, so I have one little uh, error here. I actually typed in uh, EU as uh, instead of US there. And so again, my point is, is that Terraform validate is not gonna catch these things. You're only gonna find these uh, when you actually run them. So we'll run this one more time and I think it's going to work and I'll see you back here uh, when this module is finished deploying, okay? All right, so after waiting there, it looks like our uh, VPC is ready. So if we make our way over to AWS, go to VPCs. Uh, of course, this is in the uh, European region there. So what we'll have to do is just switch over there in a moment but I just wanna show you that it's not here. But if we go over um, and find EU West one, which is apparently Ireland. Uh, there it is. So there's my VPC, the one we created there, okay? Um, so yeah, um, what we'll do next is we'll just kind of break up these files and make things a little bit easier to work with, okay? All right, so let's make it a little bit easier to uh, work with our Terraform file here. And what's really nice is that, you know, we have this main TF, but anything that's named .tf is gonna be treated as a single file. And so it's pretty common to break these up into individual files here. So what I'm gonna do is call this one providers. 
.tf. Uh, and I found out that you can only have one Terraform block and one required provider block. So if you're thinking about making like uh, one for each provider and then the resources within it, that's just not possible. So we'll name that there. Um, and I guess we'll bring these over as well. Probably a good idea to do that. Okay, and then we have a variable, pretty common to make a variables.tf. So we'll say variables tf here and we'll grab our single one there okay and uh so if we wanted to oh yeah probably an outputs would be good too so we'll say a new file here we'll say outputs.tf and i think when we get to module development i'm pretty sure this is like the standard if i just it's in my slides here we'll say like uh, modules. If I go over to that there for a second. Yeah, it's in this section here. But yeah, when we get over to this, yeah, it's pretty common to have an outputs, a variables, a main, okay. And uh, so we'll put our output there. You know, and the rest is up to you. So we can leave this in main or we could try and take this and put this into one called AWS resources. Maybe that's what I'll do. I'll just rename this to AWS. Okay. And maybe we'll just keep a main around. And I'm not sure if locals is, a, I mean, it treats it as one file, so it must work that way. But I'm gonna just go ahead and paste that in there. I was thinking maybe it's like bound to the file, but it's probably just bound to the module. And so I just wanna make sure that this all works. So I'm gonna just do Terraform plan here. and see what happens here. I'm just seeing if there's gonna be any kind of errors or just in general, what are we gonna see? Uh, no changes. So it read all the files, no problem. So this is all good to go. But yeah, you can break it up however you like. Uh, it's, it's that easy, okay? Um, yep. Okay, so so far, uh, you know, we set up all this infrastructure, but what if we wanted to go ahead and destroy it? So what we could do is type in Terraform, uh, apply, and I think it's destroy. I can't remember the flag off the top of my head, so let's go take a look here. Let's just type in Terraform apply. And go down to our flags. And it is called, should be in here, destroy. No, it's not showing it. I know that this flag exists. So we'll go over here. I just want to show you uh, how that flag works. Maybe it's like Terraform Destroy. Probably a better example here. Well, um, I know that there's a, a, another flag that we can write here. It's like Destroy, Delete. Well, that's fine because you're not really ever gonna be doing it that way. You're always gonna be writing Terraform destroy. So that's what we're gonna do. You know what, maybe it's under the plan that I'm thinking of, Terraform plan, because maybe you make it in the plan and then it gets moved along. Yeah, destroy mode, here it is. So I want you to understand that, um, you know, that's how it would set it. So active destroy mode using hyphen destroy. So I think when you use plan or apply, we could have done hyphen destroy and that is the equivalent to this destroy command. So I'll clear it out. I'm just going to try that there. Destroy. Because I just want to show you that that's an alias of destroy, okay? Or of apply. And yep, so that would destroy all of our resources. And so I don't think it's really essential to show you that, but I just wanted to show you how you'd run the uh, Terraform destroy command and that would tear down all your infrastructure. Okay, uh, but I wanna keep it up because we're going to move this infrastructure over to Terraform Cloud and then we'll do a, a destroy soon enough, okay? All right, so now that we have successfully created a resource, organized our files, learned the basics of uh, getting started up to you know this point, the next thing is to 
um, create a, cl a Terraform Cloud Workspace and migrate our local backend to our remote workspace. And the reason we want to do this is because we have this Terraform uh, .tf state file, and this is what contains all of our information about the state of our infrastructure. And if we want to collaborate with other people, we need to have it in shared space. And so Terraform Cloud is one of the options, and I would say the best option out there. And so I want to show you how to use Terraform Cloud, which, by the way, is free. Um, and so before we do that, I just want to show you uh, 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 what workspace we're in. So if you type in Terraform uh, workspace list, what you're going to see is a single workspace called default. So this is a special um, workspace, which every project comes with a default workspace, and you cannot delete it. So here you could create multiple workspaces like development and production to have um, different variables for your uh, infrastructure if you're deploying to different um, uh, different environments. But for the purpose of getting started, we're just going to work with the default. But the thing is, right now, these state files are here locally. And so what we need to do is define a backend. And so far, uh, the backend that we're using is the local backend. And that would be defined, we had put it in our um, providers. Probably been smarter to just call this like Terraform, put this in the main. You know, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this here, cut this, and I'm going to put this in main because I think it makes more sense over here. There's not like a true science to putting things places. You just kind of have to feel them out. So in this Terraform settings block, this is where we would specify our backend. Okay. And so right now we are using local, whether you specified or not, you are. Okay. And so we want to swap, uh, swap that out to remote, which we'll use Terraform Cloud. So what I will do is we'll just say Terraform local migrate uh, because they have a nice tutorial here for this. But I just want the code from it. So this is pretty close to what we want. This is for multiple workspaces. We're just doing local. So this is what I want. Okay, so what I'm going to do, whoops, is just bring this back on over. And I just want to copy this interior part. And it doesn't matter if you put it above or below providers, but we'll have a back end. We're going to specify the host name. We're going to need to set our organization, and we're going to need to set our workspace name. So now what we're going to do is make our way over to terraform.io. And what I want you to do is create yourself a new account. It does not require a credit card or anything. It's very easy to set up. You just have to confirm your email. And then once you have done that, go ahead and sign in. And what you'll need to do is create yourself an organization. It'll probably prompt you right away. So it's very easy. Just go here and give your organization name and provide an email. It's pretty much those two options. And once you have your organization, you can go ahead and start creating workspaces. And so I'm going to create a new workspace here. And we're going to be presented with three options, version control workflow, CLI driven workflow, API driven workflow. Version control workflow is, let's say, every time we push a commit to our repository, then it would trigger uh, to do a Terraform apply to execute the code. But we don't want to do that. We just want to use a CLI, which is what we've been doing all along. So here, I'm just going to say Terraform, um, Terraform example. Well, maybe we'll just say getting started here, actually. Getting started. And we will go ahead and create this workspace. And now that we have the name of the workspace and the organization, so we'll put those in here. So my workspace is called getting started. And I just want to make sure I have the right name for this uh, organization here. Um, I think it just would be called whatever it is. So for mine, it looks like it's just called exam pro. I think you'd match it whatever's up here, OK? If it doesn't work, we'll find out in a second, though. Eh? So we will paste that in there. And so all we need to do to move from our local to a remote is type in Terraform init to migrate it over. And actually, we probably need to log in first. So before we do that, well, I can't stop it. That's fine. Um, so I'm just going to say no. I don't want to migrate just yet. So I'm going to type in Terraform login first because we want to authenticate with Terraform Cloud. So I've already done this previously, so it already has a file saved over here. Okay, but what I'm going to do, I'm just going to delete mine. You don't have to do this. I'm just going to delete mine so you, you can see a similar experience, okay? So I'm going to do Terraform login. And it's going to say, if successful, Terraform will store it in plain text in this area. Do you want to do this? Say yes. And all this is doing is generating out an API token for a user. So it's going over here and um, choose the description to help identify the token later. And this is just for um, 
exam pro. We should say like Terraform Associate maybe because we're actually creating the token. Okay, so your token, we can copy it out. Um, click on the token to copy and paste it into your Terraform login prompt to continue. So I'll hit copy and we will go back to Terraform here and then we will paste in the value. I know you couldn't see it, but I definitely pasted it in. And so it's now been pasted in there. I'm gonna go back here and hit done. And I'm gonna go ahead and uh, delete my old tokens. This is the one I made a month ago. So I'll go ahead and delete that. And again, you don't want to share these tokens with anybody. Just make sure um, you know you keep those secret because then they'll have access to your Terraform account. So now that we have that ready to go, it's actually kind of cool. They have a little getting started project here. I didn't even notice about it. But uh, so now what we can do is type in Terraform init. Because now that we uh, have a local API key, and it's just going to say, hey, you have a pre-existing state that was found while migrating the previous local backend to the newly configured remote. No existing state was found in the newly configured remote backend. Do you want to copy the state to the remote backend? Before we do that, I just want to go over to our workspace and click into it just to show you that we have nothing under runs, nothing under states, nothing under variables. There's nothing in there, okay? And so what I'm going to do here is just type yes. And that's going to uh, take the Terraform state file and move it to your uh, workspace. So it's finished. That was pretty quick. So what I'm going to do is go back over here and we're going to just click on here and refresh. Okay, it looks like we also have the instructions here, which we could do. So if we go over to states, here is our state file. So we open it up and it's all the same contents of the Terraform.tf state. So what we can do now is go over here and we can go ahead and delete this. Uh, normally you wouldn't want to delete your backup, but I just want to see if uh, when we run Terraform apply, if it'll actually produce another backup backup locally here. Okay. And so now that we have our infrastructure there, all we could all we need to do is now run Terraform apply. So that's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to go here and type in Terraform apply and we'll see what it changes. Like there's no infrastructure changes, so nothing should change, but let's see what happens to the fact that we moved our remote state over. Okay, so right away it, say, it says no value for required variable. So the thing is we have it set in our TF bars over here but the problem is, is that the workspace does not have it because what's going to be running Terraform is actually um, a run environment. There's actually a server that's part of Terraform Cloud that executes your code. And so these variables are on a local machine. There's no way for them to get uh, up there. So we have to go set them under variables. And we have two options here. So there's Terraform variables. So uh, these are settings used as the Terraform.tfrs to use a non-string variable Okay, and then we have environment variables. So we have two different ways to set it. Um, the way I'm gonna set it is a Terraform variable. So we have a key and a value. But this is generally how you'd wanna do it. So we have our instance type. So we will go and put the name in there and this is gonna be a T2 micro. Okay, and I'm just simply copying them over. Notice over here we have a checkbox for HCL. So parse the field as the HC, uh, HCL language. That's if we wanted to do something a bit more advanced. Mark it as sensitive if we need to, and that's not something to do. So this is gonna be the size, of, and this is optional, but I'm just putting it the size of the EC2 instance. Okay. And we'll go ahead and set that variable. Great, and so what we'll do is now try to run this again. So now it's saying, um, so now it's saying no credential providers, so no valid pr uh, providers in the chain. And so we did specify in our providers that we want to use our profile default. But the problem is, is that this is not going to work for, this is not going to work for our, um, our workspace here because we actually have to set it in here in the environment variables. So what I'm going to do is just go look up the Terraform provider.
Oh, sorry. So we'll go to Terraform um, Provider AWS. I want to do this on the registry. And what we'll do is try to look for authentication. Um, I'm just making sure that this is what well, this says GitHub. So if you just click back here in the top left corner, go to providers, go to AWS, go to documentation. Usually in the beginning, they'll, they'll have like information in the guides that explain like how to um, configure it. And so that's what I'm just looking for here. Maybe just click on AWS provider. So yeah, here's a section on authentication. So here it would say like access key, access a secret uh, secret key. But what we want to do is set these environment variables because that's the way we're going to have to do it with Terraform Cloud. So what we'll do is go here and um, specify this key here. So we'll say uh, AWS access key ID. And we're going to have to go get those credentials. So I'm going to just type in by AWS credentials. And there is my key. So I'll just go ahead and copy that. Again, that's secret. Don't ever share it with anybody. And this is definitely sensitive, so we're going to mark that as sensitive. And we'll save that. And the other one's going to be called AWS Secret uh, Access Key. Just making sure I spelled that right. I'm just looking off screen here to see if I spelled it right. And we'll go ahead and copy that. Paste that in. Just make sure there's no uh, trailing spaces. We're going to say that is also sensitive. We also want the region. So AWS default region. And I'm going to set mine as US East 1. That's not sensitive. It's not a big deal. And so this should give us enough to be able to execute that command now. Again, there is no new infrastructure to create, but just to get it to run is what we're trying to do here. I'm just going to write and quit. And we will try Terraform Apply again and now see if we get better luck this time around, OK? Great, so notice it says no changes, uh, your infrastructure matches the configuration. So there hasn't been anything that has changed. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna do a Terraform destroy because I wanna tear this all down and then I want to maybe change uh, the variable within Terraform Cloud and we'll do Terraform apply just to make sure that it does work with Terraform Cloud and indeed we aren't losing our old state file, okay? So yeah, again, I just ran Terraform destroy for real and I said yes. So we're just going to uh, wait a while here until all the infrastructure is destroyed, and I'll see you back here in a moment, okay? All right, so it took a little bit of time to actually just generate out the uh, delete plan, and so I'm just going to go ahead and type yes. And that should proceed to destroy all the resources. We'll just give it a moment here. There we go, and so it's deleting everything. So I'll see you back here when this is complete, okay? All right, so now that we destroyed our infrastructure, what I wanna do is just go ahead to our AWS one here. I just wanna uh, comment out the module for the time being, just because we do not need it. Uh, there are three types of comments in Terraform. I believe we have this one. So we have, uh, this is the like JavaScript multi-line one. But you could also be doing this or this. It's up to you. Uh, and so what we'll do now is do a Terraform apply. And we'll notice that it's just going to provision that EC2 instance. So I'm just waiting for it to show me the option yes. There we go. So we'll type in yes. And I'm going to go back to Terraform Cloud. Uh, wherever I put it. So I might have to go back to terraform.io here. I might have closed it on my own. Okay, so here you can see that it's applying right now. We can even see it uh, as it's running. So it did the plan over here and now it's doing the apply. I could even cancel it from here if I really wanted to. I just want to show you that you have your previous states here. So every time you do a deploy, uh, it's going to store a state file. So it's technically versioned. Um, notice that uh, if we open up our backups, there's no longer a Terraform backup file. Um, I suppose there's really no need for one because if we have all these states um, in here, these are technically our backups. So in the uh, slides, I might contradict that and say that the file remains, but apparently it does not, okay?
and I'll see you here when this is done, okay? All right, so after a short little wait there, it says it's complete. Again, we'll just go over here to our overview. We'll see that it has been applied. We can see the resources under here. And so this is our AWS resource. We could even see our outputs as well. And that's pretty much all I wanted to cover in the getting started. So now it's all just about cleanup. So what I want you to do is go back here and we're gonna go type in Terraform destroy to tear down all this infrastructure, which is just a single server right now. And actually I'm just going to, oops, I'm trying to stop it here. I wanna do, I think we can do auto approve here, auto approve. And actually, if we wanted to do it the, uh, the other way, we could do destroy auto approve. And I'll see you back here in a moment when this infrastructure has been destroyed, okay? All right, so this is finished uh, destroying our infrastructure. So now what I'm gonna do is just go back to my workspace here and I just wanna go ahead and delete it. So we'll go down below and we'll delete this uh, Terraform Cloud workspace. So I will type in uh, the name of it. So this would be getting started. Like you can keep it around, it's not a big deal. Also notice that it allowed destroy plan. So when enabled, the setting allows the destroy plan. Okay, so that's just a way of disabling it. Um, so we'll say getting started. Great, and so now that workspace is gone. And so we are done uh, our first getting started and we can get back to the main course. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at Terraform provisioners. So provisioners install software, edit files, and provision machines created with Terraform. And Terraform allows you to work with two different provisioners. We have CloudInit and Packer. So CloudInit is an industry standard for cross-platform cloud instance initialization. When you launch a VM on a cloud service provider, you'll provide either a YAML or Bash script. Uh, and so for uh, the case of AWS, what you'll have is this box called user data. And so you can either put your YAML or Bash script in there. It's the same if you're using Google or Azure, they both have this box. It might just not be called user data, um, but that is using cloud in it underneath. Then you have Packer. This is an automated image builder service. You provide a configuration file to create and provision the machine image, and the image is then delivered to a repository for use. Uh, if you've ever heard of uh, EC2 Image Builder, it's a very similar service, except that one's just for AWS. Uh, I suppose for Google, you could use uh, Google Cloud Run. Um, and even on AWS, you could use um, uh, Code Build, but uh, Packer is great because it's cloud agnostic. So you're going to just build the image and then you can uh, deliver it to any provider. Uh, provisioners should be used as a last resort for the mo for more common situations. There are better alternatives. This is a warning that Hashnode puts out in their Terraform provisioner section. And so I wasn't really sure why they were saying this. So I reached out to Anton and Anton, uh, if you don't know him, he's an Abus community hero, uh, just like myself. Uh, and so he specializes in Terraform. Like he wrote so many modules for the Terraform AWS. So he knows it pretty well. And he says here, the main reason is that provisioners will do something that won't be reflected in the Terraform state. And the better alternative for that one is to use cloud provider features like cloud init scripts. I think this comes back to immutability when we were looking at uh, the fact that we want to um, lean towards doing an approach with Packer, right? We want to um, uh, bake, our, bake our machines or, vir or virtual machines and then deploy because that's gonna be probably the better alternative. So if we wanted to use cloud init, uh, the idea is we'd have to provide a cloud init YAML file, which is a, a very particular format. You can find them on the cloud init website. Uh, and the idea here is we have these run commands. So this just like bash commands here to start and stop Apache. We can install our packages here, do an update, do an upgrade. Uh, we'll have to pass along our SSH key here. That's a very important component to that. Once we have that file configured, uh, we can reference it as a template file over here, call it user data. And then we're gonna pass it on to this section here for user data so that uh, when we launch up this VM, and this one in particular is for AWS, that's gonna pass it to that user data, okay? Now you might be asking, well, where's all these other provisioners? Cause there's a lot of other tools out there. So Terraform used to directly support third-party provisioning tools in the Terraform language, but they were deprecated uh, because it, it was considered to be poor practice suggesting better alternatives as we were just talking about. So you might be asking, where is Chef? Where is Puppet? Where is Salt? Um, and the thing is, is that you can technically still use Chef and Puppet through Cloudinit because Cloudinit actually supports 
uh, some DSLs in there. I've never used this before myself, but it doesn't look too complicated. But the idea is that there's just not direct support. So you're not gonna use it directly in the language, you can use it uh, through CloudInit if you really need it. One thing I didn't see mentioned anywhere was Ansible. And this one's a little bit confusing because there's a lot of videos online about Terraform and Ansible working w very well together and they're complementary uh, uh, technologies. So uh, Ansible is a little bit different than these other ones because it does more than just configuration management. So maybe that's the reason there. Um, but anyway, the point is, is that there's no direct support for these anymore. You gotta use CloudInit and generally if you can use Packer instead when you're working with virtual machines, okay? <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at local exec, which allows you to execute local commands after a resource is provisioned. So the machine that is executing Terraform, so what's doing the Terraform apply, is where the command will execute. And a local environment could be uh, your local machine, so your laptop or workstation, a build server like GCP Cloud Build, Abus Code Builder, Jenkins, or Terraform Cloud Run Environment. So that is a single use Linux uh, virtual machine. So just an example, and there's a lot of cases where you might want to automate, but the idea here is after you provision a VM, you need to supply the public IP to a third party security service to add the VM IP address. And you could accomplish this by using locally installed third party CLIs on your build server. And so there is a bit of an overlapping responsibility between Terraform outputs versus local exec, because the idea is that by getting um, uh, by getting data out after something is provisioned or something like that, you can do something pragmatic. But the idea here is Terraform outputs allow you to output results after running Terraform apply. Local exec allows you to run any arbitrary commands on your local machine, commonly used to trigger configuration management like Ansible, Chef, or Puppet, okay? <laughs> Let's take a look at some example code for a local exec. So here we have a bunch of examples on the right hand side. And so I just kind of want to walk through some of the commands that we can use. But before we do that, just let's take a quicker look here at the code. So notice we have a resource like AWS instance and web. And then we are specifying a provisioner being a local exec. And then we have a command that is being executed under there. Okay, so hopefully that makes it pretty clear, but let's just kind of work through the options we have available to us. So the first is we have a command and this is required. And this is the command you want to execute. So notice that uh, we are doing uh, an echo there. So it's whatever is uh, possible uh, there. And I, I think by default, it's using bash, okay? So if you're using Linux, that's what it would be using. Uh, we could also set a working directory. We don't see an example there on the right-hand side, but if you wanted to uh, say where the command will be executed, that's something you could do. So maybe you want it over here. Uh, another thing is the interpreter. So this is the entry point for the command. I think by default, again, it would probably use bash if you're on a Linux machine, but you could say use bash, Ruby, AWS CLI, PowerShell, whatever you want, okay? If you needed to pass environment variables in, maybe you need a uh, key and secret. Uh, so the example here is, you know, we are printing out those keys and then putting them into a uh, credentials YAML file. Uh, so that could be an example there, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at remote exec. So this allows you to execute commands on a target resource after a resource is provisioned. So the idea is you have a local machine executing Terraform. And so the idea is that when remote exec happens, it has a script and it's sending that off to the uh, target. So in this case, it could be a provision virtual machine. And this is where the command is going to run. So a remote execute is useful for provisioning a virtual machine with a simple set of commands. For more complex tasks, it's recommended to use CloudInit and strongly recommended in all cases to bake golden images via Packer or EC2 Image Builder if you want to use something more complex like Ansible or something. <laughs> Let's take a look at an example of a remote exec script. So here we have a couple, and just to quickly go through it, the idea is you uh, define your resource. So here it's just a uh, virtual machine on AWS, and we are provisioning, our provisioner is going to be remote exec. And so we're able to put these inline commands and say, okay, let's run puppet apply, and then we'll use console join, which is the CLI for HashiCorp console. So um, there are three different modes for a remote exec. The first is inline list of command strings, which is what we are seeing over here. Uh, and then the other option is we can provide a script or scripts. So the idea is that you would, um, well, you just specify those locations and it would run it. 
Uh, what's interesting here is that it doesn't say, um, like, because we saw with local exec that we could use uh, an interpreter. And so it's my assumption that it's just going to use bash or it's going to use a script that is executable, right? Where you have a shebang in the top there. Uh, and so that's something, you know, I might uh, test out. It's not something that's going to be on the exam, but maybe we'll just uh, test out that theory because it's not in the documentation as of the time I'm recording this. Let's take a look at the file provisioner, and this is used to copy files or directories from our local machine to the newly created resource. So here we have some on the uh, right as an example. So again, we have a virtual machine that we're deploying to AWS. We've set the provisioner as file, and we are specifying a source file and a destination. So source is going to be uh, the file that's on your local machine or whoever is uh, the uh, considered the local. Uh, that You might also want to provide content directly. So in this example here, uh, you see that we're literally just giving it a string. Uh, and then there's the destination where you want that file to be. Uh, I don't have it shown in the code example here, but there's a high chance that you would have to provide a connection block so that you could say, okay, I need to use SSH or um, uh, WinRM to uh, gain access to that machine, okay? So we just mentioned that there's a connection block. So uh, it tells the provisioner or resource how to establish a connection. So here is a big example on the right hand side. So this is using the example for a provisioner file. And uh, here we are specifying our connection block. And this one in particular is for SSH, as you can see, and there's a bunch of different parameters like the user, the password, the host. Um, you could also uh, use a Bastion host. I don't, I'm not showing it here, but if you're using SSH, you could specify a bunch of keys in order to do that because maybe you need to go through a Bastion first. For uh, Windows remote management, you also have that option down below, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at null resources. So this is a placeholder for resources that have no specific association to a provider. Uh, it's a bit confusing, but it makes sense once you run into some use cases for it. So here is a big example where uh, we have an AWS uh, instance, and we're defining a cluster. And so we need a null resource here uh, because we want to uh, run this trigger. And that's generally why you're gonna be using null resources is to uh, trigger a resource. So triggers is a map of values which should cause this set of provisioners to rerun. So values are meant to be interpolated references to variables or attributes of other resources. And uh, triggers are interesting because I think we also see them in Terraform Cloud. I don't, not sure if this is the same kind of functionality, but um, yeah, that's null resources, okay? <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and in this follow along, we're going to be um, uh, learning all about provisioners. So what I want you to do is make sure you have a new folder and CD into that folder, and we are going to create ourselves a new main.tf file, and we're gonna go set up a new workspace in Terraform Cloud. So I'm gonna choose the CLI-driven way of doing it. I'm gonna call this workspace provisioners, okay? And we're gonna get some default uh, uh, code here that we can copy in. So I'll just paste that into my main TF. That's just gonna set up that workspace. We want to set up our environment variables or our Terraform variables again. So we'll need to set up that for AWS. So I'm gonna just go to the registry here, registry.terraform.com or .io. And we'll go to AWS here, documentation, AWS providers, scroll on down, just because I can never seem to remember these key names. And so we will uh, put in this one here and I will need to actually get my credentials. Again, these are secret, so you should not share these with anybody. Um, again, I'm going to get rid of mine eventually here, especially before I publish this course. And I should be able to paste that in there. Didn't get it. It's very finicky, the, um, uh, the copy paste here with uh, VS Code. So we'll mark that as sensitive. We'll add another one here. And in this case, it is called secret access key. Okay. And we will save that. And so we're all set up for AWS with the exception that we need to define our actual required providers. Again, we're gonna go back to, well, we don't actually have to, we could just go grab it from here. We go back here and grab the required provider there. 
Uh, and so that needs to go just after backend here. It doesn't matter the order as long as it's in the first level of the Terraform settings. And we'll also want to specify the provider. And I'm just going to set the region here as US East 1. And it's double quotations. I don't think uh, Terraform supports single quotations. And then I just need an AWS instance. So what I'm going to do here is go up to uh, my getting started here. And in here, we're going to grab it from the AWS code. And we'll just scroll up and we'll grab this. OK, but we'll have to make some modifications because we don't have a local here. So we'll take that out. And I'm just going to hard code this value for the time being. So T2 micro. Uh, and that looks good to me. I'm just going to double check here. That is all good. So we'll go down below, type in Terraform init. Great. And that's just going to start setting up that for us there. So the thing is, is that um, we're going to want to SSH into this me uh, machine. And so we're going to want to set up um, like a data key, okay? And so the way we're going to do that is we're going to need to use, um, it's called AWS key pair. So what I'm gonna do is make my way over to the documentation here. And I'm just gonna type in AWS key pair. Okay. And this is pretty much what I'm looking for. So I will go ahead and paste this in. If you're familiar with AWS, you can uh, you know associate keys, but um, this is the easiest way. So we're going to need to generate our own key and attach it there. Uh, once we have our key uh, in there, we can just reference it. So I'm just going to go down here and add it right now. So we'll go key underscore name. Um, and I think what we'd want to do is use uh, an interpolation there or a directive. And we'd want to do AWS key pair dot deployer dot key name. Okay. And I'm just looking at that to see if that is correct. The coloring is not right here, but um, I don't think that's why like that is the problem because the syntax definitely looks correct to me here. So I guess I'm just not going to worry about that right now. Um, another thing we're going to need is the public ID. So again, with the outputs, we will just type in output and do public ID. IP, sorry, I, I like to say ID. And uh, we'll set our value here, AWS instance, uh, my server. Okay, so we're gonna need some kind of SSH key. So we're gonna go ahead and generate ourselves a new one. Um, there is a, S or a uh, Linux command called SSH keygen. Um, it's basically the standard for generating out keys. And so I'll just hit enter here and I'm just gonna call it Terraform. And I'm going to hit enter and enter again. And notice that it has generated out in the root.ssh directory. Actually, it might have dumped it right here, and that's no good. I'm going to delete that. The reason I, I can't have it in this folder is that I'm right now mounted to a Windows directory. And so chmod, which is what we need to modify the permissions, won't work if we do that. So I'll have to do this again, and I'll have to type the full path. Okay. And so this will generate it out in the correct directory. I'm going to do a chmod on that, 400. The reason why we're doing that is that whenever you launch an instance, I'll show you later, but uh, when you if, in sessions manager, but AWS will not accept um, a uh, like a key unless it has uh, it's only readable. Okay, so we will go here and do .ssh terraform and put on the 400. We don't need to do it on the uh, the, the public key there, and we need that public key, so we'll do root .ssh terraform .pub. We're going to copy the contents there. This might take more than one go because the paste in VS Code is not great. Double check the ends here. Make sure there's no spaces. That causes a lot of issues. Check the front here, SSH. That looks good to me. Okay, and so when we deploy this instance, it's going to take that SSH key and, and install it on the server for us, which is really nice. Um, so we need to now set up a, uh, secu a security group because we're going to need a way of accessing port 80 and 22. So back on AWS here, we can go to the top here. And if we just type in security groups, I never can remember if it's under EC2 or AWS. If we go down here, there is the security group. And so here is where we have an example. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy this in here. 
and we're just going to go ahead and modify that okay. So I'll just paste it uh, right here. And I don't need any tag on that. And so we have our egress rule, we have our ingress rule. And so for ingress rule, we want one for HTTP because we're going to install Apache and just have it running on uh, port 80 here. Okay. Uh, we're going to be using our default VPC, and so that doesn't have an IPv6, so I'm just removing it out of there. And uh, we're going to have to reference some kind of VPC, so for the time being, like we're going to use an external data source, we'll have to change that, but this will be, um, we'll call this uh, SG My Server. SG My Server. We're going to have to set our description here, so this will be uh, My Security Group. My, uh, my server security group. Notice that we are explicitly setting an egress port. If you're familiar with AWS, this is usually set for you by default, but when you're using Terraform, you have to explicitly set it because if you don't, it won't be there when you deploy it. Um, so we're going to need to have that VPC. Um, and so we just need the ID and we could technically just open AWS and grab that key. Um, so if we go over to AWS here and go to the VPC, and go to VPC IDs. We could just technically grab it. That's the default VPC. Um, but the problem is we're going to probably have to refer to this VPC in other places. So we can't just grab the ID and put it in here. That's not going to be good enough. Um, so what we'll need to do is we'll need to actually reference the existing. We don't want to set up a new VPC. We just want to use the default one. So that's where data sources come into play. Data sources allow us to uh, externally reference resources um, and so like if I wanted to figure out how to reference a, a VPC, I would just say Terraform uh, data source VPC. Okay, and then I should be able to easily find an example here. So here's an exact example that I want. So I will go ahead and grab that. It's very simple. Uh, I'm just gonna call mine main because that other one was called main. And this is where we would want to actually place the ID. So I'll go back here and grab my VPC ID. Okay, and so now uh, this actually acts as a resource and we can access all of its attributes. So that's gonna be very useful. Like notice how we're referencing CIDR block. If we had just hard coded that VPC ID, we wouldn't be able to do this, which is what we need. Um, so I'll just make sure the egress, um, we don't need an IPv6. Well, we can just leave that alone, that's fine. So what we need is um, to reference this here. So we'll say data.awsvpc. Notice that we're using data dot in the front because it's a data source. That's how we always reference them. And we'll just do dot ID. Down below, this has to be data because it's, it's not a standard resource. It's a it's from a data source. All right, and that is good. So we have our data source. So that looks pretty good to me. Oh, but we have to reference the security group actually down below here. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So I think for that it is VPC security um, group IDs. And then there, that's where we'd have to reference that. So our resource up here is called a security group SG my server. So we'll just have to type that in again down below here. So we'll say AWS security group um, dot sg my server dot id and that should apply it we didn't actually create a port 22 here so we'll go here and copy this and uh we do not need uh we don't want the cider block of the vpc this is what we if we want this we want this to be the internet so we're going to say zero dot uh, dot zero uh i'll just copy the one down below here just so i don't make any mistakes so this just means from anywhere, okay? And we only want our IP to work, so what we'll do is go to the internet here and type in what's my IP. And so that is my current IP. I'm gonna go here and make a CIDR block. Forward slash 32 just means use a single address. Um, and I actually put that in the wrong block here, so I'm just gonna go ahead and paste it up there. And we're going to go and clear that out. And so that will give us access. Well, I, 
I think I messed that up. Sorry. So one is supposed to be one's supposed to be down here. So we want the SSH to be our IP address here. So sorry. We'll say SSH port 22 port 22. And I gotta go back and copy this one here because I just cleared it out by accident. Okay. And so we have the that port 80 open that SSH open. Um, the only other thing that we need is a file to configure our resource. So what we're going to do here is make a new file. I'm going to call this userdata.yaml or maybe cloudinit.yaml because that's, no, we'll do userdata.yaml. But this is basically uh, cloud cloudinit. When you're using AWS, this is going to might vary per providers, but you have to start the first line as cloud config, even though this is a YAML file. This is important for AWS to know what to do. I want to install HTTPD. Okay, and I'm going to do run CMD, systemctl, start HTTPD, and then we have to do sudo systemctl, enable HTTP. So this is going to install Apache, which is just a web server, start it up and enable it so on reboot it will work. Um, one thing I want to show you, if, if I have not before, CloudInit examples. If you're just wondering, like, how do you know what to write there? There's a bunch of examples on CloudInit. And then uh, notice like it starts with that. So we could literally create users and do all sorts of things here. But for our purposes, we're just gonna keep it really simple. Um, I don't know if it matters if it's a YML or a YML. Sometimes you have it with the A, sometimes you don't. But I'm just gonna do it that way anyway like that. So we just need to set our user data here. So we're gonna have to pull in that script. So we will type in, um, we'll need to reference our data. So we'll need to create a new data source, and this is going to just be called template file. We'll call it user data. And here we'll say template equals file. I think I called it cloud init here. Oh no, we renamed it user data. There we go. And so now we just need to reference that file. So if I go down below, and we say user data equals data template file user data. And then I think you have to type rendered there. So this will deploy a server that's open on port 80 SSH, only allow it on our address to SSH into it. It's going to copy over that key um, and it should run the script and install Apache so we can see that server and we'll output our public IP address there. So I'm gonna do a Terraform plan to see what happens. Because we did do a lot there, right? See if it takes it. I don't even know if we did Terraform init yet. If we didn't, it will complain. So it says here, a data source AWS VPC ID has not been declared in the root module. It's uh, probably, um, no, we're doing data. Right, so that shouldn't be an issue, main. Oh, I didn't write the word main on there. So that's on line 29. So I think we just need data here, or sorry, um, main, okay. And we'll try another Terraform plan. And sometimes if you wanna speed it up, you can just type Terraform validate before you do your plans. That's why you see me do validate a lot um, without doing a plan first, even though they both do it. Okay, and so what we're having here is an error where it's saying inappropriate values for uh, egress. So description, prefix, list ID, security group, self are required. So when you're specifying things in blocks, even if they're optional, sometimes like blocks being this, Sometimes you have to still specify them. So we have, we don't have prefix ID. So we should go look this up because I'm not sure what it's expecting here. So we'll go down here uh, to prefix ID. Okay, so that's just a list. So I'm gonna go here and just provide it an empty list. Okay, I have a feeling that's for ingress, egress. And uh, it wants security groups. 
right there. It's also a list, okay? And then self, that looks like it is what? Whether the security group is added by the source or not. I think that's a Boolean. So what I'm gonna do here is do security groups. Self equals false. It's not like I know what these mean in uh, granular detail. It's just the fact that it's like, hey, we want these fields. And I just go and I go, okay, I'll give you some defaults because I don't plan to use them for anything, right? So, um, and we will paste that in there. There's some weird characters there. Okay, so we'll go down here and do Terraform plan and we'll see if it likes it now. I, I don't know if we're missing a description here. We are, so description. going traffic try this again here all right so we didn't get any errors it looks like it's all good and it will provision so uh, the AWS root module does not declare a variable name AWS access key ID but a value is found in the terraform TFRs if you if you meant to use this value okay that's fine uh, so what we're going to do is now try to provision and see if it works. I'm going to do auto approve. All right. And looks like it's off to the races. I will see you here when it's done. Okay. All right. Welcome back. So uh, after a little while there, I just wanted to make sure those two checks had passed. Uh, we're ready to see if our server is working. And by the way, there is a way for us to make sure that Terraform only completes uh, when those two checks have passed, and that's where we can use null resource. And so we'll look at that uh, later on, but uh, for the time being, we'll just manually check that stuff when it's done. So what I wanna do is go grab that public IP address, go and paste it up here, and look where our Apache page is working. So everything is working as expected. Let's see if we can SSH into that instance. So uh, what we can do is type in Terraform um, outputs and see what we have here. It might just be output, my fault here. And so notice that, um, oh, we get a lot of stuff. Okay, so I just want, <laughs> I'm not sure why I'm getting so much output here. All I want is the public IP address, but notice that it's uh, giving me a bunch of stuff here that doesn't make sense. So I must have made a mistake here. If I go down below, yes, I forgot to do public IP. All right, so what I'm gonna try to do here is see if I can do a Terraform refresh and see if that, well, actually, sorry, Terraform refresh is an old command. So I'm gonna do um, refresh only and see if we can get that change, uh, that change to reflect. Refresh only is like we didn't change any infrastructure, but our state does not match our, um, our uh, like the actual objects within the cloud. So this way we can just pull that information, okay? Refresh doesn't always work uh, as expected, but in this particular case, I think it should work pretty well. Yeah, see, it's gonna replace all that information with just that. And we're gonna type yes here. Great, and so now if we do Terraform output, it should be a lot more sane. And if we just wanna get that single one there, whoops, we can do public IP. Well, what I want is I just want, um, I want it in raw because I want to be able to use it as a bash command so I can SSH in. So I'm gonna do EC2 user at sign, dollar sign, uh, parentheses here. And I'm gonna do hyphen I to specify where my uh, uh, SSH key is, my public key, or sorry, my private key, I suppose. So we will do SSH, Terraform, and so that should allow us into the server. That's much nicer than having to type the IP address every single time. I'm gonna type in yes, and I'm in the server, so there we go. So we successfully provisioned with CloudInit. The other way to provision is with Terraform and Packer, but we'll leave that for the, the Packer section. Um, but uh, yeah, that is, that's all we need to know for CloudInit, um, so there we go. All right, so I just wanna show you some other provisioning things like local exec, remote exec, and uh, file. So let's get to it. Um, for local exec, I'm just gonna go ahead and Google that quickly here, local exec Terraform. 
not working. Let's just say it is working here and we'll scroll on down. And so what this is going to do is run a local command or uh, execute something locally on the machine that is running Terraform. Now, right now we are using a remote provider. So where this is gonna run is actually in the run environment, which is not very useful to us. So what we're gonna do is switch back to the, the local provider here in a moment, but uh, we're just going to go and add this provisioner, just use the default one here that is provided to us from the documentation. I'm gonna go up the top here and I'm gonna comment this out. So we'll go here. I'm not used to migrating from remote to local, so I'm, I'm not sure what's gonna happen. Um, probably actually before we do that, we should go and tear down our infrastructure. So before I do that, I'm just gonna go Terraform destroy. We'll just say apply, delete, auto approve, okay. Terraform, did I spell Terraform wrong? Delete. It should be that. Well, I'll just do Terraform uh, delete then. That's fine. I'm spelling something super wrong here. Terraform. Good. Destroy. You know what it probably is? It's probably the destroy flag. There we go. And so we're just going to tear down what we have and then... Uh, we will set this up for local and then we will deploy that, okay? So I'll see you back here when that's all destroyed. All right, so our resources or our server is destroyed. So what I'm gonna do is go here and comment out the remote backend for the time being. And we are going to do a Terraform uh, apply, or sorry, Terraform init because we've changed out our backend. So it's now local. A change in the backend has been detected, which may require migrating existing state. Um, if you wish to migrate it, sure, we will say migrate state. I'm not used to going from remote to local, but local to remote. But it seems like it worked out okay. So we'll say Terraform apply okay and we should end up with a local state file we'll say yes here and so what i'm hoping that will happen is that we will once this is done it will output a file called private ips.txt in this folder but we'll see what actually happens here so i'll see you back here when the provisioning done and it actually has ran this private ips okay all right, welcome back. So uh, we had waited for this to execute and notice that it says local exec executing. And here is that file with those IP addresses. So that is how local exec works, okay? Um, so we'll move on to remote exec using the same file here. All right, welcome back. So we just did local exec. And so let's take a look at remote exec. So in our documentation, we'll just go down one. And here we have an example. I want something a little bit more simple than this. Um, so what I'll do is just kind of grab this code here and we'll just kind of tweak it. Uh, so we'll go down below. We don't need both local and remote here. So I'll go up here and um, I'm just gonna take this command here, okay? And paste it on in here. But I wanna make sure that it actually goes somewhere that I can find it. So I'm actually gonna just SSH, SSH into the server. We'll just hit up until we find that SSH command we had earlier. There we go. Just because I can't remember the root directory here. So we'll say PWD and I think that we can get it to, to put it in here. I don't know what this is going to execute like in as what type of user. I'm hoping that it will execute as the EC2 user. If it doesn't, I don't know how we're gonna find this file or the, the command that it's gonna run here. But what I'm gonna do is put in home EC2 user and uh, we will have the echo command in here. And we'll just actually copy this wholesale. Okay. And I'm hoping that this will place it where we want it to go. If not, like, it's not a big deal. It's just the fact that uh, it'd be nice to just be able to easily see that. Uh, local exact in 
remote are a little bit different. So this one takes just a command and this one can take multiple inline commands or a bunch of other stuff. You can read the docs on it. It's all covered in the lecture content. Um, so this should do the same thing. This one says AWS instance web private IP address. So I don't think self is gonna work in the way that we expect it to here. Uh, it might, it should actually, yeah. So let's give this a go and see if that will work. Um, to do this, because it, like from the perspective of Terraform, nothing has changed in terms of the infrastructure. So we're gonna have to do a, a replace. So we'll do Terraform, um, apply, replace, and then we'll have to give it the resource addressing name. So let's AWS instance dot my server. And I gotta type that right if I want that to work. Terraform. Oh, you know what? It's because I'm logged in the server. Common problem I have here. Replace equals AWS instance my server. Enter. And so I'm just hoping that this is going to work. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna stop that before it happens because we're missing the E there. It doesn't matter because I would have had to confirm that action. So I guess I didn't have to panic there. It's still wrong. <laughs> I gotta put a forward slash on that. So we'll just hit up again. And we'll try this one more time. This time I think I got it. We'll say yes, and I'll see you back here when it's done provisioning. We'll SSH in the server and see if we can see that file. But maybe like the best we'll get is just the command that it's executed, okay? All right, so we didn't have much luck here. Um, it says missing configure, uh, connection configuration for provisioner. So probably what we need is we might need to specify a connection. Let me just see here. So provisioner invokes a script, a remote resource. This can be used as etc. The example just shows this, right? And so down below, missing connection configuration. So I'm thinking what it is, is that it just wants the connection information. So there's like a connection block for provisioners. So we will go and type in Terraform connection block. Wasn't planning on showing this uh, right away, but if this is what it requires, then we will uh, provide it that. It's not a big deal. So I just want one for SSH. I really wish they just had, oh, they do right there. There's an example. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and grab this. Actually, this probably tells us where it would execute, which is kind of the question we had there before. Um, this does not use root first. So it's going to be EC2 user, but there's no password. Okay. Let's go down below here. So the address of the resource to connect to. So I would assume that's just the IP address. So we just say, um, self dot private IP. Actually, that'd be public IP. Sorry, public IP. Uh, there is no password, so we'll have to pass the private key. So that's how we're gonna do it. So we will take that out here, private key. The contents of the SSH key, this can be loaded from a file on disk using the file function. So we've done that once before with file. And we actually did it in this, this one, I believe. Oops, I'm trying to search in this file here. There we go. So. Just gonna go down below here so I can see what I'm doing. Um, paste that in there, whoops. You know, this uh, this VS Code doesn't always work how I want it to. So we'll say private, I, um, private key. Oh, sorry, this is template file, private key. I mean, it's not a template file, it's just a file. I don't know if we need to really assign it to data. I'm gonna go Google this, I'll be back in a sec. All right, so I took a look here and it seems like it's very simple. It's just something like that. That's what I was wondering that maybe we don't have to do a data source there. Um, so what I'm just going to do here is just paste that in there like that. And we will go down below to our connection here. And this is going to be at the root, Terraform, Terraform. 
Okay, so that looks good to me. Let me just go double check if there's any other parameters we're missing. Uh, the host, the address used to connect to the resource required. The other one didn't have it. I'm surprised that, uh, now I'm kind of like wondering if this is going to work because that other one didn't have the host, so maybe it's old. The path to use for the script, um, user type host, HPS, this all looks fine. There's really not that much to type in here. So I think that we're all good to go. And I think that this connection block is in the right area. It's with the provisioner. So let's pull the trigger and see what happens. So we'll try another replace here. Okay. Say yes. Hopefully we're just lucky here. So yeah, that kind of answers the question what it would, what it would use it would be EC2 user there. So All right, so I'll be back here if we run into any errors, okay? All right, welcome back. So uh, looks like it finished here and it did establish a remote connection. It didn't say that it failed, it said that it connected and it probably executed that command that we were expecting here. It's not saying that it failed in any way. So let's go ahead and log in and see if we can see it. If we don't, that's not a big deal. We don't have to uh, really dwell on this to make sure it's perfect. More so important that we just kind of go through the motions so that we understand what this is. Hey, the file is there, look at that. So we can open it up. Let's see if it's there, perfect. Okay, so that is a remote exec, and so then we can move on to, I suppose, uh, transferring files, okay? All right, so this last one should be really easy because I think that we can just modify this one and call it file, and then specify file. So file takes a source and a destination, uh, or a content, which might be just easier in our case. So we'll just say destination here, and we'll say content, We'll go look up how this works for file. Um, yeah, this one's a bit easier. So that's what I'm gonna do. We'll copy this over here. And I'm just gonna just say bar soon, which I think is the name for Mars in that book there. And we'll say dot txt. We want the uh, directory to be in the home um, home, what did we say there before when we logged in? It is, because I think I, I might need the full path here to know. Yeah, home EC2. So we'll say home EC2 user, bar soon. And the contents will just be Mars. And so I think that's all we have to do to get that to work. Content destination. Okay, so let's go give that a go and see if it works. So Terraform, we'll need to do a replace again. We're actually uh, logged in the server here, so let's exit. And we will go ahead and replace that again. Just double checking, making sure everything's okay. Good, we'll hit enter. Just make sure we don't get any errors here. Looks like it's good, press yes and I will see you here in a bit, okay? All right, so it says that it's been created or at least replaced. Let's go take a look at our server, give it a refresh. It's probably in our initializing state. We should probably still be able to log in there. So we'll SSH in and we'll type in yes. We'll type in uh, ls. There's our file, file bar soon. I'm just going to cat it to see if it works. Um, and I don't think the uh, contents is there. Oh no, it's there, okay. Oh, I guess because I wrote cat. Oh no, it's right there. It's just, there's no line break. All right, so that all worked out great. So uh, we're pretty much done for provisioners here. So what I'm gonna do is just tear this all down and uh, we'll just, we're all done, okay. So we'll just do a Terraform, just, or I'm gonna do a Terraform apply, auto, or sorry, destroy, auto approve. And we're all good, so yeah, I'll see you later. All right, so it looks like we do have one more uh, follow along here for provisioners and it is an all resource. I thought it was in another section, but uh, we can do it here. So uh, just notice that I went back and I broke up that provisioners into separate folders there so that when I share this repository, it's gonna be easy for you to find all those examples. But let's switch over to this uh, new folder I have here, which is for the provisioner null resource. 
and let's create ourselves a new main.tf file. So, you know, null resource just keeps cropping up in a lot of different use cases, but one in particular that it's very helpful for is waiting for those status checks uh, when spinning up an AWS instance. So what we're going to do um, is we're going to go to maybe one of our examples like the cloud init, and um, we'll go ahead and grab this one, okay? And so now what I'll do is make my way down to null resource here. And I do not believe I got rid of um, this remote workspace, but just to make it easier, we're just gonna keep it local. Okay, so I'm just gonna delete that out of there. And to simplify this further, I mean, we don't need all this stuff. Well, we just leave it in, it's not a big deal. So I think that's what I'll do. I'll just leave it in because I don't feel like uh, ripping all this out to streamline this. But uh, what we want is to create a new resource called null resource here and just a moment as I have a reference for this. It's not easy to remember, so. Okay, and so what we'll do here is create ourselves a null resource. And I'm just gonna call it status. And it's going to have a provisioner inside of it here. And it will do a local exec. And what it's going to do is execute a command. And this is gonna be the AWS EC2 wait instance status okay check. And so this is used to check whether it is done or not. And so we will have to do some interpolation. And what we need to provide here is the uh, instance ID, right? So down below, what I'm gonna do is type in depends on. And uh, I think I just type in EC2 instance here. Okay. Um, I don't use depends on very often, so let's just go look it up and check its reference. So depends on Terraform to see an example. And so here it's actually referring to a particular resource. That seems like a good idea to me. So what I'm going to do is go up here and just bring this down onto a new line. And we're just going to say AWS instance, my server, because we want that this to provision before this does. And for null resources, we absolutely have to specify that relationship. Okay, so we need to get the um, instance ID here. So I'm going to um, just try to take a single one here. And I think the instance ID, I'm not sure. So let's go look up on the Terraform documentation. So registry.terraform.io. We'll make our way over to providers, over to AWS, into documentation. And we're gonna type in AWS instance. And so what I wanna know is if we do ID, do we get back the ID? I think we would. Uh, well, I can't seem to find it very quickly there, but I'm almost certain that if we do .id, that's gonna give us the instance ID back. So we'll just type in instance my server .id. And I mean, other than the fact that the coloring looks a little bit off, I think that is fine. And so we'll go ahead and try to provision this and see if it works. So we'll do a Terraform validate here because I find the Terraform plan a little bit slow. Actually, before we do that, we have to do a Terraform init. This is a new repository. I think there's not supposed to be a P here, so I'll remove that. And this will probably fail if we don't bring in the um, uh, that provisioning file there. So we need this user data file here. So we'll just bring it over. 
or it's going to complain. I believe it's with a A, so I'll just rename that so it has an A in there. There we go. Okay, back to this file here. We'll try a Terraform init, or sorry, a Terraform validate. Let's see if it throws any errors. We have one error here. Blocks of type resource are not expected here. So maybe my nesting is incorrect, and it is because I have it nested within uh, a resource. We cannot do that, so I'll just cut that out. And we will place this resource here at the top level. And we will run that again. And so we have something else failed initiate provider registry HashiCorp null to obtain schema unknown provider. Um, we'll do Terraform init again, since it's asking for it. It's installing the HashiCorp null. I think it's because we added that null resource. So if we go over here to um, the registry so we go back to the top level, we type in null. So I believe this is what controls the null resource here. Okay. So if we want to read a bit more about it, I think it's all there. So it is a separate plugin. So now that we have that, I'm going to do Terraform validate. Okay, looks good. And what we'll do here is go ahead and do Terraform apply. And I'm happy with it because it passed. Well, I guess we should do a plan first. And yeah, it's just going to create stuff. So that's all fine. So what we'll do is type in Terraform apply auto approve. And what we're watching for is to see if it's going to wait for the status checks, because that's what we care about. Okay, so if we go back over here, we're going to have to pay close attention. See what happens. Great, so if we scroll up here, it looks like we hit an error. Um, so it's saying that it does not like our command. Oh, this is supposed to be easy too. Sorry, spelling mistake. So we will, I don't know if this provision, so I'm gonna go refresh here. It did spin up an instance. So we will have to tear down here, so. Or what we could do is just do a Terraform apply replace. That'd probably be easier to do. We'll do AWS instance my server. And we'll go ahead and write yes, and we'll see if it works this time.
Okay, notice that it's executing our status check here. We may be interested to also just try out this command while we're waiting. Up here, if I press the plus, I can open up a new uh, terminal and I can even try it myself here. So notice it's just kind of hanging because um, it's, it's set to wait. So until it's actually uh, working uh, and then it returns, that's when it will proceed. So that's probably how it's working here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and delete this window here. And so it's just waiting until it gets a valid check. So I'm gonna go refresh here Notice that uh, it's initializing, so we'll just wait. All right, so notice here, it says the uh, creation is completed. If I give it a refresh, the status of a passive check. So this null resource worked it as intended. And once this command had completed and this null resource existed, then it was ready. So basically that is null resource. Uh, you can also do triggers with it. So let's take a look here quickly. Um, so a map of arbitrary strings that when changed will force the null resources to be replaced. So that is also something else we can do. Not something we're gonna explore uh, right now, but um, yeah, there you go. Okay, so we are done the uh, provider section, but I forgot to tell you to destroy the uh, resource here. I was just doing another follow along and I noticed that uh, I still had it running. So I'm just going back here and doing a Terraform. Uh, we'll do uh, destroy. Okay, so yeah, just in case. Always consider that you run destroy at the end of these fall belongs, okay? And we'll just make sure that is going to work here just before we end here. Yes. Great, and so we're all good. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at Terraform providers. So providers are Terraform plugins that allow you to interact with cloud service providers like AWS, Azure, GCP, 
software as a service providers, so GitHub, Angolia, uh, Stripe, or other APIs such as Kubernetes or Postgres servers, there's a lot there. There's like over a thousand providers. So providers are required for your Terraform configuration file to work. So you have to have at least one provider. Um, providers can come in three different tiers. We have the official one, so published by the company that owns the provider technology or service, verified, so actively maintained, up to date, and compatible with both Terraform provider uh, communities, so published by a community member, but no guarantee of maintenance, up to date, or compatibility. Providers are distributed separately from Terraform, and the plugin must be downloaded before use. So if we do Terraform init, this will download the necessary plugin uh, provider plugins listed in the Terraform configuration file. So there you go. <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at the Terraform Registry. So this is a website portal to browse, download, or publish available providers and modules. And just remember, providers and modules are plugins within Terraform, both of them, okay? Uh, so to uh, get to this website, we go to registry.terraform.io, and everything published to the Terraform Registry is public facing. So let's just distinguish between providers and modules, and I feel that I should have given providers a little bit more attention in the uh, in its own slide, but I'll give it a, a clear distinction between providers and modules here. So a provider is a plugin that is a mapping to a cloud service provider's API. So if you wanted to call individual API actions, that is what the provider is providing to you. Uh, when we're talking about modules, a module actually relies on a provider plugin but a module is a group of configuration files that provide common configuration functionality. This is gonna help you enforce best practices, reduce amount of code, reduce time to develop scripts. Uh, so the way to think about it is, imagine that you have to do something in your CSP like AWS, and there's just common things that would go along with it. So let's say you're launching uh, a load balancer and auto scaling group with EC2 instances. That's a bunch of uh, services that, you, that are just very common. You'd have to configure it together. So there could be a module uh, that allows you to do all that with writing very little amount of code and it will choose best practices when doing that, okay? <laughs> Let's take a look here at providers and modules within Terraform registry really quickly. So um, here is the AWS one here. And so I just want to point out that this official one is by HashiCorp. It's not by AWS, but it does mean that it has uh, proper support. So you know it's going to have pretty much one-to-one -one mapping to the AWS API. Um, and so it has really, really good documentation. Now, I complain about... Um, Terraform uh, not having great documentation for learning, like their language, but for the actual documentation of doing things practically, they're really, really good. Uh, and here's just an example where we see App Mesh, and they just give you full examples for basically everything. It's really great. Uh, and if you need a code sample to uh, get going, like to actually install it within your configuration file, it's right there uh, over here. So you can just go ahead and grab that for Terraform uh, modules. Uh, it looks pretty similar. So the idea is you get your module code on the right-hand side here. You want to check out the examples. It's going to be dependent on um, who is developing these modules. This one is made by Anton. So he has lots and lots of really great examples. And then you can see a list of dependent modules here under sub-modules. So it's not too complicated. So there you go. So we're taking a look at Terraform Registry, which is a public registry, but let's talk about private registry. How would we do that? Well, that's where we use Terraform Cloud. It allows you to publish private modules for your organization within the Terraform Cloud private registry. When creating a module, you need to connect to a version control system of VCS and choose a repository. So here you can see we can be using something like GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, or Azure DevOps. And of course, we're gonna cover Terraform Cloud a lot more uh, further on in the course, and it do definitely does more than just uh, act as a private registry, but uh, I figured this is the best place to put it against the Terraform registry, okay? Let's take a look at how we would get a list of the current providers you are using. So all you'd have to do is type in Terraform providers and you'd get a full list. Uh, this command is useful if you have a very uh, complex uh, architecture where you're using a lot of files and modules within Terraform. Um, I wanted to just show this command just because I saw it on the exam and so it's just an easy point if you happen to get that question, okay? So we know we can set multiple providers uh, in our Terraform configuration file, but uh, there are some variations here that you should know. So one thing is, is that if you need to have an alternate provider, you can use this thing called alias. 
So if you just notice here, there's the alias. This is useful if let's say you want to have resources within different regions of AWS. It's a very common use case. When you want to reference uh, what uh, resource should use what provider, you're gonna have that little provider attribute and then you're just going to do uh, what the name is of the provider followed by the alias. You can also set an alias provider for a parent module. So notice here um, in the required providers, we have this attribute here and we're using this configuration alias. Uh, and then if you need to set an alias provider for a child module, but more or less, you just need to remember these two up here, okay, for setting an alias. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we're giving closer attention to modules. So a Terraform module is a group of configuration files that provide common configuration functionality to enforce best practices, reduce the amount of code, and reduce the time to develop scripts. I definitely had a lot of confusion understanding the difference between a provider and a module initially. Um, but the clear thing is that a provider uh, is just an API mappings to uh, the service, okay? So on the example here on the left, we have AWS as a provider, and the example is to show you if you had to create a VPC, you'd have to specify many networking resources, and uh, just notice that I have the three ellipses there to suggest there is a lot more that you'd have to configure, but by using a module, and there's one called the AWS VPC module, it basically has this short domain-specific language, that allows you to quickly provision a uh, VPC. So uh, the easy way to remember modules is imagine clicking a wizard that creates many cloud resources, like it, it must have the VPC wizard. That's basically the idea behind modules. Just to kind of give a better contrast to the value that modules have, we'll look at the Azure provider. So imagine you had to provision an Azure virtual machine. This is how much code you'd have to write. So it's gonna vary based on providers. So AWS does not require this much work. It's very short. Uh, GCP requires a little bit more work. And for some reason, Azure requires a lot. So this is a case where you'd want to use a module. And so there's a module called compute and network module, and it reduces the code to amount of this. Still uh, a bit long, but that's just what it is, okay? All right, let's talk about the fine line. And this is understanding the gray areas of responsibility between Terraform infrastructure as code and third-party configuration management tools like Ansible. So there are cases where uh, when you get outside of AWS, Azure, GCP, you might see pr uh, providers like for Postgres database and you might say, okay, well, what part of Terraform should be automating it? And so that's a little bit more complicated question because Terraform does more than one thing. So Terraform has providers, modules, and provisioners. And then on outside of that, if we're not even using Terraform, we have third-party configuration management tools that we can use like Ansible. And the thing is, is that you could have An Ansible do everything, but that does not mean that you should have it do everything. And with Terraform, at more or less most of these levels, you can have them do everything, but that doesn't mean that they should, right? So the idea is to try to figure out what should be where and how to define that. So let's talk about creating a database. So if we created a database, that is like setting up a, a new service. So that is going to be under the providers. Uh, and so you'd use the Postgres Terraform provider to set up a database. Now you have users. And so users are an, uh, an entity. They're not just like loose data. So there's something that you can add, remove, add permissions to, and we would treat them as entities. And so it wouldn't necessarily be under the providers, but that's a great place to put it under modules, okay? Then you have your data. So where would the data go? Um, well, data is not necessarily an entity. It's just a bunch of data. So I would say that that is for provisioners that can run random scripts. And then when we want to do things like backup tables to data warehouses or truncate da data uh, uh, daily tables, things that are re repetitive tasks, that is what we're going to use Ansible for or a third-party configuration management tool outside of Terraform. You wouldn't have Terraform do that stuff at all. So when you have a task done one time to set up the database, like seeding data, it's gonna go in provisioners. When you have repeatable tasks for ongoing maintenance, it's gonna be out as a third-party provider. And if you have something that is like identified as an identity, like as a resource that you want to manage, like asset management, uh, which are these things, these are gonna be uh, over here in providers and modules. And I do wanna point out that a pr uh, provisioner can be using Ansible, but you'd still want to use Ansible or a third-party configuration management tool, uh, uh, isolate or separate to do these kind of things. You do not want Terraform running these, okay? 
Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are moving on to our providers section. So we already covered AWS, but let's go take a look at some uh, different ones because I just want you to get a bit of familiarity with something else. So you understand that uh, there are different challenges with each one and how the providers are a little bit different. So let's take a look at Azure first, and you're gonna need the Azure CLI installed. So if you do not have that already, go to Azure CLI and get that installed. Um, it's going to vary based on your requirements. The other thing is you have to have an Azure account. So I'm just going to go to my portal here uh, to my uh, sandbox. I guess I haven't logged in in a while. So I'm just going to have to open up that for Azure. Hopefully they don't make it too hard on me here. There we go, and I'm in my Azure portal. So what I'm going to do here, and if I'm still running ML Studio, I really gotta shut that down. Uh, it doesn't look like I am, so that's totally fine. Okay, so anyway, um, coming back to uh, Azure, what we wanna do is make sure you're on the registry, go to providers, go to Azure, and we're gonna grab the information to configure this. And I have a new folder here called providers Azure. So just make a main.tf in that. We're gonna paste the contents there and just make sure you're in the correct directory. So uh, make sure you're seeded into that. And I know, uh, cause I've done this before, I know that uh, we need to um, specify features empty in here. I cannot tell you why, I just know that you have to, um, but there are a lot of different methods for authenticating with Azure. Some very easy, some very difficult. Uh, we can use the CLI when we're working in local mode. When it comes to uh, using Terraform Cloud, the remote version, it's a lot harder. We have a lot, uh, a lot more options, but we're gonna take the easy route here and use the uh, CLI. And this is gonna be reliant on us doing the Azure login, okay? So um, we have the provider, um, I'm not sure why the provider name's not there. I didn't delete it out. I believe it's Azure RM. So we'll just go back here and make sure that is correct. So I'm just gonna click um, up here at Azure, Azure RM, okay? And if we scroll on down, I think it even shows you, yeah, you have to have it like that, okay? So um, we'll do that and I'll just type in Terraform init. And it doesn't like something. I don't know what happened to the names. We'll just copy it again, no biggie. Somehow I must have replaced it by accident. And we'll do features here. And we'll do Terraform init. And one of the easiest things that we can create in Terraform is probably a resource group. If you're not familiar with the resource groups, they're just kind of like a folder for your resources. So I'm gonna go here and make a new one. It's just a resource. So I believe it's Azure uh, RM underscore resource group. As you can see, I've done this a few times and I'm just gonna say, you know, my resource group, or I will just say um, providers, Azure providers, Terraform, Azure providers. Sure, why not? And we will give that a name. Okay, and we'll have to give it a location. I'm gonna do uh, East US. All right, and so that says that has been successfully initialized. And so um, I can do Terraform plan. This is not gonna work until I do a login but I just wanna see what it prompts us with if we attempt to uh, provision this without any credentials in place. Actually, to be fair, I've probably done it before, so I'm actually just going to um, run it because I think it'll just actually work for me because I might, be, I might already have credentials. But uh, what you'd wanna do is just do AZ login. So I'll type in AZ login. And that's going to authenticate my machine to Azure. So see how it opened up my browser. I'm gonna log in. It says you are now logged in. You can close this, great. I'm gonna close that. And if we go back, um, you know, we have established a connection there. So it doesn't look like there's any error. Yep, okay, we're all good. So now if I was to do a plan, 
I don't think it would really throw an error until we do an apply. Let's see if this will work. While it's going, we'll just navigate over to resource groups. As you can see, I have a bunch of junk uh, resource groups here that I'm not even using. At some point I should clean that up. And it says, we're gonna create this resource group. Sounds good to me. So I'm gonna type Terraform apply and just see if that works. It's a bit nice not having to handle any AWS credentials, you know, like passing those along with the CLI. Though of course, once you get into these other ones, it becomes a lot more difficult. Um, every time I have to set this up, I have to really uh, read through this. It's like a lot of work. Um, but I imagine if you're working in Azure every day, it's not a big deal. But basically, you're just going to be setting a bunch of these in Terraform Cloud, okay? So you'd have to get your su subscription ID, tenant ID, client ID. Um, and it's going to vary based on a few different uh, scenarios there. So, But anyway, what we'll do is make our way back over here. And it says, do you want to perform these actions? We are going to say yes. And it says it has created that resource. So if we make our way over to Azure um, and we give this a refresh, sometimes their console is not always up to date like SAWS is. So it could be not showing up here and actually exist. And so I don't see it yet. And that's Terraform for you. So I believe that it does exist, that it is there because it says here that it has created this here but yeah the um the azure portal is just like that it just takes time to update so i would just say let's assume that we did create it correctly because it did say that it made it and we'll wait for the cache to bu uh, bust or whatever it has to do to make this show up here i mean it's also possible it could have ended up in a different um uh tenant or or that but i don't think so because this is my main one so let's give this another refresh there it is see yeah so you just have to wait again terraform or sorry, uh, Azure's portal is a lot slower than AWS, but it also does a lot more. So I guess that's kind of a trade-off there. Anyway, so now that we have a resource group, probably be a great idea to set up a server. I'm going to tell you right now, setting up a virtual machine in Azure is extremely painful. Um, I think that if we wanted to go take a, an example and see like um, Azure virtual machine tutorial for Terraform, HashiCorp has one here and actually no this is actually just on microsoft but look at all the stuff just to set up a single virtual machine like you have your resource group your virtual network your subnet your public ip your network groups your network interface like just tons and tons and tons of stuff so i don't do it this way what i do is i go to the modules um because that's the easiest way to set it up for um azure so we'll say, oops, we'll go registry. And if we go to modules and we go to Azure, there's one for compute. Maybe we just type in compute up here. Azure compute. And this is like way, way, way easier. So we have a Linux server, a Windows server, things like that. Um, we are going to need, we have a resource group, but we are going to need our Linux server because I do not want to spin up a Windows machine. Just because, uh, you know, like Linux is just very inexpensive. That's the reason why. It's not because I have an issue with Windows. I'm working on a Windows machine right now. Uh, we'll go ahead and copy the network in because that is just something we have to have. And it might be nice to have the output of the, the name of the server. Sure. So we'll do that. And we might need to modify this so that it makes sense because I named my resource group that. So this one is just called example there. So I might just have to swap that out like that. And I really should have just named it example. I would have saved myself a whole lot of trouble, but I did not know <laughs> I would have saved time if I did that. So we'll just scroll on up here. And I think that is okay. It's not specifying what size a server it is. And that is something that is very important to me because I want it to be inexpensive. So I, I know what we have to set. It's called VM size. And a very inexpensive one is standard uh, B21S. 
Okay, I remember that from my uh, Azure days, making the Azure courses. And that will be uh, very inexpensive and we're not gonna keep it around for very long, so it's not a big deal. And I think that this is correct. I'm just gonna double check. Uh, this looks all fine to me. So what we'll do is go ahead and see if this will provision. So we'll do Terraform uh, apply. Actually, we'll have to do Terraform init because we've installed a new module. Okay, and so we can now do Terraform apply and we'll just review it, make sure that everything is okay and it's happy with it. But yeah, I would say that um, Azure is the hardest thing to use with Terraform. And that's not Terraform's fault, that's just the complexity of Azure. Um, but, you know, again, that's a trade-off, you know, Azure can do a lot of things, so you just have to decide what you want. Okay, so we will type yes, there's way too much to review there, and I'm just gonna hope that this succeeds. And what we'll do is we'll go back to the top here, and I'm just gonna go over to my virtual machines. And we'll refresh here, so we don't see anything yet. Okay, and that is creating. This is gonna take a little bit of time, so I'll see you back here in a moment, okay? All right, so it looks like I might've made a spelling mistake or a, a minor tweak here. So it's saying that uh, B, B21S is not valid. So what I'm gonna do, just to find out what sizes there are and get the right name, I think we can find it this way here. And if I go to B1LS, okay, so maybe I just missed the, uh, the L in there. I'm just gonna double check. Yeah, so I guess I missed that. So let's put the little L in there. Okay, and let's see if that fixes that problem. Hold on here. B1LS, B2S. Okay, well, sure. Whatever it wants, right? Uh, I just wanted to be cost effective. So, I mean, you might have to look this up because, you know, it might be the future and they've changed change them here. Um, but I remember this being a valid option. Hmm. Okay. Well, it must be my mistake. So I want to just check it one more time. B1 LS. I don't trust it. So I'm going to copy it just in case it's a capital I. And so what we'll do is try this again. And maybe we'll have better luck this time. And actually, just to save myself some time, I'm going to just do auto approve. Okay, and I'll see you here in a bit. All right. Okay, so after um, a little bit of waiting there, it looks like it deployed successfully. So we're going to go over back to our virtual machines here and give it a refresh. And there it is. So uh, yeah, it wasn't too difficult to get that working. Um, but yeah, hopefully you can just see that when you want to figure out uh, these providers here, all you have to do again is go to here and go to the documentation, go to the first section, and that's where the authentication always is. And that's the hardest part, honestly, is just getting beyond that part. But you are gonna find different challenges locally and also with the um, Terraform Cloud because the configuration is different. So let's move on to a um, another provider. All right, so I actually forgot to uh, destroy the resources here, so I just kind of cycled back here. Uh, I was actually in my GCP one here a moment ago, but I just want to make sure that uh, you've destroyed your uh, resources there as well. So just type in Terraform uh, destroy. Okay. All right, and just type in yes. and you're all good to go. All right, so we just did Azure and we've obviously done AWS, so let's go ahead and do GCP. Uh, and using GCP with Azure is actually uh, very nice because Google's API is very uh, concise and so it's not a lot of work to set up anything there, um, but authentication is kind of a pain. Um, again, AWS still has the easiest uh, method of authentication, just dropping those keys in. Not to say that the methods are bad, it's just, again, kind of a pain to set up. So what we're going to do is grab our provider information and uh, we will have a new folder here. I'm calling this main.tf and we'll paste it in here as such. 
Okay. Um, and if I remember correctly, to configure this, oh, we need a bunch of stuff. It's like credentials and other stuff. I'll go back here and just see what information we have. And so this is, this one's a bit odd because it doesn't show that. Maybe it's under guides. Um, configuration reference. We're just looking for the credentials. Adding credentials. Okay. Oh, maybe it's under here, credentials. Yeah, so this would be the options we want here. I think this is under the provider because I'm just starting to recognize the name like credentials, projects, regions, zones. These are the things that I remember having to set for it. So what we'll do is go over here and again, see like the documentation is a little bit harder to get through. I mean, it's probably all here. It's just a lot of work to read, honestly. Um, and so I'm gonna do credentials. Okay, I'm going to do project. I'm going to do region. I'm going to do zone. And I'm likely going to want to do this in US Central 1 because that is uh, usually what I like to do for TCP. I believe this is US Central 1 there. I'm just making sure I've spelt it right. That doesn't look right to me. Uh, and so we'll have to create ourselves a new project probably. So what we'll do is go over to Google Cloud. Bye bye, Azure. And we can create ourselves a new project. Probably be a good idea for this. Console. And we'll give it a moment here. And I'm going to go over up here to the top. And I'm going to, I think that was the test one I did uh, a while back, but I'm gonna just say, make a new project here. And this one is going to be Terraform GCP example. And we'll go ahead and create that. It's usually a very, very quick creation of progress. We'll give this a hard refresh here. Okay. Uh, and it is now ready. So we'll just switch over to that project. Um, I need the project ID, which is right here. So we'll grab that there and we'll paste that in there. And now we need credentials. So I never remember how to do this. We'll say JSON credentials GCP. I just remember that it's a JSON file and there's something like with service accounts and things like that. So seems like we'll go here. And we want to go into our GCP one here. And I'm just gonna check my app as a reference. I don't remember it being that hard. My server's account. Create and continue. I do not remember this whatsoever. Okay, let me just read through here quickly. Yeah, I do think we have to create a service account. I just don't remember what role. So click the select the role. The role field affects which resources you want. I just want everything, okay? So, um, I want to be, I just will be an owner because that'll give me full access to everything there and we'll go ahead and hit continue. Uh, this is optional, so I'm just gonna hit continue here. And so now I am in. And so from here, what we can do is go ahead and create ourselves. Uh, oh, I guess we don't have to create any key things. We just have to download our key. So just looking at this here. Um, which one is it? I cannot tell. August 18th. That's kind of today. Um, so I think this is where our key would be. So if we go to manage keys, should be able to download them here. Maybe I can create it. Ah, here we go. Okay. It's tricky. So it just downloaded it right now. And like, this is so hard for me to remember. Like, 
I just have a really hard time with GCP around permissions and credentials. I don't know why. It's my AWS brain for you. And so what I want to do is place it in this folder just to make our lives really easy. Okay, and then we'll just paste that on in there. I'm really surprised I can remember all that. Okay, and but I guess the thing is once you're set up, you just you don't ever have to think about this stuff again. But every time you have to do it, it's very painful. Okay, so our credentials are in, and so this should work. Um, we're gonna need something to provision, so I'm gonna go back over to GCP. Uh, we'll just say GCP Terraform. Actually, it might be up here. And I want to go back to the documentation, and I believe that was like, it's probably like, it always starts with the name, so it's Google, and their services compute, so it's probably instance. Compute engine. There it is, okay. And we'll just see what kind of examples we have here. Might scroll down and have something at the bottom. Nope, the only example we have here is this. So I'm just gonna quickly read through it and see if it is good for us to use. Um, yeah, it looks fine. I know that we're gonna need a boot disk and we're gonna need a network interface. We don't need to scratch this. We don't need all these things. So I'm just gonna pare this down, okay? So we'll go ahead and grab on all this stuff seems like so much and I'm gonna go down below and we do not have to place in a service account we do not need metadata for this example we'll take out the metadata information the network interface is fine we don't need to put anything in here we will have it on the network uh, as default because I'll save us some time we do not need to specify the scratch disk we definitely need a boot image, and uh, I'm gonna go with Debian 10 for fun. I feel like 10 is probably out. Uh, we don't want tags right now, it's not a big deal. Um, is the zone, uh, it's almost the zone I want. I actually, I don't think I even need to specify the zone. I think it will just like pick up on what I have in my credentials. The machine type, I want this to be inexpensive. I believe it's called micro, and we need to give this a name. So I'm just gonna say Terraform instance. And I'm just gonna say like VM instance up here. And let's give that a go. Terraform plan. I'm just hoping that it's gonna pick up that credential file here locally and I did that all right. Okay, so what we'll do is scroll up. It says no changes. Objects have changed outside of Terraform. Well, I haven't provisioned anything yet. Oh, you know what? I'm in the wrong folder. Okay, I always tell you to be in the right folder. And I'm not even in the correct folder myself. So we need to go back a directory. Saying like, I hadn't provisioned anything. What is it talking about? So we'll do Terraform init to get GCP installed there. I was very surprised like we weren't getting errors, <laughs> okay? Okay, good, and so now we'll do a Terraform plan. And while that's going on, I'm just gonna bring this up into GCP and make our way over to compute. Okay, and one to add, no problems, good. So we'll do a Terraform apply, auto approve. Um, it has not been used in this project before. Oh, so we got to enable it, of course. Um, compute API. Well, didn't take me to the right place. That's something I don't like is their uh, their API jumps around everywhere. I don't want to try it. I just want to use it. It says it's enabled. Oh, I'm in the wrong thing. 
we'll go down here to Terraform GCP example, and now we'll enable it. Maybe we just didn't see it because we were in the wrong project. I like how the search just vanishes here. Like that's a great UI choice there, Google. <laughs> okay. You can see like Azure really has, other than the fact that it's slow, it has a really, really good uh, uh, UI. And that's someone that likes using AWS for you. Um, oh, I guess it probably would have brought us here anyway. Um, so I think we're just waiting for this to enable. Oh, maybe the search was here the entire time. Okay, I was just complaining because I didn't see it. I don't know why they just wouldn't keep that expanded all the time, though, honestly. I'll hit enable again. I'm pretty sure that it is enabling. So this is initializing. It is now enabled. Sometimes it's better to trust what's over here as opposed to what's here. So I believe that it's enabled and the UI is just being a bit slow. So I'm going to go here to auto approve. And what I'll try to do is maybe just click back here. Nowhere to go back. Um, I'm just going to click into another one. Sometimes that helps. Then we'll go back to compute. Is this enabled yet? Required compute zones get permission. Forbidden. Well, I'm an owner, so I should have everything. Okay. At least this is enabled now. I'm going to try this one more time, just in case the permissions were still kind of like enabling there. Okay. Um, so that's our problem. Service accounts. Uh, click into that. Okay, maybe I was creating it in my app and I was in the wrong place. That's probably what where I was and that's why I was so mixed up. Yeah, so this is in um, another test account. And so when I created that service account, I created it in the wrong place. If you made it in the right account, you're not going to have this problem as I did. You can just, you probably aren't even encountering this error. But I am, so I will go ahead and manage keys and we will create ourselves a new key. Sorry about that. And, and I mean, it makes sense because it says my app here. So clearly I generated the wrong one. Okay, we'll drag that one over. Yes, I understand it's very secure. And I'll go here and I will copy that. What we'll do here, whoops, I don't want that there. We will scroll on down. And delete that. We'll do an auto approve. And I believe that this will work. Now we'll have the correct permissions. So yeah, I believe it is working now. Oh, that was fast. There we go. And so we'll go back over here and we will make our way back to compute. The VM instances here. And there it is. Okay. So we can go ahead and do a destroy here. Terraform destroy. Yes. And we're all done, okay?
Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at HashiCorp configuration files, also known as Terraform files, that which contain the configuration information about providers and resources. Uh, this is basically core to Terraform, and that's what we're doing. So Terraform files end in the extension of .tf or TF JSON, and we'll talk about the JSON uh, case a little bit later, but Terraform files are written in the Terraform language. And so here is kind of an abstract way of looking at the language. I know it's confusing here, but don't worry, we're gonna reiterate on it to make more sense. But Terraform language consists of only a few basic elements. You have blocks, uh, and so these are containers for other content uh, and they represent an object. So it'll have a block type, which can have zero or more labels and a body. You have a block label, it's a name of a block. You have arguments, which is, an, uh, which is what you assign a value to a name. So notice like we have assignments, so we have identifier to an expression, okay? They will appear within blocks. So here it is within a block, as you can see. Um, expressions represent a value either literally or by referencing and combining other values. They appear as values for arguments or within other expressions. Uh, you might come across HashiCorp configuration language, so HCL, and this is the low level language for both the Terraform language and alternative uh, JSON syntax. I don't know if we'll be getting into it in this course um, or if there's even an easy way to distinguish it because it's basically Terraform language. But just if you see HCL, just think Terraform language is the easiest way uh, to think about it, okay? <laughs> Let's take a look here at the alternate JSON syntax. So Terraform supports alternate syntax that is JSON compatible. Terraform expects JSON syntax files to be named .tf.json. So we mentioned that earlier. And so this is generally what it would look like, okay? Um, the syntax is useful when generating portions of a configuration programmatically since existing JSON libraries can be used to prepare the generate configuration files. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Um, would you want to work on this? It's up to you. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, so that's the reason for this alternate syntax. All right, let's take a look at Terraform settings. So the Terraform configuration block type, Terraform curly braces, you'll see this within your configuration file, is used to configure some behaviors of Terraform itself. So here is what it looks like. And what's very common is you're gonna see those required providers. Uh, so there are different things that we can put in here. So we can put the required version. So this expects us to match to a particular version of Terraform, required providers. This is the providers that will be pulled during the Terraform init. We can also do experiments here. So these are experimental language features that the community can try and provide feedback on. And then we have provider metadata. So this is module specific information for providers, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at the HashiCorp configuration language, also known as HCL. I'm gonna tell you, I was really confused at the start working with Terraform because sometimes they'd mention things like HashiCorp configuration files, HashiCorp configuration language, Terraform language, and I could not discern you know, what the difference was, but so this is the idea here is to give you that clarity, okay? So HCL is an open source toolkit for creating structured configuration languages that are both human and machine uh, friendly for use with command line tools. And it's an open source project, so you can find it at github.com forward slash HashiCorp HCL. So the idea is that they have this baseline language that you can extend for your own use case. So uh, Terraform is using it. And so uh, it uses a good, like it uses the language itself, but then it goes ahead and extends it by adding additional functionality for its specific use case. And this HCL uh, based language is not just for Terraform, it's used for Packer templates, vault policies, uh, boundary controllers and workers, console configuration, waypoint application configuration, nomad job specification. Uh, and this one isn't a HashiCorp product, but this is an open source project called Shipyard and you can use it for Shipyard blueprints. Surprisingly, uh, Sentinel, uh, which is a HashiCorp um, policy as code serv uh, service, um, does not use uh, HCL, but it has its own HCL, ACL uh, custom language. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, we're looking at mostly uh, the use case is for um, HashiCorp services. But if you wanted to extend this language for your own use case, you totally could. Uh, and so I think that's really cool. But hopefully that kind of distinguishes between HCL and Terraform language, okay? 
Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at input variables, so also known as Terraform variables, or just variables, are parameters for Terraform modules. That is the way we get data in to our configuration scripts is via uh, input variables. So you can declare variables in either the root module or child modules, and the way you define them is via this variables block there at the top. And just to kind of go over the uh, possible fields for that block, we have the default option. So the default option, which is here, is going to be the default uh, variable if you do not set it. For type, this is an argument that specifies the value types that are accepted for the variable. So in this case up here, we can see string, and this one is a list. For description, this specifies the input variable's documentation. We don't see an example there. I believe that it is optional, but it's always great to put a description in when you can. There is a validation block, so a block to define validation rules, usually in addition, uh, addition to type constraints. So we don't see that here on the right-hand side, but the idea is that, you know, this just makes sure that there's less of a human error entering the wrong information. You can also have sensitive. This limits Terraform UI output when the variable is used in the configuration. And we will cover sensitive uh, a lot more in this course outside of just this one slide, okay? Let's take a look here at variable definition files, and these allow you to set the values for multiple variables at once. So variable definition files are named with the .tfvars extension, or if you want to use the alternative syntax, it's the tfvars.json file. By default, uh, if you have a file called terraform.tfvars within your project directory, this will be automatically loaded, so it's pretty common to make that file. Um, to create a, a, a definition file, it just uses the Terraform language, so you would just assign uh, values here. You wouldn't make variable blocks, but you just uh, define these um, identifiers and give them values, okay? Another way of loading input variables is via environment variables, and this is very common uh, way of loading them if you have your own CI/CD process for Terraform, so if you're using Terraform Cloud or you're using some kind of uh, build server, that's gonna be the primary way you're gonna get variables uh, into uh, those build servers. Uh, probably won't be doing this much locally, but the way it works is that Terraform will watch for any environment variable starting with tf underscore var underscore followed by the name. This is very important to remember because it definitely will show up on the exam. Uh, so let's say we wanted to set uh, a variable for uh, an image ID. So we do tf underscore var uh, and then image ID. Probably most cases when you follow the name, it's going to be a lowercase underscore. I don't think you'd probably want to uppercase that stuff and you just set the value, okay? So there's a lot of ways for us to load input variables. We just saw two. So we saw Terraform TFRs and uh, environment variables, but there's a lot more uh, caveats to this. So let's just run through them. So we already covered uh, Terraform.TFRs. The idea here is that if you create this file and it's in your project, it will automatically be loaded when running Terraform apply. You can name other TFR files. Uh, so I just call them these additional TFR files, but they won't be loaded by default. You'll have to use a command line to load them. This is useful if you have like a dev and prod environment and you want to uh, swap those out. Now, if you want to have um, files that auto load, then you can just put the dot auto here and give it any name you want. This would be useful if let's say you had a very large Terraform TFRs file and you wanted to break it up to make it more human readable, uh, you could do that. Then you have the hyphen var file uh, flag when you're doing Terraform apply or or plan, and this is actually how you load up these additional variable files. If you need to override a single value, you can use hyphen var. So here I'm overriding the EC2 type to be T2 medium. And then lastly here we have environment variables. We covered this, this is where it starts with TF underscore var underscore followed by the name. And this is going to be very common when you are using uh, code build servers or runtimes to uh, run this in a CI CD automated way. Now there's a precedence to which these get loaded, meaning that uh, that certain uh, configurations of variable or input of variables will override other ones. So as we go down this list, these ones will override the previous ones. So at the top, you have environment variables. If you have a Terraform TFRs file, that will override the environment variables. Uh, if you have the JSON one, that will override that one. If you have auto files, that will override the default uh, TFRs file. 
and then on the last list you have hyphen var and hyphen var file will override the rest so there you go uh, in terms of the exam uh, they're not going to ask you the precedence here but you're going to need to know what var var file are environment variables are in this default one okay All right, let's take a look here at output values, which are computed values after a Terraform apply is performed. Output values allow you to obtain information after resource provisioning, such as a public IP address, output a file of values for programmatic integration, cross-reference stacks via outputs in a state file via Terraform remote state. Uh, and so here's an example of an outputs um, uh, block. So notice that there's a block and you specify some stuff there. You can optionally provide a description. It's not necessary, but generally with outputs, I would recommend putting that in there. You can also mark it as sensitive so it does not show in your uh, terminal. This is important if you're doing like logging stuff, you don't want to compromise those values there. But understand that um, output values, um, even though they might not be outputted to your terminal or SD out, um, they will be visible within the state file. So if somebody opens up the state file, they're going to be plainly visible there. So just understand that sensitive does not protect the values there. Okay. Now, in terms of how we would use the CLI with the output values, uh, if we type Terraform output, it's just going to print out all the values that are within the state file. I don't show this in the example here, but if you wanted to use a, um, a like, bash command to uh, parse json you could extract them out and see they're just plainly in the json okay if you need to get exactly uh, a particular field you type in terraform output and then followed by the name if you wanted in a json format all the output then you could uh, give that flag i don't know if it would work with this one i actually didn't test it just thought about that here for this one here uh, if you want the raw output of it, meaning like if you output a string and you want it to be escaped or what have you, then you could use it pragmatically by passing it to something like curl to do something. But the idea with all these output values is that it's one way of inspecting, but you could also use this in a configuration script or, or something to do kind of like an after action, okay? All right, so we're taking a look at local values, also known as locals, that assigns a name to an expression so you can use it multiple times within a module without repeating it. So here, what we're gonna do is define our local block up here. And then the idea is that we're assigning uh, these names or IDs, uh, expressions or values so that we can reuse them throughout our code. Uh, notice that we can define multiple local blocks in the same file. Um, and I just say this because like when you use required providers, you're only allowed to have a single block, but in this case, like with variables or locals, you can have many, um, and you can even nest them within each other. So notice down here, we're referencing local uh, within a local, so that's totally possible. And I imagine it's in the order to which uh, it is specified. We can do static values or computed values. So we can actually, here's a function, right, an expression, and then it'll output a value. Um, once a local value is declared, you can refer reference it via the dot as local dot the name. So here, notice it within our AWS resource, we have local and common tags. I have to point this out, but when you're referencing, you use the singular local uh, because you might get an exam question where it shows you local dot or locals dot. And uh, the trick here is you got to remember which one it is. Locals help uh, can help dry up your code. It is best practice to use local sparingly since it's uh, in Terraform, it's intended to be declarative and overuse of locals can make it difficult to determine what the code is doing. This all comes back to describing Terraform as declarative plus where they give you functionality that's imperative like, but the idea is that, uh, you know, if you overuse these, you can run into trouble, okay? <laughs> Hey, it's Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at data sources uh, for Terraform. So the idea here is you want information defined outside of Terraform, and it's def defined by another separate Terraform configuration or modified by functions. So the idea here is we are gonna define ourselves a data block, and uh, we have an external resource we're looking for. So we're saying, hey, I want to see if I have an AWS AMI. We're gonna use these filters as a way of, of kind of selecting it within our um, AWS account. So we'd have a provider set up and so it'd be looking within that account to find it. And it's even saying, look for the most recent AMI, okay? Um, and once we uh, have uh, found that data source, we can just reference it. So notice we're using data to reference it there. So data, AWS, AMI, dot web ID. So there you go.
we're taking a look here at name values, and these are built-in expressions that reference uh, various values that you'll find in your configuration scripts. We do cover these in their respective sections, but I wanted to consolidate them here in one place just so that uh, you get a second chance to reinforce this information because the uh, crux of questions on the exam could be based on knowing how the name values work. So let's go through them. The first is resources. I'm gonna get out my pen tool here. And so the way resources work is that you start with the resource type, so AWS instance, and then you're going to do the name of it. So there's nothing that uh, um, starts uh, before the left-hand side of it. So just remember, it just starts with that resource type. Then you have input variables, and that starts with var period. So that's the singular var. Then we have local values. And again, that's singular, so local period. For child modules, it starts with module period, again, singular. For data sources, it's going to be data singular. Just remember singular because they can have a, a matchup on the on the exam questions where it'll be like data or datas. For file system and workspace info, we have path.module. This is the path of the module where the expression is placed. We have path.root. This is the path of the root module of the configuration. We have path CWD. This is the path of the current working directory. And uh, in practice, uh, the default CWD is the same as the root, so those would be technically the same. We have terraform.workspace. This is the name of the currently selected workspace. Then we have block local values. These are things that appear within uh, a body of a blocks. So this could be within a resource, provisioners, things like that. So we have, um, if we're using the count meta argument, we're gonna get count. And with that, we'll have count.index. So we can say, okay, this is the uh, fourth iteration of you know uh, this, this uh, count loop. Um, then we have for each, and this allows us to have the key and the value, so we can access that during our iterations. We have self, uh, so self is a, a references information within provisioners or connections, um, so it's just like a self-referencing thing. Name values resemble the attribute notation of map or object values, but are not objects and do not act as objects. You cannot use square brackets to access attributes of name values like an object. So there you go. <laughs> Hey, it's Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are going to be learning all about variables and outputs. So let's get to it here. Uh, and the first thing we're going to do is create ourselves a new folder. And just so you know that these uh, file names might change because I have yet to actually publish this as I'm creating this course. So, you know, if this one isn't 040, because I just decided not to do the uh, Terraform registry one because I'm doing it later, that, uh, you know, the numbers might be different, okay? But in the course, I will link up the uh, correct repos if you're trying to find them. But what we'll do is type in main.tf, um, and we just need to provision something. So we'll probably go back all the way to our getting started one and try to grab something from there. So I will go and grab this AWS instance here, and we will also grab its outputs because that's probably a good idea. And we will go and grab its provider here. All right, and we will also go ahead and grab a variable because we're all learning about variables. So we're gonna have to have some kind of setting here. And we also need our Terraform configuration block. So I think that's in my main. And we will go ahead and grab that. So we'll go to the top here, paste that in. Okay, this looks all good to me. Actually, we're just going to use a local backend for this to make our lives a lot easier. And we don't need tags. I'll just remove that for the time being. And so this should be good enough. Um, yeah, I'm happy with this. So what we'll do is go ahead and deploy this instance. But actually, this is all about learning again about uh, variables, right? So we said that there is a lot of different ways to inject them. So we did. We have the terraform.tf vars. Um, and other ones like that. So let's just go down the road or go down each one and see if we can uh, learn how to do all these, okay? So the first one is gonna be terraform.tfvars. And in here, we're just going to specify the instance type. And that's gonna be a T2 micro. Put that in double quotations. And we'll go ahead and type in terraform uh, plan. I just see if that gets populated. Oh, we have to do Terraform init first. We honestly don't even need to deploy this infrastructure because we're going to just be able to um, run Terraform plan. If it's populated, then we know that it's working as expected, right? And while that's going on, I'm just gonna go to the documentation here and we're just gonna pull up uh, Terraform variables. 
because I'm pretty sure it's just straight here in the documentation. It talks about all the different ways. There's like a list when they talk about the um, uh, the variable definition files download are down here. So they kind of mention all the different use cases there. And I mentioned that obviously in the course, um, but we'll just go and now do a Terraform plan. And so what I wanna see is it's gonna use a T2 micro here. So if we scroll on up, we can see that it said it's T2 micro. So it's loading that from our Terraform TFR. It's just to prove that it is, I'm just gonna write in nano. And we're gonna go down below and run Terraform plan. And if we scroll up, we can see now it's a nano. So Let's say we didn't have a Terraform VARS file. We had something that is just anything. We call it um, my variables. Or how about just VARS to make our lives a bit easier. So we'll just say VARS.TFVARS. And if we do Terraform plan, is it going to auto load that file? No. See how it's prompting us? Because um, if it doesn't have the word auto in it, it doesn't know to load it. So what we'd have to do here is we'd have to do Terraform plan var file and then say VARS. Um, dot tfrs and so now it should load that file okay we're going to scroll up see if it's nano it is good i'm just going to go change this to a medium for fun so let's say we uh we didn't want to have to always do that hyphen var file because we always want this to be loaded because it's just an additional file what we can do is put the word auto in it all right and so now if we do terraform plan it should just pick that up Okay, we're gonna go ahead and scroll up and we can see we have that T2 medium, okay? So let's say we just wanted to input it from the, uh, the API here. So I'm just gonna rename this here or from the CLI. So what we can do is type in var uh, instance type equals uh, T2 nano. And so if we scroll up here, this should be T2 Nano. So yeah, that's pretty much all the variants that we need to explore, but also notice that there is uh, uh, an order of precedence, right? So this is the order that will load in and later sources taking precedence over the earlier ones. So the later it is, the more likely it's gonna override it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to create myself a um, new file here and we're going to say terraform.tfvars because I just want to show how that plays out and we'll have our vars.tfvars file which is fine actually we'll do the auto okay and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off small so this is going to be instance type equals nano and then this one here is going to be a uh, micro and so I want to see what happens if I run terraform plan is it going to take this one or that one right and we're going to scroll up and we can see that it's a t2 micro so it's taking the one from the auto file because it, it's second presidents, right? So this one has priority over this one. And then if we want to uh, override that there, we could do um, hyphen var and say instance type equals T2 medium. And so that should override those there. And we'll scroll up and see, we can see that's a T2 medium. So that's pretty much all we really needed to um, explore in this one here. And so we'll just move on to something like uh, outputs, okay? You know what, I thought about it and I think that uh, maybe what I should do before we move on to outputs is actually just look at how we define these variables here and some of the additional options. So here we have variable instance type and we specified it as a string. Of course, there are different types, but there's a few other things that we can do. We can provide it a description. Okay, so we'll say um, uh, the size of the instance. 
I've never really noticed where the descriptions show up. I, I'm assuming that uh, if you were to run this without any kind of like Terraform bars or anything, so what I'm gonna do here is just go ahead and delete this file here and delete the auto file here. And I think that uh, if we were to run it, the prompt would show up there. So I'll just clear that out. I just wanna see where it shows up. Yeah, so it shows the description there, okay? Um, there are some other options. So I believe we can do sensitive. I think it's just sensitive true. Here, yep. So we can do sensitive. I'm not the best at spelling, so I'm just gonna put that off screen so I can see what I'm doing. I will say true. And what that should do is it should obscure, um, it should obscure the actual value here. So if I type in t2.micro, it hit enter. It should obscure it in the plan. We scroll up here. So notice it's sensitive. So when you're inputting, it doesn't hide it. I'm actually kind of surprised that they don't kind of uh, blank that out as you're typing it in. Um, but this is the only place that it's going to hide it. And the thing that you need to understand is that just because it's there does not mean it's going to be hidden in the Terraform state file. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go ahead and uh, deploy this because I just want to show you that it's visible in the Terraform state file. So we'll say t2micro here. And I believe it's already created the state file. You know, it's still empty, so I'll have to wait a little bit. But while that is going on, we'll look at something else like validation. I, I don't really play with validation much, but I'm sure we can figure it out in two seconds. So validation, just make sure that the input is as you expect it to be. So if we go here and we need to give it a condition. And so can is a built-in function. So I assume it's gonna just be true or false. We probably should go look that up. So we go look built-in uh, functions, Terraform can. It was right here. So can evaluates the given expression returns a Boolean indicating whether the expression produced a results without errors. Okay, so that sounds pretty good to me. Uh, so we'll go back over here to our file here. And so we have can and in the input variables we have regex. And that's probably what I'll use here just to make things a little bit easier. And so what I wanna do is I want this to be a T2. Or we even say T3 here. So regex expects this to be a T3. And I don't need the uh, second parameter here. So I could just take that out and make this a period here. T3 is just another line of AWS instances. The instance must be a T3 type EC2, EC2 uh, instance. Okay, and so notice this finished and we were seeing if the sensitive would show the, um, the size of the instance within the file here or would it be sensitive? So we'll say instance type. And so notice that sensitive does not obscure it in the Terraform state file. I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, destroy that. So we'll say Terraform, um, Actually, uh, we don't have to do that just yet. Let's go ahead and actually test our validation here and see if we got it right. So what I'm gonna do is just do Terraform plan again. And I'm going to take out the sensitive option here. Terraform plan. And so the condition for the variable must refer to var instance type in order for the incoming tests. So I guess we do have to specify a uh, second parameter here. Um, the condition for the variable instance type must refer to var instance type. Okay. So I think it just probably wants it as the second parameter. 
So we did see that a moment ago, right? You would think that it would just like infer it because it's already there, eh? Um, the validation error message must be at least one full sentence starting with an uppercase letter ending with a period. Wow. <laughs> Grammar police. Your given message will be included as part of the larger Terraform error message written as English prose. I guess like if you're publishing your module, that they want you to do it properly, right? So I guess that's a good way of enforcing good practices there. And so I'm going to try T2 micro, and I, I'm hoping that my validation works. And it's, as Sierra says, that it must be a T3 type. And so that that's where that error is working. Uh, so we're all done here. I'm just going to go ahead and do a Terraform destroy. Or actually, I'll do it apply because I just like it to happen right away. So we'll say destroy, auto approve, okay. And we'll go off screen here. And I'm just checking if there's anything else of interest. That's pretty much it for the variables. So we'll move on to the. Um, uh, actually, you know what? I want to keep this instance up and running because we're going to use it for outputs, okay? So um, I think that's all good uh, for now. I'm going to just switch this over to T2 um, so that it stops complaining. Okay, and we'll look at the output CLI. All right, so let's take a look at other things we can do with the outputs here. So I'm going to go and type in Terraform outputs CLI. There's nothing super complicated here, but I just want to go through some of these options with you, okay? So we'll go back here to our Terraform here, and we should have for our output. So I want to show you Terraform output. And that will output all of your um, your uh, uh, defined outputs. Then we can provide its name. So we can say public IP. And that will give us an individual one. You can give it a raw command. And this is really useful when you are doing something like SSH or you want to pipe it to another command. You saw us do this earlier when we did SSH. So we did SSH. And then we gave it some kind of um, address. And then we did this dollar sign parentheses. And that's actually part of the bash language. And so that was great so that we were able to directly interpret it. And we had to use the raw so it was escaped as double quotations, right? Uh, let's see if there's anything else that's of interest. Um, you can say no color. JSON is something I did not show you before. So let's give that a go. So we'll just go back and say JSON. Okay. And that could be really useful if you wanted to parse that. There is a... Um, there's a, uh, um, a, a bash uh, library called, I think it's like JY or JQ. It's for parsing JSON. So you could use it with that, like uh, JQ library. Nope. JY. Nope. Parsing JSON. Um, parsing JSON bash. Maybe it's like JQ. Yeah, it's JQ. So I think I might have this installed here, JQ. And so this is a very useful tool if you want to um, parse out stuff here. So what we could do here is we could say JSON and make a pipe and then say JQ, maybe period. I'm not sure what that would give us, probably everything. But uh, if we wanted to just grab the name, see where it says like hyphen R, we could try that. So we could try hyphen R uh, type. Okay. Um, or, oh, see, so he has like a little period there. So maybe we need to do this. I mean, I've used JQ in the past. It's just like, I never can remember how it works. So maybe we do man.jq here. Might give us some examples. That's not very helpful. So we could say like, JQ examples. So I know period will get us the start of it. Here we have fruit, period, accessing properties. Okay, so I think what we need to do here is do public IP like that. And yeah, it returns a string. And so we can do value. 
Okay, and so the JQ is pretty commonly installed a lot of, a lot of instances. So that's something that you might find uh, that you might want to select things here, right? Okay. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much uh, it for outputs, and we'll move on to the next part here. Okay. Actually, again, I probably should uh, talk about some of the output options here and show those to you as well, um, because there are some things that we can do. So I believe we can set sensitive as well. So I just want to go and type in Terraform outputs here. I cannot type well today. And we can give it a description and we can set it as sensitive. So that's something that we should uh, give, give a try here and see what that does. Sensitive equals true. Okay. And I think that uh, if we do Terraform output, I wonder if we'll have to do a refresh on this for that to work. Great, so it's still showing it and I want it to be sensitive. So I'm gonna do Terraform refresh, or actually again, it's Terraform apply um, uh, refresh only. Oh, it's asking for the type again, T2 micro. And so refreshing state allows us not to have to reprovision it, right? So would you like to update the Terraform to reflect the detected changes? Um, yeah, I'm fine with that, yes. I think because we had tags before on that resource possibly. So now see that it says it as sensitive, okay? So what we'll do here is type in Terraform output. And so now it does not show us what it is. Um, so yeah, there you go. <laughs>
if that's going to work. Now, we technically have to give that module an input. And so see, it's expecting that input to have instance type. So what we'll have to do here is specify instance type. And I guess we'll just try T2, um, T2 micro here. Let's see if it likes that. So we have another issue here, unsupported attributes um, in the output module, AWS server, AWS instance, my server is a object known after apply. This object does not have an attribute named AWS instance. Um, I think I might need to specify, oh, sorry, we just want the outputs. So this is actually, def we don't want to reference it this way. We just want to uh, get whatever the outputs is. So we just do outputs here, okay? Because it, we can't access the AWS instance that way. It just doesn't make sense. Um, so we'll go ahead and hit apply again here. And so here it says, object does not have that. Maybe it's just output. And that doesn't work. So just give me a second, I'll be back, okay? All right, so I pulled up the documentation and here it says, you know, I don't need to put the word output or outputs. I don't know why I thought I had to do that. And so I should just be able to do this. So let's see if that works here. See if we're in good shape. Okay, so to reduce risk of accidentally exporting sensitive data that was intended, Terraform requires that any root module output contain sensitive data be explicitly marked as sensitive if you do intend. So it's not our intention to uh, mark it as sensitive. So I'm gonna just say sensitive false. It says line nine. So let's run that again. Not sure if it's in our other one here. I don't think so because it's line 28, eh? Oh, sorry, okay, so we had we had it in the other one, so we'll just take it out. Okay, and we will run that there. Cool, and so let's go ahead and just deploy that to make sure our sub-module works. Terraform, uh, apply, auto-approve. But yeah, throughout the course, you'll, we'll, you'll see that we're going to be repeating some things because, you know, it's impossible to show you chaining outputs without covering how to build out submodules, but we'll just have to do some variants down the road there. But yeah, I just want to make sure that this works as expected um, and that we get an output. Um, so I'll see you back here when it's done deploying, okay? All right, so after a short little wait there, you can see that uh, we have our public IP address, and so that is coming from our submodule. So that's all in good shape there. So what we can do is go ahead and just destroy this instance. I'm just gonna double check to see if the next tutorial requires it. We technically covered local values earlier, but I guess we could cover them again. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and just destroy that instance. So we'll just say apply, destroy, auto approve. Um, gotta type it right. Two P's? <laughs> there we go. Okay, great. And I'll see you in the next video. All right, let's go take a look at local values again. I know we covered this in the uh, getting started, but it helps to do things more than once. Um, and since we've had an opportunity to go through the documentation, we understand there's a few extra things that we can do with it, um, like nesting things in or be able to define them twice things like that. Uh, but there's really not a lot to do that is new here. So we're just going to go through the motions of it again, just so that it's part of our memory. So remember, we've made this into a sub module here. Uh, and so this would probably be the best place to do a locals value. And it's not complicated at all. So we're just going to do locals. And we could use this to abstract a few different things. So that's the variable. I'm going to go up here one second. And uh, We'll do this for the instance here. Oops. Locals. Okay, we could say AMI. This is probably not what you'd use it for, but you know we just have to have some kind of use case for this. So local.ami, right? And uh, I'm not sure if you can do this. Let's, let's see what happens if we do. 
Can we do var instance type? Kind of be would, would be kind of redundant to do that, but uh, let's just do it anyway. And what I want to do is a Terraform plan. You know, the key thing to remember is that when we're defining the block, it's called locals. We probably don't use an equals here. Um, and it's the uh, the singular when we are referencing it, okay? So we'll just scroll up and see if that is correct. Yep, everything is working as expected. I'm just going to pull that out because this really doesn't serve much purpose. But again, we just had to go through that um, just so that you remember how it works, okay? So I'm just removing that out of our code. Okay, and there we go. All right, so we're gonna be looking at data sources now. We did experience creating our own data source uh, in the getting started when we referenced an, an AWS VPC. And so data, uh, data sources are resources that already exist that you want to reference uh, in your code. And so a good example would be using an AWS um, AMI, the Amazon machine image to change what is being served. So if we were to go into our server here, it's using this particular AMI, but we could totally use a data source for that. And so anytime you're looking for something, you would just type in, uh, you know, AWS AMI data source, and you'll get some examples here. And notice that we have some interesting options like filter and stuff like that. These are not available to every single, um, uh, I might have actually have to update my lecture content because I might have highlighted this as a global feature, but I realized that this filter option here is actually reflecting what is in the AWS CLI. So I, I originally had thought that this was part of the language, but apparently it's just a reflection of this because if you look up something like an RDS instance, okay, and you say data source, and you go here, uh, this one doesn't have a filter option, or at least I don't think it does. I'm gonna type in filter. Right, or if we were to go over to Google, so we'd say like Google Compute, um, and we would say data source Terraform. Maybe even a project, doesn't really matter. Notice it doesn't have a filter option. So I just wanna uh, clarify here that this filter option really is particular data bus because that's what their CLI supports and that's being reflected by uh, Terraform, okay? But um, let's say we want to uh, reference a different kind of instance. And so I was looking here, and this is kind of an example where they are, uh, they are selecting an Ubuntu instance. Um, and so that's something that we could do to uh, uh, select something there. Um, notice that the owner is not ourselves here. So if you go over here, uh, notice we have self. And so this is an account ID for, uh, for AWS. And this is a particular version of, of Ubuntu. So if I go ahead and grab this here, uh, and what we'll do, whoops. The one thing I don't know is if this instance, like what um, what region it's in, because AWS, you have to launch your AMIs in the same region, but what we can do is paste this on in here and just notice that I'm just under the instance documentation here, okay? Uh, and so it's very important to get something that is, again, um, in the same region, but I. We're not specifying the AMI image, it's gonna filter it and find it. So I think what it's gonna do is based on any region, it'll find it there, okay? So here I can just go data dot AWS AMI, and we can just choose the ID and that should work. Okay, so we'll just type in clear and we'll say Terraform plan. All right, so a data resource AWS AMI has not been declared in your module AWS server. Um, so let's just take a look here. It is defined right here. AWS AMI, maybe uh, we aren't giving it the right thing here. I'm looking for the thing that we can reference. So ID is set to the ID found in the AMI. In addition, the following attributes are expected, the ARN. So I'm pretty sure, yeah, it was the ID that we wanted. Okay, it says the data source AWS AMI ID has not been declared in the module.aws server. 
Okay, I have not seen this error before because we're working in a sub-module. There's not really any explanation. So when in doubt, what I'm going to do is do a Terraform init and see if that resolves that issue. Okay, and we'll just try this again. And it still doesn't like it. Um, oh, I also have a name, so I guess I have to provide that as well. So that's probably my mistake right there. Okay. There we go. And so what I want to do is just scroll up and see if it selected an AMI from uh, AWS. So notice that it's pulling this one here, and that's going to be for the relevant region. Uh, again, I don't want to provision this because um, I don't. <laughs> but, um, you know, I just wanted to show you that... That's how you use data source. And I really want to emphasize that this filter option that you see here is particular to AWS and the options are going to vary based on how you can select stuff and not everything is available. You have to uh, Google each one and see what uh, resources you can pull in for data sources, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at resource meta arguments. So the Terraform language defines several meta arguments which can be used with any resource type to change the behavior of resources. And so we'll quickly go through the list here and then we'll deep dive on each. So the first is depends on. So this is for specifying explicit dependencies. We have count, which is for creating multiple resource instances according to account. We have for each, which is used to create multiple instances according to a map or set of strings. Provider, so this is for selecting a non-default provider configuration. Lifecycle, this is for lifecycle customizations. Provisioner, uh, this is, and also for connections, for taking extra actions after resource creation. So there's the quick list, now let's jump into them. All right, the first resource meta argument we want to look at here is called depends on. And this is the order of which resources are provisioned and is important when resources depend on others before they are provisioned. Terraform implicitly can determine the order of provision of resources, but there may be some cases where it cannot be determined uh, or like the correct order. So this is where you can be a bit more explicit. So uh, here we have some Terraform configuration where we have an AWS instance and it relies on a policy. And so what we're doing is we're setting an explicit depends on here so that it knows that it requires that. Now, in a normal use case, you would not have to do this, um, but it's hard to find use cases where this happens. But when it does become a problem, you'll know because your resources will not provision correctly, you'll get an error. So there you go. Let's take a look here at the count resource meta argument. And this is when you're managing a pool of objects. So an example here would be a fleet of virtual machines where you want to use count. Uh, so here on the right hand side, we have an example of us using that in Terraform. So we can specify the amount of instances we want. So here it is four, and then we'll have access to this name value called count.index. So uh, the tags will start at zero. So it'd be server zero, one, two, and three. Uh, then uh, just down below here, I just want to show you that with count, you can accept a numeric expression. So, you know, if you had a variable that you had set as the subnet IDs or even just an arbitrary number, like you want to have X amount of servers, uh, this would allow you to do that okay. But just so you know, those numbers must be whole and a number must be known before the configuration, which you'd put it in your input variables, okay? <laughs> All right, so let's take a look here at for each, which is for iterating over resource meta arguments, but it's slightly different because it allows you to map over dynamic values, giving you a little bit more flexibility. So here's an example of us defining a for each, and notice that we have defined a map. Sometimes I call it an object because they're so similar, but this is a map. Uh, and the idea is that once you have your a map defined with your for each, you will now have access to these name values. So you can do each dot key or each dot value to extract that out. Um, you can also just use it like with an array. So here we have an array and then we use two set to turn it into a set, which it will accept as well. Uh, and then we can just pull out the key because there will be no value. So just an example of with a map and then with something that looks like an array, okay? <laughs> To understand the uh, resource meta argument lifecycle, we need to understand how resource behavior works. And so when you execute your execution order via Terraform apply, it will perform one of the following to a resource. So the most common one you'll see is a create. 
Uh, so these are resources that exist in the configuration, but are not associated with a real infrastructure object in the state. The way you can tell it's creating, it will have this nice little uh, green plus sign. Uh, the next one is destroy. So resources that exist in the state, but no longer exist in the configuration. And so that's going to tear down your resources out of your cloud providers. This is represented by a minus symbol. Then you have update in place. So the resources who arguments have changed. So the idea here is that if you have a virtual machine and let's say you change the size of it, it's not going to destroy it. It's just going to modify its settings. This is represented with a, a tilde. And the last one here is destroy and recreate. So resources who arguments have changed, but uh, which cannot be updated in place due to remote API limitations. So there are just some cloud resources that always require destroy and recreate. And this is something very easy to trigger if you are using um, the replace command or uh, the older Terraform tank command in order to uh, uh, replace a degraded or damaged instance. So let's talk about um, lifecycle. So lifecycle blocks allow you to change what happens to resources on the create, update, and destroy. Lifecycle blocks are nested within resources. So here is a resource, uh, which is just an Azure resource group. And within it, we have a lifecycle block and we're setting our first option here uh, that's possible called the create before destroy. So this is a Boolean. And when replacing a resource, first create the new resource before deleting it. So the default is destroyed old first. So this is more about just the order of how it's destroyed. Prevent destroy, so ensures a resource is not destroyed. Then we have ignore changes. Uh, and this is based off a list of attributes that you feed to it. So don't change the resource on create, update, destroy if a change occurs for the listed attributes. So maybe um, maybe you, uh, you're you just changing a tag and you say, don't, don't change, uh, like don't uh, tear down, create, or do anything strange if we change a tag, okay? So there you go, that's uh, life cycles. <laughs> So we're looking at our last meta argument here, which are resource providers. And this goes along with the idea of an alias. So here we are de defining ourselves a provider in Google Cloud, but there's a case where we might need to override uh, the provider uh, at, a, at a per resource level. And the way we do that is by creating an additional provider and setting an alias. And then here we could change something like the region. And then once we have that set, we can then reference our provider explicitly under a resource. Uh, and so that's all there is to it. Uh, definitely on your exam, you will see a question about alias or you'll see that example. So definitely want to know how to do that, okay? Hey, it's Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. And in this follow along, we're going to be covering all the different types of meta arguments, okay? So what I'm going to do is just CD into the directory I created for our first one, uh, meta arguments depends on. And we're going to take a look at this. As always, we're going to create ourselves a new main.tf file as soon as I can find uh, <laughs> the correct folder here. So we'll say main.tf. And I'm just going to go to my variable outputs and just grab some existing code to save myself some time. I think everything is self-contained into this subdirectory here. So I'm just going to go ahead and grab that there. And I'm just going to take out some of the code that I do not need. Um, so we have an instance type, which is fine. Um, we don't have, we don't need that. We don't need validation. We don't need to put the description in there. Um, we have this big old one here for the AMI. And what I'm gonna do here is I just want to uh, specify an AMI manually just to make our lives a bit easier. So I'm here and I'm just going to go and launch a new instance, not for real, but I just want to go ahead and grab this ID here. And what we will do is go back here and paste that on in. And I'm just going to hard code, hard code the instance type T2 micro. Oops. And I'm going to scroll up, take out this instance type variable. Okay, and so then we get a very small file, makes our life a lot easier. And so as always, we need to do our Terraform init. And that's going to initialize our backend there. And we saw it depends on earlier. It wasn't super complicated how it worked. It was just that if you wanted something to be uh, wait for the creation of something before you do something else, that's what it would do. So I think in this case, what we should do is make an S3 bucket. So we'll say, and I got some old tabs here, so we'll just close these out. And we'll just say like um, AWS S3 bucket Terraform. And these aren't really related in terms of their use cases, but just the fact that we can set this on anything. So 
what I'm gonna do is go ahead and grab myself a, uh, this code here. And I'm not sure how that happens. Let's close that out there. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and paste in this S3 bucket here. And this is like having a unique name. So you have to provide something that is, um, well, I guess we can just call this bucket. But here, this is like having a domain name. So I would strongly recommend to be very unique here. So I'm just gonna pound in a bunch of numbers and just say, um, depends on, because I don't want anyone to be using that. I don't need to private. I don't need to set any tags. And that should be enough. But what I wanna say is that I want the uh, bucket to only be created after the AWS instance is created, okay? So if I go here and put depends on, okay? And then we say AWS instance, uh, my server. So now it has to wait for the server to be provisioned before it provisions the Terraform or the uh, AWS bucket there. So we'll go Terraform plan. And if we just expand this a bit, we'll see that it will create our instance and then our server. You know, I'm actually curious is what would happen if I was to take this and paste it here? Would the order change in the plan? Would it actually show in order of creation or is it just saying these are all the resources and what we're actually gonna see is after the fact, like what order it will create it in. So I go here. Okay, so I guess it doesn't really matter. It's just the order that it appears in or not necessarily just, all right, I was just curious about that. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and say Terraform apply, auto approve, and we'll let that go ahead and provision. And so if we go over to our AWS account here and we go over to S3, Okay, and you'll notice that it's not creating the bucket as of yet. And as we watch our input here, notice that it's creating the AWS instance first, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to wait for this to finish and then I'll see you back here, okay? Okay, after a short little wait, we can see that uh, it created our instance first and then our S3 bucket. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna tear this all down and hopefully it tears down no problem, but we'll say tear down, or sorry, terraform, uh, apply, uh, destroy, auto approve. And again, if you uh, find that too much to type, you can always just type in terraform destroy and then confirm the plan, but I like to do this all in one go. And so I'll see you back here in a moment once everything is destroyed, okay? All right, so after a short little wait there, uh, our server has been destroyed, our bucket has been destroyed. So now what we wanna see is if we were to take the depends on, and we are to move it um, down below here. We're obviously gonna have to change this because we can't self-reference ourselves, or we're gonna be an infinite loop, but we'll paste that in there and call this, whoops. <laughs> we'll call this uh, a uh, bucket here. And so what should happen is uh, when it does the Terraform apply, it should try to create the bucket first and then the instance, and we'll know that by the output here. So it doesn't like what I typed in this um, because I guess it didn't take what I typed. So we'll just scroll up here, paste that in, oops. Copy and paste when you're in Vim mode in VS Code is terrible. Okay, we'll hit up. And so now what we should see is the S3 bucket being created first, okay? So see that? The S3 bucket is being created first and then it's gonna create the instance. I'll see you when this is done creating uh, and then we'll just tear it down, okay? All right, so that's done there. And so let's go ahead and just tear that down because we're all done with it. And uh, I'm doing destroy auto approve. So that's just going to automate that process. And uh, you know, then I'll see you into the next follow along, okay? So see you there. All right, so we are on to learning about the meta argument called count. So this one is pretty simple. The idea is that we are going to provide a thing that says count here, and that's going to create additional uh, number of servers, okay? So what we will do is we will go to our depends on here code that we were just working on. 
I'm going to copy it and I'm going to paste it into a new file here called main.tf in this new folder. And uh, there's a few things we don't need. We don't need this S3 bucket. Whoops, I don't know what I keep on pressing to do that. Probably the side here, but um, we'll take this out and we'll take out our depends on. And so what we're going to do is specify a count. I want two instances. And we are going to also make sure that we name this so that we know which server we're looking at. And we're gonna say server, um, we'll do interpolation and we'll do count.index. And so that should be good. And what we'll have to do is just do one or zero to get that public IP address. So uh, what we'll do now is go ahead and switch folders. It's very important make sure you're in the right folder. I do that all the time where I'm in the wrong folder here. Whoops. So we'll do 051 for mine. Again, it might be different if I update the, the numbers when I do publish uh, this course. We'll do terraform init as always. And then once that is done, and that should not take too long, we'll do ourselves a Terraform apply, and we will carefully look to see if it's actually gonna provision two instances, okay? So this shouldn't take too long, the init. Just depends on how much work it has to do to fetch that information. Great, so now what we can do is do a Terraform apply, and I'm just going to expand this up here so that we have a better opportunity to look at it. Apparently I've introduced an error, so maybe it's tags or tags. Um, so we'll try that. I think they show it here on the page. So yeah, it's with, it's plural, okay. And so what I wanna do is just make sure that we're gonna have two instances. So it'll scroll all the way to the top here. It says server one server zero. So it is doing that. So that's pretty good. So we'll type in yes. And that's going to go ahead and create those two instances. So I'll see you back here when it's done. Okay. All right. So after a little wait there, um, both of our instances have created. So what I'm going to do is make my way over to our uh, EC2 console here, give it a refresh. And I want to see that there are two servers running. Notice one is zero and one is one. And I want to show you our outputs because in our outputs, we said that we wanted the uh, instance that is index one. So that's server one here. And its public IP address is 54.242.81.205. And so that is what we get there. And so um, that's pretty much all there really is to this. I think it might be interesting to show splat to see if it works here. So I wanna see if I can get all the uh, IDs returned. So I'm gonna just try, or public IPs. So I'm gonna give that a go and see if that'll work. And so what we'll do is Terraform apply, uh, or not apply, we'll do, yeah, apply, and we'll just say only refresh because we don't need to reprovision our resources. We just want to see if we can update our outputs there. And this is an opportunity to show off splat. Uh, maybe it's refresh only. And uh, notice here that the outputs is gonna turn, uh, change to a list, so we'll say yes. And so now if we do Terraform output, okay, we should get a, um, a list back here. We say public IPs, right? Whoops, public IP. I don't think we can do this, but I'm just curious if I was to do this, would this work? No, it does not. Okay, so yeah, um, you can get the ball back and you use splats and uh, we'll talk about splats later, but that's uh, all there is for now for this, okay? Oh, and as always, I forgot to uh, destroy our instances there. So let's just type in Terraform, um, apply, auto approve, destroy, and then we are all in good shape, okay? So yeah, just make sure you destroy those instances. All right, so now we're going to learn about the for each. So um, what I'm gonna do is just copy the count because they're kind of similar, okay? Uh, and so what I'll do is create a new file here and we'll call this main.tf. We'll paste in the contents here. So the difference is that instead of using a count, what we're gonna do is use an object to iterate through and change you know, some particular properties. So what we can do is maybe change the size of the instance. So we say nano, micro might be an example here. T2 micro, T2 uh, micro, I should have made the first one nano there. And I could even do a small, I suppose. 
And so instead of the instance type um, being set here, what we're going to do is just say uh, each dot value. And then for the server name, we'll do each dot key. Now, this splat's not going to work for um, a map because that's what this is. This is a map data structure, and splats only really work with lists. So what we can do is use the values function to extract, because this, this would return, if you just had this my server, this is going to be a, a map, okay? So what we can do is just put the parentheses around here, and that will turn into a list um, at just the values, and then we should be able to get our public IP address that way, I think. So what we'll do is make sure we're in the right folder first. That's always important. Can tell you how many times I messed that up. We'll do our Terraform init to get things going. And you know we might not even necessarily need to apply this as long as the plan looks good. Because if this was not correct, this part here would probably error out. Like I definitely would. Okay, but we just wanna see that when we do a plan that this, that this is correct. Great, so what we'll do here is now type in Terraform plan. And so we have an error here. I think it's because it's supposed to be values, not value. So I'll just correct that there. And these are all like built-in functions. So we go to, while we're waiting for that plan to generate there, I'll try to show this to you quickly. Built-in functions, not here. So we would just type in Terraform built-in functions. And probably under collections, that's where these things become very useful, These all these functions here. And so values is the one we just use here for the map. So I'm sure there's other ones that would uh, come into play. So now if we just scroll up, what I wanna see is that we have three instances. So notice here, the public IP is gonna give us three back, which looks correct to me. The first one is server small. Notice that it's a T2 small. We have our, oh, this has TC small as well. Nano, and then that says small. Hmm. And if we go up to this one here, this is micro. So micro, that makes sense. Maybe I just entered the value in incorrectly and maybe you're watching me this entire time. Yeah, I did. So this is just supposed to be nano up here. And so we'll run that again. I have to say, I really don't like how plans are laid out. I find them a little bit hard to read, but um, I guess it's just the level of complexity you have. So there's not a, a lot of ways around that. So we have the T2 small, the T2 nano, and the uh, T2 micro. Notice it doesn't really respect the ordering of this. They're all just kind of there in the plan. But yeah, so that would definitely work. I, I'm not gonna run this. I'm gonna consider this done and we can move on to the next part here, okay? Sorry, I, I uh, killed the screen there a little bit earlier. We have to specify the uh, region again. So we'll just say um, US East 1 because it needs to know where to take those, uh, take those operations. And so it says you can apply this plan. Did I not, did I not, uh, oh, <laughs> sorry. I guess I hit up. I really shouldn't have done that. So we'll try this again. So we'll say Terraform apply uh, auto approve hit up on my arrow and it was going to an old one, which was uh, bad on me here. So we'll try that. And so we have an error here. The image ID does not exist. The image ID does not exist. And it's showing the uh, same one here. This is my East server. And this one is my West server. So that's kind of interesting because that should be right. Again, I don't know if it's because we're doing that weird alias. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna copy this here and give us back our default provider. And I'm gonna try that again and see if that resolves our issue. Again, we're using a data source, so there's no reason it should not be able to find it because it's, it's pulling it based on the, uh, the uh, alias there, right? Eh? Unless I don't understand how data sources work and I have to set the provider for it as well.
it looks like it's working, so I'll see you here in a bit unless we have an error, okay? All right, so we gave it another go and we're getting this error again, but I mean, it shouldn't be too hard to try to figure this out because it's looking for Amazon 2 AMI HVM. And you know, if we are in uh, AWS here, we should be able to figure it out. Like this one's the HVM up here. So that's what it's pretty much selecting. So we should be able to go to one of those regions and just confirm what it is we're looking at. So this one here is for West. It didn't complain about East, but maybe it didn't ever got to East, it just ran West first and it complained. But here it says that it completed the creation of it. So let's go first check out if that instance actually exists. I assume that uh, it does not, but maybe it does. Whoops. And so we have our East server and that one worked out fine. And then if we go over to our West server here, it doesn't exist. So that's a bit curious to me. Um, I'm just gonna check to see if that, uh, that uh, AMI actually exists in the Oregon region. I, I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't. It's right here, AMI 0C2D. And we look at this and it doesn't say that. It has uh, something that says 00DFE. So what I want to do is scroll up here and look at my plan and see what it did. So for West, it's using 00DFE, that's fine. And then for East, it's using the exact same thing. So maybe it's my own mistake here. Let's just go double check here. Um, no, it looks correct. So I guess I'll do a little bit more investiga investigation. I'll be back here in a second, okay? All right, so I'm not sure why this isn't working as expected because um, as I read, the data source is supposed to be agnostic. It shouldn't matter uh, where it's coming from here. And it should uh, take into account the uh, provider here. The only thing I saw that somebody was doing different was doing interpolation around here. So maybe we'll give that a go and see if that makes a difference. I don't see why that would matter, but uh, we're just grasping at stuff here. Okay. And we'll just try this one more time and see if that actually succeeds, okay? I think we might have to enter uh, where we want that. Maybe not because we provided the default provider there. Okay, and it still has this problem, all right. So, I mean, I don't feel like I should have to do this, but I'm gonna do this anyway to see if it resolves the issue. What I'm gonna do is just copy this and make a second one. And let's see if that resolves the issue because these are supposed to be looking uh, in that particular area where that resource is. And I, just to double check here, we have uh, USC's two here. You know what I'm curious about? I wonder if it's just using the data source for the provider. So I'm just gonna undo that for a second. And what I'm gonna say here is I'm gonna set the uh, default to be USC East one. And we will try this again. And let's see if East and West fails because that would be very interesting if that happened, eh? And we could probably just figure it out by looking at the uh, plan file. So here that is changing. And so what I'm gonna do is just scroll all the way to the top here. And I wanna see what it's gonna be set as if it's still the same value or it's a different value. Um, and I can't really tell, I guess we'll just have to wait for that to provision. So I'll, I'll see you back here in a bit. All right, so after a little bit of digging, I looked at the actual uh, sources here and says for selecting a non-default provider configuration, you use the provider option. So, you know, a lot of people were saying that they're agnostic and that's how I thought they worked, but I guess you do have to specify the provider. So I suppose we will just have to duplicate this twice. All right, so that was kind of an interesting investigation, something we can uh, try to remember for later. So this would be East and this would be West. And so I'll just have to specify the provider here and we'll just say AWS West. And for this one, we'll say AWS East. And then we'll scroll down below. And so I don't think we need the interpolation here. I will we'll leave it in, it's not a big deal. Um, where did we put the name? Oh, right in front of it, okay, great. So we'll do East here. We will do West here. Okay. 
Try this again, west here. Oops, that's the east one. And then there's the west one here. Okay, great. And so we'll try this again. And so I think this time we're gonna get what we want. So, I mean, that's really interesting that if you don't provide a provider, you have to choose um, an operation uh, for it to happen. And um, it's great to know that uh, you, know, you have to set providers for data sources, but you know, you learn these things pretty quick because when you get into practical applications, you start uh, intersecting with those things. But I'll see you back here in a moment when this is successful, okay? All right, great. So it says those have been provisioned. So what I'm gonna do is pull up AWS here and we are going to make our way over to here. And I'm gonna go over to US West one, I think we set it to, I can't remember. And so we should have an instance there, great. And we'll make our way over to US East two. And we have our server there, great. So that's all we wanted to learn here. So I'm gonna go ahead and just tear this down. So we'll say, Terraform, apply, destroy, auto approve. And we are good to go. See that it runs here for a little bit and then I'm just going to stop here. Great, and I will see you in the next follow along. All right, so uh, we're gonna learn all about alias. And so what I'm going to do is create a new file here in our next folder, main.tf. I'm gonna make sure I'm in that correct directory 053 is what I have right now. It might be different for you later on in the course. And so what I wanna do is go to my, uh, anything like maybe count here and grab this one because I'm just going to update this EC2 instance for our alias. And we're actually gonna have two instances. Okay, we're gonna have uh, an east and a west. So I'm gonna say east and west. And I'm just gonna change this here to my server my west server, my east server. And what we can do here is just bring this down. And the whole point of this tutorial is to show you about aliases. So here we can go alias and we'll call this east. And we'll have, I don't know if we can do this, but I'm gonna try anyway, I actually never tried. But I wonder if we can have a, um, like a provider that has no default, like where it does not have an alias because I think that'd be a really great way to be very explicit. So here we have our instance. I want this to be the East server. And then I want to have a West server. And then for our server name, this will be server East. And for this one, it'll be server West. And so then we'll add in our provider and this will be AWS West. And then for this one, it'll be AWS East. The only thing here is the AMI is not gonna be any good to us. So what we can do is go grab some code. So here, uh, this is like HashiCorp supports Terraform 2, Amazon Linux 2. And so here's the code that we need to pull that. So what I'm gonna do is just go ahead and uh, grab this AWS AMI here. Okay, and I'm just going to paste this above our instance here. And so that should grab that uh, that instance. We're gonna need the name. So I'm gonna go down here, just paste this line here and we'll just modify it. So it's AWS, Amazon Linux 2. It has to start with data because it's a data source. Oops, we don't wanna change our instance type. That's a mistake. We want to uh, do that for the AMI here. Okay, and we'll go down and replace it for both, because we both want them on Amazon Linux too, but this way it'll pull the correct AMI. So we have server east, server west, we have the east and west public IP. So it generally looks good. Um, I don't know if this is gonna error out, but I guess we will find out. So as always, we'll do a Terraform init. All right, and so now that Terraform init is done, we are going to do a Terraform plan. Uh, and see if that works. And so notice it says the region where AWS operations will take place. 
So um, I guess what we'll do is set it as US East one because we have two resources set um, provider AWS region because we set the provider explicitly in both. I'm kind of curious what would happen because it's saying US East one, US East two, and that's something I didn't specify. Um, what I want to do is I just want to be even more particular and set one provider that is totally, and by the way, this is supposed to be West. That's a mistake. I'm just going to set it to something uh, that I know is very different. Okay. So instead of East and West, we'll just change this a little bit. So how about we'll do US West one and then US East two, which is a little bit different. And we'll do that because I want to see what it prompts. So we'll just say US East one here. And so the arguments owners is required, but no definition was found in our data source, which I'm kind of surprised because we copied that straight from um, HashiCorp. So maybe it's just an old article or maybe I did not copy that particular line. So it should say who the owner is. Yeah, see so we're like owner alias, but that's fine. We can just look it up here because here it says owners and we can just specify that as Amazon. It's not a big deal. The real challenge to Terraform is just dealing with the, the changes. It's, but I mean, like it's pretty, pretty powerful system. So you just get kind of used to it. So I'm just gonna try to fix that indentation. I don't know if we need that owner alias there if we have uh, owners up here, but we'll try this anyway and see what happens. Okay. I mean, the major regions for North America is either uh, US East one or US West two. So that kind of makes sense. Uh, incorrect attribute value type. So we have AWS instance US West data dot AWS AMI is an object with a, a multiple attributes. So I think the thing is, is that we just had to specify its ID because that's actually returning the AMI and it's just not gonna infer it. So that's just my mistake as per usual. So we'll just go there and place in the ID. Um, so what we'll do is we'll just take a look here and see if it's going to provision in the right place. So this looks all good. Um, so let's just go ahead and pull the trigger and see how it goes. Hey, it's Andrew Brown from exam pro and we are on to our life cycle for the resource meta arguments. So what I'm going to do here is just pull up the documentation so we can just take a look. Uh, an example for this. So it's under providers, or sorry, it's under resources, meta arguments, life cycle. And so you have this option where you can kind of set the behavior of it. Um, we covered this in the lecture content. So like create before destroy. So by default, when Terraform must change a resource argument that cannot be updated in place, uh, Terraform will instead destroy the existing object, then create a new replacement, such as like create before destroy, or maybe prevent destroy would be more interesting to do and a lot simpler to do. So that's what we'll do. We'll just set ourselves a life cycle thing. But what I'm going to do is make my way over to one of our pre previous examples. A, uh, an easy one to pull from right now is still count because it's very easy to modify. So I'm gonna copy the contents of that. And what I'm going to do here is open this up and make a new main.tf. And we will paste that on in here. And apparently I did not copy it. I don't know, for me, like coding in VS Code is like coding with like oven mitts on. It's really hard. I wish I could just use full Vim, but we're on a Windows machine, so you don't get to see the full power of my coding. Um, so what we'll do here is get rid of that count because we only need a single instance here. And uh, we'll just simplify this to my server. And we'll just change this back to my server. And so we are going to specify lifecycle And I think it's just destroy, but let's just go double check or prevent destroy maybe. We go over here. Actually, it's a Boolean. So it's probably life cycles a block. Yeah, it's a block. Okay.
and we'll say true. So we should be able to create this instance, but when we go and try to destroy it, that's where we're going to uh, see the effect of this service. So I'm gonna make sure I cd into that directory that I just created with that new file, and we're gonna do a terraform init. And so we did our terraform init, but what we're going to do is do a terraform plan. Actually, we'll just do apply because I have a lot of confidence in what I wrote here. If it blows up in our face, it blows up and we'll just correct it here, but I'm pretty sure that this is gonna work out pretty okay. And so we will let this provision and I'll see you back here in a moment, okay? Great, so that looks like it's successfully provisioned. And so let's go ahead and try to do a destroy. And so we'll do a terraform apply and we'll say destroy and auto approve. And then we'll see what happens here because that life cycle should uh, prevent it from being destroyed. And so there it says resource ABUS instance, my server life cycle prevent destroy set. But the plan calls for this resource to be destroyed to avoid this error, continue with the plan either disable it or reduce the scope of the plan using the target. So what I'm going to do here is put false and then we'll try this again. And it should destroy the instance and if that's the case, then uh, what we can do is we'll just end here and we'll move on to our next stuff. But yeah, it looks like it's destroying, so we are in good shape. Okay, so there we go. All right, so we're starting our introduction here into Terraform expressions because there's a lot we can talk about here. So expressions are used to refer to or, com or compute values within a configuration. So Terraform expressions is a large topic and we'll be covering types and values, strings and templates, reference to values, operators, function calls, conditional expressions, for expressions, uh, splat, dynamic blocks, type constraints. Actually, I don't think we covered type constraints just because there's nothing really to say about it, but we definitely cover version constraints. So yeah, let's start off the section and go to it. So we're taking a look here at types and values for expressions. And so the result of an expression is a value and all values have types. And so we have primitive types, no type, and complex structural collection types. That last one is a bit more complicated than what we are presenting here, but we're gonna simplify it and then cover it later, okay? So for primitive types, we have string. So you have your uh, double quotations, which represent your string. Then you have numbers, so this can be uh, integers or floats. Then you have Booleans, so this is either true or false. For no types, we have null. Uh, and so null uh, is different in all different types of languages. So it's very important to understand how it works. And so null represents absence or omission when you want to use the underlying default of a provider's resource configuration option. So when you're saying null doesn't mean it's nothing, it's gonna be whatever the default is. Um, and the default also could be nothing. It's just depending on what that is on the provider. So for collection or for collection types, complex structural types, we have list or tuple, and this generally looks like an array. Then you have map and object, and this looks like basically like a JSON object or um, a Ruby hash, or I think they call it in Python a dictionary. Uh, so that gives you an idea of the basic types. But for this last one here, because this I found really confusing, list tuples, map object, we definitely explain this more in the course, okay? <laughs> Okay, so we're giving a little bit more attention to the string type because there's a little bit more going on here. So when quoting strings, you gotta use double quotes. Uh, at one point, Terraform, I believe, supported single quotes. I think it only supports double quotes now. And honestly, you generally wanna just use double quotes because double quotes always support escape sequences. This is pretty much standard across all programming languages. Um, but the idea here is you can do things like new line, uh, carriage return, tab, literal quotes literal backslashes, Unicode characters, both uh, basic multilingual plane and supplementary planes. Um, there are some special escape sequences. This makes sense when we look at the next slide for uh, string templates, uh, but there's these things where you can do interpolation. And so you might not want to actually do them. You might want to um, uh, do it without. And so if you just use double of the symbol, that will allow you to do it. Um, then there is also the ability to have multi-line strings and we use here doc for that. And so here doc is a little bit different in all languages, but here we're using Unix style. So that means that we're gonna start with these two angled brackets to the left. 
our opening angle brackets, followed by some word that is all in uppercase. It doesn't have to be EOT. It could be whatever you want. Uh, I always like to type here doc, and then it has to end uh, at the same indentation level with the same uh, word all uppercase. And then everything in between will be treated as, um, as multi-line. The nice thing about this is that when you have this, you can actually just use double quotes wherever you want because you don't have to escape them, okay? Let's take a look at string templates because this is the real power of strings. So the first is string interpolation, and this allows you to evaluate an expression between the markers. So the idea is instead of having to do double quotations and do plus signs to stitch together uh, strings, what you do is just do a dollar sign uh, curly braces and then put the, the expression or variable that you want uh, to be uh, uh, converted, okay? Then you have string directives, and these are slightly different. This allows you to evaluate an expression uh, for a conditional logic between the markers. So uh, let's say we want to have an if else statement. So if the name is blank, um, then use var name, or sorry, if it's not blank, then use the name provided. Otherwise, put it as unnamed, okay? You can also use interpolation directives with here docs. So, you know, just to show that you can do it. Um, and then the last one thing here is you can uh, stri uh, strip out white space that would normally be left by directives blocks by providing a trailing tilde. Um, so just notice this little tilde here on the end because these do take up space. So if you were to view it, there'd just be an empty space there. If you want that space to vanish, then you just put that tilde on the end. So there you go. Let's take a look here at the possible operators that we can use within Terraform expressions. And so just a refresher, operators are mathematical operations you can perform to numbers within expressions. I'm not going to show full examples here and the outputs of them because this is pretty common for programming or scripting languages. And also the exam's not really gonna focus on uh, the use cases for these. So it's just more so to tell you what is available to you so you know what you can use. The first is multiplication. So you take two numbers and times them to get a larger number. Division, so it uses a uh, forward slash. Modulus, um, and if you've never used modulus, I really like this. It allows you to see if something is divisible by a certain amount and then you get the remainder. You have addition, subtraction. Uh, if you need to flip to a negative number, you can just put a minus sign in front of it. If you need to do um, equals, it's doubles. If you want to do does not equal, it's exclamation equals. Then we have a less than, so that's a uh, open angled bracket, less than or equal. So that will be followed by an equal sign. Greater than is a closing angled bracket and then followed by an equal sign for greater than or equal. You have or which uses the double pipes. You have n which uses the double ampersands. If you need to flip a Boolean, you can just put an exclamation in front of it. So if it was true, now it is false. If it was false, now it is true. I'm not sure what it would do for null. I would think that it would turn it to um, true. But uh, yeah, so there you go. We're taking a look here at conditional expressions, and this is pretty much the only way that you can do if-else statements uh, within Terraform, but it works out fine. And so it, it's actually using the ternary style of if-else. So what that looks like, it's a single line. So the it starts with a question mark, so that's the if, and then it's the true value, and then the colon represents the else, and then you have your false value. It's ternary because there's three things, one, two, and three, okay? So that's the way I remember uh, this thing. It's not a, uh, a preferred way of doing if-else statements in other languages um, because it is a little bit uh, condensed, but it makes sense when you're using scripting language and you're really restricted on per-line actions. So this is what it would look like in action. So we'd have a variable that is A. If A does not equal uh, blank, then use uh, the variable or set it to default A as a string. So that's kind of an example there. Just wipe that away there. The return type of it uh, of of the if and else must be the same type. So if you have a number, okay, and the one if statement, and then you have a string, they have to be the same. So uh, obviously we want a string to be returned in both cases. So what we'll do is use this built-in function to string to turn this into a string so that we're not going to run into any problems. So there you go. All right, we're taking a look here at four expressions. And so these allow you to iterate over a complex type and apply transformations. A four expression can accept as input list, set, tuple, map, or an object. I want to distinguish this between for each, which is a resource meta argument, which allows you to iterate over a, uh, a resource or a collection of resources. 
um, that are similar, but four expressions are for these primitive types, or not these primitive types, but these uh, collection structural types that we talked about in types and values, okay? So here's an example of something we might wanna do. Imagine we have a list of names and we want to iterate through our list and up, make them all uppercase. So we could do that with this four. So we have the four with the in and then we're providing the value of each item in our list. Uh, it's easy to think of list or tuple as an array. So I'll just call it an array, okay? Then you have a map. Uh, and so this is where it has a key and value. This is gonna be for maps or objects. And the idea is that we can then go apply transformations and notice that we are returning only a single string. So we're actually gonna get back something like a tuple. And so how does it decide whether it returns a, um, a array or something that looks like an object? We'll explain that here in a moment. The last one here is we have a list with an index. So it's very similar to the first one, but in this case, uh, we want to know the uh, index here. So imagine this says zero is Andrew, uh, one is Cindy, uh, two is Peter, and it would come back as an array or list. So let's talk about the return types. The return types are defined by the um, uh, the braces or brackets that are around the actual expression. So if you have square braces, we're going to get back a tuple. So let's just think of an array. So for in this case where we had our uh, list, um, it was returning back a tuple, okay? If we have curly braces, it's going to return an object. So here we have a, a list, so it's like an array that's coming in here, and then we are specifying as the return uh, this kind of object structure. And so that's how we're gonna get that. So that's that. Uh, there's one other thing we wanna mention, which has to do with um, uh, reducing or ordering. So an if statement can be used uh, to reduce the amount of elements returned. So uh, in this case, what we're doing is we're using an if statement. And so we're saying, unless this is true. So if this is true, then return. If it's not, then uh, return less of what is there. So if there's any blank names that are in our list, they just won't show up. It'll just only show names that are actually there. Um, then we have implicit element ordering. So since Terraform can convert an unordered type, so map objects and sets to an order type, list or tuples, it will need to choose an implied ordering. So for maps and objects, they're stored by key A to Z, set of strings stored by uh, 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 strings A to Z, everything else is gonna be arbitrary ordering. So there you go. All right, we're taking a look here at Splat Expressions, and these provide a shorter expression for the for expression, which we just looked at. So what is a Splat operator? A Splat operator is represented by an asterisk. It originates from the Ruby language, and Splats in Terraform are used to roll up or soak up a bunch of iterations in a for expression. So here is an example where it's for list sets or tuples. So here we have a list. And the idea is that we're iterating over uh, this ID, or in this case, we're iterating over um, it's objects, or sorry, an uh, array, and then that array is containing a bunch of objects, and so we're accessing the name within it. And so instead of writing it like that, uh, we don't even have to use a for at all. What we can do is put this asterisk here, and this is going to equate to the same thing. So here, this is gonna return all the IDs, and in this case, it's going to return a, uh, all the lists and allow us to access um, the interfaces uh, along to the name, okay? So let's take a look. Um, at splat expressions uh, when we're applying them to lists. So if the value is anything other than a null value, then the splat expression will transform it into a single element list. If the value is null, then the expression, uh, the then the splat expression will return an empty tuple. And so this behavior is useful for modules that accept optional input variables whose default value is null to represent the absence of any value to adapt the variable value to work with other Terraform language features that are designed to work with collections. So I know that's a big mouthful. It's just kind of like an, uh, an edge case to these uh, splat expressions. This is not gonna show up in the exam, but I just wanted to show it to you in case you're interested here and just notice the splats being used over here, okay? So we're taking a look here at dynamic blocks and this allows you to dynamically construct repeatable nested blocks. So I wanna emphasize that this is a very powerful feature that can lead to abuse where your code becomes uh, difficult to read, but it's also very flexible. It will absolutely show up in the exam, so pay close attention on how this works. So let's say you needed to create a bunch of ingress rules for your EC2 security group. Uh, and so this would lead to a lot of repeatable elements for rules within your uh, resource. And so what you can do with dynamic blocks is you can define objects uh, locally. So here I have my ingress rules as an object. So here's one and here is two. And then using dynamic block, what I can do is use a for each to reference those ingress rules. 
And within this dynamic ingress block, uh, we will have our content and this will specify the things that we're swapping out. So the idea is that it will iterate over this and apply all those values there. So it's something you can't uh, do with a for each or account. This is basically the, uh, the most advanced uh, iteration, but just understand if you remember this use case and it's very easy to understand or remember uh, how to use it uh, when you're doing your exam, okay? <laughs> We're looking at version constraints. So Terraform utilizes semantic versioning for specifying Terraform providers and module versions. So semantic versioning is an open standard on how to define versioning for software management. So you have your major, minor, and your uh, patch. And so here are examples or variants on this here. So we have, um, you know, where you see major, minor, then you can have this RC, this RC1, or you could not have it, or you can have beta. And this can all be read about on the samver.org, but just to quickly go through it, major version is when you want to make incompatible API changes. Minor is when you add functionality that is backwards compatible in matter. Patch is when you make backwards compatible bug fixes. There are additional labels for pre-release, build, metadata that are available as extensions. So that's where we see um, uh, those little uh, additions there at the top. A version constraint is a string containing one or more conditions separated by commas. So you have your equals uh, or no operators, or sorry, your <laughs> equals or no operators. So match exact version of the number. So it's either with the equals or not with the operator at all. Okay, that's what I'm trying to write there. Excludes an exact number uh, version. So if we just said does not or will not be 1.0.0. Uh, then you have a comparative one. So they have, the version has to be greater or equal to 1.0.0. Um, and then we have one with the tilde. So allows only the rightmost version of the last number to increment. So what this means is that the, the, the last number here um, is only allowed to increment, okay? So let's talk about progressive versioning because this kind of ties into semantic uh, versioning. But progressive versioning is the practice of using the latest version to keep a proactive stance of security, modernity, and development agility. And we like to describe this as practicing good hygiene when we're uh, working with our code, okay? So by being up to date, you're always pushing left on things that need to uh, stay fixed or compatible. Uh, you will have to deal with smaller problems instead of dealing with a big problem later on. Uh, run nightly builds is a good example where you might have golden images and the idea is to provide a warning signal just to kind of elaborate on that a nightly build is an automated workflow that uh, occurs at night when developers are asleep so if the build breaks because a change is required for the code the developers will see this upon arrival in the morning and be able to budget accordingly so what i'm trying to get at is that when you are uh like putting in your providers especially if you copy from the terraform um the Terraform website to get the providers and modules, what they'll do is they'll actually have it set as the, I'm just gonna roll back here for a second, but they'll actually have it set as the equals. But what I'm saying to you is you want to use something like a tilde or a greater than or equal sign so that you are staying progressive, okay? So that's just one thing I want you to watch out for. And we will talk about that when we go through the follow alongs, okay? <laughs> Hey, it's Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are moving on to our expression section, starting with string templates. So let's learn all about that. And we are going to have to CD into a new folder here. So I have one called expressions, and we will make ourselves a new file called main.tf. We will uh, define a local backend, and I'm gonna just define a new variable. I'm gonna call this variable hello, and I'm going to give it a type of string. Okay, and that's all I'm gonna do there. And then what we're gonna do is create ourselves a TF var file. So we'll say terraform.tf vars. And in there, we'll just set hello to world. And so what I wanna do is enter terraform console. Okay, this is going to allow us to just run arbitrary expressions. I wanna show you how you quit it. You just type exit. And so what we'll do is make a string. So we'll just first do a hello world. I wanna show you that you can put a, uh, a new line there and we'll get back a multi-line document. There, this is a, um, this console doesn't allow for multiple lines so we can't write our own here doc, but I can show you what it looks like. And then we can interpolate a, uh, a variable there. So we'll just say hello. And notice we get hello world. So that's how interpolation works. It's not super complicated. Uh, directives is a little bit different um, where we have string Right, so we can do instead this. 
but um, the control word's a bit different because you're using the uh, this um, percentage sign, the directives, when you're doing something like an if else statement. So what we could do is say something like um, Barsoon here. Okay. And what I'm going to do is just exit out here, clear. So I don't know if it um, it reloads the uh, the variables there if you just change them on the fly. But what we'll do is we'll just say hello and we will write ourselves um, an if statement. So we're going to say if var dot hello equals bar soon. What it's going to do is then print out. Um, it's going to instead print out Mars. OK. Otherwise, what we're going to get is um, world, okay? And you know what's really interesting is we're using the if and else here, but I, I could have swore that the only thing you had was ternary operators. So like if you look at the um, conditional expressions, notice here that it's doing this and it's not showing the documentation, the if else. So you know, maybe um, maybe that's just for a one-liner and if else does exist for expressions, and I might have missed that in the course, but uh, you cannot blame me if the documentation shows it like that, okay? So what I'm going to do here is just go ahead and hit enter, and here we get Hello Mars. So that pretty much uh, shows you how um, string interpolation works um, for both interpolation and directives. We'll just type in exit, and so that's all we want to do there, okay? All right, so let's learn about four expressions. So four expressions allow us to kind of iterate over something and do something fun with it. And so what we're going to do is create ourselves um, some more complex types here. So how about instead of like, this was just hello a second ago, but we'll change this over to worlds. And what I'm gonna do is just list out a bunch of worlds here from the uh, the book, uh, you know, John Carter books. So we have Barsoon, we have Jasum, we have things like Sassoon, okay? And then we have, whoops, Sassoon, and then we have something like Kosum, okay? And so the idea here is, now that we've defined that there, we gotta go back to our main TF. I'm just going to update this to be uh, worlds. This will just be a list, all right? And so what we'll do is make our way over to Terraform Cloud, or sorry, Terraform Console, and we'll try to do a for loop here. So I'm gonna do square braces for, and we'll just say w in var dot worlds. And then what we can do here is make a colon, whoops. Okay, and then type upper w. And so that returns them all in uppercase there. And if we were to use the splat operator, and technically this is something we want to move on to the next part, but um, uh, yeah, we'll leave it for the next video. I'll just keep that separate. So that is for just if we had a list. Imagine if we had this as the as an index here, um, or we'll say map, because what we can do is actually map these two names. So we'll bring this down here. And this would be earth. Now you can use the colon or the equals, it's just whatever you wanna use here. They're both supported. Actually, this is an earth, this is Mars. And then this one here is earth. And this one here would be Jupiter. And then this one here would be Venus. Okay. Um, and so I think we still need to define it over here. So I'm just going to say worlds map. And then what we can do here, instead of having list, we can say map. And we'll try to iterate over this. So it's going to be very similar, except the difference is now we have a key and we have a value. And so if we just want to return the names in capital, we can just do K here. Oh, that's the index. Uh, what if we do? Oh, you know why? It's because um, 
we have to do world's map. Okay. So reference to undeclared variable map. So we do have to exit and restart. And, oh, sorry, the input was complaining there. So I'll just copy the one up here so I don't have to type it again. Nope, it did not work as we thought. Okay, so I do have to type it by hand. Kind of a pain, but I guess that's just how it works. So we'll say 4kv in var dot worlds map. And then we can say upper v here. Okay, or we could just say take the k here and get the other values. Now, I didn't show you this a moment ago, but if we do worlds here, uh, we can specify an index, and an index would come first, so it would be the value, like the world is second, and the index is first. So notice that i is all a number, the index of it, and then the, that is the value there. Um, we could probably also return this as a map. So notice that square braces are going to give you a list, or, uh, and then uh, curlies are going to give you a map, which kind of correspond to their actual data structure. So if we wanted to turn this into... Uh, the opposite here, what we could do is just say, uh, we could probably do string interpolation like this here and do i and then do equals or even maybe uh, a colon here and then do the world like that. And it didn't like the way I specified it, so I'll try it like this instead. Um, extra characters after the line four. So I don't see that wrong there. Just give me a moment. I think, um, oh, you know what? It's We need to use, in this case, I think we have to do it this way. Okay, so we use, use the hash rocket. So in that particular case, you have to use the hash rocket. That's what that symbol is called, the equal zero. Um, and so that's how we can get that value there. So that pretty much outlines how to use um, the for loops. And next, we're going to go probably look at the splats, okay? So I'll see you back here in a moment. I'm just going to exit this. Actually, before we move on to splats, I just want to add one more thing to four expressions, which is filtering. So we'll just go back here and get back into our Terraform console here. And uh, what I'm going to do is just write another four. And it probably would make sense to use the, uh, the, the worlds list we just did there. So I'm going to do kv. Uh, type in var worlds map. And so the idea here is that I only want the, um, let's say, we'll say the upper, I only want the uh, key value here, but I would just say at the end here, I can say if the v the value equals, and I can't remember what we set these as. So this is key and value. So if it is Mars, I think it's double equal. So if it is Mars, then only return it that way. Or we could say the opposite, say, give me everything but Mars. Okay, so I just wanted to show you, you could use that if to do that filtering. So I'm gonna exit there and we'll move on to splats, okay? All right, so we're moving on to splats and what we'll have to do is create ourselves a new um, variable here. I'm going to call this one worlds uh, splat, and this one is going to be a list. And so if we go back up here to TF vars, we'll make ourselves a new variable down here, and we'll just call this one splat. And it's going to be a list, but it's going to contain inside of it a bunch of maps. Okay, so we'll do pretty much this up here. Okay, um, but what's going to happen here is going to be slightly different, where we are going to set um, one is the name so we'll just say like um, earth name that's actually mars name so we'd say mars name here for all these and then over here these are going to be The earth name. So I think that is valid. And uh, what we're going to do here is just type in Terraform console. 
And if we wrote that correctly, oh, no, we got an error. So it says expected an equal sign to mark the beginning of a new attribute value. So, I mean, this should be okay. Uh, oh, you know what? I think this colon is just missing here. Put it up again. There we go. We're fine. So if we just want to look at that variable, I think we just type it in here and it might print it out. If we're lucky. Yes, so there it is. Um, so what we're going to do here is use a splat to get maybe the Mars name or something. So if we used a for loop, what we'd have to probably write, we could try this, um, but we'd have to do for, and then it would be for the actual uh, map. So say M for map in world's splat. And then we would have to do M dot Mars name. And so a reference to the attribute by the one access attribute specifying the resource name. So, I mean, that looks, oh, you know, it's because we didn't write var. Okay. I say we, but it was really me. Um, so, you know, that's that, but we could write this in a more concise way. Okay. And so we use a splat Mars name. Okay. So, you know, that's a lot more convenient if we're just trying to access variables like that. Um, I think that if you're trying to do things like if you want to do upper here, I think you still have to use a for expression. Okay, I don't think you can do this. We can try it, but I really don't think that will work. No. And if we look at the documentation, they don't show an example like that. So, you know, it's not that bad, but you can see that it's for a particular use case. You can't use that for um, maps or whatever the equivalent, the other map is object. Um, but uh, it's useful for this one particular use case. Okay. Hey, it's Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are on to the dynamic blocks follow along. So this one should be uh, pretty fun because it's uh, quite a powerful feature. Um, so what I've done is I've created a new folder here called dynamic blocks. I'm going to make a new file here. As always, it's going to be main.tf. And a really good example for this would probably be um, an AWS security group just because there's all those ingress and out, uh, outgress uh, or egress rules. So what we're going to do is just define our Terraform settings block. And I'm just going to pull up over here and make our way over to the registry for Terraform. And what we're gonna do is go over to the AWS provider and um, go to the documentation. And actually, I first wanna grab the provider itself because that is something very easy that we can do here. We'll just move that on over so we can see what we're doing and paste that on in. And uh, we're going to have to define our provider, of course. So we'll name that as AWS. The profile is going to be defaults. And our region will be US East 1. Okay, and so now what we need is to co create ourselves a security group. So we have, of course, done that uh, previously here, but let's pull up the uh, documentation here. I believe it was actually under VPC. So let's just go down to VPC here and we will expand that. And then underneath here, there should be an AWS security group. Uh, there it is. And if we scroll on down, there's the thing, okay? So what I'm gonna do is copy uh, this code here and go over uh, and we'll just paste that on in. And there is our security group. So um, I remember that we had to have the description. If you remember it complained about that. So outgoing for everyone. And uh, we need to also have a few additional things. We will just scroll on down here because it wanted the prefix list IDs. Okay. Remember we needed that. Um, I think there was like self false. And there was like security groups. I think it was actually AWS security groups in particular. Let's just double check to make sure that is the case. It is called. Uh, oh, it's just security groups. Okay. So We'll say self equals false. We do not need cider block four here or six. Um, we do not need this one here. 
and it doesn't really matter what we set this to. So it could be set to the main cider block. That's totally fine. Uh, but we are going to need to add a data source uh, just like last time uh, for the VPC. So let's say VPC, we'll call that main. And I think it just needed the VPC ID. It was as simple as that. And so we will go over to AWS, over to um, VPC. And from there, we are going to go to our VPCs and I will go grab that VPC ID. Okay, so we've grabbed our VPC ID and then we just need to name this as data. And then we're gonna name this as data. We don't really care what the CIDR block is. It's just, again, for um, this demo purposes, we don't need tags, we'll take those out. And um, yeah, everything else is fine. Okay, so this now comes to the fact that we want to uh, use dynamic blocks. Before we do that, let's just, well, I think I didn't leave the console there last, but what we'll do here is just do our Terraform init. And as that is pulling that stuff, we're gonna look up dynamic blocks. Uh, Terraform. So we'll go here. And so dynamic blocks is like way more powerful than um, the for each, where what we can do, I'm just trying to uh, find that example there, but we have, uh, we have to set the dy uh, dynamic part, the for each. You know what, I'm pretty sure I have these in my slides. So let's just use my slides as the reference here. Dynamic, ah, here it is, okay. so. The idea is that we'll just set up a locals with all of our information here, and then we'll create this dynamic block and then provide the content, okay? So I'm just gonna move that off screen so I can see what I am doing here as we type it in, and we'll see if we run into any problems. Um, failed to query the available provider for packages, could not retrieve the list of available versions for the provider. Um, not have a provider registry, Terraform name. All modules should specify the required providers. So. I'm not sure why it's complaining here, but we'll scroll all the way to the top and the required providers is correctly set here. So it shouldn't be a problem. Not sure what it doesn't like. Um, so we'll just type in Terraform providers here. The VPC. Um, is VPC a module? You know what, it's probably because I didn't do AWS VPC. That's probably my problem here. Terraform init. And as that's thinking there, we'll just pull this on down and we'll start to make our locals block. Okay, so we can go here, make some locals and we'll do our ingress. And we'll just go like that. And the idea is we can say port, whoops. We can set the port like that, 443. Uh, we have to always have a description, so we'll just set that as well. So port 443, we can set as much as we want here. So I'll just go ahead and enter. Okay. And I think that looks right. Yeah, so we have one ingress here and then we'll just copy this and make a comma. VS Code's not really formatting the way I want it to. And so we'll do port 80. And then down below, we will need to specify our um, for each, okay? So that's going to be within our dynamic block. So what we're gonna do is tab in here. I'm gonna say dynamic. And we'll type in ingress because that's a match for what we're doing. Um, and then from there, we can do our for each equals local ingress. And then we need to specify our content. I don't really understand why it's called content and things like that, but I just know that that's what we have to do. And it's not really that big of a deal. Um, so we'll go here and paste that in. We could take out our ingress, ingress block there. Uh, we know we're gonna need self, these all here, but what's gonna change are these ports. So, we will go here and we'll say ingress value port 
and this will also be ingress value port. And then this will be ingress uh, value description. If we really wanted to, we could also set the uh, protocol. Protocol, pro, to call. And this could be then TCP. And so we would just say ingress value protocol. So it just saves us from repeating these over and over again if they're all the same. There's a lot you can do with uh, dynamic blocks, but honestly, you shouldn't do anything too crazy. We'll do our Terraform plan and see if this works. Whoops. Bring that up there. Um, an argument VPC ID is not expected here. Okay, so that is me just guessing from memory. And I guess I guessed wrong. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll just look that up. Database VPC data source Terraform. Oh, it's just ID, okay. So what we'll do is just set ID here. And then we'll just hit plan again. And that should resolve our issue there. Uh, inappropriate value for attribute egress security groups is required. Okay, that's fine. Well, this one uh, it says, doesn't say, uh, Security groups, and this one doesn't say security groups, so that's probably our problem here. So we'll just ter hit Terraform plan again. And here it says this v VPC ID does not exist. Probably what happened is I might be in the wrong region. It's a very common problem on AWS just because of the way their UI works. If I can get this window over here, and so this is because we're in US East, we're supposed to be in US East one here. And I'm gonna go up to here. We will save that. I'm gonna hit Terraform plan. And we could probably like use the filter and also just say choose the default, but it's just so easy to put that in like that. Um, so it doesn't seem like we have any problems here. So let's go ahead and execute it. Let's just double check to make sure these values are correct. So for the ingress, um, port 443, port 443, it's probably just because I didn't update the description. Probably because of a copy paste job, yep. Okay, and let's just make sure this works. So we'll say Terraform apply auto approve and we'll give it a moment and it's already created so it's that fast we can go here and take a look at it if we like it's not that big of a deal um, so we should see it in here I just have so many uh, junk security groups here. It's just a bit hard to find. Oh, allow TLS is what we called it. So here it is. We go to our inbound rules. 80443. And that's pretty much it. So Terraform, apply, destroy, auto approve. Okay. And there we go. All right, so I want to talk about uh, versioning very quickly here. And so I have a new folder called versions. I'm going to just make a new file called main.tf. And we're going to create a Terraform block. But what we're also going to do is set required uh, providers, or sorry, required, uh, not providers, required version 
And so what this is going to do is say explicitly what version of Terraform we want to use. And I'm setting this as 1.0.0, and I'm using this tilde arrow. If you're wondering, you know, what is the logic behind all those things, I think it's all explained in the semantic or semver.org. So if you want to learn more, I strongly recommend you read through this to understand all this stuff inside and out. Highly applicable across the DevOps sphere, not just to Terraform. Um, but you know, if we go over to Terraform uh, GitHub repository and we drop down the branches and go to tags, here we can see all the versioning. We are using version 1.0.0 and uh, it all goes up to 1.1.0 uh, alpha, which is not out yet. And if you wanted to really know what's going on here, you go to releases and you can read what they have done. So here in 1.0.7, remove check for computer attribute, prevent object types with optional attributes for et cetera, empty uh, containers. So, when you're looking at the patch, the patch, which is the third number, the, the rightmost number, that's going to keep you up to date in terms of security for the, the major minor version that you have for the 1.0. And you absolutely always want to be using the latest. And so that's what this tilde does. It says take the, the, far uh, the, the, the farthest number to the right and make sure that it's the latest version that has been published. Um, and you know this comes back to my progressive versioning slide, which is if you want to have really good hygiene in terms of your uh, DevOps, what you should be doing is at least setting the tilde for sure, like this, the tilde arrow, or I would even go as far as saying equals arrow. And if you're really concerned about um, you know not using the next major version, you could say you will less than, you know, like less than, um, less than uh, you know one point. 2.0, even if it's not out, that's a good indicator to say, okay, well, I don't want to go too far ahead of time, but if you want to have progressive versioning, you should really be setting it like this, okay? Um, and this is going to be applicable for your AWS providers, um, anything else. So, you know, if we go over to, um, if we go over to the registry and we choose, whoops, AWS, and we drop this down here, we have that required version as well. So uh, as you copy it in, you're gonna notice that it's actually hard coded, but I would strongly recommend again, if we go here and take this and at least, at least do this. Uh, and if you're really, really being clever, you could do that, okay? And these are also all in GitHub repositories as that's how everything works. So you can go here and click and you can go over to the tags and see the versioning and you can go over to the releases and it's the same thing. You can read about all the things that have changed, okay? Uh, and that's something that you should uh, you know, consider doing, all right? So that's all there really is to this. Uh, I might wanna just show you one more thing and this one is with Terraform Cloud. So I'm gonna go to Terraform IO and we're gonna open up our Terraform Cloud and I'm gonna sign in. I probably haven't signed in in a while, so I'll probably ask, oh, no, no username and password, that's great. What we can do is in a workspace, we can go to settings, and uh, is it version control? No, it is general. And under here, we can actually set the Terraform version. So if you happen to be working with a particular version, uh, you can go and say, okay, only use this version for Terraform Cloud, and that will, um, that will not upgrade, it'll just keep you there if you need it for legacy reasons. But again, you know, what you really should be doing is um, using that progressive versioning, doing nightly builds and uh, discovering overnight that things are breaking so you can go fix those in the morning, okay? And that's it. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at Terraform state. So what is state? Well, it's a particular condition of cloud resources at a specific time. So give an example, imagine we expect to have a virtual machine running CentOS on AWS with a compute type of, of T2 micro, that would be the state that we are expecting, okay? So how does Terraform preserve state? Well, when you provision infrastructure via Terraform, it will create a state file named Terraform TF state. It's very important to remember that name because it literally is an exam question, the exact naming of that, okay? This state file is a JSON data structure with a one-to-one -one mapping from resource instances to resource uh, or to remote objects. And if you're wondering what is a remote object versus a resource instance, I cannot tell you. I would imagine one is a representation of things that are deployed in the cloud and the other one are uh, objects or or things represented in the state file, but they don't clarify it, so I just have to take a guess. So this is kind of what the JSON structure looks like. You can see you see resources. It's just describing like a type of instance and stuff like that. Uh, there's not really any case for you to ever go through the Terraform state file and look at it, 
um, but we might uh, take a peek just so that we get familiar as to what it is doing. So just to kind of give it a diagram to help you visualize this, imagine you have your configuration file. So you have your main TF, maybe a variables TF, a TF bars to load in your variables, and then you run a Terraform apply command. What it's doing is using the Terraform API, and it's going to create, well, we'll say these, we'll call these remote objects, but maybe these are resource instances. Um, but uh, it will go ahead and create those things, and then those will get represented within a state file so the idea is that um, whatever is in the cloud uh, is going to match what's in that file, okay? Now there is a um, CLI commands for Terraform state, and it's good just to quickly go through them. So we have Terraform state list. This will list resources in the state. Terraform state move. This will move an item in the state. Terraform state pull. Pull current remote state and outputs to SD out. Terraform state push. So update remote states from a local state. Terraform state uh, replace provider, so replace a provider in the state. Terraform state remove, so remove instances from the state. Terraform state show, so show a resource in the state. Uh, some of these are a little bit interesting, so we'll definitely look uh, in greater detail to move, and some of these we will just explore through our follow-alongs, okay? Okay, so we're going to give special attention to Terraform state move because it's definitely on the exam uh, and it is uh, a little bit interesting to what it can do. So Terraform state moves allow you to rename existing resources, move a resource into a module, move a module into a module. So if you were just to rename a resource or move it to another module and run Terraform apply, Terraform will destroy and create that resource. But state move allows you to just change the reference so you can avoid a create and destroy action. So an example for renaming a resource, we would have Terraform state move, and then we would have the, we would identify the old one. So here we have packet device dot worker, and we are renaming it to helper. So it's, we, that's just how we're doing it, okay? If we wanted to move a resource into a module, what we do is say something like packet device dot worker and then do module dot worker dot packet device dot worker. Okay, so the idea here is that we're moving it into uh, this module here. Uh, and I think we could probably even rename it at the same time, but uh, we're not doing that, okay? So move module into a module. So here we have module app, and then we're moving it into the parent one. So we go module.parent, module.app, okay? So what's important to remember for the exam is that Terraform state move is when you want to rename existing resources. They're not gonna get into these more complicated use cases, but that's how you rename a, uh, a resource, okay? Okay, let's talk about how we back up our state file. So all Terraform state subcommands that modify state will write a backup file. So read-only commands will not modify it. So imagine listen show will not cause a backup file to be created. Terraform will take the current state and store it in a file called terraform.tsstate.backup. So this is what it would look like. Uh, backups cannot be disabled. This is by design to enforce best practices for recovery. To get rid of the backup file, you would need to manually delete the files. So there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are on to the Terraform state follow alongs. And these are honestly just all about the uh, Terraform uh, CLI commands, as we do cover Terraform state throughout this course in a variety of different ways. So you can't just really contain it to this one little section here. But let's go explore these things. And so I have a new folder here on the left-hand side. And as always, we're going to go ahead and create ourselves a new main.tf file. And we need to just provision something. And so uh, we've done this multiple times over. So I'm just going to go back here. And I like to always go back to the count one because I find this is the easiest one to update. And we will go um, down here into our uh, uh, Terraform state file. And well, the, it's not our actual Terraform state file, but our main file here. And we will go and get rid of the count here. So there's just a single one. And we will just say my server, okay? And I think everything else is fine. This is all good. And so we just have to make sure we are in the correct directory. And I'm going to do a um, Terraform init, okay? And we'll just give that a moment there. And once Terraform init is happy, we're just gonna go ahead and do an apply because we do need a state file to be able to do something, right?
Great. So what we'll do here is just type in Terraform, uh, apply, and then we will run um, auto approve. Okay. And we'll just give that server a little bit of time to provision there, that script. And I'll see you back here in a moment, okay? All right, so after a short little wait there, our uh, instance is provisioned, and now we can go ahead and uh, do some Terraform state CLI stuff. So just waiting for my console to be a little bit responsive there. Great, and so what I can do is type in Terraform state, and it's gonna show me a bunch of commands I can run. So we got list, move, pull, push, replace provider, remove, show. Um, I haven't much found a use for push or pull, um, but uh, definitely list, move, um, and show are something that we want to look at. Uh, we could also give remove a try, but I don't find much reason to use that. So let's do the first one, which is Terraform state list. And what that is going to do is it's just gonna tell us what instances we have there or resources we have provisioned. Of course, if we had a lot more, this would be a pretty big list. If we do show, it's not gonna show us anything because we have to specify something. So we'll do AWS instance and we'll say my server here. And so we should get a lot more detailed information here. Okay. So just gonna pull this up here. And as you can see, we are getting all that information about that resource there. Um, if you wanted to rename something, that is a, a, a something you're definitely gonna wanna know for the exam. And that's where we use the Terraform state move. All right, the way you should think about it is kind of like how um, Bash has move and that's the way you would re uh, rename things there as well. So imagine that instead of being called my server, we wanted to call this uh, uh, our server, I don't know. <laughs> and so if we wanted to rename it like that, then what we'd have to do is type in Terraform state move, and then we would type the old name. So AWS instance, our server, and then from there we would say AWS instance, oh, sorry, the original one would be my server. And then we would do AWS instance, our server, okay? And so it says moved AWS instance, my server to our server. So if we were to open up our state file here, okay, and we were to take a look at the actual name, so we just look at our server, you could say that resource has been renamed. The only issue though, is that just because we've renamed it here and we've moved it within our state file does not mean that these changes are reflected um, actually uh, in, our, in our system. Actually, I don't think it really matters because it's just a name, but let's go see what happens if we do a Terraform plan, okay? I don't think it would matter, but we'll find out. And so down below, I mean, that's just a syntax error because we have changed the name. So this is now our server, right? And we'll just do a Terraform plan here. So Terraform has compared your real infrastructure against your configuration and found no difference. So no changes are needed because like the logical name that Terraform is using, the, the our server uh, is just something that's within the state file. It's not like any of those changes are reflected on the cloud, on the cloud provider. So there's no need to change anything there. So, you know, that's pretty much it. Um, you know, if we go back to just Terraform state here, we do have replace provider. I'm pretty sure I have used that one before. Let's go take a look at that really quickly. Terraform replace provider. So the command will update all resources using the front provider, setting the provider to the specified to provider. This allows changing the source of a provider which currently has resources in state. So that's kind of cool. Um, so I guess this one here we see we have a HashiCorp AWS to the registry Acme Corp Acme AWS. I don't know if we really have much cases for this, but I guess here the idea is that if you had forked, because all these are public facing, right? So if you forked it and made your own changes, that could be a case where you'd want to uh, do that there, eh? So that's pretty much it. Uh, whoops, that's pretty much it there. Um, so there you go. Oh, and as always, uh, we have to make sure we tear down our resource there. So I'm gonna go type in Terraform, um, apply, auto, approve, destroy. And there we go. So I'll see you in the next video, okay?
Hey, it's Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at Terraform init. So it initializes your Terraform project by downloading plugin dependencies, so providers and modules, creating a .terraform directory, so that's a hidden directory, and creating a dependency lock file to enforce expected versions for plugins in Terraform itself. So on the right-hand side here, we can see we have that hidden directory. Um, but also notice here that we have a .terraform lock.htl, that is our dependency lock file. Uh, and so our dependencies are all going to end up uh, within this um, see where it says providers. That's so the provider version there. Okay. So Terraform init is generally the first command you will run for a new Terraform project. If you modify or change dependencies, run Terraform init again to have it apply the changes. You need to know that for the exam because they will absolutely ask you that. Uh, the first command here is, uh, and these are ones with flags. So you can just do Terraform init, but we have some extra options. So Terraform init hyphen upgrade, upgrade all plugins to the latest version that complies with the configuration version constraint. Terraform init hyphen get plugins, uh, uh, and I think it's supposed to be uh, equals false there, but skip plugin installation. Terraform init plugin hyphen dir equals pass, so force plugin installation to read plugins from only target directory. And then we have Terraform init hyphen lock file. So you can change the lock file mode. It actually doesn't say what the modes are, so I don't even know what you do in that case. And I could not find any examples, but it is an option. Uh, I just want to uh, make it very clear that there is a dependency lock file, but there's also a state lock file. And the way you know that they're different is that one has dot lock in it and the other one has dot tf state. This one up here is for dependencies. This one, of course, is for state. A Terraform init does not create a state lock file. That is going to happen when you do a Terraform apply. Okay. Let's take a look at Terraform get. So Terraform get command is used to download and update modules in the root module. So when you're a developer, you own Terraform modules and you may need to frequently pull updated modules, but you do not want to initialize your state or pull new provider binaries uh, and so the idea here is Terraform get is a lightweight uh, way uh, it's because it's only updating the modules, it's not pulling providers. In most cases, you want to use Terraform init with the exception of local module development. This will not show up on the exam, but I saw Terraform get and I was just so confused about it. So I just wanted to make sure I included it here, okay? <laughs> Okay, so we're gonna be looking at three CLI commands that are used to improve debugging configuration scripts. The first is gonna be Terraform format. This rewrites Terraform configuration files to a standard format and style. Terraform validate, this validates the syntax and arguments of Terraform configuration files in a directory. And then you have Terraform console, an interactive shell for evaluating Terraform expressions. And so let's go jump into these three, okay? <laughs> All right, let's take a look at Terraform format. So this command applies a subset of Terraform language style conventions along with other minor adjustments for readability. So Terraform format will be uh, by default, look in the current directory and apply formatting to all your .tf files. So let's look at some examples of what it would format. So the first is adjusting spacing to spaces indent. So here we have something and it's over indented. And so by running Terraform format, it fixes the indentation. Uh, we can also get syntax errors. So notice here that we have a problem. And so what it's saying is, is that this bracket, okay, is supposed to be up here, okay, but it's all it's down here. Uh, and the last one here is we can do Terraform format hyphen hyphen diff. And that's going to show what it would change. Okay, so there you go. Let's take a look at Terraform validate. So this runs checks that verify whether a configuration is syntactically valid and internally consistent regardless of the provided variables in existing state. Validate is useful for general verification of reusable modules, including correctness of attribute names and value types. So here's an example where I just had some code and there was a problem. It's just saying you're missing your argument because for an AWS instance, you always have to specify an instance type. So when you run Terraform plan or Terraform apply, validate will automatically be performed. Uh, one thing I need to mention about Terraform validate is that it does not go to external resources to check things are valid. So if you have uh, a, uh, a value and it's expecting a string, that's all it's gonna check for. It's not gonna check that the string is actually a proper uh, like type of size. So if it's supposed to be like a t2.micro and you write you know, gobbledygook in there, uh, it's not going to know that that's not a valid type. So, uh, but we do cover that in the follow alongs. And I think we have like some practice exam questions that cover that use case. Okay. <laughs> 
we're taking a look here at Terraform Console, and this is an interactive shell where you can evaluate expressions. So the idea is you type in Terraform Console, and what I can do is I can, uh, you know, use like built-in functions and expressions. So there I'm using min, and I've actually entered it in incorrectly. So there it's throwing an error, and here I'm using the uh, correct way of using it, and so I get the output. So this is a great way just to kind of test very simple things. Um, you can't do things like define variables or or resources or define providers, but you, if you need to uh, figure out how the expressions work before you apply them in your code, this is a great place to do that, okay? All right, let's talk about Terraform plan. So this command creates an execution plan, also known as a Terraform plan, and it consists of uh, reading the current state of an already existing remote object to make sure that the Terraform state is up to date, comparing the current configuration to the prior state and noting any differences, proposing a set of change actions that should, if applied, make the remote objects match the configuration. And so this is an example of one that is generated. You're gonna see it uh, throughout this course multiple times, so it's not gonna be uh, unique. That's why I don't have to make that too big for you there. Uh, Terraform plan does not uh, carry out the proposed changes. That's gonna be the responsibility of Terraform apply. And a Terraform plan file, if you happen to generate one out, is a binary file. So if you open it up, it's just machine code. You cannot make sense of it, okay? So uh, when you run Terraform apply, you have speculative plans and save plans. And so speculative plan plans is what's gonna happen when you run Terraform apply. So, the Terra so Terraform will output the description of the effect of the plan, but without any intent to actually apply it. When you have a save plan, you're gonna have this hyphen out flag to save it, and you can name that file whatever you like. Uh, and it will generate out that save plan file. And again, that's a binary file, so you're not gonna be able to see what it does. And what you can do is then pass it along to Terraform Apply. So you do Terraform Apply, whatever the file name is. And when you are using Terraform Apply, what you have to understand is that it will not allow, it will not ask to uh, manually approve it as you normally would. It would just be auto approved. So that's one thing you have to watch out when using those save plans. But you know, I just wanted to make it concretely understood that Terraform plan can generate out a file uh, and it's not actually the one that's doing the apply, okay? Um, I don't have it written in here, but when you do Terraform apply, it also is running Terraform validate as well, okay? Let's talk about Terraform apply here. So Terraform apply command executes the actions proposed in an execution plan and it has two modes the automatic plan mode and the saved plan mode. So for automatic plan mode, that's just when you run Terraform apply. What it's gonna do is execute the plan, validate, and then the apply. Uh, you can, or you have to uh, manually approve the plan by writing yes. Um, but if you want to skip that process, you can use the hyphen auto approve flag to automatically approve the plan. We just saw save plan mode, like how it worked in the previous slide, but let's cover it again. So when you provide a file name to Terraform to the save plan file, it's gonna be Terraform apply file, and it's going to perform exactly the steps specified by that plan file. It does not prompt for approval. So if you want to inspect a plan file before applying it, you can use Terraform show, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we're gonna be taking a look at speculative plans and uh, save plans just a little bit more in detail. There's not a lot to talk about when we're talking about speculative plans because we've been using them throughout that, but we'll just contrast them against the save plans um, and just how you would actually use them with the apply. Uh, this stuff isn't super complicated, but uh, what we're gonna do is make a new file here. I'm gonna call this main.tf. And um, you know what? I'm just gonna go ahead and grab our code here from the last one to the uh, state file there and we'll go up and I'm just gonna rename this back to my server and we'll save this as my server. And there's only a single instance, so I'm just gonna take out that there. I'm gonna CD back there and we're gonna make our way into the plan and apply. I'm gonna do a Terraform init and we're gonna wait for that to finish. So, you know, we've been seeing speculative plans throughout all the follow-alongs and that's just where it's going to show you that information, but we can also save that uh, that plan out to a file. I don't think there's a particular naming convention for the file, it just has to be named as something, um, but we'll give it a, a moment here for this to initialize, and then we'll do that with the out command, okay? So what I'm gonna do is just type in terraform plan hyphen out, 
and then we can give it whatever name we want. Probably it'd be good to name it like dot plan. That's what I'm gonna do here. And so I'm just going to call this um, uh, my save plan. Okay, and what that will do is output that file in a moment here. So it ran and then it outputted. If we open it up, notice that it's a binary file, so we can't actually um, inspect it in any way. But if we are happy with the uh, these here, what we can do is type in Terraform apply, and then we can just provide it the name my saved plan dot plan and hit enter. And so what it should do is just proceed to deploy and it won't even review, it should just deploy. At least that's what the documentation says, so hopefully it does not contradict what, what happens here. Okay, notice that it's already carrying out the uh, the action. So, uh, you know, save plans would be really great if you are setting up a um, like a tool to review. So this kind of makes sense when you're looking at Terraform Cloud and it, it applies the plan and then you proceed to the next step where you accept the apply. I would imagine that they are using that, but I guess when you're using a CI CD pipeline, that's something that would be really useful. But anyway, we're gonna let this uh, finish creating. And then once it's done, we're just going to destroy it. But that's pretty much all I wanted to show you was the fact that you can use the hyphen out command to um, output that stuff. So we'll just go here and type in Terraform, apply, auto approve and destroy. Okay. And we'll give it a moment there and we're all good. So I'll see you later. All right, let's talk about managing resource drift. So drift or configuration or infrastructure drift is when your expected uh, resources are in different state than your expected state. And the way we can resolve drift are in three different ways in Terraform. We can replace resources. So when a resource has become damaged or degraded that cannot be detected by Terraform, we can use the hyphen replace flag. We can import resources. So when an approved manual addition of a resource needs to be added to our state file, so we use the import command and refresh state. So when an approved manual uh, configuration of a resource has been changed or removed, we're gonna use the refresh only flag to reflect the changes in our state file. It's very important to know these three different ways. They will all show up in the exam. And in practice, you're gonna to need to know them, okay? <laughs> Let's first here take a look at replacing resources. So uh, we can use the Terraform tank command. It is used to mark a resource for replacement the next time you run apply. And why would you want to mark a resource for replacement? Well, the idea is that, um, you know, and here's the command here, but a cloud resource becomes damaged or degraded and you just want to return the expected resource to a healthy state. So that's the idea behind it. And the unfortunate thing is that Terraform tank was deprecated in version 0.152. However, there is a better way of doing it now. And so it is recommended to use the hyphen replace flag and pro uh, providing it a resource address when you're doing a Terraform apply. So it's basically the exact same thing. The reason why they made this change was so that um, you actually have an opportunity to confirm your change beforehand because Terraform tank would just run. And this one down below will actually prompt you to say, are you sure you want to do this? Okay, but it's not complicated. You just do a hyphen replace and then you use the resource address of the thing that you want to um, uh, use that for. And this can be used for both plan and apply. Uh, the replace flag appears to only work for a single resource. So you can't use multiple resources. It's just one at a time. And that's something that you should remember, okay? <laughs> So we just saw a resource address and resource addressing is uh, very important to know for the upcoming commands. So let's just give it a bit more attention here. So a resource address is a string that identifies zero or more resource instances in your configuration. An address is composed of two parts. So the module path and the resource path. And just to expand out that module path, it would be module.module name, module index. And then on the resource uh, spec, this is resource type dot resource name. And then if there's multiple instances, you give it an index. So module path addresses a module within a tree of modules. A resource spec address is a specific resource instance in the selected module. So a module is the namespace of the module. Module name is user defined name of the module. Module index when the um, multiple, uh, so when there's multiple specifying index. On the other side, that's your resource type, your resource name, and instance ID. Uh, most of the times you're gonna be just working with resources, um, but once you start getting to modules, it becomes pretty simple. It's always gonna be module period um, because 
Uh, that's just, I think that's the name of the name value. So it's always gonna be module dot and then the module name. But here we have a very simple example just for resource type. So uh, here, if we had a resource called Abus Instance and it was web and there was four of them and we wanted to select the third one, we do AWS Instance dot web square braces three and that would get us the third virtual machine. So there you go. Okay, let's take a look here at Terraform import. And this is a command that is used to import existing resources into Terraform. So this is how you define it. So you'd say what resource you want and uh, you could just leave it blank. So you define a placeholder for your imported resource and configuration file, and you can leave the body blank and fill it in after importing, but it will not be autofilled. So you do have to specify all the uh, values, okay? So the idea here is you're gonna do Terraform import AWS instance dot example, and then the name of the ID. So that maps over to the resource address and the ID, okay? The command can only import one resource at a time. This sounds very similar to uh, that other command we saw for replace. Not all resources are importable. You need to check the bottom of the resource documentation for support, okay? <laughs> Okay, so we're gonna look at refreshing. And so we're gonna break this between the old command refresh and the new command uh, refresh only across two slides. So Terraform refresh command reads the current settings from all managed remote objects and updates the Terraform state to match. So here we have the Terraform refresh. And I just wanna point out that the uh, Terraform refresh is basically the alias for Terraform apply hyphen refresh only hyphen auto, auto approve. So you technically have this functionality in the latest version, it's just that you can't use the old alias Terraform Refresh. Terraform Refresh will not modify your real uh, remote objects, but will modify the Terraform state. So Terraform Refresh has been deprecated and the refresh only, uh, and with the refresh only flag, like it's been replaced with it because it's not safe since it did not give you the opportunity to review proposed changes before updating the state file. So that's why the reason they got rid of it. Let's take a look here at the refresh only mode. So hyphen refresh only flag for Terraform plan or apply allows you to refresh and update your state file without making changes to your remote infrastructure. Just to really make this clear, I want to uh, give you a scenario and I want you to pay close attention here to understand the difference because this is so important on the exam and also extremely useful uh, for your day-to-day -day operations. So here's a scenario. Imagine you create a Terraform script that deploys a virtual machine to AWS. You ask an engineer to terminate the server and instead of updating the Terraform script, they mistakenly terminate the server via the AWS console because they don't know any better. So uh, what happens if you were to run a Terraform apply versus with a refresh only flag? So that's what we'll do with and without the flag. So without the flag first, Terraform will notice that the VM is missing. Terraform will propose to create a new VM. So the state file is uh, gonna be what's considered as correct and the changes, and so changes to the infrastructure will uh, be made to match the state file, okay? If we use Terraform apply hyphen refresh only, Terraform will notice that the VM you provisioned is missing, uh, uh, but with the refresh only flag, uh, it's gonna know that the that the VM uh, uh, is missing, and it's an intentional, okay? So I have a couple of spelling mistakes there, but the idea is that it knows that the VM is supposed to not be there. So Terraform will propose to delete the VM from the state file, so just the JSON code from the state file. So the state file is considered wrong and changes uh, to the state file will be made to match the infrastructure. So hopefully that makes it clear, okay? <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. We are on to the managed resource drift follow alongs and there's three things we wanna check out, replace, import, and refresh. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to our folder here, the, the managed resource drift. We're going to make a new file as always, call it main.tf. And I think the contents here is gonna be pretty much the same as our last one. So I'm just gonna go ahead and grab that and uh, We'll type clear, we'll back our way out. I'm gonna just do Terraform init, okay? And uh, the idea here is that we're just going to provision this resource here and we're just going to replace it. We'll have to try to import something and do a refresh. Maybe we'll do replace import or we'll do import last just because that one is a little bit more uh, challenging. Um, so we'll just let this initialize here and then we will uh, deploy it and then we'll try to replace it. Great, so that's all good. So we'll do a Terraform apply and we'll just say auto approve and let that go.
Great, and so that is uh, done there. And so what we can do is go ahead and replace that instance. So the reason we would wanna do this is let's say our instance became damaged or degraded, or let's just say we in general just wanna replace it. And actually I think through some of the fall longs we had to use replace in some instances. So we've already kind of had some experience with it. But the idea is we just type in Terraform, uh, apply, and then we could just do replace. And then we give it the AWS instance, um, like its resource name here. So we just say my server. Now this used to be called Terraform Taint. And depending on when you set the exam, uh, you know, if it's really close to when I, uh, when I launched this course, then you might still come across questions that are Terraform Taint. But now it's just this hyphen replace, uh, replace command here. And so what I can do is just hit um, enter. I actually don't really want to execute this. I just wanted to show you it because I want to move on to the refresh one, which is gonna take a little bit more time here. Uh, and just if we scroll on up, look what it's doing. It just says, we're going to replace this. So destroy and then re recreate it. So this is a great way to, to reinforce uh, that. Now notice when you use the hyphen replace flag, you're only able to provide a single resource and that's just how it is. So I'm gonna go ahead and here type no. Now let's take a look at, um, refresh. So a great example of this is if we make our way over to the VPC console and we go over to EC2, what we're going to do is just um, go ahead and destroy this instance. Okay, so somebody came in and let's say, you know, you're working on your, uh, with your team and they and you told Junior saying, hey, we, we need to destroy the server because it's costing us a lot of money. And they go, they go, okay, and they're not aware of all the Terraform infrastructure, or maybe there's an urgency to uh, tear it down really quickly. And so they use the, uh, the UI to do that. And so here I've terminated the server, but the problem is, is that my state file still thinks that this, uh, this exists. So we'll give this a moment to uh, get into a shutting down stage. There we go. And so now what's gonna happen if I do Terraform apply, and I don't know if we have to wait a bit longer for it to destroy there, but it's going to check the state and see whether that server exists and it's gonna tell us what action it's going to take. Okay, so um, there's no changes, so we'll just wait a little bit here, okay? So I'll just talk to you here in a moment. I'm just going to wait for this to shut down, okay? Great, so after a short little wait, you can see my server is now terminated. So what I'm gonna do here, uh, once my console is responsive, sometimes it just does this. I have to like click a few times to get it to uh, react, there we go. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, write Terraform apply, okay? And we're just going to see what happens here. So notice that it's trying to add the server because the server is gone, right? But the thing is, is that we actually want the server not to be recreated when we run this again. And so the problem is, is that um, our state file is not telling the truth. It should be updated to reflect the fact that that instance is removed. I think this is where we could use the Terraform state remove to actually remove it uh, as a resource. But another thing that we could do is use the Terraform refresh. And actually now it's called Terraform apply uh, refresh only, okay? And what that's going to do is it's going to check the actual state against uh, the actual, or sorry, the actual, the state against the actual resource. And notice it's just going to remove it because it says, hey, you removed this from AWS and I, this is your intention, right? You actually want it gone. So let's go ahead and say yes to that, okay? So yeah, there we go. And we'll move on to importing, okay? <laughs> All right, so now let's try to actually import a resource in here. So imagine we've already created something like an S3 bucket, and that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna make my way over to S3, okay? And we're gonna go ahead and create ourselves a new bucket here. We'll, so we'll say create bucket, and I'll just say uh, my new bucket, and I'll just put a bunch of random numbers here because these are unique names, uh, just like domain names. So it's easier if you just kind of like dump a bunch of random things in there. And so I wanna go down here and just uh, oops, create this bucket here. Okay, and so I have uh, the name here for that bucket, which is this one here. And so we want to import that as a resource. So I'm just gonna go over here and type in, whoops, Terraform import. And we're gonna take a look at how we can go ahead and do that. So um, it's not really telling me much, Terraform import. So I'll just go ahead and type the command. I thought we'd get a little bit more information there. Okay. And 
this is not helping much either. So I'm going to go pull up my handy dandy uh, notes here because maybe I did myself a favor. Whoops. And I detailed it out and I keep on hitting the same button here and it's just not opening the search. Okay. So we'll go look for import. Great. Here it is. So um, yeah, we have to prov uh, provide the placeholder. So that's what we're going to do. So just go up here and this is going to be resource um, AWS S3 bucket, I think it is. Just going to go double check that there. Go over to our documentation, look for S3. That's what it is. Good. And this is pretty much all it is. It's just the name, the resource and the name. So I'm sure it's not that hard to type, but I'm just going to do that anyway. Um, we'll just say bucket. And then we need our bucket name that we're going to import. So go ahead and copy that. And we'll paste it there, get rid of that space. And so now all we need to do is type in Terraform, import, AWS um, S3 bucket, bucket. And then we need to probably provide um, the ID. And I guess the ID is the bucket name here. So we'll go ahead and paste that bucket name in. And we'll see if that takes. Okay, so that bucket is uh, being added. Great. And so now what we should be able to do is if we want to tear down that bucket, we should be able to do terraform destroy. And I don't think everything can be imported. So there's some things that might not be uh, possible to import. So we'll go ahead and type yes. And it says that it's destroyed. And so we will go back here, give it a refresh. And it is gone. So there you go. Um, so we covered them all, replace, refresh, and import. So let's take a look here how we would actually go about troubleshooting Terraform. So there are four types of errors you can encounter with Terraform. Uh, the first is language errors. So Terraform encounters a syntax error in your configuration for the Terraform or HCL language. You have state errors. So your resources states has changed from a, the expected state in your configuration file core errors, so a bug that has occurred with the core library, provider errors, so the provider's API has changed or does not work as expected due to emerging edge cases. And when we talk about what's easy for us to solve and what's hard, well, the first two are, are very easy and the other two are harder to solve. So for language errors, we can use format, validate, or version to uh, uh, resolve our language errors. Version would just be say, hey, what version are we using? Maybe we need to update it, right? Validate would detect if something's wrong with um, the, uh, the the syntax and format would fix formatting syntax, but you know that probably wouldn't fix that much there. For state errors, um, the idea here is we might want to use refresh, apply, replace, everything that we saw in the drift section for core errors. Uh, we might want to go check out the log. So TF underscore log is um, basically just the way of saying like, hey, these are where the log files are or is logs turned on? We have a whole slide on that. Um, but really like all you're gonna do is use the logs to find information and re and then report a GitHub issue. Since all uh, Terraform is on GitHub, uh, you would just go there and then somebody would try to resolve it. Um, and the same thing with providers. So providers are all hosted on GitHub. And so you would just use TF logs to try to find some information there. But uh, we'll take a look, a uh, greater uh, look at uh, TF log and how to, um, you know, get that information for the harder to solve cases, okay? Okay, so let's talk about how we would go about debugging Terraform via the log file. So Terraform has detailed logs, which can be enabled by setting the TF underscore log followed by uh, the type of environment you want to run. So the uh, variables that we have or the environments we can specify is trace, debug, info, warn, error, or JSON. JSON will output logs at the trace level or higher and use parsable JSON encoding as the formatting, okay? So logging can be enabled separately. So uh, you can do this via TF log core uh, or uh, you can get it at the TF log provider. So if you just want core stuff or if you just want provider stuff, uh, you just set those environment variables. And as we saw in the previous thing that there, uh, you know, there was core errors and provider variables. So that could be a good way to uh, do that. And so TF, uh, TF core, TF log core and TF log provider take the same environment variables we see on the right hand side there, trace debug info 
etc. Okay. If you want to choose where you want to log things, you just can set the TF log path. Uh, I don't think I actually say where the default path is. I think it's actually in the, the project directory, but if you want to override that, you can. Uh, I imagine it either takes an absolute path or a relative path. Um, and here's an example of a Terraform log. So this is for everything. And so there you can see information. I'm gonna get my pen tool out here for a moment, but you can see we have information about the provider. This is using um, there, then there's some uh, backend local stuff. So, you know, there's some information. You're not expected to understand this information uh, generally, but uh, you could go bring it to the provider but you could probably solve something, uh, you know, if you were to read the core code or the providers, okay? Okay, so we looked at TF log, um, which is the Terraform log, but there's also a crash log. And so if Terraform ever crashes, and basically this means it goes into panic because it uses the Go runtime, it saves a log file with the debug logs from the session, as well as the panic message and backtrace to the crash.log. And so I imagine this is Golang information. Uh, so I don't use Golang that often, uh, but you can see we have .go, panic.go. So I think that uh, there's not much you can do with it. So this is where you would just create a GitHub issue and pass it along to the Terraform team because they're gonna be able to make sense of it, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are on to the troubleshooting um, follow-alongs here. So, you know, there's Terraform logs and there's crash logs. I've only ever encountered a crash log once. Uh, I don't know how we're going to replicate that. So I don't think that's gonna be um, something we're gonna be able to cover here, but definitely Terraform debug log is something we absolutely can do. So what I'm gonna do is go down below to my troubleshooting folder, make a new file as always, type in main.tf, and uh, we will pull from, not this one, we will go grab from our plan and apply since we had a really simple server there. And we'll paste that on in. Apparently I did not copy it, so we'll try that one more time. And we'll go back over here and we will paste that in. Um, and that all looks good to me. So what we'll do is just CD back and we'll go to the troubleshooting folder and I'm gonna do a Terraform init. And as that's going, we're gonna go look up how do we set up that log, okay? so. Pretty sure I have it in my slides. So I'm just gonna go ahead here and look up log. Okay. It's really great when I always have uh, the code on hand here. And so the idea is that through the TF log, we're going to set an environment variable and we'll set this trace so we can get a lot more information, okay? So what I'll do here is I will go and um, I'm going to set it when we do the Terraform apply. So. I'll just say tf log equals trace, and we will then do the terraform apply, and hopefully we should get a lot more information. Already you can see that we're getting a lot of stuff. See all these traces and debugs as we normally wouldn't get them. Um, we might want to uh, dump all this data to somewhere, so maybe that's something else that we can do. I'm just gonna say no for the moment here. And let's go ahead and try to set a file here. So we'll just say tf log um, path. And I don't know if it would take a relative path. So yeah, let's give it a try. Let's see if we can give it a relative path and just say um, terraform.log. So I wanna see if we can get it to log right in this folder here. And it did, that's nice. Okay. And so again, I'm just gonna type no. And if we open that up, there's all our logs. Okay, so, you know, it's not that complicated. You can also separate the logging. So they have the TF log core and the TF log provider. Um, I guess it would just be like, if you were, if you just wanted to log the core stuff, so I'm gonna go ahead and delete this. So let's say you're, or let's say you're trying to de uh, debug the provider. I guess you could just go here and type in provider. It might not log anything, I don't know. We'll just hit enter here and we'll see if we get any output. Okay, I'm gonna just type no. So we'll open that up. Yeah, we do get stuff and see where it says provide in the beginning. Okay, um, and that's pretty much it. So there you go. All right, I figured I would just include one more thing here because when you are troubleshooting, a lot of times you do have to go uh, to the uh, GitHub uh, and open up an issue. And so I just wanna show you where that is just in case you're not that familiar with GitHub or you're just 
you use GitHub, but you're not used to opening issues. So here I'm on Terraform and I could open up an issue uh, and I can go here and create a new issue. And here you can see that there's different information like feature requests, report a, report a security vulnerability, report bug. Um, if there's something else, it's gonna go here and that's gonna go to the discussion. But if we report a bug, I'm just curious if they actually tell you to include the logs here. Um, Terraform version, configuration file, deep, uh, debug output. So this is where we have the TF log and they're telling you to do it as a trace if you have a crash output. So yeah, that's pretty much it. I just wanted to show you where that would be. And also this would be the same for any of the providers. So if you go up to um, a provider here, like AWS, and this one is of course supported by HashiCorp. So if we go to issues and we open up a new issue, we're gonna see this uh, something very similar and they're gonna probably ask for the debug logs again here. But here they might just say, can you only give, it, uh, give us for the provider? Um, I'm sure it's somewhere out here, panic output, right? That would be, oh, here we are, the debug logs, right? Um, and for modules, probably the same thing. Like if we went over to the modules, I'm sure it's very similar, but I don't know how you'd get that output for that. So like if we just go to one of these sub modules here and go to issues, I just wanna see if Anton is uh, something similar. So yeah, that's pretty much it. So there you go. All right, so we're on to our module section. Uh, so let's first talk about how we would go find a module. I know we already saw this earlier when we were looking at the Terraform registry, but let's just cover it again and talk about some of the uh, 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 details of uh, search, okay? So Terraform modules can be publicly found in the Terraform registry. And so on the left-hand side, when you're under the modules within the Terraform registry, you can uh, filter your providers, okay? Uh, but another thing you can do is you can uh, type in search terms and you can do partial search terms like Azure Compute. But what I really want you to know is that only verified modules will be displayed in search terms. And so I assume that means verified and also official ones. And the reason I'm giving this extra emphasis is because it was an exam question. So I just want you to know that only verified and official ones are gonna show up when you search, okay? <laughs> Let's talk about using modules and there's our public modules and private modules. So public modules are gonna be on the Terraform registry and private modules are gonna be in Terraform Cloud or I suppose Terraform Enterprise. So Terraform registry is integrated directly into Terraform. So it makes it really easy to start using them. So all you're gonna do is uh, use the module block. So I'm just going to uh, highlight that there. Then we have the name of our module, we're providing the source of our module, and then there's the version of our module. Terraform init command will download and cache any module referenced by a configuration. Now looking at private modules, it looks very similar. Um, it's just that the name is different. So we're specifying the host name uh, in front here and a namespace as well. So to configure uh, private module access, you need to authenticate against Terraform Cloud via Terraform login. Uh, so that's something there. Um, we definitely cover that a lot in the practice exam. So just in case, you know, you know all the edge cases there. Alternat alternatively, you can create a, a user API token and manually uh, configure credentials in the CLI to configure the file. So there you go. Let's talk about how we would go about publishing modules. And this in particular is for the Terraform registry. So these are public modules. So uh, if we want to publish modules, it supports versioning, automatically generating documentation, allowing uh, users to browse the version histories, uh, showing examples and readmes. And all of these modules are actually gonna be hosted on uh, GitHub. So the idea is you're gonna put your uh, module there first. And once a module is registered to push updates, you simply push new versions to properly form Git tags. Uh, you have to name the your um, your modules in a very particular way on GitHub. So the thing is, it has to start with Terraform hyphen, then the provider, so AWS, and then the name, so hyphen VPC. Uh, and the way you publish it on Terraform registry is you have to connect and publish uh, via your GitHub account. So you just hit sign in with GitHub and it's just gonna give you a drop down, and you're just gonna choose the repo and that's as simple as it is, okay? 
All right, let's talk about verified modules. So these are reviewed by HashiCorp and actively maintained by official contributors to stay up to date and compatible with both Terraform and the respective providers. So here's an example of a module from our friend Anton down below. And as you can see, it has a little badge. That's how you know that it's verified. So verified modules are expected to be actively maintained by HashiCorp partners. Verified badges aren't uh, an ind indication of the flexibility or feature support but just to kind of go through some things here, very simple modules can be verified just because they're great examples of modules. Unverified modules could be extremely high quality and actively maintained. Unverified modules shouldn't be assumed to be poor quality. Unverified means it hasn't been created by a HashiCorp partner. So, you know, that again, it's not indicative of quality, but it just means that it's gone through a bit of vetting, okay? <laughs> All right, let's take a look here at the standard module structure. And this is a file and directory layout recommended for module development. And this is the idea if you were to go and publish your own module, this is what people would expect to see. So if you had a root module, that's what it'd be. And you have nested module. I wanna point out that when you are writing Terraform, you technically are creating modules, even if you uh, aren't intending them to publish them into the Terraform registry. Um, but uh, you know, when you make a main.tf, you've basically made your own root module, okay? So the primary entry point is the root module, and these are required files in the root directory. So your main.tf is the entry point file for your module. Variables.tf is the variables that can be passed in. Outputs.tf are outputted values. Readme describes how the modules work. License, the license under which the module is available. For nested modules, which are optional, but must be contained in the modules directory, a submodule that contains a readme is considered usable by external users, and a submodule that does not contain a readme is considered inter for only internal use. And the idea is to avoid using relative paths when sourcing module blocks. So hopefully that gives you an idea, okay? <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are on to our modules section. So, uh, you know, we looked at the structure of how modules should be, just pulling up uh, the documentation over here and scrolling on down to our uh, shared uh, module structure. So this is pretty much what we expect. We expect that main variables, output, readme, license, and then you uh, you may need a, uh, a modules directory there. If you are learning to write your own, what I would strongly recommend is to check out Anton. So Anton, um, he basically, uh, he's an Abus hero, just like myself, but he built and, and maintains like a ton of really good modules for Terraform. And you can go through any of these and find really good uh, information. So like, for instance, the RDS instance has a very good example of how uh, modules like should be used. And so we have folders within folders. And you can see everything is very well organized. And if we have a readme that tells you that it's exposed and how he's defined everything are very good examples. Uh, but for our purposes, we just want to make something very simple. And so let's go ahead and create ourselves our own module. So what I'm going to do is go over here. And we've actually done a lot of this work already um, when we were using CloudInit. So I think that would be a great place to kind of grab that stuff. And so what I'm going to do is go ahead and grab this entire file here. And we're going to scroll on down and make ourselves a new directory here under modules. And I'm gonna make a new file here and I'm just gonna call it main.tf. And we're gonna go ahead and paste that on in there. And so I think that we should have outputs as well. Uh, what should it be called? It should be called, yeah, outputs uh, based on convention. So we'll have that. And uh, I just made that a folder, didn't I? Okay, we'll just delete that there. And we will go ahead and create a new file called outputs.tf. And we also need a variables.tf. And we need ourselves a readme. And we should also have ourselves a license. Okay. And so what I'm gonna do is just copy paste over here from Anton because he's done a lot of the work here. So we have uh, this license here, the Apache license. If it's good for Anton, it's good for me, okay? So we'll go ahead and paste that on in. And so now we have that. And let's go take a look at the readme and see what kind of work uh, has been done here. I assume it's just like to show how it works. Yeah. 
So, you know, we'll just say in here, um, Terraform module to provision an EC2 instance uh, that is running is running Apache. Okay, not intended for um, for production use. Uh, just showcasing how to create a custom module on Terraform registry. Okay. So nothing super fancy there. And then we'll just give our um, brackets there for the time being. I don't know if there's like even uh, something for these, you have these three back ticks that will, you can actually um, highlight in particular. Oh, so there is one for HCL. So that's great. So what I'll do is just type in HCL there. And so now what we need to do is just kind of break up our main.tf here. And I did not forget the fact that we do not have the, um, uh, the configuration file, but we'll get to that in a moment. So we'll go ahead and paste that onto here. And then in our main TF, we might have some variables. Do we have any variables? We do not. Um, I assume we don't speci uh, specify any kind of backend. So let's just go take a look at what um, Anton has done here in his main.tf. We go to the top here and just looking through here, I do not see any kind of thing there. So that's fine. And you know what I should be doing is I should be making a new folder here. Um, and this is gonna be new folder. We're gonna call this AWS uh, demo um, Apache, okay? Or maybe what we should do is actually call it hello world. It technically is a module. So we'll say it was module uh, Apache, maybe example would be better. Okay, and so I'm just going to uh, reveal these in the folder here. And I just want to, you know, place the contents of them in here, okay. And I've decided that we're going to want to actually use our module. So what I will do is create a new file here. Um, it's actually making it in the subfolder. I actually want it at the top level there. So I might have to just touch that file there, main.tf. So it'll show up. There we go. And so if I expand that, now we have our main TF here. And then we'll just call our module. So we'll say, um, just waiting for my page to become responsive here. There we go. So we'll say Terraform. And we had module, and then we need to call our module, AWS module. Is it module or modules? Let's go up the top here. Terraform, AWS RDS. Oh, it has to start with the word Terraform. Okay. So I'm just going to rename this. Hopefully this doesn't cause me a bunch of issues. But we'll say Terraform. I think it always has to start with Terraform. AWS, and then Apache example. Okay. So we will go back over here. And so we'll say Terraform. Uh, I think we can actually name this whatever we want. So I can just say like Apache. And we have to specify its source. I don't really remember this. So I know we already did this before with something. Where did we do this where we had a child one? Getting started? No. Depends on, oh, outputs. That's where we did it over here. Okay. So just pulling up our old one here just to save us some trouble. I cannot seem to remember off the top of my head how that works. So here we are just going to specify the source locally. And so that's Terraform, AWS, Apache, example. Okay. And what I want to do here, 
I'm going to close off some of these older tabs so we're less confused on what's going on. Um, I just want to continue to break up this file here. So we'll go to our main. And we don't even need a Terraform block. Pretty sure we should be specifying a Terraform provider. Again, we'll take a look at what um, what's going on here in this one here. Maybe it's under versions. I kind of like that. Let's go call that versions. You could also call it providers, but. And so, yeah, that's where we were seeing it there. Okay, so what I'll do is go back over to here and we will cut that out. And we will paste it in here. And probably that we should be very aggressive and or with our progressive versioning and do this. Okay. I'm not sure if you specified the provider here. So I don't see the provider listed. I don't know if you'd actually have to list that. I don't think so. No. Okay, so what I'll do is I'm just going to um, grab the provider out of here. Whoops. We'll cut that out and we'll put that in our top level main file here. Okay. And so um, here we'd want to specify our AWS VPC. Um, I wonder if there's like a way we could just select it by default. So what I'm going to do here is just make a new tab. AWS VPC data source, select defaults in region. Maybe there's a good example for us. data, AWS VPC. I was just hoping there was something we could grab in two seconds. There is not, I don't, I don't feel like fiddling around with filters to figure it out. So what we'll do is we'll just assume that we have to provide that as a variable. So we'll just say var uh, VPC ID. Okay, and then in our Variables here, we'll just do variable. We have to spell it right though. VPC ID. Type string. And so we can just close our versions here, that's fine. So that's set. Um, this has a security group, which is totally fine. That's hard coded to our IP address. So we might want to provide our own IP address. My IP. Okay. And so with CIDR. Okay, so provide your IP, e.g. I might just go grab mine really quickly here. What's my IP? Thirty-two. There's probably some built-in functions we could use, but oh well. My IP, right? Um, that's fine. We have our deployer key. Um, we only need this if we want to log in, but I, I suppose we could do that as well. So we could just go here and say variable public key type equals string. var public key. Uh, we will need this user data file. So I will have to go back to um, our tutorial that we did this in. So 
This would have been for remote exact, no, cloud init. Okay, and then we'll just go ahead and grab the contents of this file. And we will go ahead and create this in here. User data dot YAML. We'll paste the contents. Okay, so that is good. Um, we probably would want to dynamically select the data source for the AMI. We have done this multiple times over. The last time we did it, uh, did we do this for alias? Yeah, we did. So we'll grab it from here and we will go over back to the data source here. Um, kind of getting a little bit mixed up here. So just close some of these other files. So we will want this here. And so I'm just gonna say my server. I noticed like uh, Anton likes to do this, which is I guess really good if you just have one of everything. Um, I think that's a pretty good idea. I don't think I grabbed the right thing here because that is not, this is just another server, we already have that. So I'm gonna go back over to um, that other project there under, what did we say, it was under alias? Main TF. Yeah, it's right here. I, I just didn't go up a bit, that was my problem. So we'll copy that. And we'll paste that in there. We'll just go up a bit and we'll just say Amazon Linux 2. We will scroll on down here and we will just make sure that we get this correctly. I don't think we need interpolation again, but I uh, don't feel like updating this. We'll just keep it the same. And we'll go over here and we'll just say Amazon Linux 2. We might want to pass along the instance type. So we'll say var instance type put the, whoops, double quotation there on the end. Um, we'll go to variable. And we will say instance type. And we'll just default that to T2 micro. Okay. Um, this is our real file here. Deployer key, instance type, this is all fine. This is all fine. Um, we have this file here. This is old. So we can go ahead and just remove that. Um, we want CloudInit. Yeah, CloudInit's still happening. That was just an additional thing there. Maybe we, they can name their server. So we can just say like, var uh, server name. Okay, and I think I'm pretty happy with that. Could have spelling mistakes, I don't know, but um, that seems all fine to me. So what I'm gonna do, is go back to my main file here and I'm gonna do a Terraform init. I just wonder if I have to uh, apply the provider. Looks like I don't have to. I think it's pulling it from the, uh, the sub module there. Yeah, it is. Okay, that's great. And it should complain on Terraform plan if we don't provide the values in here. So if we go to our variables, we can go here. And I'm pretty sure that uh, Anton has a, um, I'll probably cover this in the course, but I think he has like a way of generating out his documentation, um, which is something we might want to look at at some point. But uh, we know that we're going to need some of these keys here or these values here. So I'm gonna to go to my main over here. I'm just going to go ahead and paste that in. So we have server name, whoops. It's a bit of a mess. Try that one more time. So we have server name, we know we want to set that. 
we want our T2 micro here as instance type. Okay. We have our public key here. Um, we'll figure that out in a moment. We have the IP address. And I'm just gonna go ahead and grab mine there because we already have it. It's just gonna save me some time. I'm gonna go grab that to SSH key so I can save myself some time there. So we have SSH, um, Terraform. Oh, it's root, right. For this anyway, Terraform. I guess I, I actually just wanna cat it. So we'll do that root.ssh terraform here.pub. And we will go ahead and grab the contents there, copy. And I'm just going to paste it in like that. Make sure the, the end is the same there. That is all good. Um, we just did this, so that's fine. BPC ID. Just make sure you are in the correct region. But first we're gonna switch over to VPC because right now we're in global region, which is not gonna help us that much. I want to be in North Virginia. So I'm gonna go over here. Um, we're gonna go to our VPC. We'll go ahead and grab that. Something I don't know is like, how would I override the uh, region? I just assume I can just specify that it would know. So right now this is all hard coded for uh, uh, US East one. So I do specify that up here to the provider, which the region is. So I think that's fine. So we will clear that out. And I think that's what we need. Okay. So if this all works, um, then we can put that in our documentation. So I'll do a Terraform plan here. It says to work with Apache module data, Amazon Linux 2, it has to be West. Okay, so I just forgot to remove something in here, uh, which is probably like there's a provider or something in here. Uh, West, so we'll just take that out there. Okay, hit up. And Invalid value for the path parameter, no file exists at user data. This function uh, works with files that are distributed as part of the configuration source code. So this file will be created by a resource. Uh, you must instead obtain the result from an attribute of that resource. Okay, so doesn't like the way I'm specifying this. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do here. So I'll come back here in a moment, okay? All right, so just thinking about it for a moment, I bet I have to use some built-in functions to do this. So we probably could get the absolute path because under the file system functions, they definitely have a function like this. And see, this is calling path.root, um, but we have to really figure out what it is that we want to use. Now we check this in our named, uh, named values. So maybe we can find that in our slides here. If we go named values, we can just find that here. Yeah, so for a module, um, there's these here, right? So file system and workspace info, path of the module where the expression is placed, path of the root module of the configuration. So I think we want path.module, okay? And so I think if we were to do like a B absolute path, and then we were to do um, path.module, again, I don't know, I, I'm not publishing these on a regular basis, but this is my guess. And probably what we could do is do interpolation. And I don't know if this is proper, but I'm gonna do it this way. Cause sometimes like file systems don't use, like Windows will use backslash. So I don't know if we're allowed to do that like this and how that will work, but I'm gonna do it anyway, okay? And so we don't need file here just yet. Actually, we don't even need interpolation here. We're just gonna take that out. 
And uh, we don't need, yeah, that makes sense. And so we do file like that. So let's see if that works. Okay, and if that doesn't work, I'm gonna have to do some digging, okay? Fingers crossed. Wow, okay, that works. So I guess we'll know once we provisioned it. So what we'll do now, um, and I want the outputs in the, the main module here, so we're gonna have to grab those. And we learned how to do that in the outputs section there. So we're gonna go back and I'm just gonna see how I did that. I'm a large propo uh, proponent of like always using your old code as you can tell. So we'll go up here, we'll paste that in like that. This is Apache. So we'll just say Apache here. And um, you know, hopefully that works as expected. So we'll do Terraform apply auto approve. I'm gonna be pretty pumped if that just worked first time uh, doing that uh, path there, because that was definitely a big guess on my part. Seems to be creating no problem. Okay, well, I'll see you here in a bit and then we'll just verify if the server works, okay? All right, so that is uh, finished provisioning. I don't think it's past the initializations, but you know sometimes it does work even if we don't do that. So what I can do is just check box this here, whoops. And uh, we'll just open that address in a new tab and see if we get that page. Not sure why it's not filling in the IP address. It's kind of annoying, um, but we'll go here and paste that in because it's trying to hit the HTTPS. And so, yeah, there you go. So it looks like our module works. Uh, and that means that we can just wrap up uh, some of the documentation here and then we can uh, go ahead and see how we can publish it on the Terraform registry. So um, what I wanna do is just update my documentation here. Um, and so we will go back to our readme, um, not this readme, um, the actual readme for uh, this here. And we will paste in our HCL and we'll just clear up some of our values. So um, my own IP address. Right, and then we'll just clear that out and say like zero, 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 zero. And then here, you know, it's the same thing. It's just like, okay. So nothing super complicated here. Um, and so pretty much this is ready to move on to the publishing thing. So we'll make that a separate little follow along here. Uh, but this is pretty much done here, okay? All right, so we're gonna go ahead and uh, start publishing our um, module here to the Terraform registry. And by the way, if you forgot to, and I might not have told you, but you need to go and destroy that previous instance. So I'm gonna just do Terraform apply auto approve, uh, destroy. Okay. And uh, what we need to do is make our way over to GitHub. And we're gonna have to create ourselves a new repository here. So we'll go here and I'm gonna create myself a new repository. I'm gonna put it under exam pro co and, we'll, and we're gonna name it exactly what it is. So Terraform, AWS, um, Apache example, I think that's what we called it. Probably have to spell that right though. And if I look here on the left-hand side, Terraform, AWS, Apache, example, okay? And we're gonna set that as public. And we're gonna go ahead and say create repository. And we're gonna go ahead and initialize that. So just waiting for the server to be uh, finished destroying there, that's all good. And so what we'll do is CD into the subdirectory here and we'll go get init. And one thing I want to do is actually go check out what um, Terraform module, VPC, GitHub, doesn't matter which one. I just want to see what he put in his .gitignore file so I, I can figure that out as well. 
And I'm just gonna go copy that because I bet it's good. Okay. So let's say new file here, we'll say dot get ignore. Get ignore here and paste that contents. Okay. And I'm just gonna click back here and just see if there's anything else I'm missing. Doesn't seem like it. And what we are going to do here, whoops, so we're gonna go git add all. We'll go back to our GitHub instructions here, if I can find it. And we're just gonna go down the list, so we'll copy that in, okay. And then we'll make our first commit. And we'll create our main branch. And we'll paste that in there, create our origin. Okay, so that's set up for main tracking. And so if we refresh this, it is now set up there. The only thing that's not showing up is our highlighting, which I'm a bit surprised. I think it's because I didn't name this readme.md, so we'll just rename that here to .md. And we'll say git at all, git commit m, fix readme file type, okay, get push, and we'll flip back here, and there it is, some crazy indentation uh, there, I'm not sure why, maybe that's what's happening on mine, I'm going to go into the main, or into the readme here, is it really that crazy, like it's that level of indentation, it should, shouldn't be, Okay, well, I mean, it's not a big deal. It's just aesthetic. Might want to update the description here. So this is, um, oh, we have a little spelling mistake there too. I'm gonna leave it in there just because I know like how much spelling mistakes bother people. And so that's gonna give somebody an opportunity to, uh, you know, interact with my uh, repo. So I'll just leave it in there. That's like my personal little touch. So uh, now that that's all set up, um, what we want to do is actually just publish it. So we're going to go ahead over to the Terraform registry and click on here. And I want to just go ahead and sign in and sign in with GitHub. And I guess we're granting to everything here because it doesn't seem like we have any other option to say just a few there. If there is, I'm, I'm not uh, being smart about it, okay? And I need my password for GitHub, so I'm just gonna go ahead and grab that off screen here. I'm just getting it from my um, provider. I like my password uh, thing. And I'm having a really hard time finding it right now. There it is, found it, okay. So we'll just paste that on in there. We'll hit confirm. And so what we want to do here is go and hit publish a module. And we're going to go select the repo so it already kind of autofilled and we are going to agree to the terms of use. We probably should read it, right? I agree that I won't do anything bad. Okay. That was me reading the whole thing. I'm a speed reader. We'll go ahead and hit publish. No release tags found that are in the valid format. Please ensure the repository has at least one tag formatted V version where version is semantic version. That's fair. So what we're gonna do, just to see how that is, we're gonna go Terraform modules. Again, it doesn't matter, um, GitHub. And we're just gonna take a look at uh, one of the repositories here. I'm just wondering if it's how, yeah, so he puts the V in front of it. I really don't like the V. And I think that we don't have to. It says, yeah, V or version. So I'm going to I'm gonna do the opposite of what Anton's doing. And I'm going to not have V in mind. Okay. So what we'll do here is go over to the 110 modules. And I'm going to go git tag 1.0.0. .0. Um, oh, sorry. We got to go into the subdirectory there, and we'll again do that. Probably still have that other one open there. I don't know why I have two now. I'm gonna just close this redundant one, I don't need two. 
and we'll do git tag push or it's git push tags. I should know this, I do this all the time. There we go, so our version has been pushed. And so now I'm going to try this again and hit refresh. Click on that, publish the module, give it a moment. And there we go, I'm in. So yeah, um, there it is. Cool, eh? And that's all there really is to it. Uh, you can see that I've had less than 100 people provision this, so I guess I have uh, some work to do to promote this. But, you know, if you want to provision it and give the project a star and I become uh, super famous here, I, I wouldn't mind it. Um, but, yeah, you'll notice, like, I, I did the AWS there and it picked it up and so it shows the AWS logo. Um, but, yeah, so we're all done here. Uh, I don't think there's any infrastructure for us to tear down. So, yeah, that was fun. <laughs> Let's talk about core Terraform workflows. And these have three steps, write, plan, and apply. So write, plan, and apply. We saw this uh, kind of in the Terraform uh, life cycle. Uh, and the idea here is that, you know, it's just to try to describe what it's gonna be for your team and requirements as you grow and you're utilizing this workflow. So if you are talking about individual practitioners, so a single person, a team using OSS, so they're not using, they're using open source software, so they're using Terraform, but they're not using the Terraform Cloud Platform. And then what it would be like if they're using the Terraform Cloud Platform. In terms of this right plan apply, you're gonna see these examples don't perfectly fit here. I am just presenting uh, a summarized versions of the uh, documentation. And the reason why is because on the exam, this is one of um, the subdomains that you need to know. Um, so I'm not saying that I think these are perfectly presented, but I think that I have to cover them because they are on the exam. And I, you do learn something here, so we will go through them, okay? Well, so let's take a look at uh, a Terraform or team workflow for a single person, an individual practitioner, looking at the write step first. So you're gonna be writing your Terraform configuration in your editor of choice on your computer. Um, but the thing is you'll be storing your Terraform code in something like GitHub. Even if you are an individual user, you're gonna be putting in Git or GitHub or some kind of version control system. You're going to be repeatedly running Terraform plan or even possibly Terraform validate to find syntax errors. And the great thing about this is that you get this tight feedback loop between editing the code and running your test commands because it's all on your local machine. We're not sending things off to build servers or uh, other services. So it's very uh, fast and easy. Uh, talking about the plan stage, so when the developer is confident with their workflow in the right step, they commit their code to their local repository. This is the stage where it's a local commit, it's not a remote commit. Uh, they may be only using a single branch, so just you probably working in main, or if you're still using the old syntax, master branch. Uh, once their commit is written, they'll proceed to apply. That'll bring us to the apply stage. So they will run Terraform apply. This is on your local machine. It's not it, part of any other process. You're just running Terraform apply, and they'll be prompted to review their plan. After the review, the final review, they will approve the changes and await provisioning. After a successful provision, they will push their local commits to their remote repository. So this is where you will then finally commit your code. Uh, so there you go. So we looked at what it would be like if we had a single person working with Terraform. Let's talk about if it's a team and they're not using Terraform Cloud, they're just doing it uh, the old fashioned way, okay? So each team member writes code locally on their machine in their editor of choice as per usual. A team member will store their code in a branch in their code repository, whether it's a uh, per feature, per user, uh, per whatever is up to you. Um, branches help avoid conflicts while a member is working on their code, but branches will allow an opportunity to resolve conflicts during a merge into main. It's no different than working with you know code because that's what it is. Uh, Terraform plan can be used as a quick feedback loop for small teams, so we still have that option. But as your team grows larger, a concern over sensitive credentials becomes a concern. And so this is where you may need to introduce a CI CD process. Um, so that it's it's going to be in control of the credential. So the idea is that you don't run plan, you just push to your branch and it could run it or it only happens on pull requests. That's up to you know your team and how they decide to set it up. 
When a branch is ready to be incorporated on pull requests, an execution plan can be generated. I guess when we say execution plan, this could be a speculative plan, okay? So it's not something we're gonna run, it's just something we're gonna review and displayed within the pull request for review. To apply the changes, the merges need to be approved and merged, which will kick off a code build server that will run Terraform apply. That's the apply stage there. So this is all good, but uh, what we need to kind of highlight is all the work and labor that goes into setting up your own team if you're going to do it all uh, from scratch without Terraform Cloud. So the DevOps team has to set up and maintain their own CI CD pipeline. They have to figure out how to store the state files, whether they're going to be um, in a standard back in a remote state or they're going to encrypt it and put them into the uh, code repository, which is not recommended. They are limited in their access controls, so they can't do granular actions to say, okay, I only want to allow this person to destroy and this person to apply. It's not like that with uh, Git uh, repos. Um, they have to figure out a way to safely store and inject secrets into their build server's runtime. Uh, and that's not argue, argue, It's not very hard depending on the solution that you choose, but it is a thing that they have to figure out. Uh, they might need to manage multiple environments, and this can create additional overhead because for each environment, you'll have to create uh, another CI CD pipeline, okay? So hopefully that gives you the idea of the effort here, and this is gonna set us up to say what Terraform Cloud is going to solve, okay? Let's take a look at what our team workflow or our Terraform workflow will be if we are using Terraform Cloud. So a team will use Terraform Cloud as a remote backend. Of course, they're using uh, their favorite editor as per usual, working on their local machines to write that code. The input variables will be stored on Terraform Cloud instead of their local machine. Terraform Cloud integrates with your uh, version control system, such as Git, to quickly set up a CI/CD pipeline. A team member writes code to a branch it commits per usual, so that doesn't change. A pull request is uh, created by a team member, and Terraform Cloud will generate the speculative or execution plan, however you want to call it, for review in your version control system. The member can also review and comment on the plan in Terraform Cloud. Uh, after the pull request is merged, Terraform Cloud uh, in the Terraform Cloud runtime, sorry, the Terraform Cloud runtime will perform a Terraform apply and a team member can confirm and apply the changes within the Terraform Cloud uh, UI. Okay, so Terraform Cloud streamlines a lot of the CI CD effort, storing it, storing and securing sensitive credentials, and makes it easier to go back and audit the history of multiple runs. So in terms of the exam, if and I didn't see any questions on this, but I know they exist, they're just gonna be asking you, you know, which, like they might describe something and say, which kind of workflow does this fit? And so if you generally know the difference between Terraform Cloud, working with a team uh, open source software without Terraform Cloud and an individual workflow, it's not too hard, you'll be okay, all right? <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are on to the Terraform workflows. And so I, you know, I listed out here individual Terraform workflow, but I think really what I want to do is just show you how to use um, uh, the VS uh, the VSC workflow because we've been mostly working with the CLI, and also just like committing our code in a way that we should be doing it. Okay, so what I'm going to do is um, I guess start a new project here. And I'm just thinking about it here. Uh, we did just create that module and I kind of feel like using that module right away just to kind of get this going. So what I'm gonna do is create myself a new main file here, main.tf. And I'm gonna go back to the previous project here where we have this. I'm gonna copy this over and we are going to uh, paste that on in here. And so this has my credentials here. There's some sensitive stuff that I probably wouldn't want to be passing in here. So what I'm going to do is make myself a um, variables dot, or sorry, not variables, terraform dot tfrs. And I'm going to just copy the contents here, like so. And I'm going to paste it on in as such. And uh, then what we're going to do is set up a, a bunch of variables here. So we'll have var.vpcid. We'll have var. And we'll just name them all the same, okay? We probably could grab that, uh, that key via um, using like the file system, but I'm not going to do that. And I'm going to grab this here. 
whoops, var.server name. Okay. And we do need to set up our variables. So I'm going to make a new file here. We'll call this variables. Uh, well, variables.tf would probably be better, right? And we will go to our modules here. And luckily, all we got to do is grab this. So we'll grab that. And I'm going to go to our new one here. Um, am I in the right? Nope, I'm still in modules. Workflow is good. We're going to go ahead and paste that on in. I'm just going to remove the defaults. Okay, uh, we want to explicitly set all these. Okay, and so that's all set up and we're going to have to create ourselves a new repository. So I'm going to do git, whoops. Git init. And I'm going to go ahead and make myself a new repo. I'm going to make this a private repo, by the way. So we will go to GitHub here, make a new repo. And yeah, I'll put it under Roman King and this will just be like VSC Terraform or version control system. I always get that VSC, VCS mixed up. You can't tell I'm dyslexic and I, I literally am dyslexic. So uh, we have that set as private and that's totally fine. We're gonna create ourselves that repository and we have uh, established that init. I think I'm gonna go ahead and grab the .git ignore file that we um, had there a moment ago with our modules that was in our sub module there because I thought that was pretty good. Get ignore there. So we'll go ahead and grab that. And we will create ourselves a new file. This will be dot get ignore. We'll go paste that on in there. And so we just have to go through this whole process. So Git add all, git commit, switch over to main. And we will switch over to this. I kind of want this menu. I'm sure you can move it to the right, but I kind of want it on the right just so when I click over here, I'm not clicking onto a different file. And we will go ahead and push this. Uh, let's just refresh this. Nothing has been pushed yet. Get remote add. So we add the main. Did our commit not work here? Oh, you know what? I might, I'm in the wrong uh, folder. That's fair. As always, wrong folder, Andrew. Okay, so we'll do git add all. Whoop. Oh, well, get in it, I guess. Get at all. Get commit. Get branch main. Get add remote. Get push. Sure, we'll set it like that. We will make sure that our code is up to date. Great, no readme and that's totally fine. Um, and so what we'll do is make our way over to Terraform Cloud, okay? So we'll go over here and close that out. We will sign in and I'm gonna just create myself a new workspace. We haven't really done anything with this provisioners. I can go ahead and delete this. We're not even using this anymore. So go ahead and delete that. Uh, yeah, delete Terraform Cloud. Put the name in provisioners. Delete this workspace. And we'll go back to our workspaces here. We'll create a new one. And we're gonna choose a version control workflow. We're gonna go down to GitHub, choose github.com, authorize it, give them everything. Uh, please disable block up popper. Okay, so we'll go up here. Done. No, 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 always. Always allow here, sorry. So we're gonna GitHub here, authorize Terraform Cloud. 
This is in my personal account. Um, we only need it for a select repository. So what did we call this? It was VCS. There it is. It's a private repo. Install. And there it is. I gotta select it. I don't know if I have to do anything there. Terraform working directory. Uh, workspaces with no Terraform working directory will always trigger runs. I guess I will be doing that. The default branch is, I'm not sure what it is, but I'm gonna set it as main. Uh, the branch from which to import new versions, this defaults to the value your version control provides by default branch. Well, then it's gonna be main anyway, so I don't have to change that. Uh, we don't have any sub modules, so we'll go ahead and hit create workspace. Okay, so our workspace is set up. Um, we are going to need to set our variables. So we're going to make our way over here. And we're going to go ahead and add this here. If there's a way to do like an import, I would love to know if like Terraform is watching this, like HashiCorp. If there's a way, I'd love to know how to just like one import my uh, file there. But you probably have to bring it one over at a time. It's probably like a security reason for that. So we'll go over here into our variables, whoops, our TFRs. And we should probably check to make sure that this works. Um, no, nah, I'm pretty confident with it. So we're just gonna copy these over. So first we have our VPC ID. I'm just gonna make this a little bit smaller. Okay, so we have VPC ID. We're gonna save that. And then we have this IP address. I'll just copy this one at a time. And we'll add that. We need our public key. This we will consider, I guess, sensitive. And we will paste that on in there. Um, we will Specify our T2 micro here. That would be instance type. We are going to need our server name here. Okay, and we do need to set our AWS uh, environment variables here. So I'm going to go over um, to AWS provider Terraform. I can never, ever, ever remember <laughs> those environment variables, even though I work with AWS the most and super frequently, I can never remember them. So we go here to this, to documentation. We're gonna scroll on down and there they are. So we're gonna grab that one. And uh, did I close? Nope, I didn't. Okay, good. So we have that key. And I'm just going to cat my AWS credentials. Again, I'm going to get rid of this, so there's no chance that this is gonna get abused at any time here. And we need a secret here. Fun, 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 fun. And I should be making these sensitive because they are super sensitive. And we'll add a variable here. And this one will be our default. US East one. We will save that. And so this is all set up. Okay. And so it should trigger whenever there is some kind of change to the repository. Now, I don't know if it's gonna change every time. So like if I make a change or I add a readme file, I don't know if that's going to trigger it. And so I think that should be uh, interesting to find out, okay? So your configuration has been uploaded next. You probably wanna configure variables. We just did that. What's queue plans? Oh, okay, like if we wanna run something. 
And so triggered a few seconds ago. I'm not sure what's talking about. I didn't do anything. Unreadable module directory, unable to evaluate the directory sim link at Terraform. Oh, that's right, because we published it. We actually never tried our module um, after we published it and we need to refer to it. And that's a great opportunity for us to update this file here. Um, so we want to uh, reference it from Terraform. So we'll go registry Terraform and we're gonna find our sweet, sweet module. Can I go to my profile to show my module under there? I've published a module, what are they talking about? <laughs> I've definitely published a module. Um, so we'll go uh, to modules here and we're gonna go over to, what would we call it? Terraform, AWS, Apache. Oh, it's not gonna show up because they don't show uh, show them under there, eh? Oh, well, it's under modules here, AWS. Oh, I don't like that. Okay, so that's a bit tricky, but I think we can find it. So this one here is Terraform AWS module. So we could probably just do Terraform Apache example. What? Come on, my module's published. They told me it was published, right? I'm not crazy, am I? We'll do it one more time. Yeah, it was already published. Well, there it is. Okay, so we found it. It was a little bit tricky. And so uh, we just gotta grab uh, grab this here. And I'm just gonna go and swap out the source. And I guess we should set the version. And we will do a Terraform init. Oh, but something we haven't done is set up our, our workspace here. So that's another thing we're gonna have to do. Um, we don't have any instructions, I don't think in our CLI or sorry, in our overview here, no. So we're just gonna have to go back to our getting started one where we've actually used Terraform Cloud and use that as an example. So we will go over to our, to what is under providers? No, it's under main, here it is. And so I'm gonna go ahead and grab this here. And we'll go back here and we'll paste it in at the top. And this one is going to be VCS. What did we call this? Terraform. Terraform. And I feel like I'm missing a curly brace here. Yeah, I am. And so what we're gonna do again is do Terraform init. And then we're gonna go Terraform plan. Because that's what you would do. You'd say, okay, does this plan look good before I push it out, right? Running the plan in the remote backend output will stream here. We'll stop streaming the log. So uh, I guess we can see the run happening. Not seeing the run here, but it was streaming it out, it said. So if I went to, where's that run here? Copy that. And we'll grab it here. So here we can see the run. This was started as a speculative plan, so it cannot be applied. And that makes sense, right? Uh, if I go back to my runs here, does it show up? So it doesn't show under here, but we can see it in isolate. I don't know why they do that. I guess it's because it's not a real run. It's just kind of like a speculative one. So I'm not really sure about that, why they would do it like that, but that's what it is. Um, so I think this is all good to go. Like we just, we look at our and be like, yeah, this is great, right? And so now what we'll do is we will go get, um, status, we'll say git at all, git commit hyphen m, and this is going to be um, 
make it work, you know, because that's what we want to do. We want to make it work and we'll do a git push. And so what that should do, oh, I just pushed to the main branch. <laughs> you know what? Like that's not what I should have done. I should have made a pull request and then merged it in. But the point is it doesn't matter if you push anything uh, there, it should deploy it. And wow, I really spelled work wrong. W-O-W-R-K. Terrible. That's awful. Uh, so we'll give that a moment to deploy. It's now in plan, so we can close in here and watch it if we want. Oh, and it's, it's a pending, so it's waiting for us to uh, accept it there, eh? So, wow, this is actually really nice. I, I hadn't ever seen this before in the UI, so I guess when it does that, you can go here, and this is a lot easier way to navigate I think that if I knew this earlier, I would never, ever, ever output here because it just sucks there. And so if I'm happy with it, I can confirm and apply. I can add a comment. Looks great. And since we actually haven't deployed anything yet, I actually do want to go ahead and confirm it. And I guess I have to write a message. So I will um, accept um, everything that goes wrong here. So that's pretty cool. And so we're going to watch that run. And I'll see you back here when the server's provisioned, okay? All right, so after a little wait here, it looks like our server is provisioned and, you know, it shows us that we have our resources have been created there. And we can see our outputs. And so if we go over to AWS, we'll just see if our server is running and it absolutely is. And so now what I want to do is actually do a branch and then push that branch and do a pull request because as far as I understand, it's going to output some stuff for us in our PR. And that's what I want to see. So what I'm going to do is make a new branch here. We're going to go git checkout hyphen B and we'll just say um, add tags. And we're going to go into here. And I want to go down to our module. So our module's here. And I don't think we're gonna be able to modify the server directly and add tags to it. So I guess what I'll have to do is just add another resource. So I probably shouldn't have called it tags. It's kind of like too late now. Um, I actually, no, it's not too late. I'm gonna move back and fix that. So we'll go back here, get checkout main. We'll say git checkout hyphen B, and I'm gonna just say S3 bucket. We'll do that instead. And so we will add our S3 bucket. So this will be resource AWS S3 bucket. And we just need a name here. So we'll give it a name. And uh, we can randomize out the name because there, there are functions like random with, um, with whatchamacallit here. So I'm gonna go built in functions. I'm just Googling this really quickly here. Terraform random. Um, you know, even if it wasn't that, we could probably just use a UUID as well. That probably worked pretty well. Yeah, let's do that. So I'm gonna go here and curly's here and we'll just say um, VSC. VSC, VCS. <laughs> you can't imagine how many times I made that mistake when I made the lecture content way too many times. So what we'll do is do a Terraform plan just to see if it's happy with that. Um, we actually have to give it a name, say bucket. And so it's going to just run that plan there. And we'll just wait here. Um, an argument name named name is not expected here. Okay, so maybe it's called like bucket name or something. Maybe it's just called bucket. Terraform. So it's just called bucket. It's just bucket. My bad. Bucket. I guess the only problem with using the UID there is every time we run it, it will change. 
So we probably shouldn't have called it UUID like that. That's probably a bad idea now that I think about it. Yeah, so I think what I'll do instead of doing that is I'm just going to set a new variable in here. Say like bucket. And I'm just going to default it to something like and we'll go back over here and I'm just going to say var bucket and uh, I'm going to do another plan here, just making sure everything is okay. Great, and so that plan is all good. And so now what we're going to do is go get add, get commit, m, add bucket. We're gonna do git push. It's gonna ask us to push upstream. So we're gonna copy that, paste that in there, hit enter. And what we'll do is make our way over to our browser. We're gonna go over to GitHub here. And I'm not gonna bug um, HashiCorp today. I'd like to bug them quite a bit. Uh, and we'll go to GitHub and we'll find our new project. What did I call this? VCS, right? VCS, Terraform. And there's a thing here. So I'm gonna go ahead and create this pull request. And it's asking to merge into main. And I'm gonna go over to Terraform and see if it does anything interesting. Oh, we got all our resources there. That's pretty nice. Uh, we'll go back over to... Here, there are no conflicts. We can definitely uh, merge and accept this. I thought, I thought it would generate out a plan here. I really thought that it would do that. So I'm just wondering if maybe I don't have it configured how I think I, I do. Um, don't trigger speculative plans for pull requests to this repository. For pull requests to this repository. That's that's what I wanted. I want to turn that on. So we'll update that. And so now my question is, if I go back to my pull request, is it going to generate one? I don't see one. Maybe it's from then on out. So what I'm going to do is get rid of this um, pull request. Uh, close this pull request. And I'm going to reopen it. Maybe that will trigger it. Ah, see, here, here we go. So now I think it's going to create a speculative plan here first. So we're just waiting for that to finish. Great, and so uh, if we we see that it generated a speculative plan, I guess I thought it would output it in here. If we go show all checks, so it's not here, but it produced I guess a speculative pa uh, plan somewhere. I really thought it would be in line here. Okay, if we go to runs, I don't know where those speculative plans go. So. <laughs> They're somewhere, right? I mean, it's great that it ran it. Um, I just wish I knew where they were. And maybe like it would show us a link to it in there. So maybe I can get a link. Details. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So maybe like someone could click in and just review it and that's what they would do. So what we're gonna do is go ahead and merge that pull request. 
still using my old emails there, but that's fine. So we're going to add that bucket. And we're going to go back over to here. And we're going to see that's now running there. So that's pretty much it for workflows. And that pretty much covers, like, I mean, technically we did it as an individual. And so, you know, if I was an individual, I would use the, the version control system, like as opposed to the CLI. Um, but this will also be for Terraform clouds. We're not like covering the, the remote one, the, uh, the middle tier there, just cause it's a lot uh, like the, um, the Terraform workflows for teams without cloud, because it's just a lot of work. Um, and, you know, I, I honestly think that you should use Terraform Cloud there. So, you know, once this is done, we need to kind of pull it down. But, you know, I don't want to get rid of it because we might come back to this particular project. And so maybe we can just destroy the resources here. So I'm going to go to our settings and just take a look here. When enabled, this setting allows destroy plans to be created and stuff like that. Um, queuing a destroy plan will, will redirect to a new plan and will destroy all the infrastructure managed by Terraform. It is equivalent of running the Terraform plan. Destroy. So I think we'll try that once this is done. Shouldn't take too long here. Oh, maybe we have to accept it in here. So I think that's the thing is like, if you were to, if you were to have pull requests, it'd be kind of annoying to have to like double accept this every time. So I think this is where you would go to general and you'd have auto apply turned on, right? And I will flip that on because that's gonna get annoying if I'm gonna have to keep on doing that. Okay. And so that's applied. This will go pretty fast, it's already done. And so we'll go back over to uh, settings here because I just wanna destroy the infrastructure but I don't necessarily wanna get rid of the state file or anything else, um, like all the work we put into this. So I'm gonna say queue a destroy plan and I'm just going to type in the workspace name. So this is VCS Terraform. And I believe this will just tear everything down. But we'll leave our workspace in place. So we'll give it a moment. Because I definitely think we're going to come back to this uh, when we're looking at Terraform Cloud, okay? So we have four resources we want to uh, possibly destroy there. And it's, it has auto apply, so it's gonna just automatically start doing that. We're not even gonna confirm it. I wonder if they should make like a feature that should just be auto, like auto approved for just apply or, you know, et cetera like that. That might be something they should, might, might want to offer. Because in that case, I kind of felt like I should have confirmed that because it's not going through the, um, the version control system where I'm doing a pull request. I just happen to be destroying it. But anyway, that's good for now. And I feel like this satisfies it and we'll come back to this, uh, this setup, okay? All right, we're taking a look here at backends and each Terraform configuration can specify a backend which defines where and how operations are performed and where state snapshots are stored. So Terraform divides their backends into two types. We have standard and enhanced. First looking at standard, this is where you can only store the state. Uh, and it does not perform Terraform operations such as Terraform apply. So to perform operations, you have to use a CLI on your local machine. Uh, and the reason why is that standard backends are basically third party backends. So a standard backend could be AWS S3. And so, you know, this is a stored service. It doesn't have the capabilities of pragmatically triggering things, okay? Uh, when we have, when we're talking about enhanced backends, we can store both the state and perform Terraform operations. So enhanced backends are subdivided further. So we have local, so files and data are stored on the local machine executing Terraform commands and remote. So files and data are stored in the cloud, so Terraform cloud. The reason why they can perform Terraform operations, and when you look at local and remote, local is your machine. So of course it can execute Terraform and then remote is Terraform cloud, which has its own runtime environment basically a build server. So it, of course, uh, can do both those operations. And that's how you're gonna remember the difference between those two, okay?
All right, so we were just talking about standard and enhanced backends, and I was saying that standard backends are basically third-party providers. So it's something other than Terraform Cloud. So let's take a look at what options we have available to us, starting with the uh, major cloud service providers. So AWS has Simple Storage, S3. Azure um, has Block Storage Account. Notice it says Azure RM because that's just the name of what they call it. I don't know what the RM stands for. Resource Manager, I imagine. Um, Google Cloud Storage is an option. Then we have Alibaba, we have OpenStack, we have Tencent, and then we have um, Manta, which is part of Joynet's uh, cloud storage. So uh, I don't think a lot of people are going to remember Joynet. Joynet was a very popular provider like post or pre-2010. Uh, so I remember them. Tencent is a uh, Asia provider. I think they were um, a texting service. They're very popular, but they're not the largest provider over in Asia. Alibaba is. Um, and of course, we have the, the three major ones here. And then OpenStack is for uh, private cloud, okay? Then on the other side of it, when we're looking at more uh, exotic or things that aren't cloud service providers, we have um, Artifactory. Uh, we have HashiCorp Console, ETCD. Postgres database, Kubernetes secrets, and you can also use the HTTP protocol. Now notice I have these little locks here. Uh, that's indicating which have state locking, which do not. If you don't know what state locking is, don't worry, we'll talk about it here uh, in a moment. Um, would there be a question on the exam saying, oh, which service you know doesn't have state locking? And the answer is no, they would never ask that. It's too uh, minute. But just notice that the only thing that doesn't have state locking is uh, Artifactory, which I'm kind of surprised because it's a universal repository man uh, manager. Uh, and there's the one case like with HP protocol where it's optional. So it's not that you can't have it. It's just that it's not, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be there. And in particular, some, the, the state is, um, or the locking, state locking is by another service. So for AWS, it's DynamoDB that is doing the state locking. And then with Alibaba, uh, uh, Alibaba's cloud storage, it's table store. Okay. So, uh, you know, there's not much to know here, but, uh, you know, it's just kind of interesting. If you want to have a different kind of backend, maybe you want to use Postgres because you're really familiar with it, you can actually store it there. Okay. So let's take a look at what it would look like if we were to use a standard backend. So here's an example for AWS, uh, since I think S3 is very popular. Uh, so if you were to set up your backend, so here I have a bucket um, here. And I've, I have to name the state file, so I call it state file, and then I give it the region, and there it is. So the backup of a state file will reside on your local machine, so the backup's not going to be in S3. Uh, configuring a standard backend does not require Terraform Cloud Account or Workspace, um, because, you know, it's just it's totally separate from it. So that's something I wasn't sure when I was first using it was, okay, can I use a standard backend, but I still have to have a Terraform Account or Workspace? And the answer is no, all right? <laughs> All right, so we're taking a look at enhanced backend. So we're gonna start with local and then move on to remote. So for the local backend, we store the state on the local file system and it locks the state using the system's API. It also performs operations locally. And when we say local, we just mean a local machine. We don't necessarily mean it has to be our workstation. A code build server could also be considered uh, a local machine, okay? It just means anything but Terraform Cloud that is running the Terraform code. Uh, so by default, you are using the backend state when you have uh, not specified any kind of backend. So normally you'd see a background def uh, defined in here and we don't. So it's going to just default to the local. Uh, you can specify the backend with an argument local. Most people don't, we just leave it blank. And you can change the path to the local file and working directory. So I think that um, if you were to specify, you'd want to put the path in, but generally, again, we keep that blank. Um, you can set a backend to reference another state file so you can read its outputted values. This is a way of cross-referencing stacks. So just notice that we have this thing that says Terraform Remote State. We're going to repeat this later on in the course uh, because this is a very important concept and I feel that it gets overlooked in the documentation, but uh, it has to do with local backends. So the idea is that um, you could say, hey, um, I have this other file that has a backend and I'm just going to use data sources, specify its backend, and then point to its actual Terraform state file, okay? <laughs> All right, we're taking a look here at remote backends for the enhanced backend type. And a remote backend uses the Terraform platform, which is either Terraform Cloud or Terraform Enterprise. Uh, by default, I usually just say Terraform Cloud when I'm referring to the Terraform platform, but just to understand there is a distinction between Terraform Cloud and Terraform Enterprise, Enterprise being the on-premise um, offering, okay? 
So with a remote backend, when Terraform apply is performed via the CLI, the Terraform cloud run environment is responsible for executing the operation. So that's what you get when you get Terraform cloud, you get this run environment. So it's basically just a built-in uh, code build server uh, to run Terraform commands for you. One thing I really want you to know about remote backends, because this really tripped me up uh, when I was actually trying to make the follow along, which is the fact that because the Terraform Cloud run environment is the one executing the command, your provider credentials need to be configured in the environment variables in Terraform Cloud. So, you know, if you had a project and you configured it with um, TF vars locally, and then you were to swap out your remote backend, uh, it's not going to work the way you expect it to because. Um, Again, the Terraform cloud run environment is not going to take your credentials and then move them to the cloud, okay? You have to do that yourself. Um, when using a remote backend, you need to set a Terraform cloud workspace. So you would uh, go ahead and go to Terraform cloud and just go create one. You create one or multiple ones for a single project. If you use a single workspace for a project, you're just gonna use the workspaces uh, name. And if you set multiple workspaces via prefix, uh, you can use a prefix, okay? And the way this prefix works is that you're gonna say like my app or something. And when you go to run Terraform apply, what it's going to do is prompt you to say, which environment do you wanna use? So, uh, th and this is what you've created in your Terraform cloud workspace. You've created one called dev, you created one called pro uh, prod and saying, which workspace do you want to deploy to? I want you to know that uh, you can only set uh, either name or prefix, you can't set both, okay? so. Just understand that. So since we're talking about backends, let's talk about backend initialization. And in particular, the backend hyphen config flag, this is more of an exotic option, but uh, I figured we should go over it because it could appear on your exam. So uh, the flag for uh, the backend config flag for Terraform init can be used for partial backend configuration. So in situations where the backend settings are dynamic or sensitive, uh, so they cannot be uh, statically specified in your configuration file. This is what you would do. So here would be your, your main.tf. And notice it says back and remote, and it has no details in it. So then what you do is you create a separate file called backend.hcl, and now you're specifying the workspace, the host name, the organization. And then uh, with Terraform init, you're going to then say, okay, use this file as the uh, backend information that we're going to inject into our backend remote. So there you go. Okay, we're taking a look here at Terraform remote state, and I give this a lot more attention in the course because I feel that it gets uh, overlooked within the Terraform documentation. It's such a powerful feature, and it's something that I'm used to having in CloudFormation, which is cross-referencing stacks, so I wanna make sure that you know it too. So Terraform remote state data source retrieves the root module output values from another Terraform configuration file using the latest state snapshot from the remote backend. So the idea is that you can reference a, a state file from somewhere else. You can do it uh, uh, via a remote backend and a local backend. So just take a look here. Uh, we see data and the data source is Terraform remote state and we're setting the backend as remote on the right hand side here it is local. And if it's a local backend, we give the path to the TF state file. If it's remote, that means it's another workspace in Terraform Cloud. So we set the workspace that we want to access. And then when we want to access those resources, we're using data sources. So we do data dot and then it's Terraform remote state. And then we specify it. Notice that it's no difference whether it's remote or local, but you're gonna be getting data from outputs, okay? So only the root level output values from the remote state snapshots are exposed. Resource data and output values from nested modules are not accessible. To make uh, module outputs values accessible as a root module output values, you must explicitly configure a pass-through in the root module. So here's just an example as of us doing a pass-through. So we have a module called app and it has a source, and then we're just setting an output. Notice that we are just grabbing the value and passing it along. I wanna tell you about the alternative to Terraform remote state because if you can, you should use these as opposed to using Terraform remote state. So Terraform remote state only exposes output values. Its users must have access to the entire state snapshot, which often includes some sensitive information. It's recommended explicitly, uh, uh, it, it, it's recommended explicitly publishing data for external consumption to a separate location instead of accessing it via a remote state. So what would be alternatives? Well, you've seen this because when we looked at data sources, we were technically we were using alternatives, but the idea is that 
you are going to say AWS S3 bucket, AWS Route 53 zones, and these are kind of already set up to work with AWS or whichever provider, okay? So um, that's that there. But uh, you know, hopefully that's pretty clear. So the idea is that when you can, use these data sources because you know they're actually working off of live data right like it's hitting a resource it's not just looking at a state file that contains data okay so we had mentioned state locking just briefly when we were looking at standard backends but let's go take a look in detail what these are because they're very important for your workflows so terraform will lock your state for all operations that could write state this prevents others from acquiring the lock and potentially corrupting your state. So state locking happens automatically on all operations that could write state. You won't see any message that it's happening if the state locking fails, all right? So Terraform does not output when a lock is complete. Um, however, if acquiring the lock is taking longer than expected, Terraform will output a status message. So neither on failure and neither when it is complete, just if it takes too long. So there's a transient issue, something with like a networking issue. Uh, you can disable lock. So what you do is use the hyphen lock flag, but it's tr generally not recommended. You can force an unlock. There's cases where uh, you know, it just does not unlock. Or, and so what you'll have to do is use the force unlock command. Um, if you unlock the state when someone else is holding the lock, it could cause multiple writers. Force unlock should only be used to unlock your own lock in the situation where automatic unlocked failed. To protect you, the force unlock command requires a unique lock ID. So Terraform will output this lock ID if unlocking fails. So this is what it would look like. So you have Terraform, force unlock, and then whatever the ID is, hyphen force. So yeah, there's a lot going on here, but um, yeah, that's what it is. All right, so let's talk about protecting sensitive data. So Terraform state file can contain sensitive data, so long lived AWS credentials, and is possible attack vector for malicious actors. And so when you're dealing with the local state, when you're using local backend, the state is stored in plain text JSON files. You need to be careful you do not share the state file with anyone. You need to be careful you do not commit this file to your Git repository. When you're using a remote state with Terraform Cloud, um, the idea here is the state file is held in memory and is not persisted to disk. The state file is encrypted at rest. The state file is encrypted in transit. With Terraform Enterprise, you have detailed audit logging for tampering evidence to take it one step further. So you can just see that there's a lot of work that has to be done when you are using it locally. Um, but with uh, Terraform Cloud, this is kind of the sell for Terraform Cloud is that it's just gonna do everything possible to make that secure. Would it be secure to use a remote state with a third-party storage? Let's talk about that. So you can store state with various third-party backends, but you need to be careful to review your backends capabilities to determine if you meet your security and compliance requirements. Some backends are, are not by default as secure as they could be. So for example, AWS S3, you, could, uh, have, you have to ensure encryption and versioning is turned on and you need to create a custom trail for data events so you can get tamper evidence logging if you turn on uh, data events for uh, custom uh, cloud trail events but one thing that if it's important to you is that you know if you use s3 it's not held in memory you know that'd be um, using a cloud hsm uh, or kms so you know you have to understand there are some trade-offs okay <laughs> Let's take a quick look here at Terraform ignore files. And if you know what git ignore files, it's pretty much the same thing. So when executing a remote plan or apply in a CLI driven run, an archive of your configuration directory is uploaded to Terraform Cloud. And so you can define paths to ignore from upload via the dot Terraform ignore file at the root of your configuration directory. If this file is not present, the archive will exclude the following by default. So dot git dot Terraform. Uh, and .terraform ignore works just like a .git ignore with the only difference is that you cannot have multiple .terraform ignore files in subdirectories, only the file in the root directory will be read. So there you go. And yes, I know there's a double the, okay? So <laughs> uh, don't worry about that. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are moving on to our uh, backends. And so the first thing we're gonna do is try to use a standard backend. So we're gonna back something with Amazon S3. So what I want you to do uh, is we're going to go find our folder here, which is called backends. And I think I'm just going to break this up into um, multiple files or folders, I should say, because I feel like we're gonna be doing more than one thing. 
So I'm just going to rename this folder to standard uh, S3 here. Okay, I'm going to create myself a new file uh, called main.tf. And what I'm going to do is type in Terraform here. And what we'll do is we'll go to the internet and we'll see uh, how this looks like for a standard backend. So we'll go type in sta standard S3 Terraform. Okay. We're going to scroll on down and there is our example. It's pretty darn simple uh, to set up Terraform there or for, um, uh, you know, AWS. And so we have our backend defined there and we're going to need a new bucket. So uh, we'll name that here in a moment. So I'm going to just call this uh, Terraform backend and I'm just going to pound in a few numbers here. And we're going to have a key. And so this is going to be our state file. So I'm just going to call this um, terraform.tf state. And we'll keep the region to US East 1. So now that we have our bucket defined, um, at least the name, we're going to go there to AWS and go ahead and create that bucket. So, you know, we have something to put that in. So we'll make our way over here and I'm going to go ahead and create myself a new bucket. Okay, scroll all the way down, hit create bucket. And so now we should have that bucket. That's all good to go. But we're going to need something to provision because we don't necessarily have anything here. So what I'm going to do is go to one of our uh, previous tutorials. Um, actually, I think the code in the uh, last one is pretty good with the exception that we don't want to have it uh, backed by... Um, we don't want it backed by all this stuff up here. So what we'll do is go grab all of this here. Okay. And I'm just going to go ahead and paste that on in. And I will also uh, bring over the variables.tf because we'll need that as well. So we'll say variables tf. And paste that on in. And we'll also grab our Terraform's tf vars to save us some time. Um, what's that? It's called Terraform TFRs. And we will paste the contents in there. And so now what we should be able to do is go into our folder here. And I'm going to do a Terraform init. I think that should just uh, be in good shape there. Now notice that we set it to S3, but we didn't specify a provider or details. I assume that it would just pick up those environment variables if they are set in our credentials, but I guess we'll find out here in a moment what's going to happen, okay? And while that's going, I'm just going to look here and see what they have for permissions. Um, I'm just looking for general permissions, configuration, like region and things like that. So, you know, uh, it looks like we would have to set a particular region and stuff like that. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and do a Terraform um, apply and see if this just works. And while that is going, we're just going to give a read here. So region is required um, if the DynamoDB table is used. The following configuration is optional. So the access key, the secret, IM endpoint, max we tries, the profile, and I am using the default profile, so that's totally fine. I would just assume, that, you know, if we want to do something besides the re like the default profile, we just go like profile default here or what have you. And so down below, I'm just going to type in yes. Well, it's going. We're just going to keep taking a look here. So yeah, there's a lot of options here. Um, DynamoDB endpoint. So custom endpoint for DynamoDB API. This can be sourced from the AWS DynamoDB uh, endpoint. So I guess if you provisioned a table or created a table, you just specify these two options to uh, add that there um, if you want locking, okay? But we'll give this a moment here and uh, see it all spin up, okay? See you back in a moment. All right, so after a short little wait here, um, our server is done provisioning. So what we can do is just confirm that. Um, and we'll go into our Terraform folder here and give it a refresh. And so there we have our Terraform TF state file. Um, and I want to see if there is a backup. And so, and here I don't see one. 
So I'm not sure what's going on. Like when local, when you're local, you're always going to get a backup here. Um, I didn't turn on versioning here. It probably wants us to have that versioning. Uh, it's highly recommended that you enable bucket versioning on the S3 bucket to allow the state recovery in the case of accidental uh, deletion or human error. I guess my one thought is, is that um, how would you keep track of previous versions, right? Like if I was to um, update this, uh, you know, what's going to happen? So here I'm just going to maybe just change the um, instance size. So we'll go over to variables or sorry, our, uh, yeah, I think it might be set in our TFRs there and we'll change this to a nano. And what I'm going to do is go ahead and deploy this again. So we'll say Terraform apply auto approve. Because what I'm really curious about is like the versioning, right? Because if we turn on versioning and then we look at S3, uh, will we see those multiple versions? Because that's just a way of like recovering older versions of the state file. And that might be something that is important for us to do. Because again, I don't see any backups over here. I could probably open up this folder here. And yeah, so I don't see any backups. All right, so I'll see you back here in a moment. Great, so after a short little wait there, this deploy is done. So we'll go back here and give it a refresh. And so, yeah, we don't uh, we don't have a, a, another file here. It's just the same file that it's overriding. So this is probably where we'd want to turn on our versioning. Um, and so I'm not sure if we can, we have to empty the bucket versioning as a means. I'm not always turning versioning on all the time. We'll go here and enable it. Uh, you might need to update your lifecycle rules to manage previous versions of objects, which is totally fine. Okay. And so what I'm going to do is go back over here. And I think if we go over here, we can actually see, um, we see like the version here. Hmm. I could have swore there used to be like an option here to, to see multiple versions, but that's totally fine. So um, I'm going to go ahead and see if I can do a Terraform destroy. Okay. Because I'm not sure if that file that we've placed uh, up there is actually being versioned. It might be the one after this. Not only when you turn versioning on, there's like no way to actually delete things. At least that's what I remember. So we'll see how this goes and I'll see you back here in a moment, okay? All right, after a short little wait, it teared everything down. So I wanna go back here and give this a refresh. And so our state file is still there. Um, and that's the thing with um, versioning. Oh, it's right here, that's the button. So we go here and we can see our multiple versions. Okay, so uh, I guess we might've just peeled back one there. And so what I'm gonna do is just switch this back to micro. Okay, oops, I don't wanna, I don't wanna destroy. <laughs> but we'll say Terraform, um, uh, Terraform plan again. Well, actually, I don't wanna plan, I just wanna apply it. Auto approve. Okay, and my thought process is still again, like if I'm doing destroy, am I like just falling back to the previous state file of the previous version? And the reason why that matters is that, um, you know, if you keep on destroying, that means that, um, you know, you're not getting, you're not going to have a state file that actually reflects uh, what it is, unless the Terraform destroy is writing a new version. If it's doing that, that would actually be pretty useful. That's what it might be doing. Um, and so that's something we should really be sure of here. So we'll do an apply. And what I want to see is another version appear. And then I want to do a destroy. And I want to see if it, it removes the, the state file or just adds another one uh, with the remove things. And I think it's going to be the latter, okay? But we should just definitively know here. So we'll see you back in a moment. All right, so this just finished here. So what I'm going to do is give this a nice little refresh. And you can see we have a new state file. And so what I'm gonna do is now do my Terraform destroy. So we'll do Terraform, um, apply, destroy, auto approve. Okay. And I will see you back here when this is done destroying. And we'll see if we have an additional file or if the last one was removed, okay?
All right, so another short wait here and our deploy is done. So what I'm gonna do is refresh and what we have is another state file. So that's what it's doing. It's just updating the state file, removing all of those things and applying it there. Um, some other things that might be important to you is turning on encryption. So if we go down to encryption, it's, it's disabled by default. And so there is an option to turn it on here, but I also noticed in the back end that they have it here as well. I'm not sure if that would flip the switch for you or if the fact that you need to have this enabled as well. It would be also really great if they told us if this was a Boolean or not. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Um, so if I was to go over to here, and we go up here and say encrypt, and say true, I'm not sure if it would take that. Let's just type Terraform init here. If you wish to migrate automatic migration for state Terraform init. So it sounds like it might have to do a lot of work there. So I think you'd probably want to turn that on before you do this. But that's something you wanted to do is probably have encryption and then make sure that no one can delete the original option uh, option or the um, object. Uh, but usually versioning takes care of that for you. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. So we'll move on to uh, the next part of our uh, backend stuff, okay? And uh, just as always, let's go ahead and destroy our um, infrastructure there. Almost forgot to do this as per usual. Um, and you probably might want to tear this down. So if you want to do that, I think you'd have to suspend it. But preserve existing object versions. Um, do not change. Okay, that's fine. We will save that change there. And I'm going to go ahead and press N yes here. Okay, and we'll go back to our objects. And I want to show the versions. I just want to see if I can empty this bucket here. Whoops, I don't want to open that. But hey, we can see the contents of that file, which is nice. Probably would have helped to show that as we were doing this. We'll go ahead and delete all these. Say permanently delete. And we'll go back over to our back end here. And now our bucket is empty. And so if you want to uh, delete this bucket, you just go back a layer here. And we'll go ahead and delete this bucket. There we go. This is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. And so we just set up a remote backend, or sorry, a standard backend with S3. Um, but that was just for a single uh, workspace. So imagine if we wanted to set up uh, this for multiple workspaces. So the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and create a new bucket. And by the way, we're not going to go and create a bunch of AWS accounts because I, I realize that's a lot of work for some people. But uh, what you, I want you to do is go and create that bucket. Um, so just make sure it is named the same here. And since we're using the same project, we might have to do like a Terraform init on this or even a migrate. Um, so this looks like, oh, sorry, I'm uh, initializing the wrong directory here. We got to go into 120. That's the one mine is called here. And we'll do a Terraform init here. Oh, sorry, sorry. That's the wrong <laughs> workflow. It's 130 for me. Having uh, what, like uh, one of those days where I'm a bit forgetful here, but we'll type in Terraform init. And because we had just used it, we'll have to do like a migrate state on it. Okay. And if that's giving us too much trouble, another thing that we can just do is just open this up. Uh, I don't want to find it in a folder. I just want to op uh, reveal that in my Explorer here, sorry. So we'll go uh, reveal and file explorer, and I'm going to bring that over. And I, we've deleted these, so we don't have them anymore. So it's not a big deal if we uh, delete them. So say continue. Try again. And really won't let me delete this here. Of course, I have permission. I'm the one who created it. So we'll say continue here. Okay, but that's fine. We'll try to do uh, terraforming it on it now. Maybe it will take now that uh, there's just the modules there. There we go. It's not always easy.
Great, and so now what we can do is just do Terraform uh, workspace list to see what workspaces we have. Or it's just workspace. And we do Terraform workspace new um, staging. And I do not need to update my GeForce drivers today. And then we can do one for production. And so the idea here is what we need to do, uh, and I have, uh, it's all in the S3 backend here, but I'm just kind of walking you through it. But the idea is what you'd first have to do is set up a variable here. And we, you know, we should probably put this in our variables folder, you know, since that would probably be more proper. And what this is doing is it's saying, okay, the default setting is a map and we have one value called staging or key and one key called production. And this is gonna be pointing to an, a role. And this role is gonna be in whatever account is doing the provisioning. So you could have one account that is just provisioning both the development or staging and production environments. Um, and so you'd have a user. And so if I went into uh, IAM here and I went to my users, I guess I just have to create a role. So I just create a role. Again, we're not gonna go fully do this, but it'd be like another AWS account or third party. We'd have to put the ID in there. Uh, and that's the way we would go assume that role. And so once we've created those, we, so we'd pr be providing the account IDs for each of those uh, and the name of the role there to over to uh, whatever it is. Uh, once we had that, then we can go over to our provider, which is in our main here and we can just provide this assume role here. Okay, and notice over here, it's getting the variable and then we're passing in terraform.workspace. This will select whatever workspace we're in. So for in production, it's gonna pass production in here and that's gonna go through and select this and assume that role and we will have permissions to then deploy to that. But things are gonna still be stored in this single uh, bucket as far as I'm aware of. Um, and so that's one part of it. But one thing that they don't even cover in the actual uh, documentation here is how are you gonna handle your terraform.tfvars? Because this is a file that generally you don't want to be tracking. Um, and so what you probably would do is you would create a new file here. So I would just go here and say um, staging.tfvars, right? And then when you want to, you just fill in all your environment variables in there. But when you want to go execute this, uh, when you are in production, you're gonna have to do Terraform, uh, apply, and you just do var hyphen file staging uh, TF vars, okay? And so there's not really an easier way of doing this. It's just pretty much it. And this will, once this, this runs, it will, it will, you know, it will, um, work that way. So you probably just make a staging and a production one and that's just how it would be. You'd have to update your git directory there. So whatever it would be, you'd have to go to dot git ignore and just you'd ignore everything that had TFRs. Um, I bet that git ignore file that we're using over here probably does a good job of that. If we just scroll up and down, yeah, see so it already ignores it there. So that's pretty much how you'd use uh, multiple environments. And again, it's just too much work to set up here and it's not really that important to the certification. So. Uh, there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we're going to be looking at the Terraform remote state. Uh, maybe not remote because that might be too much work to set up, but um, we'll definitely look at local here. So what I'm going to do is go on the left hand side here and then just find uh, my folder that I've uh, created there. And I guess I have backends there. So I'm going to need a new folder. Um, I feel like I should have all the folders here somewhere. Yes, I do. And we're just going to make a new one here. And we're just going to call it uh, 131 um, backends terraform remote state. And then within this, we're going to have to have two projects. So project one. And then we're going to have project two. Okay, and we're not gonna treat these as sub-modules, they'll both be root modules, uh, meaning like we're not gonna have a main in here. So we're just gonna go and make a main here, main.tf. 
And then we're going to add another one here, main.tf. And so what I want to do is provision something in one place and then access it somewhere else. So I think this is a good time to go and grab, um, I have some things open here, would be a good time to go and grab Anton's AWS module there. So let's say AWS VPC module. And we'll just expand this a little bit here. And so I just want to go ahead and grab that. And we will make that project one. Okay. So this looks fine. I want to do US East though. And we'll just say my Terraform VPC. So we uh, don't forget what it is. You know, I'm going to do a US East 2 just in case I have one in, hanging around US East 1 that I didn't delete. So I might have it from something else. And I mean, the this doesn't necessarily need us to specify the provider because it should get pulled in from this module here. And so I'm just going to navigate to that folder. Uh, 131 is what I've called it. And we want to go to project one here. And we'll do a Terraform init. Just wait a little while there. What I'm just curious about are the outputs to this. So there are a bunch of uh, outputs here. And I'm just looking for the VPC ID. Okay, so uh, that initialized there. And so I do want to output that value, output, outputs, I cannot remember. So I'm just gonna go look at another project and see how we do our outputs. Uh, main TF here. Yeah, just output like that. Back to our project here. And this one is called VPC. And um, we can specify a provider if we want. It's going to use the default anyway, but we might as well be explicit here. We'll just be explicit about the region. So we'll do region US East 1. And it's got to be double quotations here. And we'll do um, profile equals default. OK. And then we'll go down below and we'll do a Terraform apply. And we'll see if that takes. We'll type in yes. And so that looks like it's going to work while that is running. Hopefully it doesn't uh, break along the way, but we'll go set up our other main.tf. And so we just want a basic project. I think we've been pulling from the same one, which is counts all the way at the top here. Um, or maybe we could pull into the standard backend, might be a bit easier. Yeah, let's use this one. And uh, I, all I want is this here, the Apache module that we created. So we'll go down below and we will jump back into our project two here. And we will paste that in there. And notice that we just have an error down below. Uh, can only create the following A, B, C. So there is a minor error there. USC is two, two, two. Oh, it's because I set this as one up here. We're gonna do two here, okay? Let's say auto approve. 
we'll go back to this project here. And so what I want to do is specify a, a data source. And this is going to be that Terraform remote state. And we'll call this VPC. And we're going to set it to the back end here. Uh, saying, oh, we want it to be local. Um, and then we need to set the config path. This is going to be where the actual uh, file is located. So I think that we could probably get away with doing this there. Okay. And so then down below here, I should be able to do data dot uh, VPC, VPC ID. This is going to need a configuration file or TFR is there. So I'm going to go here and just go terraform.tfrs. And I'm going to go up to our previous project where we might have defined that here. But there's one minor difference here, and that is that we are not specifying the CIDR, or sorry, we're not specifying the VPC ID here. Okay. So we'll go down below, back to this file. And we're just waiting for that VPC to be created. It's creating a NAT gateway. Uh-oh. <laughs> I don't think I want that. Um, NAT gateways uh, cost money. I mean, like, it's not a big deal. We can just rip it out. Um, but I think what I would have done here is not had either of these. I would have just said false and false. So we're going to have to wait for that to finish to create. This is going to take forever. Um, if you've watched up to this point, you know, save yourself some trouble and just remove that out. Oh, yeah, so just finished. Mm, nope, it's still going. So I'll see you back here in a bit, okay? The problem is it's creating NAT gateways in all the VPCs, and there's a lot, so I'll be back in a bit. All right, so we didn't have to wait that long, but what I'm going to do is just do false and false on this, and I'm going to go and do Terraform auto or apply auto approve here. Or actually, I'm going to just do Terraform Apply because I don't know if it's going to uh, just tear down those resources or actually replace the VPC. If the VPC doesn't get replaced, then we can move on to um, the other part of this. So I'm just going to go to the top here because I'm really curious about the VPC. So the NAT will be destroyed. The NAT will be destroyed. The gate will be changed. The rotables tables will be changed, but the VPC ID is not going to change. So we can just say yes. Okay. And uh, what I'll do here is while this is going, we can go figure out project two. So I'm just going to open up a new uh, terminal here or window, whatever you want to call it, shell. And once that's loaded, I'm just going to CD into that. I believe it's uh, 31 we're on right now. 131. Again, the numbers might change depending on uh, if I change them after the fact. So uh, we sourced our data source there. I want to go back to our project two. And um, that's the TFVARS file. And so this should just work. It should take it. Except uh, this is in the wrong project. So I'm just going to close this out. Project two. Yes, yeah, so this looks... Good, so what I'm gonna do is do terraform plan and see if this is gonna take it. Oh, we gotta do terraform init first as always. Great, so um, we just ran that there. And so now what uh, we can do is do our terraform plan. And while we're waiting on that, let's go just take a peek over at our original one here. So that one got rid of all those extra um, services we didn't know need. And so down below it says an input variable with the name server name has not been declared. This variable can be declared with a variable server name. Um, I thought we did define these. Yeah, it's right there. Did I name this file wrong? Terraform TFRs. No, that is correct. Oh, it's because we don't have a variables. Okay, so we just do variables, tf. We'll go back up to this one here. And we'll grab all of it. And uh, we don't need this workspaces thing. 
Um, we don't need a VPC ID like that because we'll just pass it along via the data source. We don't have a bucket, so we'll just get rid of that. Okay. And we'll do Terraform plan again. And they're saying data, VPC, VPC ID um, has not been declared in the root module. Um, I'm going to do Terraform init just as a sanity check there. And uh, I'm going to go back to my main TF here and just take a look. Oh, it hasn't been defined. Did we put it in the wrong project here? Maybe I put it in the uh, 130 here while I was doing it. Hmm. Did we put it in project one maybe? Nope. Okay, well, wherever it's gone. Oh no, it's right here. Okay, so then uh, what's it talking about? Let's try this again. Terraform plan. Unless I named it wrong here. Oh, um, maybe what we have to do is do outputs or output. I think it's outputs on this one here. data.vpc, so a data resource name that does not exist. Oh, you know what it is? We also have to do um, Terraform remote state like that. And now it should take it. The region is required, but is not set. Um, sure. It doesn't say for what. But we'll, I guess maybe it's just talking about the provider. Region equals US East 2 default or pro, um, profile default. And so I'll go down here and hit up. Okay, and so if we just scroll up, it's going to take it. So let's just go provision that and see if it works. Terraform apply, auto approve. Okay. And I'll see you back here if this successfully works, okay? All right, so we've ran into a little bit of an issue here. Notice that it's giving us, uh, saying that it's running in a different network. So the thing is what we're doing here is we're passing our um, VPC ID here, which is coming from project one. And so that should be setting this to be US East 2, right? Because we have the region set up as such. Um, th this is all right. So we'll go over here and this is all right. So some of the security groups, all I can think of is we'd have to go back to our uh, modules project and if we went in here and checked out the main, because this is where we define our security group and we specify the VPC ID here and that is what we are passing through. So, you know, I would expect this to be using the correct subnets and things like that, but uh, it's, it's just not taking for some reason. So instead of worrying about that, what I'm just going to do is I'm going to go back to project one and I'm going to tear this down. And the only reason I didn't do this in uh, US East one was because I thought I might've already had one there. So if we go over to our AWS account and this won't be a problem for you, this is just a problem for me. But if I go over to VPC here, and we go to your VPCs, notice that I have two, and one is called, oh, it's my Terraform VPC, and that's in North Virginia. So maybe that never provisioned where we wanted it to be, So, but I'll be back here in a moment. All right, so we ran into a bit of an issue here. Um, after waiting a long time, it didn't delete, and so, uh, if this happens, there's not a lot you can do except delete the resource out manually. This is like something you, that's not great. 
Also notice that somehow I ended up one with in North Virginia, and also this one has um, a virtual private gateway. So probably what happened was I deployed in US East 1, it wasn't correct, so then I went to US East 2. And uh, so it just made a big old mess of this. So I'll have to go here and see if I can delete it manually. And I'm just gonna type in delete. And we'll see if that takes. Okay, I'll try that one more time. It's possibly that it's not deleting because of all the additional resources. So I acknowledge and I really, really want to delete this. So I'll go here and type in, oh, hold on, that's my default one. Uh, so it actually did remove it that time. What I would say is I would double check to make sure there's no virtual private gateways because those, you do not want to leave those running. That will cost money, but these got deleted out of here. Um, maybe also check endpoints or NAT gateways. And so those are deleted as well. I'm gonna go over back to my US East one. And so this thing, uh, if we go here, oh, it's all gone now. So I'm not sure why it was showing up in both. Oh, NAT gateways, that's fine, those are gone. So we have my Terraform VPC here. And if I go down to NAT gateways, there's nothing there. And I go over to virtual private gateways. I have one set up here and I didn't want to create one. So what I'm going to do, and I'm going to see if I can fake it here, but I'm going to just switch this over to one and I'm going to do a Terraform apply refresh only. I see if it picks it up. And I'm going to see what it gets. So here it says Terraform detected the following changes made outside of Terraform. That that resource was deleted. So that's not really the behavior I'm looking for. I thought maybe we could like kind of like attach it there, but I don't think that's going to work. So what I want to do is I just want to delete this one here. And so we will go and... Oh, sorry, I'm going to go delete the VPC because it might just take everything with it if we do it that way. And so let's say delete VPC. And notice it has a virtual private gateway attached. So I guess we're going to have to delete that first. And we'll go up here and detach. Say yes, detach. And we'll make sure we don't have any NATs. We don't, that's good. So we'll go up to our VPC. And we'll go ahead and delete this VPC. And go delete. So yeah, Terraform's not always perfect. Sometimes you have to go in and delete resources. Uh, but generally, it's pretty darn good. Um, you just got to be careful what you're doing. And that's why you should always be doing Terraform plan and pushing things through um, a version control system like Git. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just try this again. And we're going to do this through US East 1. So I'm going to do a Terraform apply. And I should be able to do this no problem now because, um, well, there's nothing in my way. So... And while that's going on there, I'm going to switch this over to US East 1, and we'll say yes. And while that's going there, I'm just going to refresh. Because once we have the uh, VPC ID, we are ready to start using it. So down below here, it says, oh, right, right, right. So this is set up for um, two. So we'll set one, one, one. We'll hit up here, and I'm just going to do a sanity check and make sure there's nothing in my other uh, my other uh, region here. Okay, good. We'll go back to North Virginia here. And we already have the VPC ID, so because we have that, it looks like it might produce a new one, though. 009. No, it's the same one, I think. But what I'll do is I'll go back to Project 2, which is referencing this state here, and we'll go back to our second one here, and we'll just do a Terraform uh, init because we did change the region here, so it might want to do something. We'll do a Terraform plan. I don't think we ran into an issue with the plan last time. Okay, that's all updated there. Okay, great, and so I'm really hoping that this just works this time. So we'll do Terraform, apply, auto approve. So there must be something we don't know about how we developed our module and it's not supporting other 
regions. Again, this is kind of out of the scope of uh, the course here because um, we're just getting into uh, very detailed stuff. But, uh, you know, if we can just kind of get this working here. So error launching source instance invalid security group SG subnet belongs to a different server. Okay, so I'm going to see what is going on here. So we have this state file here. And it's set for that. I don't think it created a server. Let me go see. Go to North Virginia here, see if we have any servers. No, and we'll go over to Ohio here. Okay, so I absolutely do not trust the state files in here anymore. So what I'm gonna do is open them in File Explorer here. For this one here, I'm just gonna delete them out. And I'm gonna delete this out, and I'm gonna just clear out whatever I can clear out. It probably won't uh, let us delete everything, like the modules, that's fine. And so I'm gonna just try this again, Terraform init. Who knew this would be so hard? <laughs> um, Terraform apply, auto approve. And so what I'm hoping is it just takes it. Um, I'm going to just also check our Terraform vars, make sure everything's fine here, because we, we don't say anything in there. So it should just take it. Um, double P here. So the problem is there's a duplicate key. So this is under, um, it's in the talking about key pairs here. So we'll go here and we'll just go ahead and delete that. We'll also do that in USCs. I think it's more of a problem in USCs than anywhere else. We'll delete that as well. And we will go ahead and hit enter there. I'm really surprised I didn't generate like a unique name each time. I thought I would do that, eh? And I guess the security group still exists, so we'll go here and delete that out as well. So I think it's just this one here. Delete. Is the key pair back now? Do we have to delete that? No, okay. And we'll try this again. Maybe what it was doing is it was picking up the old security group that was that was pointing to somewhere else. I don't know. But whatever issue we're having, it was pretty odd. And so it's complaining about the security group, but now we're doing everything in USC one. So I don't know what it, its problem is. So if we go over to our security groups. Wherever that is, it's under VPC. Security groups. So here it's 009 FE, all that kind of stuff there. And if we go to the original project here, 009 FE. So it is using the correct VPC, right? And this one here is fine. If we go over here to this one, this is in US East one, so that's totally fine as well. So there must be something that's not being set for it. So it must be using like the default VPC. I think it really has to do with our original uh, module here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to specify our original source there. And so this one's going to be, uh, what was it? Just type in child module Terraform here. Source, local, just doing this off screen here. Uh, yeah, you would just do a period or something. I, the other one had like a double slash or something, I can't remember. So this is in our, 
this is up one directory and it's up another directory and it's in our modules here. Um, one, one, 10 modules, Terraform, AWS, Apache example. Okay, and so this will just allow us to modify this and, and kind of like fix what, uh, what, whatever issue we're having with this. Terraform init. Let's see if it can find it there. Uh, there wouldn't be any version constraint on here, so that's right. We'll just take that off. And so I think what's happening is our um, our resource is trying to launch in the default security group. So we'll open up our main TF here. And so this should be using that, right? And that should be using that. And we don't set like a VPC here. We just set the VPC secu security group IDs. So I'm just gonna scroll up here for a second. Or this is on WC2, right? Or WSL2. Um, and so this would be Terraform in it. Terraform. Auto approve. Okay, so if this is the problem, what we'll do is go look up AWS instance. This is insane. Because maybe we're not specifying the security group correctly, but I'm pretty sure we are. So we'll just say VPC. This is the optional EC2 classic default VPC only. So that's the old way of doing it. A list of security groups IDs to associate it with. Subnet ID. Do we set the subnet ID here? We don't. Aha, so that's our problem. So we can go subnet ID here. And uh, that's what we want to set. So the VPC subnet to ID to launch in. Um, I'm not sure how we're gonna grab the subnet here. So we'll go over to AWS VPC. Sometimes it's just easier to type it up here, ABS VPC. And I'm looking for a subnet. AWS VPC get for subnet, Terraform. I guess that would be one way of doing it. So we could just, I suppose, select them that way. So we're going to say data dot. Um, oh, we're in the wrong one. We're in the uh, example, aren't we? Oh, no, that's right. Okay. So then we would just want to go up to the VPC up here. So data AWS VPC main. Um, 
BPC ID equals data dot VPC dot main dot ID. And these are subnet IDs. I assume what this is going to return back is like an array. So I'm, going to, I'm just going to take a guess here and do AWS subnet IDs and just choose zero here. And we'll see if that fixes our problem. Terraform init because we might have changed our module there. And uh, there's a command terraform get. This I think would be the perfect case because we're just updating the module. We're not updating the provider. So that'd be the time that we would use that. So now I'm going to try this again and see if this works. A reference to data source must be followed by at least one attribute um, accessible there. The problem is I don't know what this is, right? So that's not really helping me out here uh, what this in particular would be. Um, so AWS subnet. IDs, a set of attributes found by the IDs found. This data source will fail if none are found. So if that's the case, then what we're going to be doing is doing dot IDs and then maybe zero like that. Okay. It was subnet IDs has not been declared. Oh, okay. So maybe we do subnet IDs, IDs. Is that going to work for us now? I don't know why this looks all messed up. Oh, uh, it's just maybe the indentation here. That doesn't look right. Um, yeah, this is, this is super messed up. Hold on here. Apparently I lost some of the block. Okay, so we said subnet IDs dot IDs. A data source VPC main has not been declared. It's right there. What are they talking about? Um, So what I'll do is I'll just cut this here, or like cut it. Paste this below here. Data VPC main ID. I don't know if we can do like a depends on on this. Probably not. Apparently we can, we can do it. Uh, I'm seeing an example where they're doing it depends on. So what I could do is say, um, depends on, and then I would just specify data.awsvpc.main, and we'll see if that helps it out there. We can do terraform init again. And try that. And if it doesn't like that, maybe we can go into the uh, directory itself and see if that will fix it. Um, 110. And we'll just do terraform init here, maybe. I don't remember ever having to do an init with inside of it, so I don't think that's the case. Oh, you know what? Uh, it's just this mistake, and you might have caught that. VPC. But the depends on is probably a good idea. 
data.vpc.main. We'll try this again. Must be a whole object. Um, okay, well, we'll take the depends on out then, and we will try this again, because it should be able to infer the order uh, into which it works. A data source, AWS VPC, VPC has not been declared in this stupid module. <laughs> this is so stupid. Data dot AWS VPC dot VPC. Oh, because it's not called VPC, it's just called main. Okay, my fault. And so here it says elements of a set are identified, but only their value and does not, um, it does not have separate indexes or keys with it. It's only possible to perform operations across all elements in a set. So let's just look up set. So set Terraform. I just want to get like the first element in a set. First element in a set. Terraform, one. One takes a list, a set of tuple with either zero or one elements. If the collection is empty, one, it returns null. Otherwise, one returns the first element. So what we can do here is if it's doing an ID, I suppose what we could do is go down to our subnet ID here, and we can say one. And we will try that. Apparently it doesn't take an index. Invalid value for list parameter must be a list set or tuple with either values either zero or one elements. It is a set of string with six elements. So I don't know what this thing is. Like, I don't know how you would go and say, all right, just show me what this value is. What I could try to do here, I'm just trying to think here, how could I see this value without having to provision the resource? And that's what I don't know. Um, hmm. It's very, very frustrating. Um, I'll be back in a second, okay? All right, so this is what I found, and we, what we have to do is actually convert, because this is actually a set, and we need to convert it to a list. At least this is what I think. So what I'm gonna do is take this out of here, and we'll wrap it as such, and then we'll give it zero, and maybe that's our problem here. Please be the answer. Okay, so I think it's Craig now. So yeah, that's kind of like, and we're not in that section into the built-in uh, functions, but this is just where sometimes the data set returned is a set, or uh, and it, those are really frustrating to use. And so I guess you just have to cast it into another type. Um, that one function I think should have worked with it, but it just decided not to for whatever reason. Um, but if this provisions that are, uh, we're all done here and we're all in good shape. So, yeah, that is all good. So what we can do is now just tear this down because that worked, no problem. So we'll say apply, auto approve. Okay. And while that is destroying, what I'm gonna do, I guess I already have a third one open here. I'm gonna just update the code here, git status, git add, um, here, git commit, oops fix my module. So should use uh, the subnet specified for the VPC from the VPC. Okay, and we will do a git push. We'll do a git tag 1.1.0. We'll do a git push tags. And so now for, uh, for uh, now on, we'll just use the version 1.1.0. 1. 
Um, so that's destroyed. We'll go back to our original one here. We'll do a Terraform apply auto approve destroy. I just want to show you as it's destroying that if we want to do remote, it's pretty much the same thing. We're just setting the back end as remote and we're providing that configuration values there. Uh, I'm just going to stick around here just to make sure that this does destroy just because for some reason it just might not. So this was project one. Oh, we're in project two in both of these folders. Okay, that doesn't help that, that much. But we're going to wait until this is destroyed. And then once that's destroyed, we will um, tear down the um, VPC, okay? All right, so we'll just make sure we go into the other project here, project one, and we'll do the same thing. Tear that down. So yeah, I realize this follow along is a bit of a mess. Um, I could go back and reshoot it so that it's a lot more streamlined, but then I feel like we will miss all of these kind of little things. And without getting that kind of experience, you're not going to know how to debug that stuff on your own. So I, I feel that I'm just going to keep this follow along as is. Uh, you know, hopefully you find value out of it, but it will be a, a frustrating experience. And you'll know this because you'll get to the end of this, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we're going to be looking at how to uh, force uh, an unlock, okay? And so what we're going to do is as always, we're going to need a new folder here. So I'm just going to expand this and I'm going to uh, reveal in my file exp uh, explorer here. And we're going to make a new folder here. We're gonna call it uh, 132. Uh, locking, right? <laughs> okay, like force unlocking, I suppose. And I'm gonna to try to do this with Terraform Cloud because I feel like that will be the easiest way for us to do this. So I'm gonna just go main.tf. And what I'm going to do is make my way over to Terraform Cloud. I know we still have that uh, other environment that we're using. The uh, VCS Terraform one. But um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new workspace. I'm just going to call this one CLI driven. We'll say create workspace. And this one, whoops, we're going to say uh, force unlocking and then that's going to give us that nice little code there that we can grab we'll paste that on in there and um, I'm going to go back to our last tutorial here where we had project two and because I need something that's going to take a little bit of time so that we can force an unlock right so I'll go ahead and grab that code We'll paste that on in there. And we actually are going to use the version if we can here, because I would rather do that. Um, and this is going to be Terraform. Hit us Apache example. Uh, I think I have to do exam pro code to get that module there. And it's going to be version 1.1.0. And we are not going to import our VPC ID here. We're just going to set it like we did before. So we'll just say var VPC ID. And we will need a variables here. So we'll say and we'll have to go over to our um, project here. We'll copy that over. And what I want is to add the VPC ID here. Okay. And I really don't feel like entering all the state form files. I guess I'm going to have to. There's not really any way around that, I suppose. I'm going to CD back here. 132. Terraform init. Um, cannot apply constraint to a non-registered URL. So I clearly uh, entered that incorrectly. We'll go up to here and see what it was. This one's referencing it locally. Uh, we used it in another project here. 
Maybe we used in the remote state one here. Nope. Uh, standard probably. There it is. Okay, so we'll go ahead and grab that. We're gonna go down to our main here. We're gonna paste that on in. And I'm gonna do terraform init. It's going to initialize that back in there for us. And uh, while that's going, I'm going to go set up our variables because this always takes a thousand years. So we need to add quite a few here. So I'm just going to pull this over here and then pull this over there. I'm going to go look at a previous one here where we have TFRs. Um, so we want a VPC ID here. Okay. We want our my, our my cider block here. We're going to get our public key here. We are going to add another instance type. We're going to add a server name. And uh, we're going to need our environment variables. Never can remember these. So we're going to go over to the Terraform registry. I have this open already up here. So we're going to go to the top, Terraform registry. We'll go over to providers. Just make this a little bit smaller here. Whoops, a little bit too small. And we will go to documentation, scroll on down, grab these keys here. This is going to go first. That's going to be sensitive. We're going to cap as always. And we're going to grab the first one here. Paste that in. We go grab the second one here. Forgot the name here, so we'll grab that one here. We'll say uh, whatever the region is here. I should really memorize these so I don't have to ever have to look up that page again. Um, that one's not sensitive. We probably want the secret sensitive. That's probably more important than the key. Okay, and so we're all configured here to go. And so what I want to do is deploy this, but before I do, I just want to double check to make sure that I know how to use the force unlock. So I'm just going to go here and we're going to just pull up some documentation. So we're going to say Terraform force unlock. And so we just write Terraform force unlock lock ID. We need the actual key there. Um, So we can disable it with the hyphen lock command here. So that's what I need to find out. So all right, I'll be back in a second, okay? All right, so what's gonna happen is um, when we run it, it's going to give us that output of a lock ID when we do Terraform apply twice. So what I'm gonna do is do Terraform apply auto approve to get this going. I'm hoping this just works. You gotta spell that right with two Ps. And we're just waiting for that plan to start. And while that's going, I'm just gonna open up a, another one here. I'm gonna make my way into the same directory, CD13, or it's 132. Oops, we got to be quick here. Uh, that's old, so I'm gonna close that out. That's old. We'll go back to this one. I want to get it before it finishes. So what I'll do is type in um, Terraform apply, and what it's gonna say is that it's locked. If we can do this quick enough. Oh, interesting. So it says waiting for one runs to finish before queued. 
So I guess this is a case where if we're using Terraform Cloud, we're not going to be able to get that lock ID. And I guess the only way to unlock it would be to go into uh, Terraform Cloud itself as it's executing. Right? And see how it's running. And from there, you could do a force unlock. But that's not what we were trying to do. We were trying to use the actual command so I could show you. So that means that we do have to um, use a Terraform backend. And so if that's the case, what I'm going to do is once this is done here, so now it's triggering the other one. I'm just going to stop that. So we're going to go back to our original one here, and I'm just going to tear this down. Uh, destroy. And I'm going to go back over here. And what I want to do is go back to our uh, standard backend tutorial because that'll make it a lot easier for us to do in that one. And so we will just go and close off these here. Close out our tabs. And what I want to do here is go to our main one here. And we need to upgrade that to 1.10. And the other problem is that we're going to have to actually set this up for a DynamoDB table. So not only are we going to have to create this folder, right? So what I want you to do is go to your S3. And we want to make sure that we already have this uh, bucket. And we do, good. So we'll go over to DynamoDB and create ourselves a new thing here. So say create table, and as always they're updating the UI, and I just wanna call this like uh, force unlock. Terraform. I don't know what we'd have to set as the partition key that's a good question. So state locking DynamoDB Terraform. Okay. So which can be enabled by setting the DynamoDB table field existing. A single DynamoDB table can be used to uh, lock multiple remote state files. So it's not saying here like what we'd have to set up is the key for this. Okay, so maybe we can just set it. I don't think it's gonna auto create it, but let's give it a go and see what happens, okay? So I'm gonna go down to DynamoDB options. Here it is. Custom endpoint to the AWS DynamoDB API. This can be sourced from the endpoint. And then there's a the table name used for state locking. The table must have a primary key of lock ID with a type string. Okay, so that's our instructions there. And we're gonna go back to DynamoDB. We're gonna set up our partition key and that's gonna be a string. We don't need to set a sort key here. Um, default settings are fine. And that's going to go ahead and create there. And so what I'm going to do is grab that name. And what we need is DynamoDB table. Okay, so I'm going to do Terraform init. And we're gonna migrate the state. I'm totally fine with that. Yes. Great. And so now if I do Terraform apply, oh, right, we have that old code in there that we're not using. All right, so uh, yeah, we have some old code here we need to remove. So we're gonna just take out this workspaces thing um, to see if there's anything else remaining there. No, I think that's it. So we'll go ahead and we'll try this again.
And uh, we are going to make sure, we're gonna to have to switch to both of them in order for this to work. So I'm just gonna go here ahead of time. Okay, we'll go back over to here. No problems this time around. So we'll say yes. And that is provisioning. So I'm gonna go back to this one here and I'm just going to type in Terraform apply. And it should complain saying, hey, this is locked right now. You shouldn't unlock it. And so this is where you would grab that ID, okay? And so you would just type in Terraform force unlock and then we'd paste the value in here. And the thing is, this is where you just type yes, but we definitely don't want to do this because the other one is provisioning, but I just wanted to show you how you get that ID and pass it along. Um, and you know, when I'm talking about state locking in the lecture content, I kind of wrote about here, it says state locking happens automatically on all operations that could write state. You won't see any message that it is happening if state locking fails. So it's true as locking's happening, it, it doesn't tell you that it's going on, but it will tell you when you do another Terraform apply, it will say, hey, it's in it's in state. So I didn't technically lie here, but I guess that could be like a little highlight that would have been good in the lecture content there. Um, but I'm just going to cancel it out there. We're gonna go back to our first one here and we can see that that was deployed. And what we can do for fun, I don't think there'll be anything within DynamoDB because I think that it will create the record and then get rid of it. But we just click into our table here and we go view items. Notice that there's zero items right now. Well, no, there it is, okay. So there was a an ID at one point. So I think that is good. And what I'm gonna do is just go ahead and destroy the infrastructure. Type yes. And while that is happening, um, well, we gotta wait for this to finish, but once that is done, then we'll go ahead and we'll just tear down the DynamoDB and um, S3 bucket, okay? All right, so that is done destroying there. So what I wanna do here is go ahead and uh, just delete this table. Really don't like this new UI. I don't know who came up with this. Um, Yep, we'll delete all that. Make our way over to S3 here. And I'm gonna go ahead and just delete this table. Um, we'll have to go in and just delete all the records first. Pretty sure we turned off versioning there, so there's no versioning right now. And Oh, I went into the wrong bucket. Not that it matters, that's old anyway. Oh, cool, yeah, so we didn't look at this earlier, but uh, when we had production and staging, they placed them into these uh, areas here. Okay. So that's kind of cool. Um, I guess it's something I didn't look at, but if we go Terraform workspace list, are we in the default one? I would have thought we were in there, eh? Oh, we're in the production one. Okay, so, I mean, I never showed this to you earlier because we didn't actually deploy it, but um, we actually did do a deploy this time around. And I guess both the environments were set up here and they had their own folders. So that's kind of interesting to see. We'll go ahead and we'll just go delete all this. And I'm just gonna leave the bucket around here just in case I want to use it again, but it is completely emptied out. So we're good from scratch. So there you go. All right, let's talk about resources. So resources in configuration files represent infrastructure objects such as virtual machines, databases, virtual network components and storage. And so it pretty much looks like this. A resource type is, uh, determines the kind of inf infrastructure object it is. So here it says AWS instance, and this would represent an AC, uh, AWS EC2 instance. This is all defined within the provider's documentation. So you have to kind of look at what name they use to figure out what it is. And even though you don't see provider explicitly set here, a resource does 
does belong to a provider and you can explicitly set it and you would do this when you'd want to set a resource outside the default provider that you have in your configuration file. Um, and so one little thing that I hadn't mentioned anywhere else, and that's why I made this slide, was to mention about special timeout nested blocks within resources. So some resource types provide a special timeout nested block argument that allows you to customize how long certain operations are allowed to take before being considered to have failed. Okay, so there you go. Let's talk about complex types. So a complex type is a type that groups multiple values into a single value and complex types are represented uh, by type constructors, but several of them are uh, have shorthand keyword versions, okay? So there are two categories of complex types. We have collection types for grouping similar values, so list map set, and structural types for grouping potentially to similar values, so tuple and object. And so now that we have an overview, let's go jump into collection types and structural types. A collection type allows multiple values of one other type to be grouped together as a single value, and the type of value within a collection is called its element type. The three kinds of collection types are list, map, and set. Uh, and so looking at our first one here, what we're doing is we are setting ourselves something that looks kind of like an array, and it's this list type here. And what we can do is use our index, so the indices zero, to reference the first element, which is Mars. So that's going to make our username Mars. For a map, it's very similar to a Ruby hash or a single nested JSON object. And the idea here is that it's very similar to the first, except now we're doing a key and value. And then we access it by, based on the key name. So plan B it's going to return 50 USD, okay? We have set, it is similar to a list, but it has no secondary index or preserved ordering. All values must be of the same type and will be cast to match the first element, okay? So it's a great way to kind of have, um, well, I guess no secondary index, but yeah, so you do two set and then it would turn into this, okay? <laughs> All right, let's take a look here at structural type. So a structural type allows multiple values of several distinct types to be grouped together with a single value. Structural types require a schema as an argument to specify which types are allowed for which elements. So this is what they're talking about when they say this schema. So when you actually define the variable, notice where it says object and you are actually setting A is going to be a string and B is going to be a string. There's this optional option, which I think is right now in beta, uh, but hopefully by the time this course is out or it's the future, you have that option there, but just assume that they're all required. So that's what they're talking about is that you are specifying exactly what you expect the schema to be, okay? So there are two kinds of structural types. We have objects and tuples, and they're gonna look very familiar to maps and lists because they're pretty much the same, but with explicit typing. So object is a map with more explicit keying. So this example, we'd have name for string, age for number, and so that's what it would expect the data structure to be. For tuple, multiple return types with a parameter. So we can have string, number, or Boolean. So this is where we'd have um, A as a string 15 or true as a Boolean. So, you know, there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we're gonna look at uh, the collection and structural type. So I have a new folder down below, uh, just in case we need to define some things. So I'm gonna go here and just call this main.tf. And we are just going to configure this for local Terraform. So we'll just give the brackets there. And so the idea is that um, we might have different kinds of variables. And we had done this previously where we created um, a list and a map, but we can do that again. So we'll have like planet, right? So that's list. And then we just default that to a value, Mars, Earth, Moon. And then we could also have, you know, plans here, and that would be our map type. Okay, and so here we'll just set it with the curlies, plan A, plan B. Plan C, um, 
So we'll do Terraform console, and so that should load uh, these variables for us to use. And so if I do var.plans, I get that. And if I do var.planets, uh, didn't like what I did there. Input variable has not been declared. I suppose it's just planet there. So I should have named that planets up here. And so what we're gonna do here is just go ahead and exit. Type clear. I'm just gonna expand this a bit bigger so we're taking over more of the screen. And let's take a look at structural types. So these require you to actually define um, parameters. So what I'm gonna do is go down below and we're going to do the object. And object is very similar to the map. So we'll just go down here, plans object. And so here what we do is we'd say type object. And we would just have to define some settings here. Um, so we could say A is a string. All right, we'll see if that works. The default value is not compatible with the variable type constraint attribute A is required. So that's fine. Um, what we could do is just define this as like plan A. Plan B, plan C. And now if we just do var plans object. When you are using this, you know, you might want to specify some different kinds here. So you could just say like, you could say like plan here. So we say plan name, plan amount. Maybe it's like number. And so then we'd say plan name, plan amount, basic, maybe this would be 10. Okay, and we'll just uh, type exit here and go back into Terraform Cloud. Hopefully we don't get an error here. So the plan amount is required. So, you know, we can't have a spelling mistake here. Just do var plan here. Um, well, we named it correctly there. And when we went up here and specified it, well, I think we got it right, plan object. So, I'm sure what it doesn't like here. Oh, you know what? We're not in Terraform Cloud. Okay, that's fair. And we're still spelling this wrong. Whoops. Okay, so there we go, we got our basic plan. Um, and then we could do a tuple here, so... I don't know if I've ever defined a tuple before, so let's just try it here. And so we'll just say... Uh, groceries, or value, or random. Type equals tuple. I'm just looking up if there's any kind of definition I can find here. I'm not really finding anything, but I'm just gonna go uh, define this here because I thought maybe it needed like a schema or something, but maybe it doesn't. So we'll just say, hello, 22, false. Okay, Terraform console. Tuple constructor requires one argument specifying the element types as a list. Okay, so if that's the case, then what we could do is say string, number, boolean. The uh, type constructor requires one argument specifying the uh, number of elements. So clearly I'm doing this wrong, so just give me a second, I'll be back in a moment, okay? All right, so I think the problem here was just that I need to make brackets here like this. We'll give that a go. Boolean is not a valid option. What if we try bool? Okay, we say var.random. 
Good. And so I'll just go ahead and exit that out. I'm just going to see what happens if I change the order here. So let's say I do instead of 22 here, we go here. Okay, so notice that, you know, we can have all sorts of kinds, but they have to match exactly the order that is there. So yeah, uh, that's pretty much it. So there you go. The Terraform language includes a number of built-in functions that you can call from within expressions to transform your combined values. So we have numeric, string, collection, encoding, file system, date and time, hash and crypto, IP network, uh, type conversions. So we are going to go through all of these. We might not go through every single function, but we'll go through every single major category. Uh, in terms of the exam, the only thing that's going to show up might be string functions. Why they do this, I don't know. It's not a very good exam question, but those might appear. But I think that this is one of the strongest features of Terraform over something like CloudFormation. Uh, and I really want to just show you the gambit of them, okay? <laughs> Let's take a look here at numeric functions, starting with absolute. So it returns the absolute value of a given number. So 23 is 23, 0 is 0. And if you get a negative number, it's going to flip to the positive. For floor, what it does is it rounds down to the nearest whole number. So see where it says 4.9, it becomes a 4. You have log, so it returns the uh, logarithmic, I can't say that word, logarithm, logarithm of a given number in a given base. So log 50, comma 10 is going to give you that. 16 comma 2 is going to give you 4, okay? Seal, it, it's where it will always round up. So see where it says 5.1 and it goes all the way to 6. We have min, so take one or more numbers and return the smallest number from the set. And max, take one or more numbers and return the greatest number of the set. I don't have examples because that's pretty straightforward. You know, if there's a 2 and a 4, it's going to return the 2 in min. If it's a 2 and a 4, it's going to return the 4 for max. Uh, we have parse int, so parses the given string as a representation of an integer in the specified base and returns the resulting number. So if we have uh, 100 here in strings, it's going to, uh, and we say comma 10, we're going to get 100 because that's the base system. It's base system 10, uh, base system 16. We can see letters in there, right? So it's able to translate that. This is two, so that's basically binary. So zeros and ones. So you get the idea there. Uh, pow, so calculates an exponent by raising its first argument to the power of the second argument. So that's just a way of doing powers. And then we have signum. So determine the sign of a number, returning a number between negative one and one to represent the sign. Uh, so there you go. All right, let's take a look here at string functions. The first being chop. So removes new line characters at the end of a string. So, you know, if there's a hyphen n, or sorry, backslash n, you don't want to see that there. That's the way you get rid of it. Then you have format, so it produces a string by formatting a number of other values according to the specification. So here there are uh, percentage d lights, so this is representing a, uh, a digit. So it's taking that number, this says it's going to be formatted as a string, okay? Um, format list, so produce a list of strings by formatting a number of other values according to a specification string. So here we have uh, an array, and then we have our specification. So you can see it's substituting the name there. Um, we'll look at indent. So it adds a given number of spaces to the beginnings of all but the first line in a given multi-string. So here we have a string. Um, and what it's going to do is see where we have the interpolation here. And then we have indent. I know the, the highlighting is not great because it's a, a single string, but we have interpolation. We have parentheses two, so give it a, a, a layer of two indentation. Uh, and then it's going to break that up and give it indentation. So we have join, so produce a string by concatenating together all elements of a given list of strings with the given delimitator. So you use uh, delimiters is double quote, or sorry, is a comma. And so it's going to glue that together to make this, okay? If there's only a single one, there just won't be any comma in there. We can lower all the text, it's pretty straightforward. We have regular expressions. So that is an extremely powerful feature. So here we have the regex. I don't know what the regex format is. Uh, maybe it's Perl, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, there's like a bunch of different types of regex standards. So, you know, do you have to figure that out so you know how to use it? And then there's a regex all. So applies to a regular expression to a string and returns a list of matches where this just is returning uh, one, okay? We have replace. So searches a given string for another given substring and replaces 
uh, each occurrence within a given replacement string. So this is just like the JavaScript replace. We have split. This is the opposite of join. So if we want to split on the comma, we specify comma here. We have str rev, so string reverse. So reverses a string. So hello becomes ole. Uh, we have sub ol, 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 ol. <laughs> sure, I don't know. Um, so substring, so extracts a substring from a given string by offset and, and length. So we have a substring and we're saying we want one to four. So we only want uh, one, two, three, four here, okay? Because it starts at zero. We have title, so make it title case. So capitalize the H and the W. We have trim, removes the specified character from the start and end of the string. So we don't want these and we tell it to remove those. There's a lot of string functions. Uh, so we have trim prefix. So it removes the specified prefix from the start of the given string. If the string does not start with the prefix, the string is uh, is returned and unchanged. So here we say we want to get rid of hello in the front. So we do that. Suffix is the opposite. So we want to get rid of world out of the suffix. So we do that. We have trim space. So it removes all types of white space from both the start and end of the line. So it gets rid of the new lines and uh, the spaces. Upper is going to put everything to upper, and there you go. On the exam, they probably will ask you uh, like what string function does or which one does not do something. So this is the only part of the built-in functions you have to know for the exam. I don't think it's a very good exam question, but it does appear there, so you need to know it, okay? We're on to collection functions, and these are the most powerful built-in functions, and there's a lot of them. And I made sure to give you an example for each one because I really do want you to know these because this is the power of Terraform. The first on our list here is all true. So returns true if all elements in a given collection are true or true, uh, or it also returns true if the collection is empty. So it's either true, true, right? Or we have true, false. So because there's a false, it's not going to be true. So any true is very similar, but there only has to be one that is true. So if this is true and there's a false, it's going to be true. If it's blank, it's going to be false, okay? We have chunk list splits a string list into fixed size chunks, returning a list of lists. So uh, here we're telling it to chunk it every two. So grab every two and make them into their own little array or list, I suppose. We have coalesce, takes any number of arguments, returns the first one that isn't null or empty string. If you're used to Postgres, you use this all the time. But the idea is it's going to uh, grab the A. In this case, it'll grab the B because that's blank. In this case, it'll grab the one because that's the first value. We have coalesce list takes any number of list arguments and returns the first one that isn't empty. So very similar, it's just using lists or if we want to call them arrays. So the first one is available, so it takes that one. We have compact, so it takes a list of strings and returns a, a new list with an empty string elements removed. So it's just going to get rid of that space there and we'll get ABC. We have concat, so it takes two or more lists and combines them into a single list, so that's very convenient. We have contain, so it determines whether a given list or set contains a given single value as one of its elements. So does it have an A? Yes, it does. Does it have a D? No, it does not. We have distinct, so it takes a list and returns a new list with any duplicate elements remove so we just want to make sure we only have one of each so do we have any duplicates here we have two a's and two b's so we're going to end up with just uh, a single list so only exactly one of each letter we have element retrieves a single element from a list so get me the element at uh at three here so um wait retrieves a single element from a list Okay, well, that's what it does. You give it a three and it gives you an A. I'm no, I don't know why it's not clicking for me, but I, I'm not following through here. Uh, index finds the element index for a given value in a list. So we say, where is B? And the index of B is, is one, because it'd be zero and this would be one. Still really confused about this one. Uh, flatten takes a list and uh, replaces any elements that are, are uh, lists with a flattened sequence of list content. So basically it says, give me a bunch of arrays or lists, turn it into one flat list. Uh, keys, take a map and return a list containing the keys from the map. So we just want the keys A, C, and D. We want length, this is pretty straightforward. So what's the length of this? Zero, this is two, this is one because it's a one uh, map or one thing, key value in there. And if it's a string, it's going to count the characters. So there's five characters. We have lookup. So retrieves the value of a single element from a map. 
given its key. If the given key does not exist, the given default value is returned instead. So we say uh, look up A, uh, and what we get is A Y, right? Look up C, and uh, it could not find C, so by default, give us what instead? Key, uh, match keys. Construct a new list by taking a subset of elements from one list whose indexes match the corresponding indexes of values in another list. That sounds complicated. Let's read that one more time. So constructs a new list by taking a subset of elements from one list who indexes and match the corresponding index of values in another list. That is confusing. So we have uh, one list and another one. So we have this one here. And we have US West, US East, US East. So we say, okay, we have US East. So th the elements here is two and three. So give us two and three. So that's what it does. That was, a, that was a tricky one. I can't think of what you use that for, but that's an interesting function. Merge takes an arbitrary number of maps or objects and returns a single map or object that contains a merged set of elements from all arguments. So it just merges them together. So it's just like concat, or I suppose like flatten. Uh, one takes a list set or tuple values from uh, with either zero or one element, if the collection is empty, one returns null. Otherwise, one returns the first element. If there are two or more elements, then one will uh, one will return an error. So it returns null in an empty list. It returns the first one, and then here it says invalid function. So it's just saying, is there one? Right? Is one or zero? Uh, ranges generates a list of numbers using a start value, a limit value, and a step value. So we say three, and we get zero, one, and two. Uh, generates a list of, of numbers using a start value, limit value, and a step value. Okay. Uh, reverse. So takes a sequence and produces, res oh, not reverse, reserve, sorry, reserve. Takes a sequence and produces a number, uh, a new sequence of the same length with all the same elements as the given sequence, but in reverse order. Oh, it is reverse. R E reverse. I guess I spelt it wrong here. Sorry. Reverse. One, two, three, three, two, one. Just notice this is a spelling mistake, okay? Uh, set intersection. So function takes multiple sets and produces a single set uh, containing only the elements that all of the given sets have in common. In other words, it computes the intersection of the sets. Oh, that's tiring. So from what I can tell, it's like they all have B, so give us B, right? Set product functions find all the possible combinations of elements from all of the given sets by computing the Cartesian product. We're really getting into math here. So uh, we got app one and app two, and so we get uh, development develop. Okay, so this continues on. So it's going to say, give me app one with development, give me uh, app two with development, then app one with staging, and then app two with staging, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Because that's why I put the three dots there. Set subtract function returns a new set containing the elements from the, a f from the first set that are not present in the second set. In, in other words, it computes the re relative co uh, complement of the first set in the second set. Uh, it lost me there, but it says set subtract. So here I see A, B, and C. A and C minus it, you get B. Okay. Set union function takes multiple sets and produces a single set containing the elements from all the given sets. In other words, it computes the union of the sets. So it says set union. So we have A, B, B, C, and D. And in the results, we get D, B, C, A. So I guess um, single set containing the elements from all the given. So yeah, yeah, I guess it's just we get unique ones across the sets. Uh, we have slice. And notice like we're going through all these things. It's like you probably won't use these more exotic ones. So it's not a big deal if we don't nail them here. But it's important that we go through these so that, you know, you just know all the options are here. So slice extracts some constructive um, consecutive elements from within a list. So here we are saying 1 and 3. So we have B and C. That's where they start. Index 1. Um, and then C extracts some consecutive elements from within a list. 1, comma 3. Okay. Sort takes a list of strings and returns a new list with those strings sorted lexicographically. So we have E, D, A, and X. And so now they're alphabetical. So A, D, E, and X. Well, I think this is the last one. Uh, sum takes a list of set numbers and returns the sum of those values. That's pretty straightforward. Add them all up. Transpose, take a map of list of strings and swap the key and values to produce a new map. A list of strings, so kind of like 
inverts it. Values takes a map and returns a list containing the values of the map. So we saw this earlier, we got the keys. This is where we just wanna get the values. Zip map, so construct a map from a list of keys and a corresponding list of values. So we have a, b, one, two, and this turns it into a equal one, b equals two. I think I saw this on the exam. So that one you might wanna remember, but yeah, that's collection functions. As you can imagine, they're extremely powerful, but they can also be really confusing. So maybe just use them a little bit when you need to, okay? We're taking a look here at encoding and decoding functions. So functions that will encode and decode for various formats. So imagine we need to encode into base64. So we do hello world, or imagine we give that uh, encoded string and we wanna decode it back to hello world. Uh, that's what we can do. So there's a lot of different encoding decoding functions. Most of them are the same. They're just kind of variants. So we're not gonna go through every single one, but I'll list them out so you know what they are. So we have base64 encode, JSON encode, text encode base64, YAML encode, base64 gzip, URL encode, uh, base64 decode, CSV decode, JSON decode, text decode base64, YAML decode. Um, and just notice that you know these aren't one-to-one. -one, so there is one for this. Uh, we have one for here. Uh, we have one for YAML. Uh, this is unique. This is unique. This is unique. Okay, just so you can tell. For your encode, I think this one's a very common one that you'll use. But the idea is that let's say you have Hello World, you want to replace that string with a uh, whatever friendly for a URL, right? So it just encodes it. Okay, it's very useful when you're making uh, URL links. So there you go. <laughs> We're taking a look here at file system functions. So this has everything to do with the file system. So the first is absolute path. So the idea is you give it something that's relative and it's gonna give you something absolute. Uh, directory name, so this is a string containing a file system path and removes the last portion from it. So we don't need the file name, so we just remove that off of there. We have path expand. So it takes a file system path that might begin with a tilde and expands it into uh, its absolute path. So this would be like for home, okay? Um, base name, so it takes a string containing a file system path and it's basically the opposite of directory name, we just want the file here, okay? On to uh, the next page here. Uh, this file will read the contents of the file, pretty straightforward. Um, we can check if a file exists, so we just do file exists here. We have file set, so it enumerates a set of regular file names given a path and pattern. Uh, file base64, so it reads the contents of a file at a given path and returns the base64 encoding. That might be good for images. Um, template file, so it reads the file at a given path and returns its content as a template using a supplied set of template variables. So that's really useful if you want to do some kind of templating. Uh, and just notice it's a two-step process. So this is the template file, the actual file itself, and then we load it here and it's called a .tpl. So there you go. We're taking a look at date and time functions. The first is format date. So the idea is that we provide a format that we want and then we give it a timestamp that is in the RFC 3339 format and we get a variety of different um, formats out there. We can add time. So again, it's gonna be that RFC 3339 format and we say add 10 minutes, add one hour. Then we have timestamp. So you it returns a UTC timestamp string in the RFC 3339 format. So you just say timestamp. It's I guess it would get right now and then you get it in that format, okay? Let's take a look at hash and crypto functions. So it generates hashes and cryptographic strings. So the most popular one out there would probably be bcrypt. So here we just say hello world and we're gonna get this thing here. Uh, understand that a hash cannot be reversed. So once it is turned uh, into uh, you know this format, the only way you're gonna be able to confirm the contents of it is to um, hash something that is similar and then compare it against it, okay? So we have base64, SHA256, uh, we have 512, we got bcrypt, we have file base64, SHA256, file base64, SHA512, file MD5, file SHA1, file SHA256, file SHA512, MD5, RSA decrypt, SHA1, SHA256, SHA512, UUID, UID v5. So I only showed the one because, you know, it gets kind of boring to go through all these and really it's just gonna be based on your use case. What you're gonna be using on a day-to-day -day basis is probably bcrypt, md5, and UUIDs. So there you go. <laughs> the 
let's take a look at IP network functions. These are the coolest functions, I think, that are built into Terraform. So we have CIDR host. So what we can do is give ourselves a, um, a address, and then we can give it a, a subnet mass size, and we'll get back an IP address. Um, and so you can see we have this both in the IPv4 and the IPv6. Uh, we have CIDR net mask. So here we are doing CIDR net mask. So we just say um, uh, forward slash 12, and it's going to translate it into the full IPv4. Uh, then we have CIDR subnet. So this is just where we say, OK, I want a subnet of a particular size. So we say 172.16.00,42. And look, it's going to give us 18.0 back. If this doesn't make sense. That's OK. I mean, networking is really hard, but I just want you to know that uh, these functions are here for you, okay? CIDR subnet calculates a sequence of consecutive IP addresses within a particular CIDR prefix, so 4484, and then you get those sizes there, okay? All right, we're on to type conversion functions. So the first we're looking at is can. So can evaluates the given expression and returns a Boolean value, indicating whether the expression produced a result without any error. So can we use this, right? So we say local.foo.bar. And so, you know, if if this foo wasn't defined, then it would say false, but apparently we made it all the way to bar, okay? We have default, a specialized function intended for use with input variables whose type constraints are object types or a collection of object types that include optional attributes. Uh, and I don't show that one here because it's not that exciting, but non-sensitive takes a sensitive value and returns a copy of that value with the sensitive markings removed, therefore exposing the sensitive value. So if we have an output here and we want to make it non-sensitive, that's what we could do. Then sensitive, as you imagine, is just the opposite, okay? Um, we have to bool, so converts its arguments to a Boolean value. So if we have a string that's true, we can turn it into a real Boolean value. We have to map, converts an argument to a map value. To set, converts it to a set. To list, converts it to a list to number, converts it to a number, uh, string to string. Uh, and then we, last we have is try. So evaluates all of the, its arguments, expressions in turn and returns the result of the first one that does not produce any errors. The thing that's the hardest to figure out is set. I cannot find really good examples or documentation on the use case of set. There are some cases where you need to use sets, which is an actual type, but even talking to DAs and technical writers, they weren't even sure themselves. So um, this is not something you're gonna come across very often, but there's like one case where I saw it. So I'll probably point that out when we do hit it, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are going to go take a look at um, uh, built-in functions as soon as my terminal decides to be responsive. I don't know why, as soon as I start recording, it decides to lock up. So we'll just give it a moment there. There we go. And so I have a new folder there. I figured we could just define some variables so that we don't have to, uh, um, you know, constantly write stuff in. So we'll just say main.tf. I'm gonna go Terraform here. And so it might be fun to, you know, set kind of some kind of variable here. And so I have off screen here all the functions. So we're just gonna kind of pick some at random here to play around with so we get some experience, okay? So just going through strings. I think what we can do is define like our strings. So we just say str here, and we'll just say type equals string. And we'll just say default here, and we'll just say hello world forward slash n, something like that. Okay. And then we'll do Terraform console here. I gotta remember to do it this way. So we do var.str. Okay, and so that accesses our string there. Maybe we might want to take out the new line for now. So I'm just going to kind of pull this up over here. Look at some kind of things we can do. Okay, maybe collapse that, get that out of the way. All right, so um, there's a lot of string functions and on the exam, they might actually ask you some, which is, in my opinion, I don't I don't really like that, but that's what they do. And so you know, might, we might wanna look at something like split or something. So here we could do hello world. Okay. Start that up again. 
So we'll do split, comma, var str. Okay, and that would split that into a list. We might want to do something like upper. So I think we, we did that earlier where we did upper. Okay, might want to do trim, remove spe specify characters from the start and end of a string. So maybe we have this here. And so we'll say trim var str and whoops, it's not what I wanted it to do. Trim var str like that, okay. And uh, there's, again, there's not a lot that's exciting here. Maybe we'll try a replace. So we can do replace and we'll, we want to replace, we will provide our string and then the substring that we're looking for. So world, replace that with barsoon, which is Mars. There we go. So nothing super exciting over there. Uh, what's more interesting are some things like these hash and cryptos. So something we might want to generate out is a UUID. I think that we might be able to do this here. So let's just see what happens if we try to call it like that. Clear, Terraform Cloud. Oops, Terraform console, that's what I meant to type. And so functions can't be called in here, which is totally fine. We'll go back and just set that like that. But I just wanted to show you that. So if we did UUID, we would get that. Um, if we used bcrypt, so I might say bcrypt, hello world. Okay, um, might be something interesting in the IP network here. So you might wanna generate out a CIDR subnet, right? The type of conversions is something that you might come across a bit. So we already saw that when we converted a set to a list and things like that. So maybe we might want to convert something to a Boolean. So we might say to bool true, okay. Um, these are pretty complicated, the collections, but we might have something that we want to do here. So coalesce might be something that's interesting where we have an array, so, or a, a list, I suppose. So we might say like uh, items and make that a list. Null, null, empty, last, okay. Bar items, so we might say col less, okay. And that didn't look like it pulled anything out of there. To perform coalesce operation with this list of strings, use this symbol. So we could use that um, to do that. So that just kind of expands the arguments. And so that, what happened here is null didn't exist, null didn't exist, this didn't exist, so it pulled out last, okay. Maybe we might want to just use keys. Maybe we might just want to use keys here. Okay, so I'm gonna say like, hello. World. Goodbye, moon. And remember, we can do uh, hash rocket arrow equals or colons, just up to your preference. I just wrote that in for whatever reason. I'm used to using Ruby and that's what we use as hash rockets. That's the name of the symbol, the A equals arrow. Um, okay, didn't like that. So I guess we do have to do it this way. That's totally fine. I'm not upset by that. I thought it supported all three. Maybe it's like minus equals or something. I don't know. But uh, what we'll, we'll do is say is a var stuff. And then what we can do here is do keys. Okay. And it didn't look like 
I grab the, oh yeah, I grab the keys, that's fine. Okay, and then we might say values. All right. Um, you know, maybe we might want to try reverse. That one's pretty clear. One, two, three. Okay, so nothing super complicated. Um, I wonder if absolute would work in here, like the file system, so we have absolute path. I don't, know if, I don't know if this would produce anything here. Oh, it does, okay, so we could abs path, say path.root, there you go. Okay, so that pretty much gives you a general idea of um, built-in functions, so there you go. All right, let's take a look here at Terraform Cloud again, but in greater detail. So Terraform Cloud is an application that helps teams use Terraform together. Uh, and so there is the UI there. And Terraform Cloud is available as a hosted service on Terraform.io. Terraform it's actually at the app.terraform.io once you're logged in. And it has a lot of different features. So it can manage state files, uh, uh, have a history of your previous runs, a history of your previous states, easy and secure variable injection, tagging, run triggers, so chaining workspaces together, specify any version of Terraform per workspace, global state sharing, commenting on runs, notifications via webhooks, email, and Slack, organization and workspace level permissions, policy as code via Sentinel policy sets, MFA, single sign-on, uh, cost estimation, integrations with ServiceNow, Splunk, uh, Kubernetes, and custom run tasks. And that is not the limit to what it does, but this is what I could fit on the slide, okay? Let's take a quick look here at the terminology or anatomy of Terraform Cloud. So we have an organization, and within an organization, we have our workspaces. And a workspace represents a unique environment or stack. Then you have your teams. These are composed of multiple members and a team can be signed to multiple workspaces. Then you have runs. A run represents a single run of the Terraform run environment that is operating on an execution plan. Runs can be uh, tr triggered by like you, your, the UI itself or maybe like a Git repo. It can be API driven or CLI driven. So there you go. <laughs> So there are three types of cloud run workflows. So when you create a workspace, you have to choose a workflow and you have either version control workflow, we have CLI driven workflow or API driven workflow, okay? So just going over them in greater detail for the first one, which is that uh, version controlled workflow, uh, Terraform Cloud is integrated with a specific branch in your VCS. So GitHub's via webhooks, whenever pull requests are submitted for a branch, speculative plans are generated. Whenever a merge occurs to that branch, then a run is triggered on Terraform Cloud. Then you have API driven. So workspaces are not directly associated with the version control system uh, repository and runs are not driven by webhooks on your VCS provider. A third party tool or system will trigger runs via uh, uploading a configuration file uh, via the Terraform uh, cloud API. So this configuration file is a bash script that is packaged in an archive and you're pushing it as a configuration version. So you're basically creating configuration versions every time you do that. Then there's CLI driven, and this is the way we're going to be using mostly in the course. So runs are triggered by uh, the user running Terraform CLI commands. So uh, you'll run Terraform apply uh, and or, or plan locally on your machine. It's going to just work as per usual. Okay. <laughs> Let's take a look at organization level permissions, which manage certain resources or settings across an organization. So the first things that you can set would be something like manage policy. So create, edit, delete the organization's central policies, manage policy override. So override soft mandatory policy checks, manage workspaces. So create, administer all workspaces within an organization, manage VCS settings. So set of VCS providers and SSH keys available within the organization. And for an organization, we have this concept of organization owners. So every organization has at least one organization owner and you can have multiple. This is a special role that has every available permission and some actions only available to owners. So uh, this could be publishing private modules, invite users to organizations, manage team memberships, view all secret teams, manage organization permissions, manage all organization settings, manage organization billings, delete organizations, uh, and manage agents. So just understand that there are these special ones just for this organizational owner, and then these are these other ones here that you can set 
or other types of organizational level permissions, okay? Let's take a look here at workspace level permissions that allows you to manage resources and settings for a specific resource. And we have granular ones and then we have pre-made permissions. So let's go through the granular permissions first. So these granular permissions, you can apply to a user via a custom workspace permissions. And so we have read runs, queue plans, apply runs, lock and unlock workspaces, download sentinel mocks, read variables, read and write, read state outputs, read state versions, read and write state versions. Uh, and so the idea is that what you can do is just go and cherry pick out what you want to assemble your permissions for your user. Now, if you want something a little bit easier uh, uh, to do, you can use fixed permission sets. And these are pre-made permissions for quick assignment and they're based on the read, plan and write. So we have uh, read runs, read variables, read state versions for plans. We have queue plans, read variables, read state versions. We have write, so apply runs, lock and unlock workspaces, download sentinel mocks, read and write variables, read and write state versions. Uh, and then there are workspace admins, and this is kind of like the organizational owners. So a workspace admin is a special role that grants all level of permissions and some workspace admin only permissions. Those uh, admin only permissions would be read and write workspace settings, set or remove workspace permissions of any team and delete workspaces. So there you go. Let's take a look here at API tokens. So Terraform Cloud supports three types of API tokens, users, teams, and organization tokens. So for organization API tokens, they have permissions across the entire organization. Each organization can have one valid API token at a time. Only organization owners can generate or revoke an organization token. Organization API tokens are designed for creating and configuring workspaces and teams. They're not recommended as all purpose interfaces to Terraform Cloud. So basically you just use them when you are setting up your organization for the first time and you wanna do it pragmatically, okay? Then you have team API tokens. So this allows access to workspaces that the team has access to without being tied to any specific user. Each team can have one valid API token at a time any member of a team could generate or revoke that team's token. When a token is regenerated, the previous uh, token is immediately becomes invalid, designed for performing API operations on the workspaces, same access level to the workspace the team has to access to. I would imagine this is when you're setting up your own custom CI CD pipelines or something like that. Um, I'm not really sure exactly the use case for team API tokens. We have user API tokens, the most flexible token type because they inherit permissions from the user they are associated with. Uh, could be for a real user or a machine user. When you do Terraform login, this is what you're getting, a, a, um, a user API token, okay? <laughs> All right, so I just wanted to quickly show you this access levels uh, chart that helps you understand uh, what kind of permissions you are giving at the access level. And notice there's implicit and then re required or explicit permissions. I'm assuming that this means that you need to assign those permissions to the user first before they'd have it. So just because you have a user token doesn't mean you get all of these orange uh, diamonds. It's just the ones that you've assigned to that user or team where I believe that the organization, you're, you're gonna run into a chance where you're gonna have all these permissions by default, whether you want them or not. So just understand uh, that uh, you have to double check this before you use your tokens and that this chart exists, okay? All right, so we covered private registry earlier in the course when we were looking at the Terraform registry, the public one, but let's cover it again with a little bit different information. So Terraform Cloud allows you to publish private modules for your organization within Terraform Cloud private registry and Terraform Cloud's private module registry helps you share Terraform modules across your organization. It includes support for module versioning, a searchable, filterable list of available modules, a configuration designer, which I didn't find this thing, but it sounds really cool. All users in your organization can view uh, your private module registry. Um, authentic for authentication, you can either use a user token or a team token. So I guess this would be the case where you might want to use a team token for authentication, but the type of token you choose may grant different permissions as we saw with the access levels, uh, just the slide prior. Using Terraform login will obtain a user token, just a reminder, and to use a team token, you'll need to manually set it in your Terraform configuration CLI file, okay? <laughs> So there's a feature within Terraform Cloud that can do cost estimation. Uh, and it is a feature that will give you a monthly cost of resources displayed alongside your runs. Uh, this feature is only available starting at the teams and governance plant and above, 
But the idea is that uh, it will tell you for specific resources and then give you a summary. So uh, notice here that we have some pricing. I'm gonna get my pen tool out, but we have the overall cost and then it's broken down per resource. And so you can see we have an hourly, monthly and monthly delta. I don't know what the monthly delta is, but um, uh, you know, it gives you kind of idea of cost. You can use Sentinel policies to assert the expectation that the resources are under a particular cost. So that's just kind of a bonus there where you're like, okay, I wanna ensure my spend is this. The only downside, at least at the time right now for cost estimation uh, is the amount of support it has. So we have AWS Azure and GCP. So these are the resources that it will support. And so you have to look through here and say, okay, um, you know, is there any resources I'm using outside of this that I really care about? Um, and that, so I think that if you're using like core services, so like EC2 instances, uh, load balancers, things like that, that should help you out. So like we see AWS instance, the load balancer, the volume, some CloudWatch logs, ALB, um, for Google, it's just disk instance and database. So yeah, it's just really dependent on, you know, what's here. So, you know, it may meet your needs or you might say, okay, this is not enough. Okay. <laughs> Here's just a few options that I think are worth noting within the Terraform Cloud uh, workflows. We have a whole section of workflows, but I decided to put it over here just because. But let's talk about it. One thing you can do within Terraform Cloud is set whatever version you want. So you can go as far back as you want. Uh, and this is great if you need to uh, mix and match uh, different workspaces because you have different stacks and they were built on different Terraform versions and you're just not ready to upgrade them yet. You can choose to share uh, state globally across your organization. Uh, for a particular workspace. This could be really useful um, if you need to reference things wherever. Uh, you can choose to auto approve run. So if you don't want to always do that manual approve, you can do that. This is great if you're looking for that kind of uh, agile kind of workflow where uh, is, if something is merged, then it should be rolled out okay. <laughs> Let's talk about if we had to migrate our local state and we're using just the default one to Terraform Cloud, how would we do it? So to migrate Terraform projects that only uses the default workspace Terraform Cloud, it's pretty easy. You're gonna create a workspace in Terraform Cloud. You're gonna replace your Terraform configuration with a remote backend. So if you have nothing, it's using local and then you just put in your remote state. Uh, and then once you have that in there, you do a Terraform init and it's gonna say, hey, do you wanna copy the existing state? You're gonna type yes. And once you've done that, I believe you have to delete your old state file. Uh, if you are migrating multiple, um, uh, multiple environments or you're moving from a standard remote backend, it's a little bit more complicated. They definitely have guides in the docs, but this is the pretty much standard one that you're gonna come across when you're working very early. And we'll definitely see this as we are using um, Terraform in our follow alongs, okay? <laughs> I want to talk about what kind of integrations we have for Terraform for uh, version control systems. So we have GitHub, GitHub Auth, GitHub Enterprise, GitLab, GitLab EE, and CE. I assume that's Enterprise Edition and Community Edition, Bitbucket Cloud, Bitbucket Server and Data Center, Azure DevOps Service, Azure DevOps Server. So it's very simple. You're just going to choose from the one of the four right? And then you're going to just drop down and choose what variant it is there and connect your repo. Every single um, uh, provider has different configuration settings. So you might have to meet those depending on what they are. You can get from private repos. You might have to add your SSH key or something like that. Okay. Let's talk about Terraform Cloud run environment. So when Terraform Cloud executes your Terraform plan, it runs them in its own run environment. So what is a run environment? A run environment is a virtual machine or container intended for the execution of code for a specific runtime environment. A run environment is essentially a code build server. So the Terraform Cloud run environment is a single use Linux machine running on the x86 or x64 architecture. And the details of its internal implementation is not known. It is possible to install software on it, but the only issue is that we don't know what it is. is it Debian? Is it Ubuntu? You just can't tell. Uh, Terraform Cloud will inject the following environment variables automatically on each runtime. So we have TFC run ID. This is a unique identifier for the current run. Uh, the workspace name, uh, the workspace slug. So this is the organization followed by the workspace. Just going to get my pen tool to just kind of point out over here on the right hand side. Uh, we have the configuration version and Git branch. So, you know, if it is going to be on main, it's going to tell us that. If it's gonna be a particular version, we'll know that as well. We can get the SHA of the current commit. There's that version. Uh, and if you want to access these variables, you just define variable and the name, and then you can access it throughout the code, okay? 
Let's take a look here at Terraform Cloud Agents. This is a paid feature of the business plan to allow Terraform Cloud to communicate with isolated private or on-premise infrastructure. It's kind of like an in-between uh, between Terraform Cloud and Terraform Enterprise where you want to use Terraform Cloud, but you have uh, on-premise infrastructure, but you're not ready to move to Terraform Enterprise. So this is useful for on-premise infrastructure types such as vSphere, Nutanix, and OpenStack. The agent architecture is pull-based, so there are no inbound connectivities required. Any agent you provision will pull Terraform Cloud for work and carry out execution of that work locally. Agents currently only support the x86 architecture or the x64-bit Linux operating system. Okay, so you can also run the agent within Docker using the official Terraform agent Docker container if you just prefer that over a VM. Agent supports Terraform versions 0.12 and above. Uh, the system requ uh, requ this requests, the system requires, I'm going to change that uh, in the slide later on, but the system requires at least four gigabytes of free to space for temporary, temporary local copies and two gigabytes of memory needs access to make outbound requests uh, so you need to have open port 443 for app terraform io registry terraform io releases hashicorp.com and um, archivist.terraformio so there you go hey this is andrew brown from exam pro and we are on to our terraform cloud uh follow alongs now we already did terraform cloud uh version control system earlier than i thought we were going to do so i'm going to remove it from the list and what we'll do is focus on permissions and maybe the API tokens and things like that. So what I want you to do, and I've got some old tabs open here, but I'm gonna make my way over to uh, terraform.io and I'm gonna go log into Terraform Cloud here. And I don't think I've ever done this, but I can upgrade to the trial account because the thing is, is that when we are in our account here and we're trying to look at uh, permissions and we're not using force and locking anymore, I might just keep that around for a little bit. But if we were to go to our user settings here, we go to organizations. Um, that might not be a very good example. I guess I wanted like the organization settings here, which would be maybe here, yeah, up here. And so, you know, when we go to our teams and our users, our users, everyone's being added as an owner. We don't have like granular permissions and that's because we'd have to upgrade and so I figured this would be a good opportunity for me to just kind of upgrade to show you those uh, more detailed uh, role-based access control permissions, just so you know where they are. So I'm gonna go to the upgrade now and notice that we're on the free plan and also take note because um, later on the course I talk about pricing or we've already already crossed it, but notice that we have a team plan and a team and governance plan. This one's at $20 and this one's at $70. So, you know, this is not something that's reflected at least not right now on the Terraform website. And so it just looks like there's a team and governance plan for $20 and this middle one's missing. The key difference here is this one has send no policy as code. But you can see on the free plan, we are able to do team-based stuff. But let's go switch over to the trial plan. I'm gonna see if I can do this without entering a credit card in. So here it says you're currently on trial plan. I didn't have to enter anything in, that's really great. And so that means now I have all these team management options. So if I go over to team management, um, I can actually go ahead and create some teams. Uh, so I'll just say like developers, okay? And so now I have all these options. So we, we can say this person, if someone's in this team, they're allowed to manage policies, they're able to do that. Uh, a visible team can be seen by every member or we can keep them secret. We can generate out um, team API tokens, which I guess we could just like cover this as we do it, but notice we can go here and that generates out that token that we can use. I'm gonna go ahead and delete that token. Um, so nothing super exciting there. You know, it's not like that complicated. If we want to uh, set things on the workplace, now if we go back to workplace or workspaces here, and now we have team access, and notice I can go to add team uh, permissions here, and we can say select this team for their permissions. And so these are these uh, pre-built ones in. Um, so we have read, plan, write. So these are those three predefined ones that we talked about previously. And then we have down here like assign permissions for the admin of a workspace. We are able to set customized permissions. So if we toggle this, um, we should be able to do it. I mean, this looks like it's the same thing. No, I guess it's more granular. So here, I guess we have our granular permissions that we can set. So for runs, we can do read, plan, or reply. Lock or unlock a workspace send no locks, things like that. 
It's not super complicated. If we want to drain out API tokens for, uh, well, there's the organizational one, there's the teams one, and then there's the user one. So if we go to the organization, we can see that we can generate out one here. So I can say create an API token. So there it is. Let's go ahead and delete that. And if we go back to our teams, we did this earlier, but we can generate one here. And then if you want to generate one for your user, it's probably under user settings. Yeah, so we generate tokens there as well, okay? Um, so, I mean, again, there's not a lot to talk about here, but um, yeah, so I guess that really covers permissions and API tokens, okay? Okay, so that finished uh, deploying there, and so we can see our resources have been created. But one thing that uh, we didn't set was the prefix. I'm actually uh, interested to see that that worked properly. But what I could do is say prefix, and then do an underscore here. And I don't know how that would affect it. And this actually happened over in this repository here. I'm actually using a hyphen, so I'm going to just change that to that. I'd have to do a Terraform init there, migrate the state. So that was a complete mistake on my part, but I guess my thought was that I thought I had to have, um, this is still on main, and I guess we never really set up a production branch, but yeah, so now when we have the prefix in, it's actually gonna prompt us for the other one. So the currently selected workspaces are default, does not exist, and so dev is showing up, and notice that we can't deploy to main, so I think the thing is, is that if we wanted a production one, we would just create that workspace and then it would reflect here. So the, the way you make uh, multiple workspaces here would actually have to make them all. So we'd have to make a VCS Terraform prod. And I'm very certain that it would just show up here and then you would select the number that you'd want. Uh, though what's interesting is the fact that we are in the dev branch and we have to say, oh, I want to deploy the dev one. So that's kind of a, a little bit of a caveat there, but I guess there's not really any way around it. But I mean, that's pretty much you know, explores what we need for um, multiple workspaces with Terraform Cloud. And we did the remote ones and uh, we're all good. So there we go. I guess the last thing here we should probably do is just clean up. So if we go to Terraform Dev here, uh, we're gonna go down to Destruction and we'll run a Destroy Plan here. Okay. And once this is all done, you know, you can go ahead and just delete these repositories. And notice this one is, it has a private lock on it. So, oh, cause it's actually running right now. So it's being locked. So yeah, there we go. So that's it. All right, now let's take a look at the Terraform registry, the private registry. So just go over here and click on registry at the top and we can bring in public, um, public things here. So I can just go here and type this in and we can hit add. And so now um, we just hit add to Ter Terraform Cloud, add to my organization, and that's public facing, but we could also add private facing modules. So if we go back to our registry here, it's gonna go ahead and uh, down to publish here. And we can go to GitHub and I guess custom. And so then I suppose we just have to enter all the stuff in here. So as an optional display name for your v, uh, version control provider, client IDs, client secret. So it seems like there's a lot of work to do. We'd have to set up the SSH key pair, but I mean, that's generally the details that you need to know for that, okay? It just seems like a lot of work for us to set that up. Um, you know, and the course is just gonna be like, hey, can you add a private module? And you'd be like, yes, okay. So we'll go ahead and just remove this. So you can add both public and private modules, um, you know, so there you go. I have mentioned Terraform Enterprise so many times in this course, but uh, we've never really talked about it in detail and now is our opportunity to do so. So Terraform Enterprise is the self-hosted distribution of Terraform platform. And I just wanna point out sometimes I call the Terraform platform Terraform Cloud just because that's the more prominent uh, version of it, but Terraform Cloud is a separate product um, from Terraform uh, Enterprise. It's just one is uh, a SaaS and the other one is self-hosted. 
So Terraform Enterprise offers a private instance of the Terraform platform application with the benefits such as no resource limits with additional enterprise grade architectural features such as audit logging. So you do, you'd have tamper evidence, SAML, single sign-on, uh, and I'm sure there's a lot more other options there. So let's just kind of look at the architecture really quickly on how this works. So the first thing is you have the Terraform platform, which is going to be installed on a machine. And in particular, this is installed on Linux and uh, it's specifically installed on Debian, okay? So I believe that is the Debian logo, if, as far as I remember. If it's not, we'll find out on the next slide if I'm wrong, okay? Um, you're gonna have to have some kind of storage and there's a few different options. Uh, probably the most common is going to be on uh, something like S3, but you can store it on the storage or on the disk itself. Uh, you have to have a Postgres database, uh, so that's part of the infrastructure because that is what the platform uses. And uh, you'll also have to have your own TLS uh, certificate to access the machine. But there are also cases where, you know, these are going through air-gapped environments. But the idea is that you have um, SSL or TLS. Uh, it's like end-to-end -end encryption. It goes all the way to the machine. That's where it terminates, okay? Um, you'll also need your Terraform license. So you'll have to plug that in once you uh, start up the Terraform platform and say, hey, tell us the code so we can unlock this, um, this software for you to use on this uh, dedicated machine, okay? So the requirements for Terraform Enterprise is going to highly vary based on your operational mode that you choose to run it in. And that is really dependent on how data should be stored. And when we were looking at the uh, the architectural diagram, that was uh, the, the operational mode of external services. There's three types of operational modes, the first being external services. That's when you use Postgres and then um, you use uh, cloud storage. So in that example, we're using S3, but you could use GCP, Azure Blob Storage, or Mino Object Storage. Uh, but the idea is that Postgres and the cloud storage are external. They're not part of that Linux server, okay? Then you have a mounted disk. So this would just be having a, a, a persistent disk attached to the uh, VM. So, you know, in the best case, it's called EBS. So this stores data in a separate directory on the host intended for external disk. So that would be both the Postgres database and the storage volume itself. You know, Postgres is still a requirement in no matter mo what mode you use. Then you have demo. So stores all data on the instance. Data can be backed up with snapshots not recommended for production use. So this is uh, where you have ethereal data. So, you know, the data, uh, you know, can vanish if you restart the machine unless you make physical snapshots shots. Another component is credentials. Ensure you have credentials to use enterprise and have a secure connection. So the first is we need the Terraform enterprise license. So you obtain that from HashiCorp. And the other part is having a TLS certificate and private key. So you need to prove uh, you're the, uh, you own uh, your own TLS certificate. Okay. Then we have the Linux instance. So Terraform enterprise is designed to run on Linux. And it supports more than one version. So, you know, I said it was only Debian, but I guess there's a bunch. I just forgot. So we have Debian, Ubuntu, Red Hat, CentOS, uh, Amazon Linux. Uh, there's a variety for those. Oracle Linux. Um, so, yeah, I guess I'm just a big fan of Debian. So that's, I guess that was my, my thinking there. Uh, for hardware requirements, we have at least 10 gigabytes of disk space on the root volume, at least 40 gigabytes of disk space for the Docker data directory. So that would be the var lib Docker. Uh, at least eight gigabytes of the system memory and at least four CPU cores. So there you go. Let's talk about air gapped environments. So what is an air gap? An air gap or disconnected network is a network security measure employed on one or more computers to ensure that a secure computer network is physically isolated from unsecure networks. So the public internet. So it's no internet, no outside connectivity. Industries in the public sector, so government, military, or large enterprises, finance, and energy often employ air gap networks. And so I want you to know that HashiCorp Terraform Enterprise supports an installation type of air gap environments. Okay, so to install or update Terraform Enterprise, you will supply an air gap bundle, which is an archive of a Terraform Enterprise release version. So that's how you would, um, you know, provide it. Okay. <laughs> So let's take a look at Terraform Cloud features and pricing. So I just want to quickly go through it here. So we have three models. We have the open source software, so OSS. We have the cloud offerings and the self-hosted offerings. And under these tiers, we have free, teams, and governance. Technically, it's teams. 
and then teams and governance. So they're two separate plans, but this is the way they display it uh, in their marketing content, but it really is a separate, two separate tiers in there. You have business and then enterprise, which is considered self-hosted. So in terms of feature set, across the board, you have IAC, workspaces, uh, variables, runs, resource graphs, providers, modules, the public model registry, which is Terraform registry. Workspaces is a bit odd because there are Terraform cloud workspaces, right? And then you have local workspaces. So technically those should be broken up into two separate things um, or named differently, but that's just how it is with Terraform. So, you know, just asterisk on that workspaces there. For the free tier, you get remote state, or sorry, for everything uh, outside of the open source, you get remote state, VS, uh, VSC connection. So that's version control state connection. So connecting to GitHub or, or GitLab or whatever, workspace management, secure variable storage, remote runs, private module registry. Uh, once we get into cloud, we get team management, Sentinel policy is code management, cost estimation. The reason why I have that in red is because on the exam, it could ask you, when is Sentinel policy available? Is it available at what level? And the, and the thing is, it goes from teams and governments all the way to the enterprise level. Now, technically, there is, again, um, one called teams, and there's teams and governance. So it's part of teams and governance, not part of teams, okay? Uh, once we get into business, this is where we start to get single sign-on and audit logging. So, you know, if you need it in the cloud or if you need it uh, self-hosted, both options are available. Uh, in the business, we have the you can have the self-hosted agents. For configuration designer, ServiceNow integration, you have it for those uh, as well. Um, in terms of how many runs you can have, this is very important because this is how many, this is gonna put a bottleneck in terms of your infrastructure, right? So in the free tier, you can have one current run uh, of a workspace. In Teams, you can have two. And then at the business level and beyond, it's unlimited current runs for uh, how you would actually interact with um, Terraform. You know, this is gonna be through the local CLI for the open source software. Uh, for these, it's cloud, meaning that um, it's cloud that is triggering the execution commands, and then self-hosted, it's not in the cloud, it's on that private machine, okay? Uh, then we have support. So for support, it's all community. Um, so that's just going, reaching out to DAs, maybe there's a Slack channel. I believe that they have a form. So they have um, like a, a form where you can ask questions. And then they have these layers like bronze, silver, and gold. I could not determine what these are, like what is offered in them. And the odd thing is, is that, you know, there's a silver and gold, but it's offered both at business and enterprise. So I don't know if like you can upgrade to from silver to gold. So it's optional or you always get silver and gold. Could not get clarification. I tried asking the sales team. No one would tell me. So I think you have to really be deep in that sales funnel to find out. Uh, in terms of pricing, it's zero to up to five users. So the thing is, and this is really confusing about um, Terraform Cloud, and they really shouldn't have called it Teams up here, but you can start using Terraform Cloud for free up to five users as a team, okay? So just negate the fact that it's not called Teams. What they're saying is that Teams is really about getting um, uh, base, uh, workspace remote management, which is actually R RB8, like um, RABC controls, uh, role-based access controls. So that's the whole point of using Teams. So if you need that, and that's when you're at five, that's when you use it. But you can use it in the free tier as a team, and you it absolutely should. Once you get to the Teams plan, it's going to be $20 a month. And then if you need Teams and governance, it's actually like $7 a month. So again, it's kind of like a bit misleading how they've labeled this out. But if you go and open up Teams Cloud, you can see what the actual packages are. For uh, business, self-hosted, your contact and sales. So I have no idea what the cost is there. So there you go. All right, we're taking a look here at workspaces. So workspaces allow you to manage multiple environments or alternate state files, such as development or production. And there are two variants of the workspace. We have CLI workspaces, a way of managing alternate state files locally or via remote backends. And then we have Terraform cloud workspaces that act like completely separate working directories. I'm gonna tell you, these two are confusing because they don't exactly work the same way, but they have the same name. And originally workspaces were called environments. And so, you know, when you're using Terraform Cloud, it makes a lot of sense to call them environments. 
and the CLI workspace, it's just a little bit different. So, you know, I'm not sure if I'm gonna do a great job explaining the difference of these things. You really have to go through the motion of it to really uh, get the hang of it, uh, but I'll do the best I can here, okay? So think of workspaces as being similar to having different branches in a Git repo. Workspaces are technically the equivalent to renaming your state file, okay? So in Terraform 0.9, they used to be called, uh, workspaces used to be called environments, but people got confused, which I have no idea why, but uh, you know, that's what it is now. So by default, you already have a single workspace in your local backend called default, and the default workspace can never be deleted. So even if you don't think you're using workspaces, you absolutely are, even the first time you use Terraform, at least in the CLI workspace, okay? Let's get a little bit into the internals. This isn't really that much detail, but depending if you are on a local or remote backend changes how the state file is stored. So if you're on a local state or remote state, it's gonna be different. So uh, Terraform stores the, the workspace states in a folder called terraform.tfstate.d. Um, on the remote state, the workspace file are stored directly in the configured backend. Um, in practice, individuals or very small teams will have been uh, have known to commit these files to the repos, but using a remote backend instead is recommended when there are multiple collaborators. So I guess there's not really much to say here, but just understand that when you have a local state file, it's going to be in that Terraform TF state D, and then when it's remote state, you don't have to worry about it, okay? Let's talk about interpolation with current workspaces. So you can reference the current workspace name via the terraform.workspace uh, named value. So we saw that in the lineup way earlier in the course. So the idea here is that if you wanted to um, see if the default, like let's say you want to say, am I in the default workspace, then return five as opposed to one, because maybe uh, you're very comfortable spinning up more in the default than whether it was something else. Um, and just another example, maybe you want to use it to uh, apply the name of the workspace as a tag. So here that would actually give this virtual machine in AWS the name web hyphen, whatever it is, production or development. So there you go. Let's talk about multiple workspaces. So a Terraform configuration has a backend that defines how operations are executed and where persistent data is stored. So like the Terraform state. So multiple workspaces are currently supported by the following backends, Azure RM, Console, COS, GCS. So that's Google Cloud Storage, Kubernetes, Local, Manta, Postgres, Remote, S3. They're not gonna ask you this on the exam, which ones are supported, but you know, for your own purposes, if you wanna use multiple workspaces with a, um, a standard backend, you probably wanna know which ones. Certain backends uh, support multiple name workspaces, allowing multiple states to be associated with a single configuration. Um, that, uh, the configuration still has only one backend, but multiple distinct instances of the configuration to be deployed without configuring a new backend or changing authentication credentials. Why would you want to use a multiple workspaces for something like a standard, um, a standard uh, backend? Well, the idea here is that you know, if let's say you're using Terraform Cloud and you've reached your limit of five users, and it just gets too expensive to go to the uh, six user where you have to pay for all of them, uh, you know, then the thing is is that you know, this is an option for you. It's just kind of like another option out there until you are ready to pay for Terraform Cloud at the next tier up. So that's the reason why I'm mentioning it here for you, okay? All right, let's quickly walk through the Terraform Cloud workspace. And the easiest way is to just show you a screenshot. So uh, you create a workspace on Terraform Cloud. So first you'll create an organization, mine's called Exam Pro. And within that, you'll create uh, multiple workspaces. From there, you'll click into your workspace and you'll see uh, like previous run states, variable settings. We'll click into runs. From runs, what we'll get is a list of what happened previously. We can click into one of those and we can see our plan and our apply. We can leave a comment on each run that has happened. If we, if we just want to expand the plan and apply here, for plan, we will see all the details of what it would change and then apply is it actually uh, setting up that infrastructure and whether it was successful or not. Um, notice you can also download Sentinel mock files. We'll come and talk about that later when we get to our Sentinel section. We can also see a history of previously held states. So these are um, snapshots of that infrastructure. And so you can click into there and exactly see what it looks like. This is useful if you want to go and download it um, if you were to need it. 
So here's a diff of what changed since the last state. Okay, and of course you can download that stuff. So, you know, hopefully that gives you an idea of what you can do with Terraform Cloud Workspaces. Let's talk about Terraform Cloud Run Triggers. So Terraform Cloud provides a way to connect your workspaces to one or more workspaces via run triggers within your organization known as source workspaces. So run triggers allows runs to queue automatically in your workspace on successful apply of runs in any of your source workspaces. And you can connect each workspace to up to 20 source workspaces. So run triggers are designed for workspaces that rely on information or infrastructure produced by other workspaces. If a Terraform configuration uses data sources to read values that might be changed by another workspace, run triggers lets you explicitly specify the external dependencies. So the idea is just allow you to say, okay, I have one workspace. I I've triggered that, I want it now to do that. So this is really great if you have a bunch of, uh, of um, environments uh, or, or stacks that are reliant on each other and you want it to kind of have a chain reaction. The reason I'm mentioning run triggers is like, A, I think it's a cool feature and B, because um, triggers is something that is also uh, something else when we're looking at provisioners. And I just wanted to just clarify that there's run triggers from Terraform Cloud and then there's triggers that are for, um, uh, when I said provisioners, I really mean null resources. They have triggers in that, okay? Uh, so it's not gonna show up in the exam, but it's just a good to know feature. I just wanted to make sure there's no confusion with the other triggers. Let's take a look at some of the Terraform Workspace CLI commands that we have available to us. The first starting with Terraform Workspace list. So list all the existing workspaces and the current workspaces indicated by an asterisk. So that is our current workspace there. Terraform Workspace Show, show the current workspace. So right now we're working in development. Terraform Workspace Select, switch to a target workspace. So here we could say select default, and now we're in the default. Terraform Workspace New, so create and switch to a new workspace. And then we have Terraform Workspace Delete, so delete a target workspace. Now, understand that this is affecting um, your local ones uh, for the CLI commands, okay? But um, yeah, so this would actually show up in the exam. They might ask you like, what, uh, you know, which is select and what does list do and things like that. So make sure you know these commands, okay? All right, so I just wanted to contrast against the local or CLI driven workflows via the Terraform Cloud workflows because there's this great uh, table chart that's from the um, uh, documentation that I want to show you. So Terraform Cloud Workspaces and local working directories serve the same purposes, but they store their data differently. So just looking here, we'll go down the components here. So for Terraform Configuration, it's going to be on disk for local. For Terraform Cloud, in linked uh, version control repositories or periodically uploaded via the API or CLI. Uh, we have variable values, so this is where we use TFRs, and when we're in Terraform Cloud, it's in the actual workspace, the Terraform Cloud workspace, and so that means that we are setting environment variables to propagate that into our code or inject those variables into our code on execution. For state, it's on disk or in a remote backend, uh, and in the workspace for Terraform Cloud, it's actually in the workspace. Credentials and secrets are in shell environments or are entered at prompts. In workspace, they're stored as sensitive variables. These are environment variables again. So there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are on to our Terraform Cloud uh, follow-alongs. Now, we already did Terraform Cloud uh, version control system earlier than I thought we were going to do, so I'm going to remove it from the list. And what we'll do is focus on permissions and maybe the API tokens and things like that. So what I want you to do, and I've got some old tabs open here, but I'm going to make my way over to uh, terraform.io and I'm going to go log into Terraform Cloud here. And I don't think I've ever done this, but I can upgrade to the trial account because the thing is, is that when we are in our account here and we're trying to look at uh, permissions and we're not using force and locking anymore, I might just keep that around for a little bit. But if we were to go to our user settings here, we go to organizations. Um, that might not be a very good example. I guess I wanted like the organization settings here, which would be maybe here, yeah, up here. And so, you know, when we go to our teams and our users, our users, everyone's being added as an owner. We don't have like granular permissions and that's because we'd have to upgrade. And so 
I figured this would be a good opportunity for me to just kind of upgrade to show you those uh, more detailed uh, role-based access control permissions, just so you know where they are. So I'm gonna go to the upgrade now and notice that we're on the free plan and also take note because um, later on in the course I talk about pricing or we've already, already crossed it, but notice that we have a team plan and a team and governance plan. This one's at $20 and this one's at $70. So, you know, this is not something that's reflected, at least not right now, on the Terraform website. And so it just looks like there's a team and governance plan for $20, and this middle one's missing. The key difference here is this one has Sentinel policy as code. But you can see on the free plan, we are able to do team-based stuff. But let's go switch over to the trial plan. I'm going to see if I can do this without entering a credit card in. So here it says you're currently on trial plan. I didn't have to enter anything in. That's really great. And so that means now I have all these team management options. So if I go over to team management, um, I can actually go ahead and create some teams. Uh, so I'll just say like developers. Okay. And so now I have all these options. So we, we can say this person, if someone's in this team, they're allowed to manage policies. They're able to do that. Uh, a visible team can be seen by every member or we can keep them secret. We can generate out um, team API tokens which I guess we could just like cover this as we do it, but notice we can go here and that generates out that token that we can use. I'm gonna go ahead and delete that token. Um, so nothing super exciting there. You know, it's not like that complicated. If we want to uh, set things on the workplace, now if we go back to workplace or workspaces here, and now we have team access and notice I can go to add team uh, permissions here and we can say select this team for their permissions and so these are these uh, pre-built ones in. Um, so we have read, plan, write. So these are those three predefined ones that we talked about previously. And then we have down here, like assign permissions for the admin of a workspace. We are able to set customized permissions. So if we toggle this, um, we should be able to do it. I mean, this looks like it's the same thing. No, I guess it's more granular. So here, I guess we have our granular permissions that we can set. So for runs, we can do read, plan, or reply. Lock or unlock a workspace, send unlocks, things like that. It's not super complicated. If we want to drain out API tokens for, uh, well, there's the organizational one, there's the teams one, and then there's the user one. So if we go to the organization, we can see that we can generate out one here. So I can say create an API token. So there it is. Let's go ahead and delete that. And if we go back to our teams, we did this earlier, but we can generate one here. And then if you want to generate one for your user, it's probably under user settings. Yeah, so we generate tokens there as well, okay? Um, so, I mean, again, there's not a lot to talk about here, but um, yeah, so I guess that really covers permissions and API tokens, okay? Okay, so that finished uh, deploying there. And so we can see our resources have been created. But one thing that uh, we didn't set was the prefix. I'm actually uh, interested to see that that worked properly. But what I could do is say prefix and then do an underscore here. And I don't know how that would affect it. And this actually happened over in this repository here. I'm actually using a hyphen, so I'm gonna just change that to that. Might have to do a Terraform init there, migrate the state. So that was a complete mistake on my part, but I guess my thought was that I thought I had to have, um, this is still on main, and I guess we never really set up a production branch, but yeah, so now when we have the prefix in, it's actually gonna prompt us for the other ones. So the currently selected workspaces, our default does not exist. And so dev is showing up and notice that we can't deploy to main. So I think the thing is, is that if we wanted a production one, we would just create that workspace and then it would reflect here so the, the way you make uh, multiple workspaces here would actually have to make them all. So we'd have to make a VCS Terraform prod. And I'm very certain that it would just show up here and then you would select the number that you'd want. Uh, though what's interesting is the fact that we are in the dev branch and we have to say, oh, I want to deploy the dev one. So that's kind of a, a little bit of a caveat there, but I guess there's not really any way around it. But I mean, this pretty much you know explores 
what we need for um, multiple workspaces with Terraform Cloud, and we did the remote ones, and uh, we're all good. So there we go. I guess the last thing here we should probably do is just clean up. So if we go to Terraform Dev here, uh, we're going to go down to Destruction, and we'll run a destroy plan here. Okay. And once this is all done, you know, you can go ahead and just delete these repositories. And notice this one is, it has a private lock on it. So, oh, because it's actually running right now, so it's being locked. So, yep, yeah, there we go. So that's it. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from ExamPro, and we are taking a look at Sentinel, which is an embedded policy as code framework integrated within the Terraform platform. So what is policy as code? When you write code to automate regulatory or governance policies and features of Sentinels include uh, it that it's embedded. So enable policy enforcement in the data path to actively reject violating behavior instead of passively detecting. So uh, it's, it's very active or proactive. Fine grained condition based policies. So make policy decisions based on the condition of other values. Multiple enforcement levels. So advisory, soft and hard mandatory levels allow policy writers to warn on or inject, uh, reject behavior. We have external information, so source external information to make holistic policy decisions. We have multi-cloud com compatible, uh, compatible, so ensure infrastructure changes are within business and regulatory policy across multiple providers. And Sentinel is a paid service part of the team and governance upgrade package. So starting at team and governance, it's available for that. Um, business and enterprise, okay? Let us expand a bit on the concept of policy as code and relating to Sentinel. So Sentinel is built around the idea and, and provides all the benefits of policy of code. Let's talk about the benefits we get with this. So sandboxing, the ability to create guardrails to avoid dangerous actions or remove the need of manual verification. Codification, the policies are well documented and exactly represent what is enforced. Version control, easy to modify or iterate on policies with a chain of history of changes over time. Testing, so syntax and behavior can easily be validated with Sentinel, ensuring policies are configured as expected. Automation, so policies existing as code allows you to uh, allows you to direct integrate policies in various systems to auto -rem remediate and notify. We're talking about Sentinel and policy as code. We have language, so all Sentinel uh, policies are written using the Sentinel language. This is designed to be non-programmer and programmer friendly, em embeddable and safe. For development, Sentinel provides a CLI for development and testing. And for testing, Sentinel provides a test framework designed specifically for automation. So hopefully that gives you an idea of the benefits of policy code and in particular with Sentinel. All right, let's take a look at the Sentinel language and also just a broad uh, range of, of use cases that we could use these for so you can start thinking about how to start applying Sentinel. The great thing is that there are a bunch of example policies provided by HashiCorp, so you can easily um, you know, start using them right away. But let's go through the big list to kind of give you an idea where you would use policies code. So for AWS, maybe you'd want to restrict the owners of the AWS AMI to a data, uh, of the data source. Maybe you want to enforce mandatory tags on taggable AWS resources, restrict availability zones used by EC2 instances, disallow um, uh, 0.0.0.04.0, .0 basically anywhere address out to the internet. Um, restrict instance types of EC2, so maybe you only want people using T2 micros. Require S3 buckets to be private and encrypted by KMS, since that is a big um, uh, a big problem for people on AWS where their buckets get leaked. Uh, require VPCs to have DNS host names enabled. Relegate really GCP. Enforce mandatory labels on VMs. Disallow anywhere cider. Enforce limits on GKE clusters because those can get really expensive. Restrict uh, machine types of VMs, just like AWS. For VMware, uh, require storage DRS on uh, data store clusters. Restrict size and type of uh, virtual disks. Restrict CPU count memory of VMs. Restrict size of VM disks. Require NFS 4.1 and uh, Kerberos, I never can say that properly, on NAS data stores. For Azure, enforce mandatory tags of VMs, restrict publishers of VMs, restrict VM images, restrict the size of Azure VMs, enforce limits on AKS clusters, restrict uh, CIDR blocks of security groups. For cloud agnostic, allowed per, uh, only say, we can only use these allowed providers, say, uh, or explicitly say what providers are not allowed, uh, limit proposed monthly costs, prevent providers in non-root modules, require all modules have version constraints, require all resources be created in modules in private module registry, use most recent uh, versions of modules in a private module registry. That's more so like about the tooling around modules. Now let's take a look at an example 
Uh, and this is one for restricting uh, availability zones on EC2 instances, so like what data centers you're allowed to use. And so we first import our language functions. That's going to allow us to use particular uh, feature functions in this. We're going to specify our AZs. We're going to get all the uh, virtual machines. We're going to filter uh, that and restrict the AZ for those VMs. And we're going to define that rule to make it enforceable. So there you go. All right, let's take a look here with Sentinel with Terraform. So Sentinel can be integrated with Terraform via Terraform Cloud as part of your IEC provisioning pipeline. And where it's going to sit is between plan and apply, okay? So the way you do it is you're gonna to have to create a policy set and apply these to the Terraform uh, workspace. So it's not that complicated to get it hooked up. Um, so yeah, that's all there is to it, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are gonna learn a bit about um, Sentinel with Terraform. I'm not gonna say I'm amazing at it, but we are gonna stumble our way through and see what we can accomplish. We know we can download Sentinel mocks, and there's also the ability to set policy sets. And I do know that uh, there are a bunch of pre-made um, Sentinel policies. So we go Sentinel policies here, uh, Terraform, uh, and we go examples. Uh, there we are, probably here. There are a bunch of ones that we can go in here. So I'm thinking that there's something that we can do here, um, but we'll have to figure our way through here because I actually haven't ran any um, policies myself. So we have these two environments. I'm not using dev anymore. I'm done with this. So I'm going to go ahead and destroy that. And we're going to go down to Terraform Destroy. I'm pretty sure I don't have any running infrastructure. Actually, I'm going to double check by going to the overview. Everything has been destroyed. And so I'll go back over here and we're going to destroy this. I'm going to type in VCS Terraform Dev. Great. And if we go into this workplace or workspace, uh, nothing is provisioned right now. So I want to uh, get everything running again because last time we ran a destroy. So I think that if we want to get this working, it should be pretty easy. I'm going to go back to our um, workflows file here. And we're just going to revert some changes. So I'm going to go back and change this to name. And I'm just going to go, whoops, we're going to go into our 120 directory here, and we're going to go git checkout main. And that actually might just revert those changes there. I don't think anything really changed much other than this part here. And so what I'm going to do is just go um, make a minor change. It doesn't matter what it is. Maybe a space. Git add all. Whoops. Git commit hyphen m. Changes. Git push. We'll have to do a git pull here. Git push. Sorry, git push. And so what I want to see here is a trigger for the run. There we go. And I'll see you here in a bit when it's provisioned, OK? All right, so after a short little wait there, it looks like our uh, branches ran. So I think our resources are provisioned. Um, it's cool. We actually have cost estimation. I didn't have to do anything to turn that on. We already have it. Notice that it's giving us an hourly of um, 0 12 cents. The monthly is going to be $8 and, you know, 35 cents there. If there was more resources there, we would obviously get that. I assume that it would show up here in the top right corner. So we're not really interested in the provision infrastructure, but more so looking at these uh, Sentinel locks. So I'm going to go ahead and download them there. And that's going to download as a, um, a zip or an archive of some sorts. And so what I can do here is just unzip it. So I'm just going to make a new folder. Here, and we'll just call these um, Sentinel mocks. Okay, I'm just going to open up the zip. And so here's all the stuff in here. So we have a variety of different files. I think some of them might be redundant. I'm not sure what we have to do with them, but I'm just going to go ahead and grab these and drag them into the folder here. Okay, and actually what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to just make a new section in my folder here. Uh, whoops. Just give me a second here. We'll just open up the Explorer to anything. Yeah, we have a um, folder right here. Because what I want to do is just drop those files in so we can just see them in VS Code, the contents of them. There we go. And so now I'm just going to go down to here. And we'll take a look. So we have Sentinel HCL. 
All right, and so that's just defining a bunch of mocks. Uh, we have this sendl file here. So I was hoping when we open this that we'd be able to figure out what to do with this, and I have no idea. So you know what? What I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a little bit of reading, and I'm going to come back to you after I finish reading this, okay? All right, so spending a little bit of time uh, watching some stuff, so I was just going through the deep dive of Sentinel here uh, and just going through the documentation. And as far as I understand it, it looks like that you write policies, and then you can also write tests for your policies to assert that your policies are doing what you expect them to do. And I guess those uh, Sentinel mocks are written in a form of HCL, um, but it is a little bit confusing because you get this folder with a bunch of stuff in it, and it can be either written as JSON or um, like this HCL-like format. But as far as I can tell, it's just saying what it's done is it's generated out the, the current state of exactly what your infrastructure is. And I think that it's going to check to see is it exactly what you expect it to be. Um, so I don't know if Mox is that very uh, useful and might be a little bit too much for this uh, particular course. So I'm just going to say let's just kind of ignore uh, Mox because they're just a little bit too uh, too difficult and out of scope here. Let's fo uh, focus on trying to get a policy implemented. So I'm going to go back over here and what I'm going to do is I know that if I go to settings, I mean I've seen it before, I just can't remember if it's under a workspace no, it's, I think it's at the organization level. So we're going to go to the settings here. And there we have our policies. So we here we can create new policies. So managing individual policies, Terraform is deprecated. Policy sets now supports VCS integration with direct API uploads. Uh, this provides a streamlined policy management experience policies, which includes... Okay, so this is the old way of doing it. And so we'll go here and create a new policy set. So connect a new policy set. Um, okay, so I guess what we have to do... Oh boy, this is a lot different than I thought it was going to be. So I thought it was just like, we're going to go here and create it and then dump our code in, which apparently that's what it is. But it seems like we need to associate with the policy set. So just give me a moment because I do want to show you the the, the most up-to-date way to do this. So I'll be back in a second, all right? All right, so doing a little bit of reading here, it looks like what we have to do is create ourselves a sendl.hcl file. And this is going to say what policies we want to enforce. So I assume this is basically the policy set as a file. And here we specify the policies that we care about. Um, and I actually just want to go back to the files we were looking at earlier because we saw this HCL file. So I guess this would technically be a policy set. Is that what we call that here? But notice it says mocks. So these aren't policies per se. These are just grouping mocks. Um, but in any case, I think we'll have to create this file. So what I'm going to try to do, and uh, I don't know if this is going to work, but we'll just stumble our way through here because it's the best way to learn is we're going to create ourselves our own Sentinel file here. So we're going to say um, sentinel.hcl. And we're going to have to define ourselves a policy. This isn't going to be the one that we're going to use, but I'm just going to grab it here. Notice there are different enforcement levels. So um, I don't really care what we put in. I just want to see that we can successfully get anything working here. And I'm going to go back to the examples, um, if we can go find that there. So sentinel policy examples, and let's just go take one of those and see what we can do with it, okay? So if we scroll on down, um, disallow 000 CIDR block in the security group. That seems like something that would be pretty relevant. Uh, restrict instance type of EC2 instance, that could be something as well that we could do. So, you know, I just have to decide what it is we want to do here, restrict owners. So there's a few that are good here. Let's take this, take a look at this one, because I feel like this might be very simple. So yeah, this is perfect. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll take uh, this policy here. So I wonder if I could just go download this file here. There's probably like a download button. Well, I can't find it. So we'll just, or maybe it's up here. No, okay. We'll just create this uh, by hand here. So I'm gonna go copy and uh, it looks like we can just drop it in here. So I'm just gonna go new file here and put that there and we'll just go to raw. And we will go ahead and drop that on in there. So I wish I had like send all highlighting. I don't know if there is such a one for VS Code. If there is, it'd be really nice. So we would type in Sentinel. Uh, yes, we do. This one has more downloads, so we'll go with that one. No rating as of yet. Looks like it works, so let's go give them a five star. I think that's only fair because uh, no one's done that yet. Am 
might be a bit too hard to uh i've never written a review before but we'll go here and say works as expected thank you for this uh extension okay so what i'm going to do is go back over to here and so here we have some kinds now we're running a t2 micro i believe so this policy should uh, cause it to fail. And that's exactly what we want. But I'm just gonna go look up and down to see if it's all correct. It looks good to me. The only thing we'll have to change over here is the name. So I'm just going to clear this out and we'll say restrict EC2 instance type. We'll save that. Hard mandatory sounds really good to me. Um, probably have to spell it right for it to work. R-E-S, yeah, strict, okay, great. And so what I'll do is just copy this up here Okay, and so we have our sendlhcl file and it's referencing a local file. Now the question is, you know, can we use the same repository? I assume we would be able to uh, for our policy set, but it almost seems like it might encourage you to have your policies separate from your repository that you're testing. And that might be really good because let's say you have multiple workspaces or, or environments and they all require the same policy set. You wouldn't want to have them in your code base like that. But um, for the purposes of this, we're just going to keep it simple. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, open up terminal here, and we're going to commit these uh, these changes to our repository. And this will end up triggering a deploy, um, even though we don't necessarily want that to happen, but there's no way around that. So git, well, I, I suppose we could just cancel it out but or not have the auto apply, but I don't feel like changing that. So we'll do git status here. We'll go git add all, git commit hyphen m uh, simple policy here. get push, okay? And so that's being pushed to our repository. That's gonna trigger um, a deploy and we don't care. I, I, I assume it won't pick up the policy because we have to connect the policy set. So um, apparently you can use the API to upload your policy set, which is kind of cool. I suppose we could have done that, but um, well, too late. <laughs> we probably should use VCS anyway, you know what I mean? So we'll go to GitHub here and we will find our Terraform repository, which is here. Um, you know, policy, well, we should probably name this, right? So we policy to enforce uh, instance type. I don't know if we need a description. I guess we'll find it in a second here. I guess we could have also put the policy in a, um, a subdirectory there. That might've been okay to do. Um, it's gonna default to the main branch, which is fine. Policies enforced on all workspaces or policies enforced on selected workspaces. And we only have one, but that's what we'll do down here. So we'll say uh, update. The name is invalid. Oh, uh, it has to be like a proper name. So restrict EC2. Now, again, this is a policy set. So you could just say like, um, you know, basic server policy set. That'd probably be better. And then you probably want a list to say what it does. Restricts um, EC2 instances, instance type. Okay, and we'll go down here and create that policy set. And that looks like we're in good shape. So we applied it. Um, now, will it actually happen on this run because it's already running, I believe. We go into this workplace, workspace. I like to say workplace, it's workspace. And uh, we go over here, this is already planned and finished. So what I want to do is just trigger another uh, um, deploy here. So there's nothing changed. So, I'm not sure what we do here. Um, I guess what we could do, and actually this is something that I'm, I don't know, but like how would you trigger a replace on here? Because if we are doing, let's just go to plan and see what happens. I wonder if we could do that in the plan here. Reason for trigger, do refresh only plan. Because one thing I was thinking about is like, imagine I wanted to replace an element, you can do that hyphen replace, but I don't know how you do that through VCS. But anyway, what I'm gonna do is just go change anything in our code. Um, so it could just be a space. It doesn't really matter. Git add plus git commit trigger uh, change. And we just want to observe the, um, the policy working okay. So I'm just going to open this up here. I'm not sure if it's going to show up in the plan section or the apply section. So we'll just wait here to watch, see the plan generate out. Oh, 
And so the plan finished. Um, we don't see any Sentinel, uh, Sentinel being applied there. Apply will not run. Let's expand that there. This looks fine. I guess technically we didn't change anything, so that probably is not very helpful. So what I'm going to do is go and change a variable because maybe that's that's what's going to help here. Um, so we have a micro here, which is fine. We're just going to change this over to nano. That makes sense why it didn't do it. So we'll go back over to runs, and I'm going to trigger. I'm going to start a plan. So uh, change EC2 instance type. We'll say start plan. Okay, so we have one change, which is fine. We just Okay, so that part pass, it's going to go to cost estimation. That passed, it's going to apply it. Because remember, we have um, auto approve on the server, so it's not even going to ask us to confirm it. And so I want to see if that policy is in place. While it's running, I'm just going to go review our policy here. Just to make sure it's not like the opposite saying, like, you cannot have these. So include now allowed EC2 instance type. So it's small, medium, or large. So it really should quit out on this one here. But it seems like it's working. Like, it's not, uh, it's not picking up the policy. But I'll see you here back in a bit. Okay. All right, so I didn't see the policy trigger there. So I'm going to go back to policy sets and notice here it says zero workspaces, which is unusual because I definitely selected one, but maybe I didn't click through or hit uh, add. So I'm going to go down here and click this one again. And maybe I didn't hit this button here. Okay, and now I probably have to hit update um, policy set. Before we do, I just want to read about this. These parameters are passed to central runtime when performing policy checks. So I guess that'd be uh, like a way where you'd have a generic policy and then you could kind of put parameters in. So that's kind of cool. So I'm going to go back here and double check to make sure that we have a workspace set. And so what we'll do is just change the variable again. Um, so we will go to our variables here. And I'm going to go change this back to a micro. And so I think this time we are going to have better success. Okay, so we'll hit save. We'll go back up to runs. We'll go and start a new plan. Uh, change instance type again here. And we will save that plan. And so that plan is now running. I will see you back here in a bit uh, when we see that Sentinel policy. I don't know when it triggers, so I'll see you back here in a bit. All right, welcome back. So after our cost estimation, it did a policy check, and you can see that it failed. Um, and here the error says, import TF plans function is not available. So I'm not sure why that's happening. So I think that, um, I mean, our set failed, but not for the reason we wanted to. So I'm going to go investigate this, and I'll be back in a moment, OK? All right, so uh, what I've done here is I've gone and looked up uh, like how to create a policy set, and HashiCorp Learn has this um, example project here. And if we go into its uh, GitHub project and I go here, uh, you're going to notice that it, it's like this apparently does basically the same thing, restrict AWS instance type and apparently tag as well. But it doesn't have the TF functions, the TF plan functions here. So... Um, Maybe we don't need that function in there, and maybe the uh, the example is just out of date at this time. So import common functions for Sentinel, okay? But this one doesn't have it. It does it. Ha it does have it for Mox, right? Um, so maybe we just need to kind of like walk through this really quickly and see how we can fix this. So the policy uses the Sentinel TF2 plan import to require that all EC2 instances have instance types plan on the allowed list but I don't see that import there, okay? And it is in here. So I guess what we'll do is just grab this one, okay? And I'm gonna go ahead and just delete this one out here. Um, again, this isn't working. I don't know if, if this would work with that one, so I'm gonna take it out. Um, this is pretty clear what this does, so we'll just have that allowed types. It's interesting, like here it's underscore, and then here it's like uh, title case. There's some inconsistencies there. 
So they have a lot of types as well. Um, and I'm just seeing if there's like find resources in here. So allow types, rule to enforce the name tag. So I don't care about that. Um, rule to restrict the instance type. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab this one here and let's just take a look at the differences here. Okay, so instance type allowed rule all EC2 instances as that instance change after instance type allowed type. So this is way, way different. Um, so, I mean, I fully don't understand this, but I do know that this one it will probably work. So I'm gonna go down here. We have count violations. I'm not really worried about that. And the, the rule's different. Like, if I was really serious about this, I'm sure I could, you know, figure out the logic here. But again, this is just for the purposes of us learning. So we don't have to go too crazy here. Now, this says instance type allowed and mandatory instance tags. We're not dealing with tags here. So I'm just going to say this. Okay. And so I think this will produce what we want. So allows those types. Um, I don't know if it had this in here. Get all instance types from the module. I think we didn't put this in here. So this might be kind of the equivalent. EC2 instances, filter, TF plan, resource changes. Okay. Contains a create or an update. Okay. Um, I mean, this isn't bad. We technically have a name set. So you know what? I'm just going to grab this whole thing because then we're just going to have a much easier time. We don't have to worry about it. But it was nice to walk through that file very quickly because the name tag is set um, in our project, eh? Because we can see we can see that it's the server name. So uh, what we'll do is we'll just go ahead and add this to our repository here. And the great thing is, is that since it's the VS code or it's in the same version control system, I would think that it would update in time. So what we'll do is just do git add all, git commit hyphen m, fix the policy, git push. Okay, and we'll go back over here. And we will see if the policy check happens and when it does happen, it's actually erroring out because we're not using the right instance size, right? So that's what we want to see. A little bit of trial and error, it's not a big deal. I also read like over here that the Sentinel file for HCL only contains module and policies, but then we saw a Sentinel file or the HCL file that clearly had mocks in it. So I mean, maybe, maybe it's just only used locally. Maybe it's not intended for um, production. Um, so we'll go down here, TF plan. So it didn't pick it up. Okay. So what I'm going to do is go back to my policy set and maybe it's just like the order of how this happened. So see this, so it says it was updated, uh, last five minutes ago, updated it a minute ago. So this could just be like a race case where, um, you know, this ran before the other one. So I'm going to try to execute this again, start a new plan, uh, trigger plan. And we'll see if that works now because again, this said literally updated a minute ago. So maybe it didn't pick it up. So you can see why it would also be good to have your policy set in a separate repo because if you're deploying this, you don't want to um, keep triggering your deploys. So I think probably that's what, you know, we should have done. I mean, it's a lot extra work, but you know, this way you kind of understand why. So waiting on that plan run, I really don't care about cost estimation. I mean, you could make a policy to check based on that. I, I'm assuming we can just turn that off if we wanted to. And we'll go over to cost estimation here. Yeah, we could just disable it. But the thing here is that it said our policy passed. So we'll go here. So the, the result means that all central policies passed. So restrict the instance type. So description main rule that requires other rules to be true. 
Uh, rule to enforce name tag is on all instances. That's true. Rule to restrict the instance type. So maybe uh, we don't understand. Uh, maybe this works in the opposite way. Oh, the T2 micro is here. Okay. So I just want to see it fail. So what we'll do is go back up to our variables here. And we will go to our instance type. And we'll just change this to nano. And we'll save that. We'll go back over here to our runs. Oh, this is still running the old one here. That's fine. We can just queue up another one here. So we can just say start a new plan. Uh, new instance type. Okay, and if we go back over to here, the last one wouldn't have done anything because the infrastructure would have been the same. So the previous one we just did here, right? It would just been like, oh no, it's still trying to apply it. So I guess there is a change. Maybe we changed the uh, instance type last time. I don't know. So anyway, I'll see you back here when this is completely done, okay? All right, great. So we got an error. If we go into our instance type here, right? And we look at it, we can see that it failed because uh, it wasn't the uh, right uh, type. So, um, I mean, that's pretty interesting. So the other thing I would say uh, that we could do is also kind of check out mocks now because I kind of feel like I have a better grasp on it now that we have a test running. So just thinking straight about it, a mock really is a representation of the state of infrastructure at the time of. So if we go back to our runs and we go to a successful run like the trigger plan here, and this one was successful, we could go to the plans here and then download these mock files. Um, so we do have the ones from prior and I think those are totally fine and valid to use. So what if, if what we do is go back to our uh, project over here and we have um, the uh, mock files over here, but really where they need to be is within the uh, workflow directory because looking at the documentation here, uh, what it's saying is that you get all these things and this basically represents the state of those mock files. And then you need to make a test folder and then a test data folder. And then there's gonna be something based on the name of the, uh, the mock file. So what we'll do is we'll go um, up to this folder here and we'll say new folder, test. And then we'll make another new folder here, test data. Are those folders or files? I think those are files. <laughs> so we'll delete that. It's just out of habit to uh, click the um, the file there. So we'll say new folder. So we'll say test. And then we'll say another new folder there. Test data. Okay. And so we have our Sentinel file here. So we need to um, have, I think, a similarly named one here. So if we go back over here. Um, this is foo or whatever. So I think we need to have a folder in here. Because it's all based on convention. And I just, it's pretty, not that hard to figure out. I don't even have to read the docs to know that. Uh, we'll just put that in here. Take out the word Sentinel. And then I would assume that we need a file in here. What's it called? Like just pass and fail. So I'm going to just do a pass. File new. Pass.hcl. Okay. And then we have our test data. So that was what we had down below here. So I need to go grab that information. I'm just looking for a folder where I might already have open here. If I don't, that's fine. We'll just go ahead down below and just right click and reveal and explore. We'll go over here and I need to move all these over. So I just copy them over and we're gonna go over to our Terraform work flow here. And I'm gonna go here and paste that data in. Um, I don't know if these contain any kind of sensitive data because if they're based on the TF state file, these might be something you don't want to share. That might be a security vulnerability, I don't know, but I definitely won't have these available when I put this uh, repository up for free. Um, so we have those files in the right place. And we have all this stuff here. So I, I think that, um, like you notice it's not there. So I'm assuming that we need to open up this file and copy into our main HCL file. So we'll go down below here. And then I think it's just a matter of copying all this stuff, right? We'll say cut. And then we'll go to uh, back up to here, I suppose, into our file. It's getting a little bit confusing with all this stuff, eh? Okay, so that's in the right place. Our test data is there, good. Here we are, okay. So what I'm gonna do is just go down here and paste that in. Okay, and so 
we didn't write any kind of pass. Test data, test. So that's something we, we will need here. I'm not sure what we'll get, so we'll just scroll down here. We can find the contents of a pass.hcl. It's not showing me anything here, so just give me a moment. I'm gonna see what we have to do for this, this test, okay? All right, so a little bit of Googling. It looks like uh, this one's on the same track here. So since we probably copied the mock data from this one or somewhere through here, we could probably just go grab this. So um, this is pretty much what our pass file will look like. Um, so we'll go ahead and grab this here. I don't know if we really need a fail to write a failing test. I don't really care about that. I just wanna see anything pass here. We'll paste that in here. We do have to be sure that we are accessing our data correctly. So if we are in test, it's gonna go up one directory to the Terraform directory, but wouldn't it have to then CD into uh, test? So I don't think that source path is correct. Just gonna double check that here. They do have an example repository. So let's take a look here at what we have. Um, yeah, that's kind of odd. Um, so I think that if this is relevant, it needs to go to test data because how, how else would it get there? Okay, so we'll do that. So test rules main equals true. Um, okay, so that's a pretty simple test. And so I think the way we run tests is there's like a send null test thing here. I don't know if we have send null installed. I don't think so. So there's no send null command. So I guess that's something we're gonna have to install. Send null um, CLI Terraform. Okay, we'll go over here. Uh, we're on technically Linux, even though we're on Windows, we're on Linux. So here it's just saying uh, download it and then put it in the correct path. So install, so we'll get the appropriate package here. And we are technically on Linux. And I guess we are 64 bit. Just gonna download here. Scroll up. Oh, it is already downloading. Okay, great. And so I'm just gonna go to my downloads. And I'm gonna open it up here. So there it is. And so I need to. Um, get it into the uh, user local bin here. So I'm just going to first get it in anywhere. So um, because I'm just working here, I'm just gonna go open this up. So reveal in the Explorer, okay. And this is not where I want it to be. I'm just dropping it here for the time being. Technically we could run it from there. I don't think it'd be that big of a deal. So I'm just gonna go back to my VS code here and I'm gonna just type Sentinel. Sentinel it is there, right? Yep, it's there. I'm not sure if it's executable, but um, I'm just gonna type in Sentinel here, Sentinel test. Okay, so it doesn't think it's command. So maybe I have to do like chmod u plus x. That makes it executable on Linux. Sentinel command not found. Well, heck, I'm right there. Maybe I have to put a period forward slash like that. Okay, there we go. So, um, I mean, of course you don't want to leave it in here. You And this would also end up in a repository. So this will go to like your user local bin probably. So um, I'm going to say like move Sentinel to user local bin. And so now I should just be able to type Sentinel. It should get picked up. It does, great. So here I can do test. And down below it says, open test, no such file or directory. So it can't find the mock data. Notice that it's going into the test test data. So that is no good for us. Um, we did say to go up a directory. So maybe if I go up back one more like this, would that work? No, let's go put back in what they actually had there, which I have a hard time believing that would be correct. So open mock, okay, so that's definitely not right. Okay, and so personally, I just want this to work. So I'm just gonna cheat. This is absolutely what you should not do, but you know, like I don't wanna be fiddle around with paths all day here. And so I'm just gonna give it an absolute path and see if that fixes our problem. 
Okay, and so just say test data here. Um, so that should absolutely work. I'm just going to expand this here. This is mock TF plan. Oh, but it says pass in the name. Okay, so the problem isn't that. It's the fact that uh, the mock data isn't named. It's because the thing is you could download two different mocks, right? So you could have a state that is successful and failed, and you'd probably want to rename them to say passed or failed. So we don't necessarily have that. So I think my original thing was correct, where we had this test data. And so here we just have to make sure we match the name. So mock TF uh, V2 is fine here. Okay. Again, I don't understand the difference between all these files. I definitely saw in the documentation they explain them all. So, you know, that might be something we want to read through here. Um, so this is looking a little bit better. So mock TF plan hyphen version two Sentinel. So that is correct. Um, but the direct, it doesn't like the direct, it's going in that test again. So again, I'm going to just go back up one more layer here. There we go, and it's passing. So um, yeah, so that's all it takes to um, do that. Again, if, I think if we were to commit this to our code, I don't think that these run. So we can go like, we, so we can just go add it and see what happens. So we'll say git add git commit hyphen m uh, validation. And again, I don't know if this mock data should be allowed to be committed into the repository because we have a tf state file here, right? Okay, I don't know, but I'm gonna just do a, a push here to see what happens. But I, again, I, I, I really think that we're probably not supposed to have it in there. Um, so what we'll do is go back to our Terraform IO, sign in, and we'll just see what happens here. I mean, we don't expect the uh, this to pass because it's still using the wrong uh, instance type. But I was just curious to see if the mock would appear in any way here. I don't think it does. I think that's just something that you would have to do uh, beforehand. And I think what you'd have is you'd have a pull request. And the pull request could be used to run those unit tests because that's basically what it is. Okay. So, yeah, that's exactly what I thought would happen. But down below here, it says the mock block is not supported. So... I wonder what you would do. So if you can't have mocks in the file, what would you do locally? Because you need to, I guess the thing is, is that the mock file, the sentinel.htl file would not be in this full. So you might have the sentinel.htl file in your main repository for mocking, right? And if you committed it, it wouldn't run it because the policy set would actually be in another repository. So I think that's how it's supposed to work. So. Yeah, I think really we want to have policy sets in their own repository, like completely away from there because we're seeing we're running into a lot of problems. But we pretty much accomplished what we wanted to do with Sentinel more than I thought we were going to do. Uh, so that's pretty great. So there you go. Um, in terms of this, we probably want to tear this down. Uh, we do need to do something with Vault and stuff like that. But I think that uh, what we'll do is just tear this down and you know, if we need to bring it back up, we'll do that. So I'm going to go to Destruction here. And... <laughs> And we're going to go ahead and just destroy the plan here. Okay. And we're all now in good shape. And so, um, yeah, I'll see you in the next part, okay? But we're all done here for, for Sentinel. All right. Uh, actually, I guess we're not gone here just yet because it looks like our destroy run failed uh, because we didn't pass here. So um, that is a bit of a problem. So we'll have to go to the variables. I guess it's a good edge case to know about, but um, we'll go back and change this to a micro, even though it's going to just tear it down anyway, you know? So we'll go and type in micro, save variable, and we'll go back to our runs. We'll start a new plan. Or sorry, we'll go to settings here, destruction, queue the plan. Uh, I'm just curious, queuing a plan will redirect a new out output here. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm just going to type in VCS Terraform again here. Okay, and so this should work. And I will come back and just confirm this with you, okay? So I'll be back here in a second.
All right, so the real reason we can't uh, get rid of this is because we have the, those darn mocks in there. So um, what I'm going to do is go over to our Sentinel file here um, up to, I mean, we don't use this one, so I'm going to go ahead and delete that. That's not even something that's going to happen. And we need to update our HCL file here. Okay. And I'm assuming that this supports con uh, con uh, this, okay? Because this is not how we should be doing this. Um, and I'm going to go git add git commit hyphen m. Minor change. Okay, and this is going to trigger a run here. If I really want to do destroy. So we'll just give it a moment there to start so we can kill it. Um, did I not push? Oh, I, maybe I didn't push. And we'll go back here. There's that run. I'm going to go in here. I want to stop it. Uh, cancel run. Okay. And so now what I'll do is go over to the here, destroy this. We'll run that, okay. We'll destroy that. And I will, again, see if this is working and I'll see you back here in a moment, okay? All right, so I just wanted to confirm there that everything is uh, destroyed, so we're all in good shape, okay? So uh, yeah, so we're actually done Sentinel now for real, okay? Bye. All right, let's take a look here at HashiCorp Packer. So it's a developer tool to provision a build image that will be stored in a repository. Using a build image before you deploy provides you with the following immutable infrastructure. Your VMs and your fleet are all one-to-one -one in configuration. Faster deploys for multiple servers after each build. Earlier detection and intervention of package changes or deprecation of old technology. So let's take a look at what that workflow would look like. So you'd have your code, you commit it to your CI CD pipeline, and within that pipeline, it would start up a build server running uh, Packer, and that would trigger a build image. So you'd use a, something to provision it with. So you could use Ansible or a variety of different provisioners within Packer. Uh, and then Packer would then store it somewhere. So maybe this would be Amazon machine image because you're deploying to AWS. And then what you do is reference that image in your Terraform code. And when you provision, it would get deployed to your CSP. So this would be AWS in this case. So Packer configurations is a machine, uh, uh, Packer configuration uh, configures a machine via, oops. Hey, it's Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at HashiCorp Packer. So Packer is a developer tool to provision a build image that will be stored in a repository. So using a build image before you deploy, it's gonna give you the following benefits. Immutable infrastructure, your VMs in your fleet are all one-to-one -one in configuration, faster deploys for multiple servers after each build, earlier detection intervention of package changes or deprecation of old technology. So let's take a look at what that workflow would look like. So first we'd have GitHub. Or, or your Git, so wherever you co uh, commit your changes. And uh, from there, that would trigger a CI CD pipeline. With, within that CI CD pipeline, it would trigger a virtual machine, so or a build server that's running Packer. And so that would trigger the build image process. From there, Packer would use some kind of provisioner like Ansible to provision the image. And then when it was done and, and it was all good, it would store it somewhere like an Amazon machine image. Uh, once it is stored wherever you want it to go, um, then in Terraform, you would just reference it using like a data source. And then from there, you could provision your resource, okay? So Packer configures a machine via a Packer template. And yes, I know the E is missing. Um, so sorry about that. But Packer templates use the HashiCorp configuration language, HCL, which we saw, uh, if you remember, way earlier in the course. Uh, and that's what we're going to review next is what that Packer template file looks like, okay? All right, so Packer configures a machine or container via a Packer template file, and Packer template uses the HashiCorp configuration language, HCL, so that's why it looks very familiar to Terraform and a variety of other languages we've been looking at in this course. 
And so what this file is doing is provisioning a virtual machine on AWS. So here you can see that it's a T2 micro in the US West 2 region, that it's probably gonna be installing Apache since it's named HTTPD. Uh, and the way it's going to be created is via an EBS volumes. Let's talk about kind of the components that we're looking at here. So when you have a Packer template file, you have to specify a source. And this says where and what kind of image we are trying to build. So the source is Amazon EBS. So it's looking for an AMI image or it's being backed by that EBS volume there, okay? Uh, in this case, it's an EBS backed AMI. The image will be stored directly in AWS under the EC2 images. And so we have the build step. So the build allows us to provide configuration scripts. Packer supports a wide range of provisioners. So we have Chef, Puppet, Ansible, Power, PowerShell, Bash, Salt, uh, whatever you want basically has it. And the post provisioners runs after the image is built so they can be used to upload artifacts or repackage them. All right, and the, the place where this is gonna be stored is gonna be on uh, AMIs, okay? So there you go. Let's look at how we actually integrate Terraform and Packer together in terms of a CI/CD workflow. We kind of saw this in uh, that overall graphic in the first uh, Packer slide. But let's just kind of look at the code, okay? So to integrate Packer, there are two steps. You're gonna build the image. So Packer is not a service, but a development tool. So you need to manually run Packer or automate the building of images with a build uh, server running Packer. And the second part of that is referencing the image. So once an image is built, you can reference, reference the image as a data source. Uh, so if it's stored in AWS AMI, we're going to just source it from there. Uh, and the way we select it is what we can do is say, okay, get us the most recent one and use this regular expression and the owner has to be us and, and those kind of parameters to decide how to choose that image. So that's all there is to it. You're just using data sources to reference them after they've already been built, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at uh, using Packer with uh, Terraform, and mostly it's just about just using Packer. Uh, and so what I want to accomplish here is to generate an image and store that onto Amazon Machine Images, and then load that into a Terraform file or like reference it as a data source. So I've never done this before, but it should be fun and we'll figure this out. So what we're first gonna need to do is download Packer. So notice in the top right corner, uh, we have to make your way to Packer however you want to, and we'll go ahead and download. And this one is for Windows, it's a binary, but we are gonna be using Linux. Uh, we've done this so many times, these three, two commands, so I'm not gonna do that again here, but if you have yet to do so, you can go and run that. And so I'm gonna go ahead and install Packer. And once Packer is installed, I will come back here and we will get to it, okay? All right, so after a short little wait there, Packer is installed. And so what I wanna do is go into my uh, Packer folder here, and I'm just gonna run Packer and see what we get. And so we have uh, Packer build, console, fix, format, init. So install missing plugins. Uh, looks kind of similar to Terraform. Uh, build images from a template. That, that sounds kind of interesting. So I think the first thing we're gonna need to do is define ourselves a template file. So uh, I remember I researched one and, and put one in my uh, slides here. So let's make our way over there and see if we can kind of just like use our notes here as a reference. So going down to this Packer file, Let's go ahead and just write one here. Uh, I don't say what the name of the Packer file is. That would probably help, but I believe that they're just named as .hcl files. So what I'm gonna do is go into this here and make a new file. And we're gonna just say, um, uh, I guess, apache.hcl, since we are already very familiar with how to install Apache, that seems like the easiest way to do it. Um, and again, this is gonna be very similar looking to Terraform because it's, you know, all based on HCL. So we'll do a type string. And we are going to need some kind of default AMI. So uh, we can go grab the one we've been using all along here. Um, I think we specified it. And we can just go back to count. Count's always a good one to go to. Um, so I just want to go and grab. Where is it? Um, count, count, count. Where are you? you see, anybody see it? I'm blanking today, so I'm just gonna grab it from AWS. It's not a big deal. I'm just pulling up AWS here. We're gonna make our way over to EC2. And we're gonna go ahead and launch ourselves a new server. Actually, I could probably grab it from the old one. Now I'll launch a new one just in case you don't see anything there that might not be fair. 
gonna go ahead and grab that AMI ID. And I'm just move that off screen here for a moment. And we're going to place in that AMI ID because I assume we want one to override. Then we're gonna say locals uh, app name. And I think the example I wrote here is, is Apache because that is what Apache is, is HTTPD. Not sure how they came up with that name, but uh, that's how they call it. So we need to provide ourselves a source. So we're gonna do Amazon EBS, HTTPDD. Notice that like the source is not called data, it's just called source. Uh, if we go over to the documentation here, just kind of wanna show you here, docs. If it ever loads, come on docs, you can do it. So down below here, or on the left-hand side, we have sources. So if I believe if we were to go over to here and go over to Amazon AMI. So that one says Amazon AMI. Overview. Uh, builders. EC2. EBS. I'm just trying to find the same kind of information that it has there, eh? It's not really doing what I want. But anyway, I know that this code is correct, even though we can't seem to find uh, this out. Probably could just go type in Packer EBS, Amazon EBS. I really like to always refer to the documentation when I can here. So it does say it's a builder. Amazon EBS, source. Down below, here we go. All right, so yeah, um, I don't understand this uh, this builder flag as of yet, but uh, we'll work our way through here and figure it out, okay? So I'm gonna go back and pull up my VS code here and we're gonna put curlies here. And so we need our MI name here. So my server, uh, dollar sign, local app name, instance type, uh, T2 micro, uh, region, this is gonna be US East one, uh, source AMI, this is going to be the variable we set up above, AMI ID. Then we are going to do SSH username, that's gonna be EC2 user, that's the default that AWS always has. EC2 user, we can do some tags here, not really necessary, but uh, it's good to probably give it a name, right? So we'll just say name uh, Apache server. And actually we could probably just uh, do local.app name maybe instead. And then we have our build step here. So we're gonna specify our sources and we're gonna do uh, source.amazonebs.htpd. And we're going to do provisioner pro Visioner shell. And then we want to provide a script. I think we can we can actually do it inline if we didn't want to do a script there, but we know our script works. So maybe we should just stick to that. So I'm just gonna call this um, user data.sh because we already have that somewhere um, before. So we'll do post process. We don't need a post process here. So we just wanna run that script. Um, I believe we have that in our Terraform workflow. We go over there to our workflow, wherever it is. Might also be under modules. If we go into our module here, didn't we create one there called user data? Oh, that's a YAML file. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, that's not a, a big deal. Um, we could probably just, okay. So we're, we're not gonna do it that way. All right. Um, if we're not gonna do it this way, we probably can provide inline things. We don't probably have to do script equals. So what I'm gonna do is go back to the Terraform documentation here, or um, Packer documentation, I should say. And what I wanna do is look at provisioners. We're gonna go look at shell. So it has this inline step, and I assume that this is going to run in a sequential order. So inline array of strings. Okay, so what we will do here is we will type in inline.
And I've done this like a thousand times, but I'm just going to go Google it. Apache install AWS tutorial. There's probably like one on the AWS website for it. For like user data. And this is pretty much has some of it here. I was just kind of looking for these commands like the yum install and the pseudo system start. So we're going to go ahead and grab that. And then we're going to go and grab the next few lines here. Because we want to start and enable. That's the three things that we need to do. Not complicated at all. And so what I'm going to do is type in Packer build and see what happens. Now, I didn't specify any AWS credentials or anything like that. I assume it would pick up the default. And we're going to go to the top here. So it looks like we have to provide the template name. So maybe we'll do Apache HCL here. And it says error parsing JSON invalid character V for the beginning of the value. Oh, so it has to be pkr.hcl. Okay. I'm really liking the uh, user experience or the developer experience for these CLIs. They're really good at telling us what's wrong with them. Um, PKR HCL. If there's like a default file, I don't know what it should be called. Uh, so we've got a bunch of errors, which is fi uh, fine. Unsupported argument locals. An argument locals is not expected here. Did you mean to define a locals block? It's because I put an equals in front of it. It's supposed to just be this. Not that we were really using locals for much here. And it looks like it is provisioning, found an AMI. It's going to use that as the, the source one, creating a temporary key pair, authorizing to port 22, uh, name, packer builder. So I don't know if this uses, I don't think it does, but I don't know if it uses Amazon, because uh, the, there's like EC2 builder image. And there might be a way to use it with um, packer directly, but I'm, I'm not sure how to do that. It's going to go over here. I'm just going to see to make sure it's not running a pipeline here, is it? Image pipelines? No, okay, that's good. Um, but what I will do is go over to my EC2 here. And what I want to go do, okay, so Packer Builder is just running as a virtual machine. So it's actually um, uh, going to spin up a VM and then bake the AMI that way, which seems a lot better. Um, we'll go over to our AMIs and see when that happens there. Um, existing lock and other, those, that red stuff doesn't look good. Seems seemed like it didn't really matter. So the thing like AWS has an entire pipeline for EC2 image builder, but it does cost money to run where I kind of feel like if all Packer is doing is spinning up a virtual machine temporarily to bake that image, that's going to be a lot more cost effective. Um, I mean, we could go look up what the cost is to use EC2 image builder while we were watching this. Builder, can't seem to type today. Uh, it's pricing, I just want to know the pricing. It can't be free. Oh, is it, there's a no cost? I could have swore there was a cost for this. No cost. Image Builder is offered at no cost other than the cost of the underlying AWS resource. I think the thing is that it's that when you use um, EC2 image builder, you have to use of a particular size. You know, if you don't really use AWS, you're more into Azure or GCP, I can understand why this is not much of an interest, but I'm pretty sure if I go here, that the size that you get for the image, what size of each image does EC2 image builder use? Because I remember it was like really really large, un, like unreasonably large. And that was the cost involved in it. Can't find it today. It's not a big deal, but uh, waiting for the AMI to become ready. So if we go over to our AMIs here and give us a refresh, we can see that it is spinning. So it is provisioning that AMI. While that is going on, what we can do is just start setting up the next part of this. So um, within 
our packer here. We can say new file and I'm gonna say main.tf. I'm gonna go as per usual and grab some default code from our count example, which is from right here. Okay, copy that. We're gonna go all the way down to the ground here and gonna go into the main TF here, paste that on in. And we probably wanna keep the public IP around. We actually don't really care, but I'm putting it in anyway. I'm gonna take out the tags. Oh, I wanna leave the name in, so I'll just say like server packer. Okay, server Apache packer. And uh, this is the thing that we want to replace out. This all looks fine. So this is what we need to figure out is our AMI here. It's probably going to come in as a data source. I, it has to come in as a data source. And I'm pretty sure that's what I wrote in our documentation here. So yeah, AWS AMI, example, things like that. So what we're going to do is type in AWS AMI Packer image. And we'll just define that data source. So AWS AMI, Packer image, and we have executable users, executable users equals self. I'm not saying I know what all these options do, but like you just go to the documentation, you grab them, you got something that works. True name regex. Okay, and so we would do something like, uh, start with the little caret character and what did we name this? This starts with uh, my server hyphen. Probably would have helped if we named it with like something like Packer in the name, but I think that's fine. Um, we might as well might, might, might as well go with the full name here and say HTTPD because that's technically what it's going to be. Um, we might want to match for more values here, so. I'm not sure, I guess like we do that. Because sometimes it's like three digits or whatever, but I don't know what Packer is going to do if we keep pushing additional ones. I'm not really familiar with, with that. So we'll just say owners equals self. And so now that should be all set up to go as that is running, it finished. So that's all good. We're going to say um, Terraform init. And here it says uh, block definition must have a block content eliminator. So we have a small problem here. It looks correct to me. Uh, this is not right. Okay. We'll see if we can init this. Now, whether our build image works properly, I don't know. So it'd be really good to write like some tests for it. I, I imagine that there is some kind of way to do that. Um, I guess it'd be like the post processor scripts. Maybe you'd want to do that where you'd want to use that as a means for testing. I'm not really sure. Obviously different provisioners might have um, that kind of stuff built in. So, you know, it might be just part of the provisioning tool you can use. So it initialized here. We're going to do a Terraform plan because I'm hoping that it might complain about the data AWS AMI here if it does not exist properly, and it did. So your query returned no results. Please change your search criteria and try again. So uh, however I wrote this is probably not correct. So I will just take this out here, try this. Data, AWS AMI Packer, no results. So what I'll do is go over to EC2 here. And actually that's the only name that's here for the AMI. So I guess I could just go here and grab the name, but maybe that's not the problem. Oh no, that might be fine. So we'll just do this. Name regex. Okay, so let's go look up data, AWS AMI. X couple of users, most recent, name regex, owners. Maybe we could just do like a filter here. Let's look at name regex. A regex to apply to an AMI list returned by AWS. This allows for more advanced filtering not supported by the AWS a API. This filtering is done locally on the AWS returns. So, 
I suppose that is good, but like I just need it to work. So I'm gonna try the filter instead. And I'm actually gonna put literally the name in my server, HTTPD. I'm gonna take out the regex, assuming that is the problem. Owners is self, executable users is self. Um, please change the criteria. I don't know what executable users, users actually does. Let's maybe look up what that is. Limit search to users with explicit launch permissions on the image. Um, is that required? No. So let's just take that out. If more than one, there isn't. So let's just take that out for the time being. Who's the owner of this? We're the owner, right? We have to be. Owner is this IP address. That must be us. Or, or sorry, not IP, but like our account number. So, I, I mean, that should be fine. Incont incorrect attribute value type. Oh, okay, so that was fine. So we'll do dot ID. But, you know, if you're doing this, like if you wanted a continuous pipeline, you'd probably want to get the most recent and have a better regex. Um, and so I'll do a Terraform apply, auto approve and see if this works. One thing I kind of wonder is like with Packer, how would you do like a versioning? Because that's what I'm not certain about. So like, I'm just kind of like looking through here and seeing what they would do for that. I would imagine that uh, you're probably supposed to like increment it and have it part of the name. Nothing's really speaking to me there, but you know, like the idea is that you want to have things like zero, 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 zero one zero two zero three but i imagine like there's some pragmatic way maybe there's like a built-in function or something that we can do to do that um, or what you do is you would just have a variable probably that's actually what you probably do is you'd have like variable like version right string and then you probably set it and it would come through that way eh? like you'd, you'd set it over here uh, it says our server has finished provisioning. Let's go see and take uh, see if that actually worked. We'll go up to EC2 instances here. That is running. Copy that. Paste that in. Um, the security group doesn't have any open ports, right? So it probably did work. It's just we didn't create a security group with this. So there are no open ports for us to check. I'm not worried about this. I don't care if it actually did work or not um, because we've more or less followed all the steps there. But I believe the reason it's not working like there is just because we don't have a security group. And I just don't want to uh, fiddle with that and put it into a state so that it does not match. So anyway, we're all done here. So I'm gonna do a Terraform, um, apply, auto approve, destroy. But there we go, we accomplished that with Packer and that pretty much wraps up all the main uh, follow alongs for the course. So hopefully that was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, we'll just continue on here. All right, so let's talk about Terraform and console because you're gonna hear console mentioned throughout the uh, documentation and you might think it's critical to the exam, but it's not. So I just wanna make sure uh, we understand its relation to Terraform. So console is a service networking platform which provides service discovery, so central re registry for services in the network. It allows for direct communication, so no single point of failure via load balancers. It has a service mesh, so managing network traffic between services, a communication layer on top of your container application, so think middleware. It has application configuration capabilities. So console is useful when you have a microservice or service-oriented architecture with hundreds of thousands of services. So these are containerized apps or workloads. And so the way console integrates with Terraform is in the following ways. It is a remote backend because console has a key value store 
and this is where you could uh, store the state of your Terraform files. Um, then also there's a console provider because you can use Terraform to set up some things in console for you, but there's not much else outside of that, okay? All right, we're taking a look here at HashiCorp Vault. So Vault is a tool for securing accessing secrets from multiple secret data stores. Vault is deployed to a server where a Vault admin can directly manage secrets. And we have operators, also known as developers, can access secrets via an API. Vault provides a unified interface to any secret, such as AWS secrets, console key values, Google Cloud KMS, Azure service principles. It provides tight access control, so just in time which is reducing surface attacks based on a range of time and just enough privilege. So reducing surface attack by providing at least uh, permissive permissions. We can also uh, record a detailed audit log. So we have tamper evidence. So this is kind of the idea of our uh, little HashiCorp vault stack. So you have your secrets engines. These are third party services or sorry, cloud services that actually store the secrets. You have your vault cluster, which act as the adapter to your resources and then the resources which are going to access them. So again, vault is, is deployed to virtual machines in a cluster and vaults can be backed up via snapshot. So if you do provision them and you're worried about the state of those uh, vaults, you can definitely save those for later, okay? Let's take a look here at Terraform and Vault, how they would work together. So when a developer is working with Terraform and they need to deploy a provider like AWS, they will need AWS credentials. So AWS credentials are long lived, meaning a user generates a key in secret and they are usable until they are deleted. So the AWS credentials reside on the developer's local machine. And so the machine is at risk of being compromised by malicious actors looking to steal those credentials. So if we could provide uh, credentials just in time, expire the credentials after a short amount of time, so short lived, we could reduce the attack surface area of the local machine. And so this is where Vault comes in because Vault can be used to inject short lived secrets at the time of Terraform apply. So imagine you are, uh, you are the developer and you run your Terraform apply at that point in time, it's going to inject the secrets. The way we do that is via uh, data sources. Data sources is always the way we get data into our Terraform configuration file. But let's look at that in greater detail in the next slide here, okay? All right, let's take a look at how this vault injection via data source works. So a vault server is provisioned, a vault engine is configured like AWS Secrets Engine, the vault will create a machine user for AWS. Vault will generate a short-lived AWS credential for that machine user. Vault will manage and apply the AWS policy. And then within our Terraform, we can provide a data source to the vault. So that's what we're doing. We're saying vault AWS access credentials, and we are getting the output from our Terraform remote state admin outputs uh, backend. Uh, and then from there, we can reference them into AWS, okay? So when Terraform Apply is run, it will pull short-lived credentials to be used, uh, used for the scope of the duration of the current run. Every time you run Apply, you will get a new short-lived credentials, which is the whole point of uh, the short-lived idea, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at Vault. Um, and so the idea here is that we want to be able to inject uh, secrets from Vault uh, in a secure manner for our local developer environments. I really kind of wish I included this screenshot um, or this graphic within my uh, slides. I just found it as, as of now because it does really represent all the types of secret engines and capabilities of Vault. One thing in particular I wasn't aware of is that it has its own key value store. Uh, so that's what we're gonna be using. We're gonna keep it really simple here. Um, but uh, the first thing we're gonna have to do is go ahead and install Vault. So just down below, I have a link here that I found um, and we'll go down below. And it's not, shouldn't be too hard to install. So uh, we are on Linux today. I mean, I'm on a Windows machine, but I'm using Linux um, as the Windows uh, subsystem there. And so this is where we're gonna start and grab our stuff. So making my way over to VS Code, whoops. Um, and I'm just trying to think, should we use this for a new project? Probably, so I'm gonna just CD out here and I'm going to make my way into uh, Vault, which apparently I don't have a folder for. So I'm going to just go here. And we're going to uh, find Reveal and Explorer. And we'll make a new one. 200 Vault. Okay. And so we'll start first install something, then we'll set up a project, all right? So um, 
let's go through the installation process here, okay? So we'll go do a curl, which is our first step. And that's just gonna grab the GPG. I think we already have it because we did it for probably the, the CLI for um, Terraform there, but we'll just do it again there, it doesn't hurt. I'll add the repository again. I think we already did this when we installed the CLI in the beginning of this course. But we'll let it go again there. I remember this takes a little bit of time, so we'll just wait here for a bit. All right, so now we need to run the last command, which is actually going to go ahead and install Vault here for us. We'll just go ahead and grab that line. And I'm going to go ahead and paste that on in. I'm not sure if I grabbed that properly. We'll try that one more time. It, uh, I got my console's unresponsive. There we go. Okay. This happens when I, um, I stop and start recording. It just for some reason times out like that. So I'll go ahead and hit enter there and that will go ahead and install our vault. And then after that, we're going to have to start getting it running. Um, there is again, a tutorial to inject secrets. I'm not going to stick one-to-one -one with it because, um, it does come with a repository, but I find that it is a little bit more work than we want to do here. We just want to kind of get a basic example working. And I just want to make our lives a little bit easier. So I'm just going to modify it as we go here. But uh, yeah, we'll just wait for that to install. I'll see you back here in a moment, okay? All right, so after a short little wait here, I believe that um, Vault is installed. Let's find out if it works. So we'll type in um, Vault. Once I get the responsiveness back from my uh, console here, just giving it a moment. Great. Nope, nope. There we go, Vault. And so Vault is there. And so what we can do is start it up in a uh, developer mode. And I remember from here, they actually had some pretty good instructions on the starting of that. So um, like the way they do this project, and I have the repo here, is that they, um, they provision Vault with a bunch of different things. So I think they're using like S3 here. And that would probably be a really uh, common use case for this, but I really want to simplify it. And I don't want to have to provision that with Terraform and cross-reference the uh, stuff. So we're just going to uh, simplify that. So I'm just looking for the command to start Vault because I saw a good one here that was like, Vault, um, ah, here it is right there. So vault server hyphen dev that starts in the developer mode, dev root token ID. Uh, there's something about like sealing or unsealing stuff. I don't know what that means, but I assume that's a way of securing the vault, but we're gonna go ahead and just type that in. So we're gonna go vault server hyphen dev hyphen dev root token ID. And obviously you wouldn't wanna do this for your production. They call theirs education. I'm just gonna stick with that to make our lives a bit easier. And so what that's gonna do is start up a vault server um, it is running on this port here, so I, I suppose we should export that or or keep this because we'll probably have to reference it somehow. Uh, notice that we have this like unseal key, so the unseal key and root token are displayed below in case you want to seal or reauthenticate. Um, development should not be used in production. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create a um, uh, a readme file in our vault here. So we'll just say new file. Read me, because I just want to dump this stuff. Of course, you know, you should not share these with anybody, but I just don't want to forget these while we're working through this. So I'm going to go ahead and copy that. And we'll go ahead and save that. Uh, and so what I want to do now, oops, did we lose our terminal? Did I close it? Okay. I must have closed it. So which one were we working in? Second, third one, which is it? Fourth. Okay, it's the third one. So don't be like me. Close out your old ones. So I'm just going to close out these old ones so I'm less confused. There we go. And so it says that it started on uh, this address here. So I'm going to go copy that address. And we are going to open this up. You can do everything via the CLI. Uh, I just want to... Copy that there, uh, but they have a nice UI, which is nice. And so this is where we're gonna put that token, education. I'm gonna drop that down. So there are some other options or there's a lot of options for authenticating, but token is obviously the easiest and probably not the most secure, uh, especially the way we wrote it. And notice that we have a couple things pre-installed. So we have cubbyhole, which is a per token private secret storage. And then we have key value secret storage. Again, I don't know much about these because this isn't, isn't a, um, this isn't a course on Vault. It's just kind of us showing a basic integration and more focus on the Terraform side. But here is where we can create our secrets. We can, of course, use the uh, CLI to do that. And I think they showed in the getting started here. And 
we don't have to do it this way. I, we, I'd rather do it through UI, but you do like vault key, v, uh, key V put, and then you put the name of your secret. So here's secret forward slash hello, and then the key and the value, that's where it would store. I assume that this would go to the, well, this would specify what you're using here. So what we'll do is we'll go over here and we'll create ourselves a new secret because we're gonna wanna store something here. So we want the path for the secret. This is pretty common with, um, if you've ever used a uh, parameter store, you have a path. I don't know if it starts with a forward slash, may not end in a forward slash, probably can begin with it. So I'm gonna say A to S key, uh, cause we'll do the key and the secret, right? So here, oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. So we can do forward slash AWS. And then down below, I would just add another one. Maybe I gotta add each one at a time. So we'll say key and I'll go actually go grab our proper ones. Um, oh, I shouldn't have stopped that. I'm gonna have to start that up again. Okay. And we will add a plus there because everything lives in memory when you're in the dev one. So you really don't want to shut that down or you'll have to redo all this from scratch. So what I'm going to do is just go back here. I'm going to drag this down a little bit more. Okay. And I'm just going to go see if I have to re-log in because I might've messed this all up. Yes, I do. So we'll type in education. So we really don't want to stop running that server during the uh, duration of this uh, follow along. Okay. And so we'll go back into secret here, create a secret, forward slash AWS. Uh, what we want is adjacent. No, I don't think it matters. If we can add two keys, that's all that matters to me. And so what I'm gonna do is cat out my credentials. Of course, this is not the secure way of doing it. So, you know, again, don't show people these things. And so I want this, and I probably should match the name. I'm gonna like type in the whole darn thing. And we'll grab this. Oops. Want to see that value is correct? Good. We're going to add another one here. This is going to be our access secret or access secret access key. I really don't like how those have been named. And we'll go ahead and grab on this. And um, I mean, we don't really need to really store the region here, but why not? Because we're doing all the rest of here. We might as well just throw them all in here. For fun. And uh, here it says maximum number of versions. I don't need anything beyond one because we're not going to be updating these. Um, require check and set. So writes will only be allowed if the key's current version matches the version specified in the CAS parameter. I'm not sure what that means. Maybe just like you're passing something along when you are doing something. But uh, I think this is all good. You know what, I'm just gonna leave that back to 10 just in case I've made a mistake and we have to go debug that. I'm gonna go hit save. And so there are our secrets. Um, and so what we wanna do is be able to access them. And so maybe this is our, our opportunity to learn the CLI here a bit. So I have it pulled up on the left-hand side. And so what I'm gonna do is type in vault, key V, get, and we'll do AWS. I don't know if we can start with a forward slash there. I'm gonna hit enter and um, the server gave an HTTP response to an HTTPS client. So I'm not sure why that's a problem because like, I mean, I understand that it started up in HTTP, but I mean, I'm in development. So, you know, what else am I gonna really do here? Let's see if I can just scroll up here and if there's anything else. Um, hmm. And I could have swore that it installed a private key as we were doing this, because I remember seeing that there. It was like a private key. I could have swore there was one, something about private key. So I'm not sure what the problem is here. I'll be back in a moment and I will resolve it, okay? So uh, the suggestion I'm getting is that uh, we need to um, export a couple of environment variables. So see here where it writes this. So we say, you need to set the following. So maybe we will go through and set those. So I'll go grab that there. But here's the thing is like, how do I run that? Because these are, I think these are like not the same. So, I mean, I can't run it over here, can I? I don't think so. Uh, well, I guess if we're doing key vault value there, maybe we can. Um, still no good. What if we export the vault token? I think we said it was education here. Hmm. 
Let's do vault status. So yeah, I'm not sure how we're going to do it that way. I mean, it's not a really big deal because I don't think that we have to access it that way. But notice here, like, as I was reading here, you know, they're just saying down below, oh, we had to set this and that. So I'm not really sure what I would do here. So the output is like this. Run these commands and it should do it. Again, the error message can be similar or different problems. So that, or maybe I'm just specifying the key incorrectly and that's why it doesn't like it. So um, let's just type in vault and see what we have here. So vault key V. Maybe if we do like a list, can we get a list? List the secrets. Um, AWS. AWS. Clear. I'm not sure what parameter it wants there. Uh, let's go look it up. So let's say like tariff or was it uh, vault key V list option. Seems to want another parameter here. Going to scroll on down. So secret forward slash my app. Um, folders are suffixed with the forward slash. The input must be a folder. List of a file will not return. Um, do I have to put secret in front of it? Secret. Uh, AWS. No. So I don't know what the issue is there. It just would, would have been nice to use it via the CLI. But the thing is, is that, again, we don't need to use it that way. We just need to, um, you know, set it and, and get it. But I thought it would be fun to kind of use the CLI there. So now that we have those set, the way we're going to um, extract out these values is by using a data source. Um, and so what I want to do is just create a new local project. And I think we like to always pull from our account repo here. So I'm going to go all the way up to here and I'm going to go grab the main and I'm just going to copy the contents there. We're going to go all the way down to the ground and we're going to make a new main TF file here. We're going to go paste that on in. And uh, we just want my server. We don't need an output. It's fine. This is all fine. This is all fine. But uh, the one thing is we don't want to use our particular provider there. So what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to just open up our credentials file there. And I'm just going to change this to something else like other so that it doesn't load that profile there. Okay, I'm going to just take these out of here. Um, I think we can leave that alone. And I think that's everything. So what I want to do now, we don't need that count. We'll get rid of that count. We'll go check out the uh, documentation or the code base here. Because it gives us a bit of an idea how we need to implement this. We'll go over to the operator. Uh, we'll go over to the main. And so they're setting some variables here, like name, region, path, things like that. But again, we want to grab it from the source. They're uh, actually cross-referencing it like this other, they provision the admin and grabbing it that way. I don't want to do it that way. I wanted to use just the data source like this. So I'm not sure how that's going to work. So let's go look that up. Okay, so here it says read AWS credentials from an AWS secret backend. And I'm not trying to do that. I'm just trying to read them from the key vault. Okay, so we probably want vault generic secret. Would this be from key vault? This uh, resource is primarily intended to be used with the generic secret backend, but it is also compatible with any vault endpoint that is provided. But is that the key value one? That's not clear to me. Um, so I think it is. So let's see if we can figure that out here. So I'm just going to move that off screen here. And we're going to add ourselves the data source. So I guess we're really not following that other tutorial at all because it, we literally have to use a different, um, uh, key value there. Eh? So we'll say secret, and this is going to be like AWS credentials, maybe, or maybe it's creds that I don't have to worry about spelling mistakes. 
and we need to specify a path. Notice it always starts with like secret. I don't know if we always have to start it with secret. Um, so I will just say AWS here. And there might be some additional options. I'm just scrolling through to here that so you have path. So this is the fully the full logical path from which to request the data to read data from generic secret back in Mountain Vault by default. This should be prefixed with secret forward slash. So we do have to do that. Reading from other backends as data source as possible. Consult each backend documentation to see which endpoint supports the get uh, version version of the secret to read. We only have a single version, so we don't have to specify that. Um, so technically, that should be correct. So what we will want to do now in our provider is specify all those options. So again, I'm just going back to the source code. This is off screen, but uh, we need to set the region, the access key and the secret key here. And so this is gonna be data and it's going to be vault generic secret. And I guess it would be AWS. And then we're accessing those things like region. And so I'm gonna go ahead and just copy that really quickly. And we will go over back to our vault here because the names are over here. So go grab that, paste that in there. We'll go grab that, paste that in there. And I'm just gonna double check to make sure if I've made any mistakes. This one, it's showing it from the admin. So it goes admin outputs, but we're not outputting from anything. We're just grabbing it from uh, the vault there. So maybe what we need to do is just kind of review how this uh, generic vault works. So this does data vault generic, and then it does data and then square braces. So I wonder if we always have to do data. So for the example, the vault, there is a, a, a key named auth token. The value is a token that we need to keep secret. But yeah, I don't understand. Is this a JSON object or just a way of referencing it? Cause it doesn't specify that. So we'll just give it a try. Nothing hurts with trying, right? So we'll say data. And this might, again, might not be the right way. I don't know if it's single or doubles there. It's doubles. So I could just wonder if that was like the one case where it's doubles. Okay, and we will do this. And so I think that that should maybe work. Don't know. What I'm wondering is if I, if I led with a forward slash, would it have considered that? and or is it now double but i don't think so because look here it looks like it's stripped it out because it just says aws here so we go to secrets and it's just aws almost looks like there's a space in the front of it eh but it's not there so maybe there's not it's just kind of like a little glitch so um we need to go and cd into this directory here and we just need to do a terraform init that's kind of interesting because like we haven't set up the provider I guess it's not gonna happen until we actually use the provider, so maybe it's not an issue just yet. I'm curious to see if it pulls any kind of modules in for the Vault generic secret. So we'll just give it a moment there to uh, initialize. Okay, so after there, we can see that it did actually add Vault in, so it must be uh, ready to take it from there. Um, I'm gonna do a Terraform plan here. And you know what, I'm going to just change this to like my server with vault. Now remember, it's not going to be able to pull from the, um, from our local credentials because we're not setting a profile and we overrode the default just in case. So here it's saying a resource, a data resource, uh, vault generic secret, AWS has not been declared in the root module. Um, it hasn't. <laughs> I mean, it looks like I did, no? Maybe I typed it wrong. So we'll go here. I don't think it matters, but I'll just put it above. Okay. And I'm just going to double check to make sure. Nope, it, it matches. Oh, because it's AWS creds. That's fair. Um, you didn't use the option out, oh, that's fine. So my question will be, will this correctly provision? Because we will not know until we uh, uh, use this right here. 
Um, I suppose if we try to use a data source for AWS, that would probably also in, uh, indicate whether it's working or not. So maybe we should try doing that. We could do like data, um, AWS VPC, and then we just do like ID equals here because that would have to use the credentials, right? Um, and so we'll just go, well, that's actually, it's not specifying any of the, the VPC here. So maybe, maybe we won't do that because it's just too much work. Um, so what I'll do here is I'm gonna do a Terraform apply, auto approve, and let's cross our fingers and hope this works. And while that is running, what I'm gonna do is just pull up my AWS environment here. And apparently I'm not logged in, so that'll give me a bit of time here to kind of catch up here while this is uh, provisioning there. And uh, so it looks like it actually provisioned the server. And if that's the case, that means that our secrets are being pulled correctly, right? So if we go over to EC2 here, and we go and check out this instance, it is running, so it worked. Um, if we just want to do a sanity check to make sure it absolutely is working, we can just introduce a bug into this. So maybe we go here and we just say, um, I guess we'd have to make a new version, create a new version. And what I'm gonna do is purposely introduce some mistakes. So we're just gonna put like an at sign here on the end. We're gonna save that. And I'm going to make a minor change like nano. And so what I'm expecting is for this to fail. Let's see if it fails on the plan. I don't think it will. I think it would fail on the apply. And it does, okay. So the plan would tell us whether it, it didn't work or not. So that clearly, uh, clearly means it absolutely is pulling from it, especially when we're doing the plan. So um, I want to go back to our file there. I just kind of lost the folder. I'm just looking for it. The, I got too many, um, too many Chrome windows open here. There it is. Okay, so we'll go back here and we'll, I wonder if we can just revert back to the previous version. Um, see, I don't know if I would delete there. I don't want to, I don't want to jinx it. So I'm just going to go here and take out that at sign. We're gonna go ahead and save that. And so that should be updated. We're gonna do Terraform plan. Great, and so what I wanna do is just tear this down. So we'll say Terraform apply, auto approve and destroy. Okay, and while that is destroying, I'm pretty, pretty confident that's gonna work. I'm gonna stop my vault server, oh wait. Is that gonna still work? Did I get the credentials in time? Oh no, <laughs> I, I made a big boo-boo. Okay, so um, I, uh, I killed my vault server before I was supposed to. That's really embarrassing. Um, anyway, that's not a big deal because I kind of wanted to stop the server anyway, but I want to go back into our, our AWS credentials there and uh, turn that back to default. And I wanted to go back up here and just flip that back so that we can get rid of the server, right? So um, I don't want to kind of lose these for the tutorial. So I'm just going to go here and just comment those out for a second. Profile default. Oops. Uh, region US East 1. And um, we'll do that again. That's embarrassing. Okay, and I'm just gonna preemptively, I'm not gonna save this file, but I'm just going to do this for now. Um, it's still trying to connect. Oh boy. So, I'll just put these back in here. Because it's set to the vault, can I do a Terraform refresh? Probably not. No, probably not. Uh, what if I do a Terraform init? Because I did change, like I was using Vault, so maybe I just have to do that to uh, fix that problem. 
And let's try destroy again. That was a big boo-boo on my part, eh? Nope. Okay, so let's go back over here and start it up again. And I'm, I'm pretty sure there's like a way to back up your vaults. Like there's probably like some kind of like snapshot or something. Um, again, I'm not that uh, deep into it, so I cannot tell you if that's the case. Um, so I guess we'll just go back here and remake our secrets. Because it shouldn't have persisted, right? If it did, I'd be so happy. Nope. Okay. AWS, we'll leave 10 in there, and then we'll just have to copy all the stuff over again because of my bonehead mistake there. So we have region, uh, which is US East 1. US East 1 here. And... Uh, over here well at least you know what to do if that happens to you okay um, I don't need the uh, equal sign there go ahead and add this one Okay, and what we're going to do is go ahead and save that. And we'll just quit out of that. We'll do a Terraform plan. Since we know that that will pick it up, right? Great. And uh, we'll do Terraform apply, auto approve, destroy. Okay, so again, this only applies to development, but uh, yeah, don't kill your vault server before you're done destroying, okay? So I'll see you back here in a moment. All right, so that infrastructure is destroyed. We can go back to here and then we can stop our server. And for your benefit, I'm just going to bring back these in here. So you don't have to worry about that. And uh, yeah, we, uh, we accomplished vault for injections. Now you might say, well, how would you do this with Terraform Cloud? Well, the thing is, is that Terraform Cloud already uses uh, vault under the hood when you store your environment variables there. And the idea is that uh, I suppose you don't need to pull them in from all those sources. But uh, I think that was one of my, my questions I had when I was talking to one of the DAs, which was like, okay, it's great that Terraform Cloud has, um, uh, you know, uses Vault behind the scenes, but what if I want that to live somewhere else? But maybe that's not really necessary um, because I don't know. But yeah, that's it. So we're all done with Vault. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at Atlantis, which is an open source developer tool to automate Terraform pull requests, which you can find at runatlantis.io. So the idea is once this is installed on your GitHub and you merge a pull request, then it's going to go ahead and do a Terraform apply. So this would be a way for you to do um, uh, GitOps or to automate your, uh, your infrastructure as code. And uh, the interesting thing is that HashiCorp actually maintains this project. They didn't originally build it. It was built by two people from another company. And it wasn't that they did not want to use Terraform Cloud, which can uh, do this. But at the time, I think they had a hard time at the company getting procurement because it was a very large company. And so uh, they had to build something. So they built out this thing. Um, and uh, anyway, these two people end up getting hired by HashiCorp and HashiCorp maintains this project, which is really nice because it is an alternative for Terraform Cloud. Um, but uh, yeah, that's all. Let's take a look at CDK for Terraform. And so to understand this, we need to first understand what is CDK. So AWS Cloud Development Kit is an imperative infrastructure as code tool with SDKs for your favorite language. So the idea is that you can use something like TypeScript, Python, Java, C Sharp, Go and Ruby. Ruby's definitely there. Uh, that's the language I like to use. And AWS CDK is intended only for AWS cloud resources um, because CDK generates out cloud formation, so CFN templates. This is known as synthesizing and uses that for IAC. Uh, but CDK for Terraform is a standalone project by HashiCorp that allows you to use CDK, but instead of CFN templates it generates out, it's going to generate out Terraform templates. And so basically anything Terraform can do, you can do it through CDK. Uh, and that allows you to do interesting things like um, use CDK to provision Azure resources. So that is very uh, interesting uh, and a great development that I think that they're doing.
Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are taking a look at Gruntwork, which is a software company that builds DevOps tools that extends or leverages Terraform. The reason we're talking about them is that they uh, produce a couple of very popular open source tools that work with Terraform, and you're going to see their name because um, uh, you know the co-founders there are very active in the community. Uh, Jim has written a really good book on uh, Terraform, so you know it's no surprise that uh, they are present, but it's worth giving them a mention so you know who they are. Uh, the first thing I want to mention is the infrastructure is a code library. So these are a bunch of reusable battle tested production ready infrastructure code for AWS GCP Azure. Um, and so they have some free ones there and some paid ones there. Then there's TerraGrunt, so a thin wrapper that provides extra tools for keeping your configurations dry. We have TerraTest, a testing framework for infrastructure provisioned with Terraform. We have Gruntwork Landing Zones for AWS. This is a multi-account security on AWS. We have Gruntwork Pipelines. And then there's the Gruntwork Reference Architecture. Uh, and so where we're going to focus our attention here is just on TerraGrunt and TerraTest because those are things I think are essential to know uh, if you are using Terraform because you know, you'll run into those use cases where you might want to use them, okay? All right, let's take a look here at Terragrunt. So this is a thin wrapper for Terraform that provides extra tools for keeping your configuration dry, working with multiple Terraform modules, managing remote state, uh, and this is accessible at the terragrunt.gruntwork.io. Uh, terra uh, so the idea here is the concept of don't repeat yourself. So it's a programming methodology to abstract repeated code into functions and modules or libraries, and often in isolate files to reduce code complexity efforts and errors. So the way that works is that you'll see these HCL files, which are the uh, terragrunt uh, code, and they're actually named terragrunt.hcl. And that's what's going to be used to um, abstract away or dry up your um, Terraform files. So here is an example of Terragrunt. Now, Terragrunt does a lot of different things. And you're going to uh, find its use when you actually use Terraform in practice and you run into these limitations in Terraform. And you go, man, I wish there was a way around it. And Terragrunt like, almost always solves that. And so one example is being able to generate um, dynamic providers. And I don't mean like dynamic values here in the sense that there's that dynamic value feature of uh, Terraform, but I just mean the fact that um, at the time of this, it's very hard to uh, inject or, or to uh, write out uh, providers. So they have this generate function that allows you to get around that. Another really interesting thing is that Terragrunt supports better granularity for modules by reducing lots of boilerplate. Uh, the way they do this is, the, is that you are referencing your Terraform files uh, via the source here. Okay, so you're not including your modules within your code, you're just referencing them and then you pass along their inputs. Uh, and this is going to be very important when we look at uh, wanting to write unit tests for your infrastructure, because uh, when you learn about how you test IAC, you have to really break things down into smaller parts. And if you have a lot of friction there, it's going to make your team not want to uh, adopt that or it's going to make that process really slow. Um, but again, this is more like at scale or when you hit these kind of requirements, okay? All right, let's take a look here at testing in Terraform. And so what we have here on the left-hand side is our usual um, uh, pyramid that tells us the layers of testing. And so I kind of want to walk through the layers there and talk about a, a bit of the uh, tools that are available to the Terraform community and uh, you know the reason why we'd want to move up the pyramid here to get uh, better tests. And then we'll take a look at TerraTest. So at the bottom, we have static analysis. And this is where you test your code without deploying. And you've been doing it all along. When you do Terraform Validate, Terraform Plan, or you're using Sentinel, uh, you're doing static analysis. And that just means that um, we're testing, you know, like the composition or the, the shape of our code or like its outputs to what it says it should be doing. Okay, but you can't catch all your problems there. And that's where you move on to unit testing. And unit testing, uh, you know, traditionally means like in programming to test like a particular function, its inputs and its outputs. Um, it's a little bit harder for infrastructure because, um, you know, there, you have to have it connected to other things. So it, the definition is a little bit warped, but the idea here, and specifically with Terraform, is you're just testing a single module. And that really says like, okay, well, you need to really pare down that module to be uh, of the small scope. And that's where you end up dividing your modules into very small units of work. And so for tooling here, we got TerraTest, Kitchen, uh, Terraform, and InSpec. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's where that motivation came with, um, you know, Terragrunt, the last thing saying, okay, let's split them up into smaller stuff. Uh, we have integration testing. This is pretty much just using multiple um, uh, uh, modules together. You know, so you say, okay, well, I know that this Lambda function is working, but do I know it works in conjunction with this SQSQ or something like that? 
Then you have end-to-end -end testing, and this is where you're testing basically like business use cases. So it's not just saying, okay, from a technical perspective, but from a business use case do, or the uh, customer use case, do we meet the requirements here? Uh, and this uh, is very hard because what you have to actually do is set up a persistent test network uh, environment. But once you have one, you're gonna be in really good shape. Uh, one example of a uh, test environment, and it is paid, but Gruntwork has their own called the Gruntwork Reference Architecture. Uh, but you know, if you had to do it uh, without that, you'd have to just roll your own kind of environment. So, you know, if you do want a good breakdown of all these different kinds, uh, you know, Jim from Gruntwork has a complete talk on automated testing for infrastructure as code. I strongly recommend it because it really gives you a better scope than what I can cover here. Um, but let's just go take a quick look at TerraTest. So TerraTest allows you to perform unit tests and integration tests on your infrastructure. It tests your infrastructure by temporarily deploying it, validating the results, then tearing down the test environment. And so here's an example of what a, uh, a test function would look like in TerraTest. It is written in Golang. I know Golang can be very hard to use, but you don't need to know much about it. If you, you pretty much copy and paste it and then just kind of tweak the values to get the result you want. So, you know, hopefully that helps to, uh, to tell you how you would test in Terraform and you know a bit about TerraTest, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from ExamPro. I'm gonna show you how to book your HashiCorp certification. So type in HashiCorp certification into Google. We'll go to the first link and we'll just scroll around and try to find uh, where it is that we can schedule. So it's not that clear as to where we can go, but let's say we click into the Terraform Associate Certification and we have schedule and take the exam. This will bring us to this page and it will just give us some instructions saying you have to have your ID, things like that. So we'll say click here to go to the exam platform. So we click that. And it's going to bring us to the single sign-on. So notice, or it's not single sign-on, but it's an IPD through authhashicorp.com. So we'll click on our GitHub, and we will authorize that. You could probably sign up via PS, uh, PSI uh, exams online if you don't have a GitHub account, but generally you probably should have one if you're taking a, uh, a HashiCorp certification. So what I'll do is scroll on down. We'll click on Schedule, and I'm just going to enter um, some of my personal details here. So we'll say Andrew Brown at andrewexampro.co. Okay. And now I need to uh, choose my location. So we're going to choose Canada. I'm going to choose my time zone. So I am in uh, Toronto. And so now I have some options down below. So you can see. We have available dates. I'm gonna book mine between Wednesday and Friday. So I'm gonna take it Wednesday and I'm gonna to try to find a time that suits me. So I'm thinking probably 8 p.m. That's the time I like to take my exams. We'll go ahead and hit continue. And we'll just review our details here and hit continue. And notice this is a remote online proctored exam. Uh, it's probably possible to take it uh, in person, but at this time, this is not possible to uh, take an in-person exam. So this is for the online process here. And so what you're going to want to do is go ahead and go to pay now. Or actually, sorry, you have to acknowledge the terms and then go to pay now. And so that would redirect you to the payment portal. I actually have a code, so I'm going to go ahead and enter my code in, and that's how I'm going to uh, proceed here. But if you are paying, you just go to the pay now. Okay, and so mine has been set. I'll go ahead and click pay now. Great. And so now my exam is uh, ready to go. So that's all there really is to it. They're gonna give you a bunch of information that you need to follow through. You need to make sure you have your government ID and make sure that matches the name that you put in. So I put in Andrew Brown, so my government ID needs to say that. Uh, and that's all there really is to it.